<laughs> I've yet another story to tell. I guess I am susceptible to spirits and apparitions, as I've had other encounters with loved ones who have passed. This one was my very first encounter. I was going through a very bitter divorce. Being only 28 and afraid to be alone with two very little boys, I didn't know which end was up, so to speak. It was in the summer. I had my two babies bathed and in bed. I decided to lay on the sofa and watch some television. I fell asleep. A pretty deep sleep at that. I was awoken by the static of the television. The station had gone off the air for the night. My baby of 10 months old had the bedroom right off of the living room. The sofa was facing his room, and he was sleeping soundly. I had a habit of keeping all of the bedroom doors open at night, so that if one of my sons cried, I would hear them. All of a sudden, the living room got so cold, like a very damp chill. A glowing light appeared at the doorway of my baby's room. Then a figure appeared, a woman, in a long white dress, in dark hair. Her hair was up in an upsweep, but I couldn't make out her face. Her face was blurry, and I just couldn't see it at all. I was shocked, couldn't move, mind racing and heart pounding like crazy. I sat up on the sofa and just stared at this figure in the doorway of my baby's room. Then she spoke, only a few words. But she spoke. She said it will be alright. Then she vanished into thin air. That damp chill vanished along with the apparition. I was so shaken by this not knowing who it was or what it was about. I eventually calmed down and put it out of my mind. A few days later, my mom and dad came up for a visit. They loved their grandbaby so much, they came to visit several times a week. We were sitting at the table in the kitchen just chatting about anything and everything. That's when I thought of the strange happening I experienced a few nights before. I told my folks about what had happened and described the figure that I saw that night to my parents. I mentioned too how cold and damp it got in that room that night and how the chill went away when the figure went away. My dad sat there looking at me with the eyes of dinner plates and had a stunned look on his face. I asked him if he was okay. He said that he was, but he knew who that figure was. I asked him who that could have been, and he said it was his mother. He was only seven when his mother died. She was only 34 years old. She died a week after her ninth child was born. She had all of her children in the farmhouse where her and my grandfather lived. Dad used to sit at his desk in a one-room schoolhouse and look out at her grave. The cemetery was right next door to the schoolhouse. I asked him how he knew it was his mother. He said the way I described her, wearing a long white dress and the color and style of her hair. Her hair was dark and always in an upsweep, but this part is what really convinced me that he was right. He told me that she would always use that expression, it will be alright, to him and his brothers and sisters when things didn't go quite right. He said he just knew it was her. He said she was comforting me and telling me that everything would get better. I was quite amazed, not only by the fact that I never saw my grandmother, but how she came to visit me in my times of need. I never had any other encounters with her after that visit, though I felt a calmness inside of me and felt somehow closer to her after that hot summer night. Thank you for reading my story. I hope you enjoyed reading it. I had visited my mother on Monday afternoon, after she and I had a disagreement on the Saturday before. She had called me on the Saturday afternoon and told me she needed to come to her house. I lived in the country at the time, and she lived about 10 miles from me. I would just been in town with my youngest two sons for baseball practice. I also had just taken my only transportation to the shop to have new tires put on, so I had no vehicle to take me anywhere for the day. Our conversation escalated into an argument quickly, and I ended up hanging up the phone after she had not stopped her insistence that I come to her house immediately. She was never this insistent over me coming to pick up some fresh veggies she had gotten from her early garden. On Sunday, I was stubborn, and though I could have gone in to visit all day, I stayed at home. On Monday, 
I'd taken off work a little early to go to school to watch my sons in a spring sports day. I had about 45 minutes after the sports events before they would be out of school and I went to see my mother. We talked and our argument from Saturday was completely forgotten. She and I talked about all three of my sons. My oldest is 8 years older than my younger and 10 years older than my youngest, so he was in college and doing well. She told me that she had some problems with asthma lately, but she wasn't going to let it get the best of her. I told her she should really go to the doctor because asthma might not be something to ignore. She said she would be fine. On Tuesday morning, around 2 o'clock, I got a phone call that they were on their way to the hospital with her. I got up, dressed quickly, and drove into the hospital, about 20 blocks from the hospital. I was at a spotlight and thinking that I could run the light because I was the only car around. When I had a warm and comforting feeling fill me, something told me to take it easy. She was okay and in heaven. Really, it was such a grateful feeling of peace. I got to the hospital and I knew for sure the way the receptionist at the ER desk met me that she was gone. In the next week after the adjustments, I'd driven my sons to school and was on my way to work. There are some industrial sites at a cross street right before a spotlight, and it can get busy and bottled up. Also, there's a hill going down in the direction of where I was headed. I again felt a warm presence and felt her hand on my arm. Her voice said, Vicky, look up. Far enough ahead of me was a tractor trailer truck crossing over my lane into the side street. I had been in deep thought about so much, but had plenty of time to slow down very preventively, not to have any problems with the truck. She has been with me many times since then, and it is always such a warm, loving feeling. In her life, she dismissed ghosts and paranormal things as if she didn't think it was real. I have no idea if she has ever been with any of my four sisters or my brother, but she has definitely been with me. Thanks for reading. When I was about four years old, I answered the front door. We had one of those bells that was a knob you would turn on the outside. There, in bright daylight, stood a woman dressed in all pale yellow, in a long dress and matching, colored big brim hat. This occurred in the 1950s, around 1959. I let her in. She asked for my mother. I told her I didn't know where she was. She was illuminated. I thought by the sunlight coming through the glass of the front windows and doorway, I was only about four years old. Not frightened by her, but rather I was fascinated and mesmerized. I followed her into our living room. She proceeded to sit on the antique empire couch and kept asking where my mother was, and she seemed very concerned that I was left all by myself at a very young age. After what may have been an hour or so, she got up from the couch and said to me, tell your mother that Ada said it was very beautiful and don't be afraid. She then got up, walked to the front door with me following her, and left. When my mother came home, I told her about the lady in yellow named Ada and related her message. My mom almost fainted and fell down in the same spot where Ada sat. She asked me in a very unnerving voice, Are you sure she said she was Ada? To which I said yes. Then she said, My cousin Ada just died a few days ago. At my age then, thankfully, I feared nothing. Ghosts were not in my brain tank, so to speak. Until about seven years later. I was up in our attic. It was a very old house looking for stuff to wear for Halloween, and came across the same dress Ada had worn when she showed up as a ghost many years before. It was a dress that had actually belonged to her from when she was young in the early 1900s. Also had a run-in when I was 19 years old, old same house, with a sea captain. I was lying in my bed, daylight, and I was not asleep, just relaxing. Suddenly, I felt someone was there, next to me, and no one but me and my mom were home. My mom was downstairs watching TV. So, very reluctantly, I slowly looked to my left, and there, standing, was a tall man dressed in a blue uniform with brass buttons with anchors on them. He had no face, just like TV static for a face, but the rest of him was visible. He reached out a huge hand to me and said, 
don't be afraid. I only want to touch your blonde hair. It took me a while to not have a heart attack until I found my voice. I screamed to my mom. She came running upstairs. I told her what happened and she said, you just had a bad dream. I explained to her I wasn't asleep. I knew what I saw and I was very frightened. She then told me that my most male ancestors on her side of the family were sea captains and some were lost at sea. She assured me that he didn't want to hurt me, but he almost killed me from fright. I've also had animal ghost visits, and those were of course sad, but that's a whole nother story. Didn't want to bore you. You may now go to sleep. Thanks for reading. I've decided after about a month or two of wandering around your site that I'll add my own story. I noticed your last update was in 2003 or so, therefore I'm not expecting immediate posting of my tale. Keep in mind, this is the first time I've ever written the story out, so excuse me if I digress or repeat myself. In other stories that I've read, I've noticed people apologizing for extensive background information, so here's my apology slash disclaimer. There's a serious pity me I've had a hard life story involved that needs to be told before the actual ghost story can be understood. Feel free to skip over it, but don't expect to get the whole situation if you do. Oh, and may I add that I'm not completely looking for sympathy or anything. So that being said, here goes. When I was 14, I was living in a predominantly African American suburb in Illinois. My best friend and I seemed to be the only white teenagers around. Something started one night when someone called my friends, let's call her Jen's cell phone. The number showed up on Jen's caller ID as private number, and Jen answered, thinking it might be her parents calling from the restaurant they had gone to, but the other person on the other end started ranting about how Jen was a slutty person and a nasty whore. The caller proceeded to tell Jen that she should just kill herself and get it over with. Adding that if Jen didn't commit suicide, the call on her friends would hunt her down and slaughter her. Jen told the girl to grow up and hung up the phone. She was obviously and understandably shaken up, but she had the sense to star 69 to call. She wrote down the number and informed her parents of the incident when they returned. The next day, Jen's father, being the military man he is, called the number. No one picked up, so he and Jen headed to the police station. The police force in that town was also predominantly black, and when Jen stated that she thought the caller was black because of the way she spoke, the officer behind the desk gave her a dirty look and said he'd look into it and call her in the morning. She never heard from him. Then again, she never got another threatening phone call either. About a month later, Jen and I were walking back to her place from a convenience store about 9 o'clock at night when we heard something walking behind us. We turned around, and there was this black girl following us. We didn't recognize her from anywhere, and yet she started screaming the most obscene things I've ever heard, directed at Jen. To this day, and I'm 20 now, I've never heard such awful things come out of a human being's mouth before. This girl, who looked to be about our age, told Jen, I told you to just kill yourself. I warned you that I'd get you if you didn't. She then stabbed my best friend in the stomach and chest. I was frozen with fear and shock, but I finally jumped on the girl and started punching her with such fury and animal rage that she backed off and ran, but in the scuffle, she slipped my arm pretty badly and took off. I started to chase her, intending to tackle her to the ground, not knowing if I wanted to hold her down until someone came to help or if I wanted to just kill her for hurting my best friend. But I quickly decided that Jen needed me. So I went to Jen, ripped my t-shirt off, wrapped it tightly over her wounds, and told her to hang on. I ran back to the store we had just left, in my bra, which made the most horrifying moment of my life also the most embarrassing, and begged to use the phone. I called the police and explained what had happened and where we were. Then I darted back to Jen, ignoring the blood dripping onto my jeans and the pain in my forearm. I sat there, with Jen's head in my lap, pressing the shirt against her injuries, telling her I loved her and everything would be okay and that the police said they'd be there with the ambulance as soon as possible. It wasn't soon enough. 
Jen died in the ambulance. The stab wound to her chest punctured her left lung. She suffocated before even reaching the hospital. I didn't find out until the next morning. It was two summers later that I saw her. My family moved to New Jersey soon after the incident, thinking a change of scenery would help me forget. Wrong. Our new home was down the street from a conservation area, where I liked to go and relax on nice days. There was one specific spot that I liked. There was a neat little clearing where just enough sunlight came through the thick trees and there was a fallen tree that I'd sit on to read or write or whatever. On the other side of the clearing though, there was a spot I wasn't too fond of. There were six saplings, taller than I, forming a triangle. I never had a positive vibe from that area. It just felt wrong, not like the rest of the clearing, where I felt peaceful and relaxed. If I walked through those trees, I'd have this overwhelming urge to burst out in tears and hurt something. I never knew why until one day, I was sitting on my tree, smoking a cigarette and reading Shakespeare when that angry, depressing feeling came over me. The feeling I only got from that triangle of young trees. I ignored it and kept reading, but it grew and grew until I felt like I'd choke on it. So I looked up at the triangle and waited. For what? I had no idea. There was a little smoke coming up from the leaves on the ground, but I wrote that off as lit cigarettes someone had thrown. Then again, since I'd been there for quite a while and hadn't seen anyone around, how could someone have thrown a cigarette in there? So I shrugged it off and kept reading. Then I heard leaves rustling and the feeling of deep depression intensified. There was no wind, the trees were not swaying, my hair wasn't blowing, but leaves were moving. I raised my head and saw only leaves being pressed into the ground, as if an invisible person were walking across them, and they were coming towards me. Needless to say, I booked it out of there and sprinted home. That night, I woke up unable to breathe, with a searing pain in my stomach. I turned the light on, and just as I did, I caught a glimpse of those familiar blue icy eyes I knew and loved. My best friend. After a few minutes, the stomach pain went away, and I caught my breath and turned the light only to see those eyes again and feel presence on my bed like someone sitting down. I felt like she was sitting there watching me. The corners turned up a little, and something cold touched my cheek. I realized then that the angry slash depressed feeling I often got was flashing back to the emotions I had the night she was killed. Angry at the killer and myself, and so very depressed that the best friend I'd ever had was taken away from me, and the pains I had moments before were the same feeling she had when she was taking her last gasp of air. I suddenly felt overpoweringly tranquil. She was here, and she was not angry with me. I miss you, I said, and went back to sleep. Nothing has happened since, and it's been three years. I think she's watching over me every day now, except I know it's her, not by a feeling of extreme sadness but by the overwhelming urge to smile and make the most of my day. Thank you for reading. I know this was heavy hearted, but I appreciate you sticking through to the end. Thank you so much. This happened to a friend of mine. She went to visit her mother's grave at the cemetery, and as she was leaving, she noticed the burial service was in progress. She saw a little boy of about 12 sitting by himself on a stone bench a small distance away watching the service and she decided to join him. She described him as a very normal happy young boy dressed in a navy blue suit. The boy then started pointing out the people at the service, saying things like that's my mom and there's my uncle Ned. My friend assumed he was just at a family member's funeral and was told to sit on the bench as it might be too much for young children and nothing more. Then. The young boy stood up and said, I have to go now, my mom needs me, bye, and proceeded to the burial service. A little teary eyed, she watched him walk down the small grassy hill when she lost sight of him. As she was leaving, she bumped into the funeral director who took care of her own mother's service. After chatting a while, the family that she had just seen were walking from the service. How sad, she commented to him, very sad, he replied. They lost a child to cancer. It was then my friend noticed that there were no children in the group, just adults. Was he a little boy? My friend asked. Yes, said the funeral director. He was only 12. 
She continued to watch as the members of the service walked by to see if she could find the boy she had just talked with, but again, saw no children. She is convinced the polite young happy man she spoke with was the ghost of the 12 year old boy who was being laid to rest, but what stayed with her the most was the concerned look on his young face when he said, I have to go now, my mom needs me. Thanks for reading. I know this is a creepy one, but I know you'd appreciate reading this. I recently attended the funeral interment of my uncle, but first, I need to tell you about his father, my grandfather. Granddad was known as Mr. Beast around the city of San Francisco from the 1940s on. Dozens of people not known to the family came to his funeral because he had rescued them from a swarm trying to move into their house or in their house. Granddad died driving his pickup with a load of beehives on board and the responders had to call in another beekeeper before they could get his body out of the crash truck. Fast forward to July of 2009. Mr. B's son's casket is being lowered into the ground. 15 feet away, the white glove pallbearers have lined up in front of a large cypress tree. 30 feet across the lawn is the headstone of my grandparents. As taps is being played, I look over, and there is a mini swarm of bees harassing the pallbearers. Afterwards, the trees check for a hive, but the gathering of bees is over. That's all. Thanks. P.S. On July 27, 2009, I sent you an account of how a swarm of bees attended the funeral of my uncle, son of a famous bee man. On April 7, 2010, my mother, the bees man's daughter, died. The next afternoon, when I got out of my car at her house for the first time since her death, I heard that big buzz. Looking around, I saw the swarm just passing over the house. They didn't stay. The swarm at my uncle's funeral also moved on, but those are the only two swarms I've seen in my life. Go figure. Hi there. I'm a regular to this site. I love the stories. I heard the story from my grandmother before she died. It is true, I tell you, and I will tell you the way I heard it. Here it is. My grandmother and grandfather bought a house in 1942. It was a beautiful two-story home and was about 60 years old at the time they purchased it. They have been only married four months and were very happy to finally have a house of their own before they lived with my grandfather's parents. When you walked in the front door, you have two big parlor rooms on your right and left and a nice sized basement. My grandfather absolutely loved her new home and nothing could ever make her leave it. After they moved all of their furniture into it and got everything situated, they went to bed. About 3 a.m. in the morning, she was awoken by the sound of children running around in one of the parlors. She got up to see what was going on, and she did not see a thing, so she shrugged it off and went back to bed. The next morning, she was outside planting flowers, so was my grandfather, when a woman from down the street approached my grandmother and introduced herself. They talked for about an hour or so about the neighborhood in the town. The neighbor woman was about to excuse herself when she said quietly, do you know the history of your home? My grandmother said no and was interested in finding out. The neighbor started telling her about the old funeral home that used to be ran here. My grandmother was startled to hear of this. Nevertheless, after the neighbor left, she went inside and looked around. She finally realized why the two parlors were so big. They were showing rooms for the deceased this frightened her. My grandfather came in from the yard and sat down in the kitchen to have a nice cold cup of lemonade. As he sat and drank, he felt two small hands on his lower back. He turned around and no one was there. He immediately got up from his chair and ran to my grandmother. She was still in the parlor walking around and thinking. He said, June, I felt two small hands on my lower back. She told him that the night before she heard the sound of children playing. Then she began to tell him about what the neighbor woman said about their home. He said, oh, Jane, I do not believe that. That is silly talk. Later that night after dinner, they were sitting in one of the parlors listening to the radio when out of the corner of my grandmother's eyes, she saw a woman kneeling at the wall. My grandmother was speechless and very frightened about what she saw. So frightened it was like she was frozen. My grandfather looked over at her and said, honey, are you okay? What's wrong? She mumbled, do you see the woman kneeling? Do you see her? He said, no, hon, I do not even see her. He started to get a little uneasy about his wife saying this. He said, Jane, 
I think you need to lie down. So he took a hold of her hand and walked her upstairs to their room. She laid down and fell asleep almost instantly. My grandfather watched over her until he knew she was asleep. He walked down the stairs and into the parlor where the radio was on. He sat down and listened to the news broadcast. After about an hour, he became tired, so he thought he would go on to bed. He got up and turned off the radio and walked to the stairs. As he came out of the parlor, he was stopped by what he thought was the sound of a strong howling wind coming from out of the kitchen. The next thing he saw frightened him beyond belief. A pine ghostly casket with a woman inside rolled through the hallway and stopped in front of him. He let out a scream of terror that awoke my grandmother, which went to go see him. She saw him standing there in absolute shock. She called out to him in a panic, George, what is wrong? All he could say was, I want out of this house. I want out. So they packed their things and went to stay with family about 10 miles away in the next town. They arrived at the family's house and told them about what had occurred. They looked puzzled and agreed to let them stay the night. The next day, my grandmother and grandfather and their family went back to their ghostly home. They picked up their things and moved out that very day. Sorry about the length, and sorry about the layout of the story. I bid you this the way I heard it. Hello, my name is Tana. I have a story that may or may not be ghost related, but it's strange and to me and my family. It's something we will always laugh about. In October of 2001, my great grandma died at the age of 94, peacefully, of natural causes. We all miss her greatly. At the funeral, I was in the separate section for all of us who were descended directly from her. There were a lot of us. Anyhow, this section had its own private bathroom, which had paper thin walls and was the size of a coat closet. The service was rather boring and strange to me because of all the weird little Catholic chanting and such. The man conducting the funeral also had a very strange accent and kept making gross throat clearing noises. Then the guy announced that my great grandma loved to sing and dance and that they would play her favorite song. The song started in it was opera style and in Italian. My great grandma was born in Italy and moved to the US with her family at the age of four. I guess I thought the music was a bit silly and so did my cousins because they all turned to look at me and my sister with smirks on their faces. This I did not think was really that funny but just then, a balled up tissue that was on my lap rolled off of me and down to the floor where it rolled to a stop. This was so out of place that I instantly burst into loud uncontrollable laughter in the middle of the funeral. I couldn't stop laughing, so with my hand over my mouth, I ran to the bathroom a mere five feet away. I had to stay in the bathroom for the duration of my great grandma's favorite song, which lasted about five to seven minutes. The whole time I couldn't stop laughing no matter how hard I tried. The only two seconds in place was my muffled laughter and a woman singing Italian opera. After the song ended, I was able to compose myself and leave the bathroom. I couldn't look at anyone because I was so embarrassed and I was afraid that I would start laughing again if I looked into their questioning eyes. I just kept my head down and my eyes closed for the duration of the service. Now you probably think that I am the kind of person who just laughs like an idiot all the time. I assure you I am not. That was the first time I have ever laughed out of nowhere, or especially at a funeral. I haven't done it since. It could have just been that I was stressed out and upset about her death, or maybe that is how I cope with death. I really don't know for sure. I have come to believe that my great grandma wanted to lighten the funeral up a bit by causing me to laugh, or that hearing her favorite song made her want to laugh with happiness, which I picked up on. There is no proof of this, but it made me feel so good to believe it. The whole situation was very strange and left me feeling funny but overall happy. This is long, so please bear with me. My grandfather passed away on Mother's Day of this year. He was 89. He had lived with my folks for the last year of his life and was a very stubborn man. One way of his to show control or whatever was to go to the bathroom in inappropriate places. Anyway. After his funeral, my family was sitting around the table talking. My seven-year-old daughter wanted to hear a scary story, so my dad came up with one about something scratching at a window, a cat. I leaned over to my mom and said that if he really wanted to scare her, he would have said it was great-grandpa at the window instead of a cat. Bad taste. Very bad taste. So everyone goes to sleep, and I'm the first to wake up in the morning. My five-year-old son is sleeping out in the living room on a sleeping bag. 
There was a huge wet spot on it, and I thought he did it, but his jammies weren't wet. Odd, I thought. So all day I air dried the sleeping bag, and that night it was dry with a stain. I folded it, with the intention of taking it to a laundromat, and put it on the floor of my grandfather's bedroom, and went into the living room to tell my husband good night. I went back to the bedroom, and there was another big wet spot on the sleeping bag. I made myself take a deep breath. I looked up on the ceiling to make sure there wasn't a leak. None. I fairly calmly called for my husband to come down to the bedroom. He was rattled also, and then my folks came in to see what we were up to. We all sniffed it. What a funny picture that is. And it smelled like urine. They have no pets. My mom thought it was strange, but my dad had a lot of encounters of this sort of thing. He thought it was funny and said I should have made fun of grandpa the night before. My lesson? Don't speak ill of the dead. Now I'm eternally scared because I keep thinking about the scene in Salem's Lot when the boy is floating outside the window and I picture my grandfather instead. Oh, about a month before he died, both my parents said they saw him walking down the hall with another man. They both sat there for a moment, then went in to check in on him. He was taking a nap. I'll post some of the things about my dad's experiences if anyone is interested, though I posted a few of those a few years back. Take care. Thanks for reading. I have another weird story about my experiences that I like to share. I was going to add it last time, but there wasn't enough room. It also happened to my mom. Maybe she is some kind of ghost magnet? It's the sort of thing you might need to read in a book, and it's not exactly paranormal. It's still pretty strange though. Once again, I cannot think that my mom would make up a story like this. It's so unusual to be made up. Okay, I'll get on with the story. One day, when I was small, in primary one, first grade, kindergarten, I don't know what you Americans would call it, my mom was alone in the house, during the day, doing the dishes in the kitchen. We have no front garden, and our kitchen window looks directly onto the street. She suddenly saw, coming down the street, the most bizarre sight she had ever seen. A funeral procession, marching down our street, a funeral car, driving slowly, and a man dressed in black, wearing a top hat, walking in front of the car. When he got level with the kitchen window, he turned and smiled to her, tipping his hat slightly, as if to say good morning. The procession continued down the street until it was out of sight. My mom's first thought was of panic. I'm going to die, she thought. This is a premonition. By the time I'd got home from school, she had stopped worrying and tried to forget about it. It doesn't seem very strange to see what my mom saw. Funerals happen every day. This one was weird for three reasons. Our street is in a maze of other streets. It is far from the main road, and driving down it is not a good shortcut. So why on earth would a funeral possession go down it? Why on earth would anyone, even someone who lived in our neighborhood, choose to take their last journey down my road? It's not old or very pretty. Nothing important has ever happened here. Even in broad daylight, it really is hard to see into our kitchen. It really is dark, which is why my mom was surprised that the man could see her. She couldn't understand why she was the only one he smiled at. There must have been other people in their houses. So there you go. Was it a ghostly possession from the past, a premonition from the future, or a real one? A someone who really likes our neighborhood? Beats me. Well, this story actually happened to my younger brother a few years ago. I'm from New Zealand, from a town or suburb called Torbay, which is on the North Shore, which is basically North Auckland. This story I'm including is true, as it wasn't just him witnessing it, but a few of his friends as well, and they all claim they saw the same thing. I can't remember the exact date it happened, but it was during summer. It was a hot, humid day, and my brother and friend were so bored, they went outside to play hacky sack. One of my brother's friends lives on a dead-end street, so they decided to play in the middle of the dead end, as it was just past midnight, and there were no cars around. Anyway, they were having a great game, when suddenly, they heard a roar of a motorcycle and felt a cold chill. They all stopped playing and looked to the top of the street. The sound of the motorcycle became louder, and suddenly, coming down the street at a fairly low speed, came a huge-ass black Harley. The biker was wearing full black leathers and a black helmet, and they couldn't make out his face. As the bike slowly came down the hill, going about 5 to 10k an hour, each streetlight he passed fluttered, then died out completely. My brother and friends were scared stiff and couldn't move. 
Each streetlight blinked out as the biker came down the street towards them, then circled around them in complete darkness and slowly went back up the street. As he passed each streetlight, it would suddenly sputter back into life, each light blinking on again as the biker passed it. Then as he disappeared, my brother and his friends were left there freaking out at what they had just seen. Naturally, they all made a beeline for my brother's friend's house, and I don't think any of them got much sleep that night. So as far as I know, it is a true story told to me by my brother and backed up by his friends who I've known for ages and it's not something they will lie about. Pretty spooky, hey? Maybe death has decided to keep up with the times and has himself a Harley now. Thank you for reading. Hey, I'm sending a few stories hoping one will make it. Let's put it this way. My house, the property around it, and my family's houses are haunted. When my sister was in the sixth grade, she had a huge sleepover. Five of her friends came. They stayed up all night and ended up somehow on the roof of her playhouse. Well, her birthday is in the doorstep of fall, so scarecrows were up in the fields near our house. I never understood why. No one ever grew crops around us. They looked at one scarecrow, could have cared less, and turned around. Five minutes later, they look, and it's closer. Now they don't know what to think, but they figure it's just their imaginations. But it keeps getting closer and closer and closer. They finally lose it and run back into the house. When I was nine, one year later, me and my friend were walking around on Halloween night. We see someone standing on the road. No big deal. We were the kind of kids who sword fought with sticks, so we wanted to see who it was. Big mistake. We get there, and it's a scarecrow, so I ran my sword through it. Well, I run off because my mom called me. When my friend ran to follow me, he started screaming Bloody Mary, which is weird because I'm the Catholic one. He runs ahead of me and beats me home. When I found out what happened, he swore, and still does, that the scarecrow spoke to him. I can remember a time when I came over for the night. We were having a great time until everyone but me went back to the house. I was just watching TV, minding my own business, when I took a glance outside and saw the scarecrow mysteriously close to the fence. The scarecrow was mostly up in the center of a field from the house. A few minutes later, I took another look and it was back up about a mile away from the fence. Later when my cousin came into the room, we both looked out and the scarecrow was roughly 20 yards to the left than earlier. Thanks for reading. I know this might not be the most practical story, considering that scarecrows as spirits don't even make sense, but believe me, this was a true, authentic experience, and I'll never forget the way I felt when I saw this thing. I know paranormal stories are easy to debunk, but hear me out, because these experiences were authentic. I'm thinking that this could be a shape-shifting ghost of some sort. Has anyone ever heard of a demon transforming into a scarecrow apparition? As a kid. I always had great fears of scarecrows. If so, I'm sure this demon was playing games with us to frighten us. My name is Daniel and I'm 15 years old. I was born and raised in Maryland, but we moved to Kentucky two years ago. This story is about when my mom and I went to visit my 20 year old sister in Baltimore. She had a roommate and four kids lived there. My sister's daughter, her roommate's two daughters, and my other sister. We arrived late at night around 9 p.m., and on the way, everyone was trying to convince me and my mom that the house was haunted. Well, I believe in the paranormal, but it takes a lot to frighten me. Well, that night, we were all playing around and I fell asleep on the couch downstairs while everyone else was upstairs. My sister and their roommates were late birds. They never went to sleep till 3 a.m. While I was sleeping, something woke me up by tugging on my sheets. I thought it was my sister playing a joke on me, but when I woke up, no one was there. This didn't really bother me, so I went back to sleep. In the morning, my sister's 11-year-old roommate woke me up because she was going to school. I asked her why they tried to wake me up last night, and she insisted they didn't. The day passed by very fast, and it was around 7 p.m. when they decided to tell us the story of what had been happening. As it turned out, a guy across the street told them the house had been a butcher's place, but the butcher was a very mean person, and everyone believed he killed people. Nobody knew his name, they just called him the man. 
They told me my two-year-old niece was the first to see the man one day while Sandy, my sister, was cleaning up. My niece had just told someone to leave her alone, and my sister turned around to see who she was talking to, but no one was even near her. Still, my niece kept saying go away and leave me alone to the wind. Another incident happened when my niece told her mommy that the man had hit her. This might have not seemed real, but when my niece showed my sister her back, my sister found teeth and hand marks on her. This freaked my sister out, but that's not the end of the story. We were all sitting at a table playing cards while my sister was cleaning. All of a sudden she yelled, ouch, you little bastard, because something hit her and she thought I threw it. At this point, I was playing cards with my mom and the others. Still, I was skeptical until the next night when I was forced to believe. I was alone and my family went out. I didn't feel like going, which was a big mistake that I've regretted ever since. Everyone was supposed to return, but they never did that night. I was watching television when something fell in the kitchen. I thought the cat had broken something, so I went in to see what happened, but found nothing broken. But I did see someone run upstairs, thinking someone stayed behind. I followed them, or it. I got to the top of the stairway, but once again, no one was there. I tried to turn on the light, but it didn't work. I decided to walk a little further down the hallway, and then something grabbed me and I heard a horrible raging scream that sounded like it came from a man. I was really frightened and turned completely white. I tried to turn around, but the flashlight went out. I tapped in my hands, but it was still broken. I tried to run, but something grabbed a hold of me. It turned me over and started hitting me and clawing at me. Something or someone was attacking me. I covered up my face, but it hurt and I couldn't break free. It had me. Then it pulled me further down the hallway. I was clawing at the floor and hoping I would die right now. Please God, kill me, have mercy on me was all I could think. Somehow, I broke free and ran, but when I got to the steps, it got me back and pushed me down the steps. When I turned over and looked up, all I could see was that there was a shadow over me. I must have fainted. When I came to my mom, a police officer and my sister was standing over me. It seems the neighbor heard me screaming and came over to check. When he found me, I was out cold and my clothes were all torn off. He had taken me back to his place and called the police. They wouldn't believe me. They took it as a simple breaking and entering case. I still dream of the incident. It might sound untrue from your end. But trust me, it happened, and I'll never forget it for the rest of my life. When my grandfather and grandmother were first married, around the early 1900s, they lived on a farm in Kentucky. This farm, it seems, housed more than your normal farm animals. At night, in the attic, you could hear large pieces of furniture being moved back and forth across the floor very rapidly. Needless to say, they wouldn't bother checking it out until daylight, but when they did, nothing at all was in the attic. It was completely empty. Out back of the house, there was a wood pile where all the wood for the heating and cooking was split and stacked. Very late at night, you could hear someone or something out there chopping wood. The morning's investigation turned up my grandfather's axe in the same exact spot he had left it the day before, and not a single stack of wood out of place. One night, my grandfather felt especially brave. This courage brought on by some homemade moonshine. So when he heard the commotion at the woodpile, he started on the porch and yelled out, Chop, you SOB, chop. Well, apparently, the thing heard him, and it began to chop faster and faster to the point where it was chopping at an inhuman rate of speed. My grandfather hightailed it into the house, grabbed his shotgun, and sat up scared out of his wit for the rest of the night. It goes without saying, my grandfather never teased it again while they lived there, which wasn't very long. Only my grandfather and grandmother lived on this farm, and at that time, they had no children nor hired hands working on the farm to account for these very strange happenings. This story still bothers me every day, so I'm going to get to the scary part first. It was 2 a.m. on a Thursday morning, and I was walking past Tony's house. Tony is very introverted, but a good friend of mine nonetheless. 
Tony and his family were out of town for the 4th of July weekend, and it was his sister's birthday, so I knew for a fact that nobody was home. Nobody. In fact, I had the keys to his house. His family trusts us. So I was walking back from the night shift at work when I passed by his house. I glanced over at his house, and what I saw made my heart almost stop. I saw a glowing blue figure of a woman, and she was moaning Tony. And I remember distinctly it was a Spanish accent. I jetted home and told my mother about the experience, and of course she thought I was nuts, but even so, she did call their house and got no answer. The following Monday, Tony got back from his trip. I approached him and casually asked, who was that old lady in the window Thursday night? To which he said, what, are you burnt? I told him I really saw someone, but when I didn't get any straight answers, I approached his mother and asked her who that old lady in the window Thursday was. But before she answered, my blood ran cold. I glanced over at a picture of an elderly lady, and then I asked his mother, who is that lady? To which his mother replied, that's my mother. She died years ago, and she had a Spanish accent. I told her that the lady I'd seen last Thursday was her. She was shocked, and she told me that her mother died of a stroke just after she found out her son lost his eye. Thanks for reading. This is a true story that has been witnessed by probably hundreds of people over the years. It happened at Stewart Indian School in Carson City, Nevada. A school founded in the early 1900s, as best that I remember, and closed down my freshman year of high school. The student body was made up of American Indian kids from various areas on the West Coast. The land where the campus was situated is really large, and on this huge area of land is the main school building, also large in two stories, a gym, a post office, medical and dental clinic, and many little outlying structures which were the various men's and women's dorms. There were some freestanding homes as well. There was also an auto shop, paint shop, etc. It would have taken a good 10 to 20 minutes to walk the length of this campus from one end to the other. Since the school is so old, the campus is full of large trees and many lonely, deserted walkways. There is more than one spooky story, but this is one I will never forget. Since the guys and gals that attended Stewart Indian School had to move away from home and live in the dorms, there were, of course, great love affairs, and well, sometimes we all know how those can turn out. This story involves a young couple who were in a really intense relationship. They had been dating and depended on each other for just about everything. I'm not sure when this all occurred since this is a haunting that has gone on for years. Eventually, the girl got pregnant and told her boyfriend. They were both really scared and were afraid to let anyone know since they would both be sent home back to their own reservations and they would be split up, so they just kept quiet about it. After a while, it got to be too much for the boy involved and he started seeing another girl on campus. Since his girlfriend had thought he would marry her and they would raise the baby together, this new development devastated her. She went into a deep depression, and since she was pregnant, she didn't have much time until all was found out. The girl had a lot to worry about. She only had dated this one person, and to top it off, she had thin skin. Unfortunately, she couldn't face it and hung herself from a rafter in the gym. She was found there by some of the students and faculty who cut her down. A few weeks later, the first sightings of the peanut lady started to occur. The reason they call her the peanut lady is because her skin was scarred from her acne and had the appearance of a peanut shell. The peanut lady is usually seen walking along the cement pathways around campus, but you will only see her if you are alone. She has been seen both during the day and night. Many times, people would see her from behind, her long black hair hanging down, but when she would turn around, she wouldn't have a face. Pretty soon, things took a turn for the worst. People who saw the peanut lady started to have misfortunes befall them not long afterwards. People who viewed her ended up having a car accident or getting into some kind of other trouble. After a few years, people started being afraid to venture out after dark or to go alone to the gym or the library for fear of seeing the peanut lady. 
Anyone who ever attended Stewart Indian School has heard the stories. In some reports seeing her walking in the dorm hallways or walking around the campus. Some have even reported seeing her hanging from the ceiling in the gym. The only thing they all had in common is right after seeing the peanut lady, they all had something bad happen to them, usually involving bodily injury. I personally never saw the peanut lady, thank God, but I know those who have. And out of those, one person was shot by accident. He ended up living. Another died in a car crash with her infant daughter. How many more saw her? I don't know, but Stewart Indian School is still there with all the buildings intact. Some of them are being used by the federal government as office space. The high school is used by the local community college. You can find it off Highway 395 South in Carson City. Just don't go there alone. There is a door that separates this world from the next. Some people pass through this door on a regular basis, while others do not even acknowledge its existence. Behind this door are the spooky shadows, bad dreams, ghosts of love lost, and all the things that are slightly out of sync with reality. I've been through this door many times in my life, especially when I was a child. I would like to share with you the readers of ghost stories, a trilogy of my experience on the other side of this door. My first journey through the door was when I was a very young child. I used to have a reoccurring dream in which an old lady was sitting in an old Victorian style chair. The ones upholstered in velvet and patterned in ornamental wood carvings. The old lady, in the dream, was eating a bowl of chicken soup. She would stare at me with the most benevolent look between bites. For some reason, the aroma of the chicken soup was very offensive to me and I would always wake up crying. I've never understood this because chicken soup is one of my favorite foods. It was like viewing my dream in a moment of frozen time. She was eating the bowl of soup just like in the dream. Instantly, I became a goose. My body was covered from head to toe with goosebumps. Of course, I asked my grandmother who the person was in the picture. She replied, that was your great grandmother. The next thing she told me never really hit me until I was a few years older. The picture was taken by my mother when she was pregnant with me and that my great-grandmother had died just a few weeks before I was born. I never knew my great-grandmother in my daily life, but somehow, in my dreams, she made herself known to me. So I asked myself, did I see my great-grandmother from the womb or was it her way of introducing herself from behind the door? This next story involves my younger brother, Bill, and my grandfather, Bill. My impish little brother created a new chapter in the haunted legacy of my family. My grandmother and brother were very close. In fact, they were together almost all the time while my grandfather was healthy. I was overwhelmed with jealousy. I could never be a part of their little games and gatherings. My brother could sense my anguish and would taunt and tease me by saying things like, Papa doesn't like you and he loves me. Oh, how I wanted to beat the shit out of that guy. Fortunately, for him, I never did. Then one day, my mother had to take Bill to the doctor and I was alone with my grandfather. I was very angry at him and wouldn't talk to him. I guess I wanted him to reach out to me or maybe I was just being the child that I was. Anyway, he finally won me over. He sat me on his knee and gave me a good talking to. He said, Sonny, I know you think that I don't love you, but there's something I must tell you. I'm very sick, and I'm not going to be around much longer. I want you to know that I love all of my grandchildren the same. The reason I spend so much time with Billy is because he's the baby of the family, and I want him to know and understand who his grandfather was and is. He really didn't have much more to say because, even though I was only 11, I felt like I could sit on the edge of a dime and swing my feet. A few months later, my grandfather passed away. My brother had a hard time accepting my grandfather's death, but as with all healthy children, he finally did. After the family had adjusted to the loss, there was all this talk about a gold watch. Nobody could find my grandfather's gold watch. I was given the third degree. My mother was questioned, and one of my aunts was accused of taking his watch for a keepsake. The only one not questioned was Bill. Then one day, 
my grandmother was cleaning our room. She picked up a pair of Bill's trousers and out came the watch. She immediately questioned him about it. All my brother would say was that Papa gave him the watch last week. My grandmother just about beat him to death, but he never would change his story, even until this day. My grandmother was about to have a nervous breakdown because she could not believe Bill. That is, my grandfather had been dead for well over a month. So, how did he get it? It was locked up in their little metal box they had kept important papers and stuff in. Did my grandfather briefly walk through that door to give his little favorite grandson his most prized possession? Not sure. This last story involves my brother and grandfather. Not long after the watch incident, something else happened that truly made me a believer in ghosts. We all were getting ready to eat supper one night, and my brother Bill was playing near the dining room door. I was watching him, not really caring one way or the other of what he was doing. Suddenly, I saw his face literally glow with delight. He opened the door, and the cold January air rushed into the room. My grandmother yelled, William, close that door now. I can't, Grandma. Papa is coming up the porch, and I have to let him in. My heart jumped to my throat. I was scared to even look towards the door. Billy was having a tantrum because my mother and grandmother was holding him down. He fought with the valiancy of a Spartan. I want my Papa. I want my Papa, he cried. I have to let him in. Please let him in. As long as I live, I will never forget that incident. I don't know if it was Bill's loud screaming or the fact that he really did see my grandfather that scared me the most. We all grew up and had our times, but I still wonder, did my dead grandfather open the door just one more time? Because that was the last time we had ever heard from him. Thanks for reading. As I've mentioned in previous posts, this area of the country is remote, has a troubled past and present, and is in general a hotspot for spirit activity. The history of Pine Ridge is loaded with superstition and hauntings. Let's start on the road to Pine Ridge, and I will begin a story that you will never forget. Anyone who grew up in Pine Ridge during the 60s and 70s knows better than to pick up hitchhikers on the way home. One of the most heavily trafficked roads in the area is between Rapid City and Pine Ridge. The trip usually takes about an hour one way, and much of the trip is over large, desolate areas. Oftentimes, as people were on the way back to Pine Ridge, they would spot a solitary hitchhiker trying to catch a ride back to the res. Now, everybody knew that there was a devil who used to try and catch rides. Many people spoke of seeing hitchhikers, but they wouldn't pick them up, but every once in a while, Someone would let their guard down and pull over. One evening, a group of friends from Pine Ridge were on their way back from Rapid City. As they drove along the highway, they saw a lone man, a white man standing along the side of the road trying to hitch a ride. Keep in mind, seeing a lone white man hitching a ride towards the reservation is an unusual sight. Curiosity got the better of the friends, and they persuaded the driver to pull over. After they picked him up, they resumed their trip home. Nothing unusual happened, at least nothing more unusual than having a white man in your car. As they drove along, at first, everything was fine. The group kept on joking and laughing and even gave the stranger a beer. But after a few miles, they started to feel uncomfortable. Finally, after they were on the res, the white man asked to be let out of the car. The driver gladly pulled over and the stranger opened the door and got out. As he walked away, there was one unusual thing about him that they all noticed at once. He had a funny way of walking. As his feet came into view, they understood why. He was walking on little goat feet. This story occurs in a movie theater in Savannah, Georgia, where myself and Patricia worked. This theater was built on the land of an old plantation, so it seems fitting that it should be haunted, and so it is. I was working as a ticket seller and Trisha was working as a projectionist. Each night, when the last movies were started, my shift was basically finished and so I would usually clock out and go up to the projection booth to keep Trisha company, seeing as how she had to stay until the movies were done. The booth is very long to accommodate 10 projections, 
Also, it tended to be very dark. We'd mostly sit up there and talk, roleplay, and basically goof around. During these talks, we traded stories of things that happened to us with the resident ghost. For instance, while the movies are showing, there isn't much for a ticket seller to do, and you can't leave your little cubicle filled with lots of money, so I'd read a book or draw. Mind you, nowhere near the buttons that pump out the tickets. Well, my machine would regularly pump out tickets when I was not paying enough attention. Mostly this irritated me because I'd have to get my manager to either void the tickets or gain permission to sell it for the next showings. One of my duties consisted of checking the ladies room to make sure it was clean and well stocked. The nozzles for the water controls were such that they were timed. You'd push them down and they'd stay on for only so long. Many times, I walked in there while shows were running to find all the sinks running with no one having been in there. One of my scariest experiences was with Theater 9. It was the last theater on the right, directly next to the door leading out to the side parking lot where the employees would park. I was on my way out from work after a long shift with another cashier when we noticed the exit lights were blinking in that theater alone. This meant a fire alarm had gone off, but there would have been a very loud buzzer as well as all the exit signs in every theater blinking and buzzing. The movies were all out and no patrons were left, so myself and the other cashier decided to check this one out. We were kind of spooked, so we poked out our heads in the theater cautiously. The temperature in that theater only had dropped to the point we could see our breath, and the lights to the exit signs were silently blinking away at us. We panicked and ran out, saying to each other that the place could burn if it wanted to. Our manager had to check the security systems the next day, and there was no reason the signs could have done what they did. After that, I never cleaned Theater 9 alone, even though that was the theater that yielded the most lost money for some reason. Trisha told me her own story from the projection booth. At the far end of the booth is a door leading to a fire escape. It cannot be opened from the outside, and there is only one access to the booth. One of our favorite games when we're bored was to sneak upstairs while the projectionist was threading games and scare the bejesus out of her. Trish caught onto this game after many a time of leaping out of her skin so would pay extra close attention while doing her job. One day while threading movies, she heard the door to the fire escape close and assuming it was our assistant manager, quickly ran to the door to catch him in the act as he had three flights of metal stairs to run down. When she opened the door with a triumphant grin, no one was anywhere to be seen. Needless to say, she called down to the office, which is in the center of the building, nowhere near the fire escape, and he was in there counting my money drawer for the day where we had been for the past 15 minutes. After that, Trisha took a short break. So those are my movie theater stories. I have some stories from when I worked at a professional dinner theater that I may submit to you at a later date. I've sent in a couple of other stories before, and I've held on to this one until this moment. Why? Because, until we recently moved, and the fact that we still lived in the house where this happened, but now, I can share it. The house we used to live in here in Pilot Mountain, Mount Pilot to Andy Griffith fans, was a split level. We remodeled it and enclosed the garage to make it a family room. When we did, I moved from the upstairs bedroom to the basement into a little mini apartment. From there, I could hear everything going on in the upstairs bedrooms. I could even tell where the walls dividing the rooms were because no one walked in that area and there were no footsteps. My dad often tried to convince us that something or someone was in the house. We just thought he was trying to scare us and laughed about it. He would say that every morning around 3 a.m. or so, whatever it was would walk down the steps from the upstairs bedrooms, into the kitchen, and out into what was the garage, which is now the family room. He knew this because his favorite sleeping spot was in a recliner that was located in the family room and he would witness it every morning around 3 a.m. So, I called it the 3 a.m. ghost, laughingly. But, one night, I witnessed it firsthand. It wasn't anywhere near 3 a.m. though. It was about 11 p.m. My dad had a job that forced him to work screwy hours, sometimes late at night, and this was one of them. My mom, my little sister, who was just a baby at the time, and myself were in the family room watching TV. My eyes got so heavy, so I decided to call it a night. I said goodnight to everybody and went to bed. I had no more than crawled under the covers when I heard footsteps pacing upstairs. I assumed it to be mom putting my sister to bed, but the pacing footsteps continued. Then, I noticed something. 
The footsteps were coming from right where the wall was. Whatever it was, it was passing from one bedroom to the next by going through the wall. It had to because the only doors in the two rooms were the closet doors, and the closets were not connected, and the entrance doors, which were on different walls at 90 degree angles from one another. I jumped from bed, threw on some clothes, and ran up to the family room where mom sat engrossed in an episode of ER. My sister was on the couch beside her, asleep. I asked mom if she had been upstairs. She said no. She hadn't moved in 30 minutes or more. So, with my heart pounding like a snare drum, I crept up the steps, still hearing the footsteps, now accompanied by a slow, heavy breathing sound. When I reached the top of the stairs, it stopped, and I never heard it again. My grandfather had died some time before. He was a good Christian man, adored by everyone. His loss hurt us all deeply, but none deeper than my mother. She loved her father more than anything that there ever was on this planet. He had a tendency to breathe slow and heavy, thus, my mom thoroughly believes that the 3AM ghost was her father, who looked after mom in life like he did none of his other children, and now, he is looking out for her in death. I hope to have some more tales in the coming weeks, and believe me, they're as scary as can be. Please stay tuned, and thank you for my read. When I was about 17, my mom would sometimes drag me along on her religious activities, and it just so happened that on this particular day, she took me to a house blessing where a little girl was having dreams about some doll chasing her. Anyways, we all get there and pray as the priest is blessing the house, going from room to room. Finally, when he's done, we all go outside to the garage, and it's here where the owner of the house brings out some stuff he found in the garage that was left by the previous owners. He pulls out this black leather bound book and a small bottle made into a doll, and it's when he shows everyone a doll that the little girl screams that it was the same doll that was chasing her in her dreams. At this point, I'm getting a little freaked out, but think that maybe she's a little brat and just wanted to scare everyone. So then, the priest examines the doll in the book, and the book turns out to be the book of satanic rituals of something of the like. Well, they place the book on the sidewalk at the top of the cul-de-sac and try to burn it, and this is where I got scared. Finally. Everyone made a circle around the book and started praying while four people went and lit one corner of the book. And finally, the fire caught and the book started to burn, but very slowly. In an effort to make the book burn more quickly, the owner of the house poured some gasoline on the book. Yeah, I was standing back at this point. And when the gasoline hit the book, there was a flash of flame rising and the gas was repelled all around the book. And where the gas fell, small flames rose. This made all the hair on my back of my neck stand on end. The book finally burned after much prayer. We used to live in a two-story, ten-year-old house in Fremont, California. We lived there until May of 2003. In December 2002, just a few days before Christmas, I woke up at about 5.30 or 6 a.m. and walked over to the bedroom window. I parted the vertical blinds and cursed under my breath because it was still raining like it had been for days. As I turned away from the window, my body chilled from head to toe. Standing right in the middle of our bedroom doorway was this huge ghost dressed in a hooded brown robe. The guy was at least seven feet tall and filled the whole doorway. Where his face should have been in the big hood was just like a swirling mass of energy and you also couldn't see any hands or feet, but he totally filled the whole doorway. As I looked at him, he extended his arms forward like he was offering me the short staff or rod that he was holding. It was maybe 24 inches long. Then I turned my head away for a moment, and when I looked back, he was gone. I left my wife asleep as I drove to work, still kind of in shock and debating whether to tell my wife. I decided to and called her on my cell phone. She was silent for a few months and said, Oh my god, that explains it. I thought I was dreaming, but I opened my eyes after you left and this huge figure in a long brown robe and hood was leaning towards me from your side of the bed like he was offering me this short rod or stick. Then when I sat up in bed, he was gone. Now we were both feeling kind of strange. That night, on the way home from work, my wife stopped to use a gas station restroom. 
something she'd never done before since she only worked 20 minutes from home. When she arrived home, she pulled into the garage and pushed the button to close the garage door behind her. As soon as she stepped into the house, she could see it had been robbed. Our son Colin, who lived with us, had come home five minutes earlier and had surprised two armed gunmen up on the second floor in the dark. Colin ran out of the house with the robbers behind him. They got away, but hadn't stolen anything. If my wife had arrived home just a few minutes earlier, as she usually did, she would have locked herself in the house with two armed robbers. I do not understand what has happened. Who was the brown robe figure? Was he there that morning to warn us about what was going to happen that night? I don't know, but it's kind of creepy. He never appeared again, but that night Colin reminded us that several weeks earlier he had been alone with his girlfriend in the living room sitting on the sofa. Something caused him to get the chills. As he looked up, he saw this robe figure looking down at them from the railing in the loft above them. They quickly left the house. When Colin originally told me his story, I had told him that he had a very active imagination. Then a couple weeks later, the robe figure appeared to me and then my wife. That night, as I was cutting sections of round, rod-like wood dowels to put in the window sashes, I got the chills again. Was the guy trying to hand me a staff or rod to try and tell me to put it in the windows? If anyone has info on ghosts and hooded brown robes with a rod or staff, I'd sure like to hear it. An Asian lady friend told me about a house of hers who knew of this kind of thing and called him a guardian angel that somebody has to give you or will to you. My brother-in-law Larry was killed in Vietnam on September 20th, 1970. To say his death left an enormous hole in our lives would be an understatement. To this day, we often speak of him and remember him fondly as a much beloved member of our family. I've always been very close to my eldest sister. She and my brother-in-law were married only three years when he died. Having been widowed at age 23, she decided to remain on her own and live in the house they had recently purchased. Thus began my frequent visits to save the nights on the weekends and keep her company. One night, not quite two years after Larry's death, we had both been in bed for less than half an hour. I was 15 years old, my sister was 25 at the time. Neither one of us had ever had any type of encounter that we considered out of the ordinary, but this one night would change that. As we began to doze off after our customary chatting between rooms, I slept in our spare room directly across the hallway from a bedroom with our doors open. We both clearly heard footsteps crossing the kitchen floor, not a dozen feet down the hallway from where we slept. The footsteps sounded like someone was wearing heavy, leather boots, and when they reached the carpet in the hallway, the footsteps naturally silenced a bit with only the sound of heady padding and an occasional creak to give away the fact that they were still coming down the hall. While this was happening, my sister called out from her room and asked if I could hear that and I answered her immediately that I could. By this time, the covers of the bed were securely over my head. There was no way I wanted to see what was going to soon pass by my door or worse, maybe into my room. The next thing I knew, my sister was reporting a nearly opaque, adult-sized mist forming in her room, just opposite her bed in front of her dark pine closet doors. The moon was full that night, so there was just enough light filtering through her shutters to softly illuminate the room so she could clearly see what was happening. Although I was nearly sweating with fear, I still asked what the mist was doing, of course hoping in part that it would not float my way. Apparently, it hovered for a bit in front of her closet doors, then floated around the bed to the other side of the room before it began to dissipate. Her dog, who slept in her room and would bark at the smallest of unfamiliar sounds, never awoke. Needless to say, we slept little for the remainder of the night. Still, we were convinced that Larry had returned for a visit. After that incident, while she never received such a visit again, my sister did have a lampshade that would repeatedly turn askew during the day while she was at work. The lampshade was rectangular in shape, so it was easy to spot when someone twisted it around. I witnessed this myself. 
We would go to bed at night, only to find the shape askew again in the morning. This went on in spurts, off and on, until she sold the house and moved nearly eight years after the night of the footsteps. The shade was twisted tightly down. An earthquake couldn't jar it loose unless the lamp fell completely to the floor. The lamp itself stayed perfectly stationary, only the shade was twisted. We always thought this was Larry's less scary way of letting us know he was still around. The day my sister moved into her new home, the lampshade never twisted skew again. A few days ago, I was sitting on my bed in a small room that has a side window. I turned on my computer and started listening to music. Everything was okay until suddenly, I saw a human shadow through the window. It was just a shadow. Yet I could make out the head and the body. There were no hands or legs. It disappeared after five seconds, and I was shocked. I turned on the light and ran down to find out who it might be. And you know what? My yard was empty. I looked around for a few minutes, and I came back home. I still didn't know who or what it was. But that wasn't all. That night, I went to bed around 11 p.m., I had just fallen asleep when I suddenly woke up and felt frozen. I couldn't move. Something was pushing my body and I was hurting. After a few minutes of being frozen, I then felt like I was about to blow up. I got out of my bed and I was breathing hard. I had no idea what was happening. Then I heard some strange sounds from my kitchen. It sounded like chewing sounds. I ran down my kitchen turned on the light, and there was nothing down there. Around midnight, I was freaking out, so I called my friend to come to my house. When he drove up, I saw a girl in a white dress and with long hair standing next to the gatehouse. I felt scared, and I screamed to my friend, hey, watch your back. Just then, the figure disappeared. My friend saw it as well, and he was more frightened than I was. He said the shadow had been right next to him. The figure looked like a 20-year-old girl with a white face, but also Vietnamese. It was extremely unusual. We sat next to the bed until morning. The next day, I invited another friend to come over and take some pictures, but nothing happened that day or the day after. I think the ghost just visited the house to make us look horrible and to scare us a little bit. Isn't that what ghosts do? Thanks for reading. When I got back from Vietnam, I went to live with my mother in Chicago. Chicago is where I was born and lived all my life. My encounter happened either in 1968 or 1969. My mother had a summer home in Northern Illinois and would go there every weekend. So I would be home in our third floor apartment every weekend by myself. I would usually fall asleep on our front room couch watching TV. One night, I woke up somewhere in the middle of the night and went to the kitchen for a glass of water. As I walked through the doorway, going into the kitchen, a transparent short-haired or bald man or boy ran out from our pantry, looked me straight in the eye, almost like he hesitated for a split second then ran into the gas stove area and disappeared. The look in his eyes was like someone being startled or caught doing something wrong. It was so real that when he ran closely by me, I kind of moved back, like if someone is going to bump into you. It all happened so fast, and I was in the process of waking up, so it didn't really hit me as to what just happened or what I just saw. I just continued to the sink for my glass of water, Mind you, this all took place in seconds. As I turned on the water and filled my glass and started to drink, it then hit me. Wow, I stopped. I was just in a little shock. I was frightened. Then I thought maybe some intruder was in the house, but no. This figure ran right into the stove and disappeared. And this figure was semi-transparent. Needless to say, I was afraid. I thought that maybe because I saw him, he would kill me in my sleep, so I couldn't tell anyone. I stayed up half the night and finally did fall asleep. One or two years later, 
I found out that the landlord's son had died in our house. I don't know what floor or exactly when or how, but I do know it was before my encounter. My mother moved out of the house, and I got married and went on with my wife. I never went back there to see if I could find a picture of the landlord's son. For many years, I thought about it and wished that I would have gone back, but now it's too late. This was over 40 years ago now. I'm somewhat of an artist, not very good, but I did draw a face picture of my encounter. I don't know what happened to that picture. The vision that I have of him is vivid in my mind to this day. Maybe I should try to draw another picture. And that's my story. In my senior year of high school, the Vietnam conflict was still going on, and I had a pen pal who was over there. At lunchtime, I would leave the school and go over to a small church located a block from the school and sit in there and pray that my pen pal was okay. One day, I was leaving the church to go back to school, and I noticed a very old 1950s car across the street. There was a man standing outside of the car, and a very young boy playing with the wheel. The boy looked to be about five to six years old. As I was walking out, the man beckoned to me across from the street. When I got there, the man said that the son, the man looked too old to have a son that age, wants to know why I went into that church. I smiled and said, to pray for the end of the Vietnam conflict. The man told me some things that were personal, then stated that the conflict would end soon, but another will start. I smiled and walked about 10 to 20 feet and looked back. There was no car, no one around. I was close enough that I would have heard the engine start and see the car go away, but nothing. Way back in the 70s when our neighborhood wasn't very occupied and only a few houses were around, my aunt, one of my sisters and my mom, was left alone in our spooky, dark, and silent house. She was left playing in one of our living rooms where a lot of spiritual activity happens. Suddenly, she could hear footsteps coming from the ceiling, hard and loud footsteps that seemed to linger right above where she was playing at. Chills crept up her spine and she began to move away, but the footsteps and banging just kept following her wherever she went. Even when she was running and screaming, the steps ran and followed her after until she finally ran outside to daylight. This story has been validated by my other aunts and uncles, but let me share my own experience. Since my grandfather is a World War II veteran, he's seen and experienced a lot more than most other people. The whole family believes the spirit protected him through the war, since one of his experiences was running back and forth along the front line in an intense gunfight between Filipino and Japanese troops. He was commanding his troops back then. In any case, fast forward to the year 2004. My whole family was relaxing in our rest house about 40 miles north of this city. The land the house is standing on is cursed. All those who have owned have gone bankrupt. I believe this is true since my grandfather is losing a lot of money to an evil and possibly possessed eldest daughter. My experience happened while falling asleep in his room. Strangely enough, I felt an intense presence within the room, but I didn't feel scared or creeped out, which is something I am prone to feel. The presence just felt safe, but it sure was there, as I could feel it enveloping me. I was half asleep then and simply fell back into my deep slumber a minute later. I later narrated my experience to my grandfather, and he simply smiled and said, yes, it's true. I wasn't born with the ability to see ghosts, unlike most of my maternal family, but I do know when they want to be felt, and I can somewhat read other people's minds and form somewhat of a subconscious link with them while talking or engaging in casual conversation. Another story involves the death of one of our longtime nannies in a spot she loved to sit on during the afternoons. She died of an embolism close to a year ago. One of our maids told us that on the night of her funeral, our maid was cleaning the plates up all alone in the house. Our whole family was in a rest house where the funeral was held, when all of a sudden, the dog started barking rather wildly. 
She looked out the kitchen window towards the porch where the dogs were barking and could see them looking up at an invisible figure while howling and barking all at the same time. The porch was where our nanny used to sit during the afternoons before she died. The invisible figure soon retreated back into the house, as if retiring for the night. Take note, this all happened at the night of my nanny's funeral, probably visiting one last time before passing on to the other side. start my story. My father and I pretty much had a decent relationship most of my life. Of course, when I was a teenager, I did the usual teenage crap and rebelled and we grew apart. I had moved out and ended up with an abusive boyfriend. I ended up moving back home and dad and I renewed our relationship. Those nine months before my dad's death were great. We actually got a chance to really talk and I think my dad knew his time was short. He kept telling me that I would find the right guy eventually and I would make a good mom someday. On February 11th, 1997, dad passed away after a long illness that we would discover later was periodontis. Things didn't start happening right away. It started after I met the man who would be my husband later and I became pregnant with our son. About four months into my pregnancy, we started noticing little things around the house, mostly having to do with noises and objects that belonged to my father. After my son was born, and he was about a month old, my husband and I were watching television in the living room, and the baby was asleep. My mother's room. We were staying with her, due to after dad died, she couldn't pay the bills on her own, was right off the living room. She had went to bed, and after about a half hour, she said she had seen a white orb about the size of a softball, traveling between the bedroom door and her vanity mirror. No light source constant. Her room was pitch black because she kept tinfoil and trash bags over her windows to keep the light out. Then, when we were getting things ready for the wedding, it seemed like all hell broke loose. Objects being thrown, kitchen drawers opening and shutting by themselves, strange noises. You name it, we had it. Then, the wedding day came. I wasn't nervous, cause I knew dad was there. I wore his turquoise ring I gave him for a Father's Day present, for something blue. Everyone at the wedding and the reception said they could feel him. Even some of the pictures taken at the reception were questionable. A couple have what appears to have a mist in them. My son is in most of those photographs. Then we didn't really have anything happen for a while until my son started getting old enough to talk. Then in the evening, when only me and my son were at home, watching TV most times, he would get all excited as if someone had just come home. He would run up to the baby gate, wave, and yell hi, and I would go up to the gate and look down the hall to see no one there, and I would ask him, who are you talking to? And he will look up at me and smile and say, Grandpa Mama, he never met my father. My son was born on 2100, and dad died on 21197. After he did this for a couple of weeks, I invested in an EMF detector. After running a few test runs to get readings from the hallway on basic electrical outlets and whatnot, I waited for my son to say hi to dad again. Sure enough, about a week later, it happened again. This time I ran into the hallway to see if I could get a reading. I did. A perfect circle about two feet in diameter, smack dab in the middle of the hallway. I knew it was dad. We have since moved, but my son still says hi on occasion to grandpa, and my sister and I can still sense his presence. I'm 19 now, and most of my experiences have happened recently, although I remember a few from when I was a child. I'm a student at a Big Ten University and stayed in the dorms my first year here. My roommate and I were soon to find out we had another roommate. One night, I was dreaming that I was lying in a bed across from another bed and a girl was pacing in between. Well, my dream soon faded to reality when I noticed myself blinking. We had lost, so the floor that was in my dream was now gone, but the girl was still pacing about five feet in the air. I don't know what came over me, and I didn't mean to say anything, but I blurted out, 
what are you looking for? The girl stopped and looked at me. Her eyes were just dark holes and then faded away. I wasn't scared of her. I just went back to sleep. During other nights, I would be startled awake, what sounded like heavy books being thrown to the floor, and in the morning, nothing would be out of place. Things would go missing, only to end up in the middle of the floor, days later. My first touching experience took place there also. I was taking a nap on the futon with my boyfriend, when I felt what I thought was my boyfriend's scruffy chin rub on my forehead. It woke me, but I didn't open my eyes. It happened again, and so I thought he was trying to get my attention. I looked up, expecting to see his face, and there was nothing there. He was about two feet away from me, with his back towards me, fast asleep. My roommate, however, had the creepiest experience. She rarely had any, but hers, I think, didn't happen to me. She came in the room from the shower, down the hall, and went to her mirror when she noticed she had a drop of blood on the tip of her nose. She wiped it off onto her finger, expecting to see a pop zit or something, but her nose was clear. She showed me the blood on her finger and told me what happened, so we checked her arms and legs everywhere to see if she had cut herself shaving. We checked her towel, robe, slippers, everything, and there was no blood anywhere else. We still do not know where it came from. Last night, was my most recent experience, which made me want to read about stories online. It was at my parents' home, which we all think is haunted by some man. I was ready to fall asleep when I was startled awake by a loud pop in front of my face. Minutes later, I heard dripping water. That ghost mostly bothers my brother, whose bedroom is in the basement where most of the activity takes place. I would like to share my experiences with someone who doesn't think I'm crazy. When I was five years old, my mom, dad, and I moved to a house in Crownsville. It was about seven years old and had originally been built as a summer home only. My dad did a lot to the house over the years to renovate it. When I was about 10 years old, he finished the new bedroom on the front of the house and he and my mother moved in. I got their old bedroom at the back of the house. I'm not sure if this bedroom was on the house originally because it was built on a concrete slab and the rest of the house was over a basement. My mother claimed to see a ghost materialize from the heating vent into the room. We all laughed it off. Later on, I didn't think it was so funny anymore. My parents were very strict and didn't leave me alone in the house until I was 13. After they left, I was really creeped out by the feeling in the house. I felt as though I was being watched. I wandered into the kitchen and heard a really weird sound. Then I noticed that the cupboard doors were moving. It looked like they were vibrating. I recognized the noise as the glasses in the cabinets all vibrating against one another. I ran back to my room and stayed there till my parents got back. One time, I got this brilliant idea to bring a Ouija board into the house. My grandmother had lots of junk in her backyard, and as I dug around, I had found the board wedged between two small buildings. If I had been a bit older and a bit smarter, I would have left the damn thing there. I shoved it into the back floorboard of my mother's car, underneath my jacket. Somehow, I snuck it inside later on, without being seen. It was just the board and the planches, the Parker brothers' kind. I put it in my underwear drawer, all the way at the bottom hoping to play with it later. I had failed school that year, so I had to go to summer school. I knew I would have to get up early, so I went to bed early. I was waking some time later, after my parents went to bed. I thought I heard a rattling. I listened for several minutes, heard nothing, and went back to sleep. I woke up again, a little while later. Again, I thought I heard rattling, and this time, I thought I had come from my dresser. I was slightly freaked out, but I heard nothing after a few intense minutes of listening, so I rolled over and went back to sleep. I woke up a third time. This time, I was angry. I still heard it when I woke all the way up, so I hurried and turned my light on. I saw the dresser drawer move for a few seconds, then it stopped. There was no more sleep for me to be had that night. 
The light stayed on, and I stayed sitting up in my bed, till dawn. Then I got into the dresser, snapped the board in pieces, and threw it out my back window. The last thing that happened, while I lived in the house, occurred when my best friend stayed the night. We were supposed to be sleeping in my bed, but being kids, we were up talking. We both shut up at once and looked out my bedroom door. It was the kind of house where all the doors line up. I could look out of my door and see clear to my parents' bedroom door, in between were my old room, the kitchen, and the living room. We both saw glowing orbs floating around in the living room. There were about five of them, and they were way brighter than any of the lamps we had. She and I stared in awe for a few minutes, and then they faded away. She and I are still friends, but we never have talked about the glowing balls floating around my living room. Thanks for listening. I have been able to explain what happened the night of the Ouija board rattlings. For all I know, it could be the workings of an overactive imagination, but it sure seemed to be real to me. The terror of that night never has faded. Hi, I've owned this large, three-story, late 1800s building for the past 25 years or so. The first floor is two storefronts and the second and third originally had three apartments per floor. I converted two of the second floor apartments into one large apartment for myself. When I first bought the building, I had a great deal of work to do on it. My mother would occasionally visit and she would ask me who was in the back room of the main store. There was no one there, but she would insist. I never thought much about this until later in life and she now sees non-existent people nearly everywhere. Sometime after gutting the building and making it partly usable, I was working on the first floor and saw a young boy running through the store. Since the place was locked up tight and there were seven alarm systems and only one was off, it was impossible for the child to hide from me. No child was to be found. Over the years, I and many others have seen a child running through the store. I've seen the occasional person while looking in a mirror, although this doesn't happen often. Many years ago, my friend Scott shared the apartment and had a rear bedroom of his own. One evening, he came out to see me when I got home and complained that something had sexually assaulted him. He found the event very painful. I somewhat dismissed this as folly on his part, but never forgot it. A few years later, I rented that same room to another fellow, and he had a similar experience. He moved out the next day. I rented a room to a fellow who was gay. He never had problems until his friend came over to visit. They were alone in the bed at the time. They were in the bedroom when the bed lifted a few inches off the floor and fell down. Then the bed moved a couple of feet from its location. Finally, the tenant had a set of barbells sitting on the floor. They were tossed up in the air several times, hitting the floor with a bang. After this happened, I began to read up on getting rid of spirits in the building. I placed a pentagram with proper symbols in the room above the tenant's room and went through the ceremony. From that day forward, nothing else happened in the building. That is, until the roof leaked above the room and I bought up a tarp and bucket to catch the leak. The tarp covered the pentagram. Since then, people, including myself, see things in the building, mostly visions of people. Some people leave the building immediately when this happens. Over the years, nothing has ever happened to me physically, and my sightings of spirits are rare. I'd like to mention another place in Buffalo. It is on West Avenue, near Ferry. The location was originally Buffalo's hanging grounds, and now there are houses on it. My friend Paul owns the house. Occasionally, when no one is in the house, there will be loud screams coming from inside the house. Police have been summoned by neighbors on several occasions, but couldn't find anything out. Thanks for reading. I had a couple of strange experiences at a cemetery in Vancouver as a teenager about 15 years ago or so. Everyone I've told the story to over the years seems to get a chill run down their necks from hearing it, so I thought it would make a good addition to your website, which I enjoy reading through on occasion, 
because I'm interested in hearing about other people's experiences with the unexplained. Back in the late 80s, I hung around with a group of friends who I'd hang around with and mostly get into trouble with. I guess looking back, we didn't really have any beliefs or interest in the supernatural or spirituality, and I suppose we were kind of like teenage nihilists in a way, getting into trouble with the police and partying a lot, not conscientious about school or the future, so what would happen at the cemetery would all seem the more strange. Well anyways, one school night, we were out looking for something to do at around 10 or 11 at night, and we couldn't really think of anything as it was midweek, and most people our age only went out on the weekends. We ended up just driving around with no destination in mind, and at one point, someone suggested we go to a local cemetery, just because we had nowhere else to go. This cemetery is cut into the forest on the side of a mountain, and is basically just a giant field surrounded by trees, and all the headstones are just flat plates on the ground, so that if you didn't know it was a cemetery, it would just appear as a big empty field upon entering it. The point is, is that there's absolutely nothing to obstruct your view or cast strange shadows in the cemetery. To get into the cemetery, you have to drive through a 40 meter winding road that runs through trees and bushes, etc. And this road eventually branches out so that cars can access different parts of the cemetery. There were three of us in the car, with myself driving, a friend in the front seat and one in the back. As I pulled the car into the small entrance road, I slowed the car right down and put on the high beams and drove the car at a snail's pace towards the cemetery. As we made the last little bend in the road and entered the cemetery, the high beams suddenly illuminated the entire field and it was at this point that I suddenly and finally jammed my foot on the brakes because about 15 meters in front of us stood a group of about 30 to 40 people. I think I recall my friend sitting next to me saying something to the effect of, what the hell is going on here? I don't know. I answered maybe some kind of midnight burial or something, and then cracking some joke that maybe they were druids. I remember my friends in the back seat, suggesting that we back the car the way we came in, so as not to disturb whatever was going on, which I declined to do in saying it, would be a better idea to make the first turn and come around as it's a narrow road. At this time, Probably about 20 to 30 seconds might have passed, and I took my foot off the brake, and we proceeded forward. After the car had moved forward, maybe 15 feet, and I was staring intently at the group of the people the whole time, there strangely now seemed to be less of them, which confused me. Although I remember slight movement within the group, they didn't seem to be bothered by the headlights, and I don't recall any of them looking directly at us. Well... By the time the car had reached about half the distance to where they were standing, and this is the odd part, there was no one left standing there, just an empty field, and it was at this point when I hit the brakes again, I can remember the intense feeling of my scalp feeling like it was covered in goosebumps and shrinking, because it was only at this point that it clicked into my mind that something ghostly and unnatural had occurred. I drove the car up to a spot alongside where the group was standing, and rolled down the window to have a closer look, but there was no explanation for what we had seen. At this point, someone suggested that we get the heck out of there, and we did, quickly. I can think of no possible explanation for what happened, and even went up there a couple weeks later with the same car, but a different friend, to see if maybe we could duplicate the feet and try to come up with some explanation, but we were unsuccessful. Strange thing was, that all three of us saw the same thing from different vantage points, and there was nothing that the headlights could have refracted off to cause an illusion against the windshield. And anyways, the groups were clearly standing at a distance of 50 or so meters in three-dimensional space, so there's no way it could have been a reflection. When I tried to duplicate the experience in the same car, nothing happened. I suppose it was this experience that has caused me to have a belief in a greater reality than we see in our everyday lives. Something else happened at that cemetery months later, not quite as strange, but strange nonetheless. But this email has turned out longer than I intended it to, so perhaps I'll submit it another time. I've had a family member who was buried at that cemetery since that time, and the experience has helped me to believe that perhaps some of them is still with us in some way.
I would like to share the experience we've had, my husband and I, with the ghost of a dead boy. We had some pretty scary moments. A few years ago, we moved into our new home. An old lady had lived there for years and had passed away two years before shortly after she moved into an old people's home. The house had been left empty since she moved out. We were the first ones to move in. It was the beginning of springtime, so it was a little cold inside. As we turned on the central heating system, we heard a noise as if a kettle was whistling. We thought it was just a little dry, as it had not been used in the last two years. This was just the beginning. When you entered our house, you would see a hallway surrounded by the living room, bathroom, bedrooms, and closet with the central heating system inside. As time passed away, we did not take any notice of the heating system making noise. I must say, I felt kind of awkward when I passed the particular closet. Next thing happened was on our clock. The pendulum would stop at different times. I would give it a swing, and it would keep going for days. It happened many times, and looking back on it, our cats were always looking at things we weren't able to see, especially into the direction of the clock. Then our candles. We used to burn them every night at two places in our living room. We never had any problems with drafts, but suddenly, we noticed our candles were burning unsteadily. All these things happened in our living room, and we never thought anything of it until one evening, the pendulum stopped. The candle started flickering, and a cold chill went through the room. The temperature dropped instantly, and suddenly, the noise from the central heating system didn't sound like a whistling kettle anymore, but like a stream drain running right through our living room. We looked at the TV, and suddenly, we saw the display changing numbers, and the screen turned to snow. It looked like it was trying to find a channel to display something we did not want to see. My husband rushed to the thermostat to turn it down, so the central heating would stop making noise. The TV went back to the channel we had been watching before, and everything went back to normal. Except for the two of us, we were scared to death, and we realized that something was haunting us. As we thought back at all the times the pendulum stopped, the noises from the central heating, the uncomfortable feeling we got from that closet and the candles, something or someone was trying to scare us out of our home. I told my husband that it was time to take some action or things could get worse. As we decided to go to bed, the central heating started whistling again and as I passed the closet, I yelled at it, stop it and shut up. Believe it or not, it did stop. Relieved as I was, I rushed into the bedroom to find the halogen lamp flickering heavily and the whistling started again. I decided to take a run through the hallway back into the living room to turn the thermostat off so the noise would stop. My husband was too scared to get out of bed, and I'll tell you, I wasn't happy either, but I managed to do so, and I was glad to return to bed, hiding under the sheets. The next day, I decided to call a psychic called Jan, who's well known for leading ghosts into another dimension, with the help of his guide, Layla. Through Layla, he was told that a young man in his early 20s, had been living here before we moved in. He had died, jumping or falling off a bridge in Rotterdam. We were never told his name, so we could not do any research on this guy. Layla led him into the light, and all went quiet and peaceful. We moved out of the house a few years later, and we were glad we never encountered anything like this again. It still gives me the creeps just thinking about it. Kind regards, and good luck with your website. I'm not sure if you'll understand my English, since it's been a while since I studied it, so if you have any questions, let me know. It happened when I was in my early teens. I think first, I should describe my room to you. It's the very smallest room in the whole apartment. The bed was placed, facing the door and the piano was on the left side of the door. That day, my sister was sleeping in the room on the floor. I don't know exactly what time this incident happened. All I know is that it was scary. So, I woke up in the middle of the night, opened my eyes to see a grim reaper with a scythe 
just standing there. His face was hidden under the hood, but the face under the hood was glaring with a very weird greenish light. My body was paralyzed. The only parts of my body I still had control over were my eyes. Suddenly, he started laughing, but it was a silent laugh. The most unusual thing about this though was that I could still hear him laughing, even though it was silent. His laugh would be best described as something evil and demonic. It was just cruel. I closed my eyes because I couldn't look at it any longer, and if I did, my heart would have jumped out of my mouth. When I opened my eyes, he was gone. I could still hear his laugh. It's weird that I fell asleep after that. After this incident, strange things started happening to me. I'd wake up in the middle of the night with my body stiff and be afraid of nothing, even if I was alone in the room. Or I'd feel like something's trying to touch me. Having dreams about people I don't know, and they always tell me that they're dead. This happened some seven years ago, in 1996. The office building where I worked then used to be a hotel. I was told there were two ghosts in the building. One, on the seventh floor, was supposed to be the ghost of a murdered hotel maid, but no one could tell where or what the second one was supposed to be. I shared an office on the corner of the third floor, and my colleague and I would often look up from our work, expecting to see someone, but there was never anyone there. We both felt that someone had walked through the office door, which we kept open for ventilation. An old office building such as this one did not have air conditioning. We talked about this, and discovered that we each had this experience on several occasions. Sometimes we were alone. Sometimes when we were both in the office, we eventually decided that we must be hearing someone walk along the corridor past the office, and after this, our imaginary visitor did not make their presence felt nearly so often. Then one morning, as I came back from the small area known as the tea bay, after making myself a coffee, I distinctly saw a man enter our office doorway. When I followed a few seconds later, there was only my colleague there. He insisted that no one had come through the door, and he said I must have been seeing someone going around the corner. I maintained that I had distinctly seen someone in the light coming from our doorway, and that the corridor beyond our office was dark at that time because the lighting was being replaced. A few weeks later, I saw the same man going into the tea bay, which is no more than an alcove with a water heater, refrigerator, and cleaning facilities. And when I got there, it was empty. There was no way he could have come out again without passing me. There was no other exit. I told my colleagues, and they said, I must have seen someone going into either the mess or the woman's toilets, which are on either side of the tea bay. I maintained that I saw someone going into the tea bay. If they had gone into the toilets, I would have heard the doors closing. There are none on the tea bay. Hello there. I've never thought of myself as being sensitive to paranormal things, but I've had too many experiences that I cannot explain easily. I would like to take this time and share two memorable experiences with you. Mind you, most of my experiences were feelings of not being alone, hairs of my neck rising, feelings of being watched, getting overwhelmed with sadness, hatred, and anger suddenly. I'm going to start off with my brush with the Martin House listed in the Haunted Places Index under Panama City, Florida, at the age of eight years. In 1978, it was owned by the paper mill company that was located across the street from the house. The Martin House sat on a huge amount of land and was surrounded by trees with moss hanging from them. There was a waterway running past the right of the house, looking at the front porch. The paper mill would rent this house out to various groups for parties. At the time, my father was in the Air Force, and his maintenance group rented out the house several times. I kind of felt safe on the lower floor and around the house grounds. I always made sure that my sister, seven years old and I, stayed with a group of people at all times. For the most part, kids were running all over the lower section of the house, and we had plenty of places to explore. 
We were told from the beginning not to go upstairs because it was not safe. A group of us, me included, decided to explore the upstairs area after we ate some food. I led the way up after the first five steps and stopped. I was looking at the top of the stairs and had the feeling of being watched by someone very bad. I let the boy behind me go first. We all started up the stairs and I stopped again, feeling very uneasy, couldn't seem to catch my breath. I was pushed out of the way by the other kids who went up the stairs. I went back down a ways until I was in the light that was shining from below and waited there still uneasy. Then the kids started the screen and came running down the stairs with me in front and told their parents that a very scary man was staring at them. Our parents went up to look around and could not find anyone. We all got punished. Each time we went to find that house, I was always looking up at one set of windows overlooking the waterway. I felt like I was being watched by something. Last, the ankle grabber. I was 23 years old and visiting my sister in Marietta, Georgia. She lived in a two bedroom apartment. The two bedrooms were located on the left side of the hallway with the bathroom right across the room. I would be staying in with my mom. This room had a faint nasty odor that got stronger towards the closet. My first two nights there in the room, I felt uneasy like I was being watched and fell asleep watching the closet door. I had a restless sleep and I always woke up looking at the closet door. The third day, I helped my sister get some extra boxes put away in the closet. It smelled like rotting flesh. It was extremely cold and unpleasant being in there. My sister said that she had tried everything to get the smell out, but nothing worked. That night, my mom decided to sleep out in the living room. I fell asleep the same way, eyes in the closet. I suddenly woke up to the feeling of someone rubbing their thumb down the length of my right foot very hard. It then went into spasms. I looked around the bed, thinking it might have been my sister. Nothing, but that closet door was slightly opened, and it was not how I left it before I went to bed. I wasn't able to go to bed the rest of the night, and my daughter slept soundly. The next day was uneventful, except when my daughter was taking a nap. Strange sounds were coming from her baby monitor. I went down the hallway with a feeling of dread and went into the room to look around. Nothing was out of place and I even checked my daughter for marks. There were none, but I did take her out of the room to finish her nap in the living room. That night, I was hot and decided to sleep on top of the covers. Again, my mom slept in the living room. I placed my daughter's playpen in a safer part of the room. I slept in the middle of the bed with my right hand on the middle of the pillow. I woke up in terror when my ankle was grabbed and I was jerked six inches off of my pillow. My right leg was hanging off the end of the bed and my left leg was bent. I got up, picked up my daughter, and went to sleep in the living room. In the morning, I asked my mom about any unusual experiences in that room. She said she didn't have anything funny happen to her. Just then, my sister let me know that her former roommate had complained of hearing footsteps in the room when no one else was in there. The room, by the way, was carpeted, unusual sounds, bad smells, and being watched. I asked my sister to move out of her apartment. My daughter and I spent the rest of the visit sleeping in the living room. On the last day, I went into the room, threatened if it ever hurt my family members, I would be its worst nightmare when I died, and called it every dirty name in the book. I figured I'd take my chances and say it anyway, even if I sound ridiculous and yell at nothing. I would like to thank you for your time, and thank you most of all for allowing me to share my experiences with you. I know the paranormal can bring a lot of skepticism into this world, but I also know there are things you just can't explain. I believe in the paranormal. I believe in the things that go bump in the night, and I certainly won't dismiss something just because someone thinks it's something crazy that may not be existing. Keep an open mind. Don't be so dismissive because you never know when something may lurk on you and you never know when you're being watched. Here's kind of a creepy story. I go to school at Lalo and my school, mind you, it is a private school. 
there have been a few suicides and drownings, we are on a lake, and other things such like that. Well, many students here have seen the Lalu ghost, and apparently we have more than one haunting. One of my friend's sisters was being followed around by it. At one part of the school, there are wooden steps, which makes lots of noise when you walk down them. She started to walk down them, and she heard loud footsteps behind her. She stopped. It stopped. She looked around. No one was there. So, she kept going, and the footsteps kept going. That, from what I heard, was the last time I know that the ghost had been sighted, until two weeks ago. It was a late Thursday afternoon when my friends Kai, Clover, and Jess walked down to the pine room, which is basically our storage room and lost and found, to get a binder or something. When they went down there, Clover had started to feel a presence. Kai saw a flicker of light, and Jess saw the entire figure of what she could only explain as a ball of white light. All three of them just got what they needed and left talking about this ghost. This is how I found out. I overheard them talking, and so did my friend, Jake. Jake is the most skeptical person I've ever met in my entire life. He doesn't even believe in luck. I had told Jake about this, and he basically laughed, and we went to go see Kai, who seems to be the resident expert on the occult here at Lalu, and find out what happened. Dave, who is also a skeptic, was laughing at her for saying this and wanted to see it himself. Kai told all three of us not to go down there. It will just make him mad, and I trusted her, mainly because I believe in ghosts and the supernatural and everything like that, and I stayed. Where Jake and Dave went down to the pine room to try to see it, they came back empty-handed and laughing. We talked a little bit more about the ghost and what it could potentially do to you if it was mad enough. Then, Jake and Adder decided to try again. By this time, about 10 other people found out and wanted to see it too. Everyone went down and everyone heard a loud bang, but nothing else. Then everyone went back up, but for some reason, Jake was called back downstairs. He was just inside of the door when he saw this ball of light light pass in front of him to the adjacent corner. Scared. He ran as fast as he could, back up to where me and Kai were waiting. He told us of this story, and David overheard as well. So, being the idiot that he is, Dave went back down there and, yet again, didn't see anyone or anything. Dave then went to go see Clover, who was waiting in the stairwell down the hall to where we were at. We started to follow, slower than him, and about a halfway, we all had the same feeling as Dave Giuliano did in his story. The hairs on her arms sticking up and an uncomfortable constant shiver. At that time, in unison, we all asked, did you feel that? Then, the creepiest thing happened to me. A feeling of soft, very, very soft hands, almost like wind, only solid, ran across my arm. And later, I found out that every time that Jake had walked by that spot, and that feeling happened. His legs started cramping up. We went to the stairwell and we talked with the two. Kai was shouting at Dave because it was challenging the ghost to its face and then she moved over a little and both me and Jake saw it. We didn't see anything, really, but we knew it was there in its exact movements. Move over from the exact spot she was standing, right over to where Dave was squatting and after David challenged the ghost again, we left. After all this, I found out from Kai that it was a different ghost and that when Dave challenged it, she had saw it laughing. Within two days of this sighting, my friends Ben and Jamie were playing with the camera to use up the film, which only had three pictures left and it was disposable. Ben's had looked through the viewfinder and saw a ball light behind Jamie and took the picture. They developed the film and it was caught on film. Hi, I'm from Ireland, and I haven't seen many stories from here. Well, 
My experience started in 1997. I was 15 when we moved to the house. We moved to a little village in Wexford. Our new house is over 150 years old, but has been done up and looks modern. Anyway, about two weeks after moving into our new house, I was trying to go to sleep one night when I heard someone calling the name Martin. I shared a room with my younger sister at the time, and she was fast asleep. I was wide awake, and whoever was calling the name called it about five or six times. The next day, when I woke up, I went down to my parents and asked who lived in the house before us. They told me don't be stupid, and that I know. Then, I asked who lived in the house before the people we bought the house off of, and I was told a man's name, called Jimmy Martin, and his wife. At first I thought this was a coincidence, and I never said what happened the night before. I soon started to feel someone was watching me all the time, especially in the sitting room. It is hard to explain, but even though I could not see anything, I could tell you there was an old lady standing in front of the sitting room door, and this is where she always stands. I was afraid to go to sleep some nights, as one night, when I was laying in my bed, something kept hitting me on the back of my head, as if to try and wake me up. Well, I was wide awake, but I was too scared to look, as I was afraid of what I could see. Another night, I was just dozing off, when someone decided to sit on the edge of my bed. This frightened the life out of me. I had kept all these experiences to myself, as I thought if I told anyone, they would think I was mad. I had an ensuite in my room, and one night, the toilet handle started going up and down by itself. Everything was getting to me, so after three years of keeping it all to myself, I started telling some of my friends what was happening to me. They thought it was scary, and asked me what my parents thought. They couldn't understand why I wouldn't tell them, but I just said they would think I'm mad. Anyway, more stuff started happening, but nothing serious. I went out for a few drinks with my mom and one of their friends, and when the night was over, we all came back to my house and had a cup of tea and a chat. They got into the subjects of spirits and started talking about past experiences they had. I thought this would be a good opportunity for me to tell them about mine. I started with my sentence with, you're going to think I'm mad, but, and then I started to cry. I told them everything that was happening to me. And to my surprise, they had their own experiences. My dad was sitting in the sitting room one night, reading the newspaper, when a woman started whispering his name and started running her fingers down through his hair. My mom has heard them walk around upstairs, and she could hear them call her name sometimes. And when she was in bed one night, it was like someone was blowing cold air into her ear. My brother woke me up one night because there was an argument going on in his room, and to his surprise, there was five spirits in his room, bickering at each other. His room is across from mine. My mom and dad were annoyed with me because I never told them what was happening to me. We have two bedrooms upstairs and two downstairs. Me and my sister used to share a room upstairs, but she has now moved out, and my brother, who has also slept upstairs, has moved out now, so I'm up there by myself, and some nights, I can feel there's someone there and it would take me half the night to go to sleep, as I would be terrified, lying in my bed. I'm 21, and the eldest of four children. Now that my brother and one of my sisters have moved out, my little sister, 13, looks up to me and likes to do stuff together. She's often asked me about my experiences, which are still happening today, but I won't tell her too much, as it would frighten her. To end my story, I will tell you about a reading we held in our house. A man came to our house who could see spirits, and he gave about ten of us our readings. I was first to get mine done, and as I sat down, the kitchen door opened. As I got up to shut it, the man told me to wait a minute. He then told me that he is now, and that I should shut the door. This sent a shiver down my spine. He told my mother how I can sense spirits, and how a bad spirit entered the room with me. He said that he got rid of him, but there is a spirit that follows me around, but it's a good spirit, and this is the one that I can sense around me, all the time. He said that there are a few spirits in my house, but they're good, 
Well, except the bad one he got rid of. Well, that's my story. And it's going on today. The good news is, I've just learned to live with it in the sleepless nights at times. Hopefully I'll be the next to move, because the terror drives me mad sometimes. Thank you. First off, I'm 19 and have believed in ghosts my entire life. Now, I don't have a sixth sense, but I find it fun to discuss ghosts and all sorts of unexplained occurrences. I'm a pretty athletic guy and played football through high school and am pretty strong too. I can bench 280. I'm not saying this to sound like I'm bragging, just to say I'm not afraid of that much. But what happened to me two summers ago left me pretty shaken. I was about 17 at the time and found out about a haunted church through my mother. She had gone when she was younger. Nothing happened, except she had a really weird feeling the whole time she was there. Well, finding ghosts fascinating, I wanted to go, but didn't want to go by myself, so I told my brother about it. We decided to go on a Saturday night. Maybe we'd have a story to tell at the parties. My brother at the time was 15 and he wanted to bring some friends along, so I agreed. Altogether, there were the five of us, me, my brother, my brother's friend, and two girls they wanted to impress. The layout of the church goes like this. The church is in the middle of a field, surrounded by woods. All around the church in sort of a U pattern are graves. The graves start a little ahead of the church and meet in back, forming the U. There is no space between the graves and church, for a few people to walk. In front of the church is a stone wall about three feet high and two sensor trigger lights on each side of the stone wall. We parked in a little dirt parking lot right in front of the church and got out. Me, being the oldest and assumed the bravest, went over the wall first. As soon as my feet hit the ground on the other side of the fence, I got a really bad feeling and my hair stood on end. The first thing we did was go up to the front steps and hang out for the first couple of minutes. The thing that struck me was that there was no noise at all inside the wall, no crickets or anything, which is strange because it's surrounded by woods. Once we got bored of sitting around, we decided to go around back. That's when the really weird stuff started to happen. We were walking in a straight line because none of the younger kids wanted to be last. It was me, my brother's friend, the two girls, and my brother. That was the order from left to right. We were walking so that I was closest to the grave, and my brother was closest to the church. About halfway down the length of the church, we all heard a whooshing sound. My brother's friend and I to the left, and my brother and the two girls to the right, like we were being surrounded. Everyone asked each other if they heard the sound, and we all answered yes. After that noise, Mike, my brother's friend, and the two girls wanted to leave, but my brother and I convinced them to stay. Not that I wasn't scared, I just wanted to see more. I forgot to mention that me and my brother both had flashlights, which gets important. As we made our way to the back of the church, we all heard a loud hum, kind of like electric wires, but no one were around. This sound kept getting louder. Also, this went on through the whole entire time we were there and probably would have scared us enough, if not for what happened next. At about the same time, I heard a noise. I saw a black ink blot, like shape move from a grave to behind a bush. I tried to follow it with a flashlight, but it was too fast. However, Mike saw it move from that same bush to behind another tree. From that point, we would hear sounds and directions all around us, and when my flashlight or my brother's was aimed at the spot we heard the sound, we would just get a glimpse of a shape going back the way the light came to, too fast for us to follow it. Now, there had to be more than one of whatever they were, because as me and Mike were going through this on one side, my brother and the two girls were doing the same on the other side. All of a sudden, I heard my brother and the two girls scream. My brother is a pretty tough kid himself, and I never heard him scream like that in my entire life. Never mind the girls. When I turned to see what was wrong, the three were sprinting out of there at a very fast pace. When I heard them scream, I almost panicked, but got my nerves under control. Mike, however, 
took off like a world-class sprinter, leaving me by myself. Not wanting to be the only one there, I backpedaled as fast as I could, so I could see whatever it was, if it was coming after us. At this point, the humming was almost deafening, and that's when I got the impression that whatever was making the sound was coming closer at every very fast pace. At that same moment, my flashlight went dead, and then I did panic. I turned and ran faster than ever before in my life. When I reached the stone wall, I saw everyone else in the car waiting for me. I just jumped the stone wall. As soon as my feet landed, the flashlight went back on. The humming stopped, and I heard guess what? Crickets chirping. Also, all the feelings of fear I had disappeared, and everything was calm. I got in the car and asked what my brother and the girls had seen. They said it was the body of a little girl floating inside the second story window. At that time, the sensor lights went on, meaning something was coming towards the gate. Remembering the humming sound, I took off as fast as possible. There have been other stories about how people have seen the little girl or heard her playing the flute, but none to the extent of ours. After this happened, I did a little research, and this is what I found. In the 70s, a man raped and murdered five young women and buried them in the back of the graveyard behind the church. I don't know where the little girl comes into the picture, but that is what everyone sees. Later, when I asked my brother why a little girl scared them so much, he said the face looked mad like it wanted us out, and he just got a bad feeling when he saw it. This is the only ghostly experience, and hopefully the only bad one I'll ever have, and this story is 100% true. Hi, not sure if you are interested, but here's a couple of stories from the place I live in, in Tasmania, Australia. My boyfriend and I live in Daisy Cottage, an 1832 brick and stone house in Marquis Street, South Hobart, Tasmania, Australia. Daisy Cottage was originally built as a nine-room hotel by an Irish stonemason. He built an almost identical house right next door for himself, which has been empty the entire time we have lived in Daisy Cottage. Legend has it that he witnessed the stabbing murder of the local policeman and testified against the killer in court. The killer was sentenced to lashings, followed by hanging death, and apparently it is he who haunts the house. Strange things have happened, but only one of us is in the house. The first thing happened to Chris, my boyfriend. He arrived home from work one day and checked the mailbox for an important letter that he was expecting. He took it out of the mailbox, opened the front door, and headed upstairs to the bedroom to get changed. On the way, he started to open the letter. Once upstairs, he realized it was raining so he put the partially open letter on the bed and went downstairs and out into the back courtyard to take the washing off the clothesline. Once he got back inside, he went back to open and read the letter, and it was not there. After about 30 minutes of searching, he called me out, out of frustration. I arrived home and helped him look for the letter, turning the house upside down. Eventually, I said, Are you sure you took it out of the letterbox? Maybe you should check. Sure enough, there it was, sitting in the letterbox, partially opened. Second strange thing happened two days ago. I was alone in the house, doing some painting. It was getting dark, so I turned on the hall, bathroom, dining room, and kitchen lights, and had not ventured upstairs at all. I finished, cleaned up, and started turning off all the lights, getting ready to leave as we currently aren't staying there during the renovations. I got to the front door and realized that there were lights still on in the house. Every single light upstairs had been turned on. As I left, I noticed that there was a light on in the upstairs of the empty house next door. The one thing that really got me though, as I was looking towards that house, I noticed some kind of print, like a handprint there. When I say handprint, I mean a floating hand. It was very faded, and then it just disappeared. Well, I guess he needed some light in the house. 
Thanks for reading. Ever since I could remember, I've always had an interest in ghost stories. That is why I'm writing you this letter. No, I don't have a ghost in my house. A friend of mine told me about this place at least 10 months ago. I was so amazed at this story, I asked if you would take me to this place. No one really ever goes there. I guess because it's so creepy and dark looking at night, but during the day, it is okay. Nothing strange happens. Well first, before I tell you more about this place, let me tell you the story of why it is so unusual. The city is called Lake Forest, California, and they call it Cannon Creek, I guess, because it is nothing but cannon and wide open spaces of nothing but rocks and wildlife. The story goes back 30 years ago of a lady who was in her 40s. Nobody knew what her name was. She lived alone with her two Great Dane dogs. She was very rich and owned all of the canyon, which is like miles and miles of land. This lady never married and had no children. It was just her dogs and herself. She lived in this trailer park home and it was not a pretty house by any stretch of the imagination. Well, about six years later, the story goes that a police officer got a call about the lady and her dogs. The officer went to the lady's home and knocked at the door and no one answered. The officer ended up breaking down the door and what he found next was horrifying. It is said that the officer found the lady dead. Nothing was left but her decaying body and her bones were visible. Worst of all, laying right next to her were her dogs. They had both died as well. Now, on to the paranormal part. People who have never been to this place don't know what to expect if they come into this place. It's unpredictable. Sometimes, when you go back to the area where she passed, you'll notice paranormal phenomena. Other times, you won't. A man was driving alone on the cannon by himself one night. And the story goes that he saw the presence of the lady standing at the side of the road with her two dogs. The man did not stop at all to give the lady a ride. He just kept going. And this other story was told by my friend. My friend told me that his ex-girlfriend and her boyfriend went up there one night to check it out. They stopped where the lady's house was. They were only there about 15 minutes away when they were just talking and listening to music. Then, all of a sudden, they heard a knock on the side door of the driver's seat. They both turned to look and they saw the lady standing there, knocking on the window. She was dressed in all white and covered in blood. They also saw the dogs nearby as well, far off into the distance, appearing as silhouettes. They sat there in shock for three minutes, horrified by what they just saw. For some reason, the lady was still knocking at the driver's side of the window, but in reality, it was really not that long. They both said that she must have been there about 40 seconds. After that, my friend said they never returned back there. That was not the only story that happened to anyone. There are far more. What I would like to know is who is this lady and why is she doing this? There is something more to why she has to haunt people who have done nothing to her. Maybe it is because she does not want anyone on her land that she loves so much. What could it be? Here is my email address. If you have any questions, please feel free to get a hold of me. I would like at least some kind of feedback on this story. Please, I beg you. I'm so confused and I'm scared. Please let me know what is going on. I find this intriguing. When I was 12, my family moved to a newer house about 10 miles away from where I grew up. The house was 7 years old and no one had ever died there. From the start, I would hear footsteps in the carpeting and I always felt that I was being watched, especially when I played her piano. 
that was the extent of my experiences until I was in my early 20s. One evening, my sister and I were sitting in the den talking. It was spring, and the temperature was perfect, so all the windows were closed, and the air was off. Suddenly, in the back of the room, where there were a lot of plants sitting together, one plant in the middle started shaking furiously. My sister and I looked at each other and went into the other room. A few weeks later, my mother and I were sitting alone in the house when it sounded like someone very roughly raked their fingernails down a couch in the back of the room, which was in sight. And again, a plant that was sitting at the end of the couch started shaking ferociously. My mother just would not admit that we were being visited, even though she'd witnessed it firsthand. The last time anything paranormal happened was on a Friday afternoon. I was in my mother's room, talking to her, when I noticed the atmosphere had seemed to grow heavy, and I got chills. As the afternoon wore on, the feeling increased until I couldn't stand to go into the room any longer. That evening, my sister and I were alone and watching TV. I had gone to the fridge for a snack and felt the heaviness with the goosebumps on the left side of it. I told my sister that the ghost was in the kitchen. I could feel it. A few minutes later, a picture that was hanging in the kitchen fell off of the wall. When we got the nerve up, my sister and I went to another door in the kitchen on the opposite side of the room. We walked in and stood there, seeing and feeling nothing. Suddenly, the hair on our arms literally stood up and we had to run out. Immediately afterwards it left and hasn't been back. I don't even feel like I'm being watched while playing the piano. I guess whatever it was only wanted to communicate, but I was too frightened. I felt the heaviness with chills in other places, but until the last few years, I hadn't seen any entities. I've moved twice and really don't believe the houses were haunted, but internally and for short periods of time, I believe there were entities present. I've seen a man with long salt and pepper hair with a dark cloak looking at me with bright colorless eyes. It looked like a negative of a photo. Also, I've seen a bright, elongated white shape out of the corner of my eye around my bed several times. The most profound experience I've ever had was when I was visited by the spirit of a friend who had died a week before his 16th birthday. Also 10 years later, I started having dreams with him there and I'll wake up with the most wonderful feeling of being loved. During one of these dreams, I was at home alone during the day and had to sleep because I was working nights. It was a little warm, but not enough for the air. I had two blankets in my bed and threw one in the floor, and the other one was a mess because I had been tossing and turning. I finally made it back to sleep and dreamed of my friend. I got too hot and woke up to find the blanket I tossed on the floor laid over me very neatly. I've had too many experiences to discount anything to just chance, and my mother is finally admitting that she's experienced the paranormal. I live in Tucson, Arizona. Shortly north of the city lies Mount Lemmon. This peak is a great forested 7,000 foot getaway from the desert city. I had my brother and two friends over at my place at about 1 a.m. a few months ago. And after a few hours of boredom, we decided to go to Mount Lemon and enjoy some nice, cool night air. I would often take the 45 minute trip to wind down and watch the stars, so this is a very familiar place. The trip started off very normal. Our first stop was without occurrences. The next stop, I became mildly aware of a presence. This is nothing new to me, however so I ignored it. By the third stop, we got out again. My brother and our friend Steve stayed in the car, and my friend Thea and I 
went for a walk. After a short discussion about friend trouble, she interrupted and said she kept seeing a shadowed figure from the top of a nearby peak. I told her that something was watching us, but not to worry because I didn't sense hostility. We started the walk back and kept hearing the sound of scattered gravel and an extra set of footsteps on the other side of me. This was at first amusing because we knew at this time we had gained a friend that was not from around here. By the time we got to the car, Thea panicked, and when we got in, my brother and Steve spoke of the shadowy figures they saw. We smiled, started the car, and drove down the mountain. As we spoke about what we saw and what we felt, it was decided that we would stop again. We pulled off at a scenic view of a canyon area where we found a newer Ford Bronco with the engine running, the dome light on, and no one in or around the vehicle. This was unsettling, but could surely be explained, no matter how far-fetched the explanation. We stayed here for about 10 minutes. After the first couple of minutes, my brother and I simultaneously noticed a large dark mass above the peak where we were being watched earlier. Thea saw the figures on the top of the peak. I could see the mass disappear, as if moving down the mountain towards us. Thea said the figures were walking down the mountainside. No one was scared at this point. We were all very amused. When I could no longer see the mass, I was only able to see it above the mountain because the sky posed as a backdrop. We all got a wave of panic. Gravel started swirling around everywhere, and Thea and Jason ran for the car. I was stunned, so I was the last to get there. Jason entered the car from the other side, but his heavy trench coat was flipped over his head as he opened the door. We started the car and sped down the mountain. We spoke with Steve about what we saw, and he said he saw the same shadow figures that Thea had seen. We pulled over one last time without getting out of the car to show Steve the black mass that was causing all of the commotion. We then kept driving until we reached the city again. The whole way down, seeing cars pulled to the side, some with dome lights on, never with anyone in or around them. This is very odd for 3 a.m. on a Thursday morning. Furthermore, vehicles are not allowed to park on the road after 10 p.m. The next night, he and I returned. We never got out of the car this time. However, every time we cut the engine in all power, we hear scratching underneath the car and eventually it would start to rock. We pulled over four times and this happened every time. Finally, the fifth time, we decided to get out of the car before that happened so we would have enough guts to see what else would happen. Once again, we didn't make it. We opened the doors and pointed our flashlights outside. And as soon as we did, gravel started swirling around louder than before. There was no wind and we watched it jumped around as if someone was kicking it right in front of us. After this trip, it turned out that the brakes in front of the left of the car where we heard the scratching from where the car was off were worn down badly. However, the rest of the brakes were completely fine. We stumped the mechanic, but once again, this is something that may be explained. I just don't know how. I'm planning a return trip, well equipped now. I'll bring a camera, several flashlights, and a video recorder. Depending on the outcome of this trip, I'll forward any eventful messages to your site. I'm stuck wondering two things now. First off, what is this entity? There are no local legends that I've found about Mount Lemon. Second off, will it be there again when I visit next week? I hope so. There's so much more I would like to learn before it just becomes a memory.
I was stationed at Ford Island, Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, in the early 1980s. I was a corpsman assigned to the hospital there, which at the time was only an aid station, kept there because of the brig on the other side of the island. I spent many nights in the large hospital, alone. They only used a small area in the ER. All throughout the night, you could hear people moving around, and doors opening, and windows closing. I would walk around looking for the source of the sounds, but no one else was there. Many people died there December 7th, and many years after that. More than one night, I woke up thinking someone was watching me, and a few nights, I was awakened by the sound of the ER doors closing by themselves. I'd even seen the presence of an old man wandering the halls from a distance, except it looked like he was floating and was missing a leg. There was always this hospital room that smelled rancid, even though it was supposed to be the cleanest room. Every time I'd walk by there, I'd see a dark fog sitting there through the corner of my eye. I would then completely look into the room, and the fog would disappear instantly. I've never written about this before. There were about 20 others who had duty there, and some men and women would pay me to take their duty so that they would not have to sleep there. I was so shocked to see that no one had reported it on their list in Hawaii. Fort Island has many suicides and strange deaths, from people driving their cars off the runway to a group of ski divers landing on rocks just off the coast. My husband and I took our two children to Florida to visit his parents this past Christmas. Since his parents live in a small two-bedroom condo, there wasn't room for all of us to sleep there. My mother-in-law has some friends with a condo about three or four miles from her building, and they primarily use it for furnished rental. It happened to be unoccupied at the time, so she made arrangements for my husband and me to sleep there. The first night we went over to go to bed, I noticed some dark shadows moving around the apartment, but just out of the corners of my eyes. I've seen spirit shadows before, and they do not look like regular room shadows. They're darker and more solid appearing. I didn't pay too much attention at first, didn't realize what I was seeing, I guess, until I got up early the next morning and went outside onto the apartment's small balcony. I saw something light colored go through the kitchen and assumed my husband had come out of the bedroom. But when I went back into the apartment, he was in the bathroom and had not come into the kitchen at all. While I was getting dressed, I saw something small and black retreat under the closet door in the bedroom. I thought at first it was a roach, rare, as they are on the nice fifth floor Florida condos. It was not impossible. I pulled back the closet door, and there was nothing in the closet but pale gray carpeting on the floor and empty hangers on the rod. I began to have my suspicions, but kept them to myself. That night, my husband stayed at his mother's with her younger child, and my oldest son, age 13, came back to the borrowed apartments with me since we were going fishing very early the next morning. He put his stuff down in the smaller bedroom, then came out in the hallway and asked me who else was in the apartment. I said we were alone. Why did he ask? He told me he had just seen something go through his bedroom. Well. That clinched it for me, but I kind of brushed it off, not wanting to scare him. I did leave my light on all night, though. I saw the dark shadows up near the top of the bedroom door several times. The next night, when my husband and I arrived, I went into the master bedroom, and as I entered the room, I felt this wave wash over me, sort of a combination of curiosity, irritation, in loneliness. Who are you? Why are you here? And where or where have you been? 
I decided I did not feel up to trying to communicate with this entity on its terms. Not that I've been very successful with that anyway. So I sat on the bed and spoke aloud and told it I was just visiting with permission from the owners. I promised to clean up everything before I left. For some reason, I had the feeling that my travel clutter was making it upset. And in return, please, it would not scare me by materializing unexpectedly. After the evening, the place just felt empty. I didn't see the shadows anymore and had the feeling that whoever it was had vacated or was just trying to stay out of the way. I guess we reached some sort of compromise. I told my husband that I thought there was a ghost in the apartment, and while he scoffed and told me I was crazy, I noticed he spent the remaining three nights at his mother's and sent our son back with me. No one has died in that apartment that I know of, but it's in a large building full of retirees, and I'm not sure many residents have passed on over the 30 year life of the building. Maybe someone was just wandering around. I will never know. Hi, I've sent info before, but I'm using a friend's computer today since the battery in my car is dead. Nothing to do with ghosts, I don't think. Anyway, having read about people seeing black figures, I thought I would add my two cents. The first time, I was 16, living with my grandparents in LA, who were out of town at the time. I wasn't drinking, just alone, when I left my bedroom and crossed the hall into the kitchen. That's when a figure stepped out in front of me. It was the strangest figure I'd ever seen. He appeared as a hairy ghost of some sort. His arms, face, and legs were completely covered in fur, but he still looked humanoid. It's a little difficult to explain, but it kind of looked like that famous Bigfoot photo in footage from 1967, except the presence was still a dark silhouette. Not dark enough that you couldn't see the fur, but still dark. It was creepy. I got a baseball bat and turned on all the lights in the house and even called a friend. Nothing else. Then, just less than two years ago, I'd since moved to Corrales, New Mexico. I was living with another woman. I got up in the middle of the night to use the restroom. As I came out, through the door, there was another shadow being right in front of me. I saw its head and shoulders, and it was taller than me. I pull my hands up as if to gesture, excuse me, or not, to run it over. Since then, here in Corrales, I felt things in the corners, running around the room, and such. I bought my own house in July 1999, and my dog barked incredibly at one particular corner. My roommate at the time immediately burned sage, and he stopped. What are these things? I've not seen anything in my place, and the dogs haven't acted weird since. Any ideas? Someone did say that I might have been dimension jumping. Have you heard of this? Let me start off by saying I've never met my real father. He died when I was a baby. Anyhow, I've always known about my deceased father. His name was Jerry. Now, no one in my family talks about my deceased dad, and we don't know anyone by the name of Jerry. One day, when I was between the ages of eight to nine, my cousin and my mother and myself were downstairs, and we were in the basement singing. The phone began to ring, and even though we had a phone in the basement, I went upstairs, one flight, to our library, to answer the phone so as to not disturb my mother's song. When I answered the phone, I noticed immediately the static on the line, and I knew it wasn't our phone, so I asked the caller to speak louder. Now, 
from here on out, it gets weirder. The caller asked to speak to REC, my mom's nickname. I then asked who was calling, and the caller replied Jerry. I immediately knew my mother knew of no other Jerry, so I repeated the name, and the caller acknowledged that that was his name. I tell him to hold on. I run down the stairs to where my mother and cousin were and tell my mother to pick up the phone, that she had a phone call, and that the caller's name was Jerry. My cousin looked up shocked, as did my mother, and simultaneously said Jerry. This is all happening within a minute or so. So my mother picks up the phone and answers the call, only there is no one on the line now. I run back upstairs to the library to hang up the phone, and I go back to the basement, and both my mother and my cousin are trying to figure out if I got the name right. I assure them I did, and then I tell them about the connection and the static. We all just kind of dismissed the call. Only later when I started thinking about it, did I realize that my father never knew me and died very tragically when he was struck by a car. I think he wanted to hear my voice and hear my mother's voice. What I didn't tell my mother or my cousin is that the caller addressed me by my name. I never told the caller my name, but he knew my name, Tamaya. My ex-boyfriend lived in a very old part of town, in a house that was built in the 1800s. At one time, the home had been a stately and elegant one, with a long and gracefully curving stair as the focal point upon the entrance into the foyer. Through time, and with the coming of rough economic periods, the home grew into disrepair and was eventually sectioned off into a two-family home. One side housed a family of bikers, whose moonshine sent many a folk into orbit. We didn't have any moonshine the night this happened. And then the other lived my boyfriend and his roommate. One night, myself, my boyfriend Nick, Nick's friend Dave, and my friend Stacy, who was dating Dave at the time, were at the house. We were descending the grand staircase I mentioned earlier on our way out to enjoy our Saturday night. All was dark, except for the soft lighting coming from the kitchen, which was illuminating the front doorway. On the front door, we saw the unmistakable silhouette of a woman in a long old fashioned hoop skirt, like women wore in the 1800s. She scared the wits out of me and Stacy, and we both refused to go any further down the stairs until the rest of the lights were put on chickens, aren't we? Although Nick and Dave were in a position to see the woman's shadow, for some strange reason, they were unable to see her. Maybe she only liked women, but I know this for a fact. The next moment we actually saw the woman, it looked as if we saw her with her eyes gouged out, and she was running towards us, flying down the hallway. It was actually pretty creepy but it happened in the corner of my eye, so I don't know if I was hallucinating or I actually saw her full steam ahead, but it definitely creeped me out. Another moment, my friend Stacy was upstairs and the door was completely wide open, the bathroom door that is, and she saw that same woman in Victorian era clothes just laying in the bathtub with again her eyes gouged out. I honestly don't understand what happened to this woman. At first I thought it was pretty innocuous, but now I understand. She must have been murdered. There's no other explanation I had than that. Thanks for reading, and I hope you enjoyed the story. I've always been hesitant to talk about this story, but what I tell you is true. In 1992, when I was separated from my wife for the first time, I was living at Old Farm in an apartment. One Saturday night, when my kids were off to their grandmother's 
and my girlfriend, who was a teacher, had an event to attend. I found myself in my apartment, all alone. I rented a couple of movies, ordered a pizza hut, went on over to the whirlpool for a while, and sat down to enjoy a peaceful night, alone at last. I was really looking forward to a night by myself. When I was reading in bed, I noticed a black silhouetted figure standing in my bedroom door. The figure appeared to have a cloak drawn over its head. I couldn't recognize any features, nor was there any attempt to verbally communicate. I was wide awake, and I was terrified. My heart was racing, and I kept pulling the covers over my head. It seemed like every second was one of terror. The figure stood in my doorway well into the morning hours, and I knew my eyes were as big as they could get. When the silhouette disappeared, I was covered with sweat. My hair was raining wet. I rushed out to the front room because I really couldn't believe it had left me. No, the only thing I had to drink was a Diet Coke with popcorn. I'm not a big drinker. After the ordeal, I quickly showered and raced off to go hiking. I can honestly tell you that no communication with the figure was made. When I would ask who you are, there was no response. This went on all night until by the grace of God, it went away. This event has always affected my life. I know of another person who had a similar experience like mine. Can you tell me what was standing in my door, why there was no communication, and why me? Have you ever had any stories like this reported to you? Until now, the only person I ever told this story to was a good friend who is a Catholic priest. It still scares me to tell this story. Why was there no attempt to communicate? And yes, when I checked my doors, they were all bolted and locked. My father loved the state of Maine. Not enough, however, to give up his cush job in Boston to live on the going wage of a down Easter. So every summer, from the mid-50s until I reached high school, we would vacation on the scenic, Maine coast. Very seldom will we stay in the same place twice. Usually, it was some remote cottage located on the outskirts of some tiny coastal town. A two-week ordeal was in store for me, with no TV or friends to speak of. To keep me sane, my mother would buy me comic books and play board games with me, long into the night. We've been at this cottage now for about 10 days, and I was counting the hours until we would leave. It was a chilly August night, and dear old dad had a few too many and drifted off to bed. Our terrier, Joe, was snoozing on the carpet in front of the fireplace, and through the big picture window, the surf was something out of a South Pacific movie. The waves were gently breaking on the rocky shore, not 20 yards from the cottage. The only sound was the reverie coming from a cruise ship that was passing off the point. In summary, the night was calm. Suddenly, Joe jumped to his feet with his hackles up and growled at the door. I yelled at the dog to be quiet as he interrupted me over a card game. In an instant, the front door blew open and with a bang, it hit the interior wall. Just then, a ghostly presence entered through the doorway. He looked as if he was from the colonial era, had a musket in his hand, and seemed as though only half his face was visible, even though the figure itself had a blur to it. This lasted a few seconds, then the figure disappeared, like a fog that evaporated. Joe Coward and my mother's hair moved like it had been ruffled by some invisible breeze. The playing cards scattered about, and before we could take a breath, the door slammed shut 
and Joe went back to his sleeping position. We decided not to tell the old man, as he wouldn't believe it anyway. A few days later, we were filling up the old Plymouth for the return trip to Boston, and my father started gabbing with the local about his vacation. With the windows of the car down, we heard every word. So where did you stay? The man asked, with the main dialect. Oh, down on the point at the Jensen Cottage, my old man answered. Folks around here know that place well, the man said flatly. They refer to it as the front door. My name is John. I'm 41 years of age and currently live in the city of Lincoln, England. During my life to date, I've seen several ghosts and whilst I still find them surprising and of course fascinating, I'm no longer afraid of whatever they are or appear to be. I saw my first ghost at around the age of eight whilst having in my childhood home a large Victorian house on the edge of Manchester, England. And the ghost was one of a young boy of a similar age to mine at the time. He was leaning over the banister rail of the stairway landing outside my bedroom as I was making my way up to bed. The shock and surprise of seeing him sent me flying downstairs into the front room of my house. Needless to say, that none of my family appeared to believe what I told them I had seen. Although over the years, I've experienced strong sensations of ghostly presences, my next positive encounter was not until I was 22, whilst living and working in the city of Newcastle. I'd obtained the keys to a vacant industrial building, which my firm was taking over. My job was to assess the work involved in converting the building for its future use. I'd locked myself in the building and was therefore sure that no other person was on the premises and was proceeding up some steep and narrow stairs when I felt a hand touch me on the top of my head and give my hair a friendly ruffle, rather like an affectionate parent may give their child. I immediately turned around only to find the stairway completely empty. Surprised, but not afraid this time, I continued my inspection of the building. We moved into the premises, and although I had my office at the top of the stairs where I had my encounter, and worked there often late into the night, I never saw, heard, or felt anything unusual there again. My next encounter took place right here in Lincoln about three years ago. Walking her dog out late one night, I noticed the cyclist approaching me along a side street. I thought the cyclist appeared a little unusual in so far as he was riding an old style sit him up and beg cycle. His hair looked rather old fashioned too, and most curiously of all, he appeared to be wearing an old style Royal Air Force uniform. I could see the street light reflecting off the silver buttons on his uniform tonic, and from the chrome handlebars of his cycle. He got to within about 30 yards of me, when for some reason, I glanced down for a second. When I looked up again, he had completely disappeared from the street, and there was no way in which he could have left the street in the vicinity of where I last saw him. I wonder whether his appearance was in some way, connected to the fact that there used to be an open air swimming pool adjacent to where I saw him. This pool is very popular with air crews during World War II, and I can only assume he may have been on his way for a midnight swim. My most recent encounter was very brief, occurring during the first time I visited my mother's cottage in North Wales. Built around 200 years ago, the back room opens directly out into the rear garden, with the narrow stairs descending into the back room, right beside the back door to the building. Whilst coming down the stairs, I saw an elderly woman walk through the back door and disappear. She was aged about 80, approximately 5 foot tall, wearing a grey dress with long sleeves, a white apron, 
and her straight grey hair was tied up in a sort of bun which in turn was covered by a small handkerchief on the top of her head. She was followed immediately by a young girl aged about 10 or 12 dressed in a long light colored smock. Her hair was very long, blonde and straight, falling down her back. She also disappeared straight away. I have no idea what ghosts are or why they appear. I do not see them as threatening. In fact, on more than one occasion, a curious sensation of contentment seems to fill the air after they have gone. I've noticed that my mind is not thinking about anything in particular at the times I've come across them. Thanks for reading. I grew up in western New York and knew the local legends of ghosts, the Rochester Durant White Lady, for example. I never really put much faith in them. I never had an experience until I left New York. In October of 99, I was transferred to Elyra, Ohio. After a few weeks, I was asked to work in Sandusky. I accepted the promotion, but having just settled into a new apartment, I decided to commute rather than move again. Halfway between Elyra and Sandusky, there was a rest stop in I-90, Route 2, just outside Vermilion. I would stop sometimes on the way home for a bathroom break, or rest a bit. It's a funny design. You drive around and park in back of the building, between the building, and wooden walking trails. I usually got off work after about 11 p.m., but it was usually pretty busy, so I never gave much thought to stopping there late at night. One night, in March of this year, I'd stop for a bathroom break. I noticed that there was only a few cars in the lot. It was a warm spring night. I wondered why more people weren't out. As I returned to my car, I had this urge to walk into the wooded area. A stupid thing to do, as it would be easy for a human assailant to hide on the trails. I walked in about 10 feet, and the path split to the left and straight ahead. I walked a little further straight ahead and felt something in there, with me. I turned and started the walk out when I heard a noise, kind of like a lumbering sound. Feeling foolish and thinking there was probably an animal, like a hedgehog or deer, walking through the woods, I looked back and saw a pair of yellow eyes on the path quite a while back. I knew it could not be an animal as only the parking area was lighted. The only light in the woods came from the ambient light and the moon. I quickly closed the distance between myself and the parking area, keys in hand. To my relief, nothing pursued me and the eyes were gone, or at least I couldn't see them anymore. I went straight home. The next day, I felt rather silly, thinking about the matter during the day. None of it seemed like it should have scared me. I rationalized the whole thing. That night, I stopped for a bathroom break. Feeling brave, I decided to once again check out the woods and dispel my fear once and for all. This time, I walked out only halfway to the fork and I felt an overwhelming sense of dread. I was not afraid in the usual sense, rabbit heartbeat sweating, etc. I just had this feeling of not being able to walk any deeper into the woods. It was like the air got heavier the further I walked. As I walked out of the woods, the feeling went away, just as it had come. I decided to come back on my day off and investigate, during the day. I'd never been in the day, and I didn't know where the trails led, or what was in the woods that attracted people to them. I returned a few days later with my jogging shoes, ready to explore. The trails wrapped around to each other and only totaled a mile loop. There was a ledge, a cliff area, but it was fenced off and there was no way to get down, but I could see a stream in the distance. 
I didn't feel anything strange at all. Nonetheless, I made it a point not to stop there after dark. A few months later, I was transferred to Newcastle, Pennsylvania, which leads me to my next story, but we are still looking into it, and it's AM now, so I need some sleep. I don't usually share this with anyone, since most people would consider me crazy for believing in this stuff, my husband and father included. When I was about two years old, back in 1973, I have very vivid memories about my childhood, and my mother confirms my memories. We rented an old house, about a hundred years old. It was there when in Phoenix, Arizona. It was not much but a lot of farmland. There was a smaller house next to it that used to be the old barn. It's still there today, but surrounded by huge mansions. Anyway, things were peaceful there until our next door neighbor hung himself in the kitchen and my father found him. I never knew about it. But about three months after, things began to happen. My mother was having an argument with my father one morning before getting out of bed. She got really mad and got up and went to the kitchen. She saw a man sitting at the table with his head in his hands on the table so that she couldn't see his face. She turned around and went back to bed, not saying a word to my dad. Later, I began to see a hand floating in my room and would hear it talk to me. I called it and this is kind of weird, bugs, but now I think it could have been about avid bugs or something about that. As a child that young, it was difficult to express myself with words yet. I didn't have the word for ghost and would be spanked by my father for crying at night when this thing would appear and talk to me. One time, I was sitting on the potty with my mom there to supervise. I couldn't get off the toilet, like something was holding me down. My mother was pulling me by the arms to try to get me off, but couldn't. Finally, it let go. Sometimes, the door was slammed shut and locked with me on the other side, and I couldn't get out. Only the lock on the other door didn't work anymore. No matter how hard my mother would pull, the door would not open. Then all of a sudden, it would feel as if nothing happened. At night, you could hear scratching noises under the wood floor in the master bedroom. Dad said it was just animals. He crawled under the house, but didn't find anything. He never believes in this stuff. At night, when I would go to bed, always fussed about not wanting to go because I was scared. Before falling asleep, I felt something was trying to pull me through the wall. Sometimes, I felt like I was floating, like in another dimension or something. My mother finally had enough and made my dad find a new house to buy. We moved and nothing quite as dramatic as that ever happened to me again. The new house had its little incidents, but that's another story. My parents are still alive in the house and they bought it 27 years ago. First of all, let me explain. I'm from England. I'm a 26-year-old male living in Cambridge. I was born in Yorkshire, North England. Just up the road from where I lived was a place called Oakwell Hall, located in an area called Birkinshaw. Oakwell Hall is a fairly small house compared to some in the UK but it certainly has local character. Many a day away from school would be spent wandering around the grounds. Local legend has it that the hall was once inhabited by a great local family named the Bats, hence the local town of Batley, and that one of the sons of the family, a womanizer and gambler of no small repute, found himself in a duel fought on the local moors. The servants all knew of this, and so were relieved. The sounds of his horse were heard, re-entering the stables. 
They were even more relieved when the son was seen walking through the hall, up the stairs, into his bedchamber. They then made a rather spooky discovery when they noticed a bloody footprint on the staircase. Thinking their master was injured in a duel, they entered his chambers to see if they could help him. He was not there. The bed had not been disturbed. There was no horse in the stable. News was later conveyed that the son had died in the duel, and every Christmas Eve, the same bloody footprint can be seen on the staircase. This is not what I saw. I was eight years old, and it was the school holidays. Two friends, Stephen and Stuart and myself, were walking through the garden when Stuart noticed one of the windows was blacked out. We noticed it, as the sun was behind the house, and so should have been shining, pretty much through the hall, and out the other side. Thinking that there may be something going on, there are occasionally demonstrations in the hall. We entered the building, and up the stairs. As we got to the top of the stairs, Stephen remarked he felt a bit funny, and I suddenly felt cold. The next thing we saw was a black blob, about a half a meter off the floor and about 1.5 meters tall, flow out of one door and into another. Stuart asked if anyone else had seen it, and we all said we had. Stuart then started to walk through down the corridor, very slowly, while Stephen and I stayed at the top of the stairs and were quite scared. Stuart looked around the corner and then ran back to us, we were so scared at this point that we just ran out and down the drive to the gate. Stuart told me later that he saw a figure about six foot tall that seemed to be made of shadows. He was dressed in a long coat and wore what looked like a top hat. He seemed to be looking for something and then it became aware of him. He told me much later, about ten years later, that it looked over its shoulder at him, and rather than a pair of eyes, it had a single red slit that seemed to pulse. I've been back to the hall since, and seen nothing out of the ordinary. However, I felt very uneasy about certain rooms. Oh well, there you go. I don't know if this qualifies as having a haunting or possession, or if I'm just crazy. I've read several stories on your site, which is great by the way, and haven't come across anything similar to one of my experiences, which I'll tell below. My father is suffering from advanced rheumatoid arthritis, along with hepatitis C. Not a good combination. Anyway. I've been living with the pain of knowing he would be sick and in pain for the rest of his life since I was 16, I'm now 22, and watching him suffer and struggle with his diseases. Because of this, I've become increasingly interested in whether or not there is another phase of existence after we leave this world. I've been asking, both mentally and out loud, for some type of proof of this mostly for my own comfort. Anyway, I've recently been hearing noises that sound like a lot of people talking at once in my house when I'm home alone. It doesn't bother me or scare me, and it's so faint that it could be my imagination. Along with this, I've heard walking on my ceiling. My rooms are in the finished basement. In thinking my fiancé was home, went upstairs to greet him only to find myself still alone in this very house. Since I've been asking for proof, I wonder if it's only my imagination, but this next part was scary. I heard the voices. Sounds like a crowd of people all talking at once, but this time I wasn't hearing them externally with my ears, originating from inside my head. I had this weird feeling that they were all talking directly to me, rather than just overhearing things like the other occasions. 
Anyway, the voices in my head just kept getting louder and louder. And all of a sudden, I was laughing uncontrollably for no reason. Probably doesn't sound too scary to you, but the whole time I was laughing, about five minutes, I was having thoughts like, why am I laughing? Why can't I stop laughing? There's nothing funny about this, and such. I was scared and physically willed myself to stop laughing, which didn't work. The voices started fading after about five minutes, and my laughing reduced to giggles, and then to shock silence. I've never told anyone about these things. I even think I sound crazy. And no, I was not on any mind-altering substances at the time this happened. Has the voices laughing thing happened to anyone else out there? Or am I just crazy? If this has happened to someone out there, please email me. Okay, I know there are skeptics out there, but my grandmother, my mom, and I are very in tune with our spirits for some reason. I'll start with my grandparents, babysitting ghosts. We call them that because only kids could see them if all the adults were out of the house. To explain the house a bit, the hallway is L-shaped. There's a bathroom to your immediate right, then two bedrooms, bedrooms one and two, on your left. When you turn the corner, there's a bedroom, number three on your left, another bathroom on your right, and the last bedroom, number four, at the end of the hall. My mom's dad was at work, and her mom and all my mom's brothers and sisters were outside, talking to friends and such. My mom was just sitting and watching TV. As my mom was watching TV, she saw something moving out of the corner of her eye and looked down the hallway from the living room. There was a very tiny old man sitting in a rocking chair, reading a book and looking up at her from time to time. She said he just smiled at her and kept rocking and reading. When the adults came back into the house, he disappeared. Two of my cousins have seen him also. The one thing that totally freaked us out was after my mom and I moved in with my grandparents. My Uncle Kay had died in the first bedroom about a year before. He was really into drinking and drugs, so one night his heart, liver, and kidneys just failed on him. He was the practical joker of the family. Anyhow, my mom and I came home one night. My grandparents were out. We both had to use the bathroom really bad. So my mom ran to the first one, and I went to the second one at the end of the hallway. All of a sudden, I heard my mom yell, Hey! I was about to open the door to ask why she was yelling when I saw a hand open the bathroom door. I hurried up and finished my business and ran to my mom and asked her what happened. Why did she open the door to the bathroom and not tell me what she needed? Then I realized she was still in the bathroom. She said she saw a hand opening her bathroom door. I told her I saw the same thing. We're the only people in this house, and this happened on the opposite ends of the house. She just looked up at the ceiling and said, Kay, stop scaring us. We don't want to play with you right now. Your jokes aren't funny. We heard the most evil laugh we could imagine. At that point, we looked at each other and ran out of the house. When we came back, my grandparents were home and we sat my grandma down and told her what happened. She had to have the house blessed three times before the spirits went away. I was visiting some relatives in Denton, Texas in early July of this year when this strange event took place. My relatives live in a trailer park and some of the trailers are sitting close together. One late night when I was there, 
My nephew left his cigarettes in his car, so we went out to get them. I went with him. As we were walking to his car, we noticed that next door, there was someone rummaging around in a trash can that was in the back of the neighbor's trunk. We thought nothing of it, thinking it was just one of the neighbors looking for something they threw away. As it was dark near where the vehicles were parked, we couldn't make out who it was. Well, my nephew got his cigarettes out of his car, and we were walking to the front of his trailer, where there is a bench you can sit on. We were walking towards it, when we noticed whoever it was that was walking through the garbage can was now walking up to the next door neighbor's porch, which was a good 20-30 feet from us. For whatever reason, just the sight of the person made both of us freeze while this figure just stood at the foot of the next door neighbor's porch steps with its back to us. It was almost as if this figure knew we were looking at it, but it wasn't even facing towards us. It just stood there, and we felt that somehow it was looking at us. Somehow. In the light of the porch lights, we could make out the details of this figure. The figure was of a small boy, but what was weird was that his head was shaven on both sides of his head, and in the middle was a blonde mohawk type haircut, except it wasn't the short type, but more of the longer hairstyle mohawk. His kid had 80 style clothes on, the short, multicolored and unbuttoned, light blue shorts and white tennis shoes. This kid just stood there for a few moments and began ascending the next door neighbor's steps in a stiff, awkward way. Its arms were close to its sides, and as it went up the steps, it just continued staring straight ahead, not once looking down or in any other direction. Then, the view of the kid was obstructed by the neighbor's porch, so we could no longer see him. The weird thing is, we never heard the next door neighbor's front door open or anything that would indicate this person went in. My nephew and I, very unnerved and chilled, ran into his parents' trailer. We sat in his living room for a while, trying to rationalize what we had seen. He told me that the neighbors had two girls, but looked nothing like what we had seen. We asked my nephew's mother, my sister, if she knew if the neighbors had some relatives over, and if so, if they had a boy that looked like what we described. She said, not that she knew of. Well, the next day, we go over to the neighbor's trailer and ask them if they had anyone over that looked like what we saw. They said no, we've had no visitors in two weeks, and no, we have no boys or children like what you described. My nephew and I then noticed their two girls in the living room. We confirmed that that was the only children they had. So, who or what could have been? Where did it go? We didn't hear it go in the neighbor's home that night. So maybe it was just the strange neighborhood kid and went through their backyard to where they were going. Well, that would have been very difficult since the neighbors have one of those extremely high wooden fences with no doors on it in their backyard. Besides, why would it go through the trouble of going up into their porch when they could have gone around? It's an old trailer park and there's no telling how many people have lived and died in a lot of those trailers. I'm just glad I don't live there. Something and everything about this is strange. And what we saw that night, I know in my heart that it was not normal, but paranormal. I'm just glad the figure never turned around to look at us. I don't know what would have happened then. I'd hate to find out. My name is Paul, and I live in Canada, in the province of Nova Scotia, in a small city called Sydney. This small city was at one time an industrial center, with coal mines and a large steel plant that employed thousands. This area's past employment promises has drawn in many foreigners to settle here, 
and we have a rich history of superstitions and beliefs. I should say that I'm not exactly a believer in ghosts, although I have an open mind to the idea that there may be something to it at all. Anyway, on with my story. I think I was 17 or 18 when this happened, which was around 1987. I was working for my local McDonald's restaurant and was working until 2 a.m. It was shortly after midnight when I took a break and called my girlfriend to say goodnight. As we talked, she stopped to see if someone had come down the stairs from the second level of her parents' home because she thought she had heard footsteps. She checked the stairs twice, but nobody was there. The conversation turned to the fact that at times, she would hear sounds in the house as though someone was walking the stairs. Our topic then returned to the normal teenage babble until she happened to look into the adjacent room. She thought she saw someone sitting at the end of the sofa. She put the phone down momentarily while she turned on the light in the darkened room. It was only a sweater and a jacket laid over the backrest of the sofa, so we resumed our conversation once again. I can tell you, that she had no thoughts of anything paranormal. She was thinking that maybe someone else was home, other than her sleeping parents, as she had a number of older brothers still living at home. I can remember that as we talked, she stopped dead in mid-sentence and started to weep. I was wondering what was wrong, thinking that I had said something to upset her. When I got her to speak, she told me that there was someone there, standing in the doorway of the room where she had just been. She sobbed that she was trying to sit very still in the hopes that this apparition would not see her and just go away. I tried to talk to her and settle her down, not quite sure if this was a joke or not. I think that the figure stood in this position for at least five minutes. Then, just when my terrified girlfriend calmed down a little, the figure moved into the hallway and assumed a sitting position, legs crossed. I again had to try and calm her down by talking to her and asking her to describe what she was seeing. The figure, she said, appeared to be a boy of about 8 or 10 years old. He was wearing a modern looking winter jacket and a winter hat. She said that although the facial features were not plain, the eyes could be clearly seen and were blue. The hands and feet area of the figure faded out of sight. This boy sat on the floor, not 10 feet from her, and looked right at her. Another minute or two passed, and then my girlfriend started weeping again. I remember her whispering, Oh, Paul, it's a girl. She told me that the figure had reached up and pulled a hat off its head and the long blonde hair flowed from under it. The figure sat and stared in my girlfriend's direction a few minutes more, and then appeared to stand up and go back into the room where it came and disappeared. My girlfriend stayed on the phone just long enough to be sure it was gone. Then she hung up with me and ran for her parents' bedroom. That was the end of the experience and had lasted about 15 minutes. She asked her parents the next day if they could think of who this may have been. They had no ideas and probably didn't believe her. I wasn't quite sure if I believed her either, and I kept asking her if she was playing a joke on me. She insisted she saw what she saw, and she wasn't comfortable talking about it for fear that it may reappear. I'm now married to my girlfriend, and she still swears every word of this is true. She still doesn't like to talk about it. No one has ever seen a ghost in that house before or since that I'm aware of. My wife over the years has gotten spooked and came running to me saying that she felt uneasy and was afraid she was bad, but she hasn't been. I don't know if you respond to these letters or not, but if you do, Write me a note to tell me what you think. Thank you for reading.
This actually began here in Lazuka, the capital of Zambia, back in 1983 when I was a young girl of five. For some reason, I always woke at 3am on the dot whilst living at our home at the time and found myself walking down the hallway. We had security lights in the garden, therefore shadows would play off trees, bushes and windows onto the interior walls of the house like a Russian puppet show. With a security guard present each night, I would think the shadowy shape of a man appearing or disappearing suddenly was simply that, our guard doing the rounds. It wasn't until one final night, after my usual check of the houses, I was walking back to my room when I just felt something behind me. Wish I had it, because the shadowy figure of a man was right behind me, away from the walls and lights, but very distinctive. I was scared, but to be honest, looking back now, cannot even remember feeling evil, just curiosity. A few months after, I started experiencing visions and dreams. I would start having a dream of a little funny white man standing in my doorway, looking at me with a mean little grin on his face. Then, he would walk off in the direction of my brother's room, whereby I once woke up to hear my brother screaming for my mom, saying there was something in his room. This experience happened only once, but the dreams of this little man continued. When we moved to the UK in 1986, my final experience occurred with this man. I heard my name being called from downstairs when I reached the top of the stairs from my bedroom, looking down into the pitch black and feeling utter malevolence directed at me. I couldn't see anything, but it was the same sensation I feel when dreaming of the white man. Let's just say at the age of 11, I had the good sense not to investigate. After that, I stopped experiencing a little white man, but I feel I became susceptible to other things from then on. Our house in the UK is set on what was once the Bean Oak Estate Farm. It's said that a mass grave of 1800s cholera victims lies within the vicinity of our estate, which could explain the experience, and not just for me. Our cat would get spooked, and my mother was terrified one night. Our cat would suddenly sit up and stare at the corner of the room, or the doorway, or an armchair, and suddenly start to growl and raise his hackle. Then he would move his head as though watching something walk through the room. It frightened me one night, when he sat up from my lap and dug his claws into my thighs. The growling reached a crescendo, as though he was going into battle with another Tom. I got so spooked, I left the room and went upstairs. My cat had left by the cat flap into the night. He wouldn't come back until the morning. What really spooked me the most was, this also happened during the day when February morning. I can handle the nighttime frights because of the sense of normality when the sun rises. When you are invaded during the day, all your security is shattered. My brother and I both experienced what is now learned a sleep paralysis event at exactly the same time, one night. Both of us also witnessed just before a sudden flash of brilliant blue. For two people of differing sexes to experience exactly the same time makes it disturbing and we still discuss it today. My other experience of sleep paralysis was when I was fully awake. Lying on my tummy reading a book on my bed, I suddenly had the overwhelming terror swamp me from my feet upwards and I couldn't move. Then, at the foot of my bed, I could feel as though someone was taking a step onto the mattress between both feet. When I could finally move, I turned around to see an indentation of a foot where the sensation was. 
Thank you for taking your time to read my experiences, if that is all I can call them. I did have one other experience, but it's too terrifying to write down, and causes me fear, even to this day. When I was six or seven months pregnant with my son Anthony, I had a terrifying nightmare. I believe this nightmare was a portal to the afterlife, that what I saw was in fact a ghost trying to communicate with me. Every night I would sleep with the bedroom door half open and also had the hallway light on just because of the weird and bizarre events that would occur in this old home. I'd always thought I'd hear laughter during the day, sounds of doors opening and closing, and other little things that made me convinced my house was haunted. One evening, I swore I saw a small dark shadow figure float into the kitchen from my bedroom. It happened so fast, I didn't have much time to process it. My nightmare was very similar to this experience. I was convinced that I woke up in my bed before, at least at the time I thought I was conscious. I was glued to my bed, couldn't move at all, virtually paralyzed. I started hearing strange noises, like a gargling coming from the hallway outside of my room. I remember struggling to open and close my eyes. All of a sudden, I was able to focus my eyes and move my head where I could see that the door was open. I saw this little girl standing in my doorway. She was a black shadow from five feet away from my bed. She approached closer to me, all while I was still paralyzed and couldn't move. The black shadow whispered, don't be scared, I'll be home soon. That's when I woke up, sweating and screaming. Even after realizing it was a nightmare, I could still feel the presence of the shadow in that house. The same girl from my nightmare. I thought it was a bit ridiculous, because I knew at that point, my mind had just conjured this up in my head, even with all the previous signs of ghostly activity. What's even weirder, a few days after I received a call from my sister, she was very emotional because she announced to me that she was having a child. The reason why my sister was so emotional was because she had tried for years and years to have children, and she was never able to. Her doctor even told her that she was never going to be able to produce a child. I bet you the shadow from my nightmare came back as her living child. I was never able to find out the history of this house or who lived there, but I can bet you that the little girl used to, and she told me that she was coming back to life. I've noticed that you don't have any ghosts listed for the University of Calgary residences in Calgary, Alberta. I had a strange experience in the residence tower called Randall Hall. I'll give you some brief information. There are two identical towers plus some apartment-style residences that were built in the late 1960s when the university was founded. They are both seven stories tall, with a central communal lounge and three hallways radiating out like spokes. Each hallway has 11 rooms and a bathroom. Originally, they were built as a female dorm and a male dorm. I spent three years of my university living in Randall Hall. The room that I shared with my roommate was in the co-ed hallway of the 6th floor of Randall. This kind of applies because we shared all facilities with guys. Toilet stalls, urinals, sinks, and showers were all communal. Think Allie McBeal. And we often had guys hang out in our room. Let's just say that there were quite a few of us engineers on that floor. I started the year living in room 661. One night, I awoke frequently, and I could have sworn that there was someone in my room, sitting in the chair in my roommate's desk. I passed it off as being asleep, 
But the next day I did ask my roommate, were there any people in our room last night? All she said was, yeah, I thought that one of the guys had come in during the night. Weird. Anyway, a little later in the year, I moved into room 557 on the same side of the hallway, two doors down. We started noticing that in the common room, which was a large open area in the center of the spokes, one of the elevators would often come up to our floor on its own accord, open, close, and then go back down to the main floor. Sometimes it would stay on our floor with the door open for almost an hour before going back down. My real experience came during reading break. I guess your guys equivalent to spring break, only we have ours in early to mid February and most people leave because the skiing's awesome in the Rockies, only a few hours away. In our hallway, the only people not gone was me, my roommate, the girls across the hall, and the girl at the end of the hall, on our side by the fire escape. To start my real story, I'll give you guys a little explanation about how our room was laid out. If you walk into the door from the hallway, there is a closet on each side that extends about two feet into the room that goes all the way to each wall, no doors in the closets. The room is approximately square. My roommate's bed was against the left wall, with her desk against the window, directly across the door, and the chair between her headboard and the desk. My bed was against the window, with the headboard against the right wall with my desk along the right wall. I awoke one night because I swore that the door to our room had opened and that one of the guys from the guy's wing had come in. He had gone on a date that night and was a close friend. I looked over at my roommate's bed and it looked like this guy was whispering something to her. I found it kind of creepy though that instead of crouching by her bed like a normal person would do, he was standing with his legs straight, bent at the waist, with his face about two inches from hers. Now, I got kind of pissed off because it was the middle of the night and this guy had come in to tell Lauren about his date. I wanted to see what time it was, so I sat up in bed so I could see her on my desk to my alarm clock, which was on a dresser in the closet. It was 2.30ish in the morning. So I turned my head to yell, or whisper strongly at this guy. Then I realized it wasn't who I thought it was. This is the creepy part. He stayed bent over my roommate in the same position, but slowly turned his head to look at me. While he was turning his head, this grin spread across his face. One could interpret this grin as malevolent. I sure did at the time. Then he slowly stood straight up and took a few steps backward towards the closet, folded his arms across his chest, and looked at me with the same scary grin on his face. It was strange because really, he had no facial features. Nothing of a face that I could see except for this grin that I could more sense than see. Well, that was enough for me. Like any 20 going on 6 year old, I dove beneath the covers of my bed and stayed there all night. This was very hard to do since the heating is very efficient in those buildings and most of the rooms are usually hot enough to be in shorts and tanks in. Anyway, I didn't sleep again that night. After a week or so, thinking about this experience, having insomnia, and sleeping with the light on, I have second thoughts on what was going on there. I think that yes, he was intentionally trying to scare someone, but only out of a sense of fun because he knew he could. I think he had my roommates in his target sites, and he had his face by my roommates, waiting for her to wake up with this ghost face two inches from hers. Well. You could wake my roommate up with a cherry bomb when she's sleeping 
never mind waking to a ghostly presence like so many of us do. Instead I woke up and his grin was more of a, finally, someone's awake that I can scare grin. So that was it, other than the knocking, which is actually quite funny. It was about two days after my experience, when all three of our rooms got simultaneous knocks at 5.30 in the morning. My roommate got up to answer the door, and scared the crap out of both her and the girl, directly across from her, by opening the door at the exact same time. Also, the girl at the end of the hall had her head out of the door, asking if someone had knocked. There was no one in the hall, and no way someone could have left without us hearing. The door into the central common room was on a mnemonic hinge, and made a whining noise when you opened it. The door to the fire escape, at the other end, makes a crap load of noise, which echoes through the floors. The door to the bathroom also has a mnemonic hinge, and bangs when it closes. Anyway, to close this outrageously long story out, I worked for housekeeping during the summer because the residents are rented out like hotel rooms. I didn't go back home in the summer. I was talking with the cleaner from the sixth floor while doing laundry one day. She related that she has had experiences with this guy over the last few years. She was cleaning a room after move out and had the door propped open with the garbage can. A guy poked his head around the door, looked her in the eye, kicked the garbage out from in front of the door, and slammed it. There was no one there when she went to look. There are rumors that a guy got really stressed out during exams in the 80s and threw himself off the roof into the parking lot. I've not substantiated these claims, so who knows. I do know that the roofs are now off limits to students, whereas they weren't in the past. The cleaner says that he is quite shy and has only seen during summer, Christmas, on reading breaks, never when the residences are filled with people. This isn't the first time I've told someone this. Normally people don't believe me because I'm only 14, but I swear that everything I'm about to say is the honest truth. My first experience happened six years ago. My friend was sleeping over at mine. We couldn't sleep, so we were just talking in the dark. Well, it wasn't that dark because I had the curtains open. I remember it being a few minutes past midnight. I also remember thinking my friend had stood up because there was a shadow on the wall opposite us, but she was still lying down, but she too had seen the shadow. It had no features and was only head and shoulders. It was where my light switch was. We both looked outside to see if anyone was there, nothing. So we started to really freak out and closed the curtains as quick as possible. And when we reopened them a few seconds later, it was gone. I have no explanation for this. I definitely wasn't dreaming and neither of us had imagined it. Later on that year, I was alone in the house watching a video. I stopped the video to get something to eat downstairs. When I came back, the video had been took out from my video player and was on my bed. My next experience happened maybe about five or four years ago. I was on the computer and I was the only one in the house as my brother was out and my mom and dad were out working. I didn't have any music on at the time and the TV wasn't on either. Basically, things were silent. I heard this voice coming from downstairs calling my name. It was definitely a woman's voice. Maybe in her late 20s, I wasn't sure at this time. I really started to freak out. It lasted for around five minutes and then it stopped. The next couple of times I heard it really scared me. The last time I heard it, I was home alone again, 
the TV was on mute, and I was on the computer again. The voice came from right next to me. It shouted my name into my ear. It shocked me so badly that I actually screamed so loud that the people next door heard me. Since then, I haven't heard it, but recently, I've been hearing music playing in and outside of my house. Also recently things keep happening in my room, like I keep feeling cold spots, and a lot of the time, I feel like I'm not the only one in the room. It's really scary. Plus, my TV has been on mute or changed channels when I'm nowhere near the remote. It scares me a lot. It shook me up so bad that I hate being alone in the house. This occurred roughly 20 years ago when I was 19 or 20, and I was sleeping over at my boyfriend's apartment in Spring Valley, California. My boyfriend left for work by 4 a.m., and I was alone in the apartment. This one morning after he left, I awoke on my back to a heaviness in the room. It was still dark, but becoming dawn. I looked to my right, and standing next to me by the bed was this tall black shrouded shadow entity. I was terrified. I could feel its presence surrounding me. Then, it spoke. I was lying there wide-eyed and in shock. I am not still sure how I heard it. Was it audible or just in my head? The voice was deep and gruff and asked, what are you doing here? I am familiar with some experiences with the paranormal, just never had it been so terrifying. I closed my eyes and began the Lord's Prayer. By the last words, deliver me from evil, amen. The room had cleared. I felt the change immediately, and when I reopened my eyes, all was normal again. I told my boyfriend later that day, and he thought it was his deceased grandfather being curious. My boyfriend's grandma was recently staying with him, and she would tell him stories of the grandfather visiting her. Possible, I guess, but I still wonder what the black shrouded entity was, and what its intentions were. For many years, I had a great cat named Kitty. Kitty didn't like many people. She mainly only liked me. She always slept up against my legs at night, on the outside of the covers. She loved to be close to me. After she died, I was absolutely miserable. I missed her so much. After a few days, I started getting a glimpse of her walking around the house out of the corner of my eye. I didn't say anything to anyone for a while. One day, my aunt said that she didn't realize that we had gotten another cat after Kitty had died. I told her that we didn't have any other cats, or any other pets for that matter. She was absolutely convinced that she had seen a cat walk across the doorway in our living room. One night, just as I was going to sleep, I felt Kitty jump up onto the bed and cuddle up against me. I could feel her pressing up against my legs. I tried my best to convince myself that it was just my imagination, but my husband felt her jump onto the bed also. Over the years, she has gradually stopped coming around us so much. She still shows up whenever I am upset or sick. I guess she just likes to comfort me just like she did when she was alive. Hello. I grew up in an old apartment building in the Fordham Hill section of the Bronx. When I was about 14 years old, I was speaking on the telephone to my best friend, who lived upstairs on the fifth floor of the building. My apartment was on the second floor. My friend said that she was going to go down to my apartment in a few minutes. 
As soon as I hung up the telephone, there was a knock on the door. I wondered how my friend could have possibly made it down three flights of stairs so quickly. As we hung up the phone that second, I went to the door and looked out of the people to see if it was her. There, at the door, stood a tall young looking man, wearing a ruffled white shirt, a thick black belt, black pants, and black boots that went almost to his knees. Hanging from the side of his belt was a sword or a saber. As I stared at him, it appeared as though he was looking right at me with piercing blue eyes, even though the door was between us. I then noticed that I could see the number on the apartment door across from mine through his shirt. I quickly ran from the door, realizing what I had seen, thoroughly frightened, and called my friend, asking her to hurry and calm down as I was alone in the house. I will never forget it for as long as I live. I did some research and learned that there was revolutionary battles on in a mug for damn hill. I came to the conclusion that the ghost was a revolutionary war soldier, probably British from the clothing. I only wish I could learn more. Nothing occurred for the rest of the time that I lived in that apartment. Thanks for having a great site where people can share their experiences. Like a lot of people, I've had friends and family members pass away. One of my best friends was John, who died from pancreatic cancer while still in his early 30s. Many years later, I started a habit while praying. I asked God to help me always remember my friends and family who have passed away, who influenced me, and who are a big part of my life. Then I think of their names and say them silently in prayer. About a year ago, our friend and family priest passed away, and I attended the funeral mass. As I was kneeling in the pews, I felt someone beside me. I looked to my right, and there, plain as day, was John. He was there for only two, maybe three seconds, and then disappeared. I shook my head and looked again, but he was gone. I hadn't thought about John at all that day, and I may never know why he decided to show himself. I know that God puts people into your life for a reason, and I know that even after they are gone, they are always with you. I love you, brother. Thanks for the visit. I met my first ghost when I was four years old in the bathroom of the first house I can clearly remember living in, and ever since then, I've been chased by them. The first ghost was a young boy in overalls and a button-down shirt and a straw hat. He looked to be about six years old, and didn't do anything except stand there in the bathroom watching as I brushed my teeth. He appeared there several times over the next few months until my family moved to a house just up the road. In the new house, which was the same property, I never felt comfortable. Sometimes at night, I woke up hearing someone call my name, but the voice was unfamiliar. I was always too afraid to get out of bed and assumed that if it was my mother or father calling me, they would come to get me. The house was always cold, as I'm told newly built houses usually are for a while. But even years after I moved in, there was always a chill in the air that neither the electric heat nor the wood-burning stove could chase away. Even in the summer, the first time anything appeared to me in that house, I was seven and my brother Josh was a few months old. His crib was kept in my room and I was always the first to wake up when he was crying. One night, in March, when Josh was five months old, he was crying and he woke me. I sat up in bed and waited for mom to come in and get him. 
and as I looked out my bedroom window, I saw something silvery and translucent standing on the railing of the deck on the back of the house. As my eyes came into focus, I made out the vague figure of a heavy set woman with a little boy in her arms. The same little boy who had appeared to me in the bathroom of the old house three years before. She extended her arms and held them, dangling from her hands, and then let them go. I quickly closed my eyes, not wanting to see what happened. I heard the sound of a child crying. I covered my hand with my pillow and tried to go back to sleep. Through the rest of my childhood, there were many more experiences of this type. I saw male ghost that I presumed to be the father of the little boy ghost, a much younger little girl ghost, and an older girl who had a distressed look about her, as if she had been through something terrible. Her clothes were ragged and torn up and appeared to be stained with something dark. I speculated that it might have been blood, and every year, on the night of August 1st, I lie awake at night, listening to the sounds of children screaming. I gave up trying to explain the sights and sounds to my parents, who just laughed at me. Their excuses for not believing me went from inadequate to just ridiculous. At one point, when I was 11 or 12 years old, they told me ghosts don't haunt new houses because they can't make enough noise. All that changed when I was 15. My mom and I were up late watching a movie after she had come in from work. Around 2 a.m., she drifted off to sleep and I went to the kitchen for a glass of water. When I came back, she was sitting bolt upright on the couch where she had been lying asleep. Her eyes were wide and fearful, and she was pointing at the front window. I followed her gaze, and in the light on the front porch, I saw the shadow of a man hanging from a rope. Together, Mom and I opened the front door to investigate, but nothing was there. Mom was proactive. She began researching the farm we lived on, desperate to find any reason for the hauntings we were experiencing. In the meantime, I experienced more and more alarming sightings. I found old toys under my bed, ragdolls with button eyes that were pulled loose, and wooden pop guns and handmade bears, all of them dirty and obviously ancient. The two small children kept appearing wherever I was, calling my name and tugging on my clothes. The most frightening thing happened a few weeks before I left for college. I was packing up my books and CDs and felt an unwelcome chill. It was early August again, about the same time I always had the most intense experiences. I stood up and moved the box I was packing, and when I turned around, I saw a large man in the corner of my room. He was different from any of the other ghosts I had seen, with a darker coloring and sharper more defined details. He was wearing dark clothes and had his back turned towards me. I looked closely and saw that there was someone with him, so when he backed into the corner, the older girl from the family ghost I had been seeing for years. He was harming her, though I couldn't tell if he was just beating her or trying to mess with her or what. But she was crying and screaming, and it was absolutely bone chilling. As I stood there in the room watching, the other male ghost came into the room holding an axe and approached the other two in the corner. I couldn't watch and ran out of the room. Over the next few years, my mother documented everything she had seen and heard in this house, ranging from the same sorts of things I had seen to some even more aggressive appearances. One day in early August, a couple of years after I left for college, she was in the barn watering the horses and tripped over an axe. Later that same year, she was cleaning out the basement and came across a rope that none of our family had put there. Her research on the farm in the original house that stood on the land 
revealed that it had once belonged to a wealthy family named Hawkins. The father, Thomas, was convicted in 1893 of the murder of a young man named James Logan after discovering him and his daughter's Francine's bedroom. Thomas was put to sleep later that year. His wife Josephine and their two young children were killed during a tornado in March of the next year, and the property was sold at an auction the following August, a year after the murder of James Logan. I've seen and heard ghosts for many years, ever since I was a small child. These are a series of ghost stories that you probably haven't heard. Forgive me, the formatting is a little different, and it's scattered, and the writing isn't very good, but I think you'll get the gist of it. This one occurred in Elon Road, Croydon, Surrey. That's England. My mother saw and heard a little boy walking up the road and singing. He then walked up a pile of sand and disappeared through a wall in a different city in Surrey. I saw two ghosts there next to the chalk pits. The first appeared and disappeared and was an old man in brown. The second was younger and he appeared and disappeared twice before my eyes. Two people walking towards me walked right through him and didn't see him at all. It was very eerie. My sister and I saw the apparition of a man in dark clothes and wearing a hat standing in our bedroom. The room was cold and eerie. We were both very frightened. Several months later, my sister saw a girl with a Scotty dog come in the front door and walk up the stairs. There was nobody there when she went to investigate. In this next small tale, this event occurred in Eversfield's old people's home. It's in Surrey. In the caretaker's house, and in the house next door, there were noises heard when nobody was around. Blood dripping through the ceiling onto mirrors, which could never be cleaned. They also heard the sounds of coat hangers being rattled about next door when nobody was in the house. Doors would open and shut violently. A bed moved away from the wall, silently, while the room was full of people. You could also hear the sounds of women's voices downstairs, of laughter and chatter. When you open the door to listen, it then goes silent. The lights swing violently as though there is a strong wind, but there is no wind to be seen or felt for that matter. At the Rygate Parish School, now converted into houses and flats, the sounds of children playing and talking can be heard. I don't mean the voices of the children while they're still in school. By the time they leave, after hours, you could hear the voices of children still ringing. People have also reported piano playing as well, as well as a tambourine. When they go to open the door, the playing stops, but the piano is reverberating. On the road of Wallfield Annex, where I get road, there is an extremely haunted house now, also converted to flats. The ghost of a man in period costume stands at the window on a full moon. I've had the privilege of staying the night at these flats before, and let me tell you, the ghost is a real thing. He's aware that you are watching him, and each night he gets closer to your bed. One night, he was peering into my face, and he winked at me before disappearing. Apparently, the house was owned by artists who liked to paint by the light of the moon, which may explain the haunting. There were times where my daughter had certain experiences as well. My daughter told me that she had a friend, a child, who visited her at night and stood at the end of the bed. Obviously, she's referring to a ghost. This house is a Gregorian mansion, and you can feel its history. It's a very spiritual house. 
I often dream of this house. Perhaps my spirit is there, even in life. Anyway, that's all my stories that I have to share. I work really early in the morning, so by the time I get off work and head home, I'm really tired. I was sneaking in a nap before my husband came home. I've seen some unexplained things when I was younger, but I've never had this happen to me. This was in my parents' basement because at that time, my husband and I were building a home. When I think about it, the dogs never came down in the room. They hated it down there. Anyways, like I said, I was taking a nap. I remember waking up in complete horror. I was being attacked. By this I mean, this shadow figure was trying to get at me while I was asleep. It started at the foot of my bed, and I was kicking my feet at it to get away from me. It then moved up right next to me. I could feel it trying to touch me, and that horrified me. Something about this thing was not right. I was still kicking my legs at it. I remember thinking in my head, no, no. I then sat up straight in bed and looked around. Nothing was there. My heart was pounding and I was sweating. I didn't know what to think. I still don't. I wasn't fully awake during this fight to keep the shadow away from me. I guess I could have been dreaming, but it felt so real. Living with a ghost is not all that bad, as my family and I have found out. We moved to our home in the Skyland Estates in 1991. At the time, we had our three and one year old boys living at home. We started to get clues that something unruly was living with us. When my wife and I started to hear our three-year-old talking to someone in his bedroom, he told us that it was an older lady that came to talk to him. He stayed in that room for three years until he moved him to another room and put his younger brother in that room. The same thing started happening with the other brother. We have two younger kids who also stayed in that room once, and they all reported that an old lady had visited them. Oftentimes, the lady would speak through them. The kids would call her Miss G. Miss G would also make herself known to my wife and I. She was very active any time we made improvements to our home. She would come and watch us, often from the closet, as we would consistently hear and see the closet door open. One time, my wife even swore that she saw a floating face there as she was cleaning. When we were working on the house, we would also feel as though a hand was placed in our bodies. At this moment, we'd also feel a draft of cold come in. When I was working alone, I'd feel the hand again thinking that this time it was my wife. I would stop to say something, look over my shoulder, and there would be nobody there. This happens to my wife too. She would think I was touching her as well. I saw Miss G once in 1993. I was sitting in the living room late at night. I remember I had the doors leading to the living room closed. A short moment later, I heard what I thought was the sound of my wife walking behind the door. I turned to look back and saw the silhouette of a figure walk by. I immediately went to open the door and look for my wife. When I saw a figure move quickly from the hallway into the kitchen, then turned the corner. It happened so fast and it spooked me. That's when my wife walked through the front door. She had been shopping. That's when I suddenly realized that this was the presence of Miss G that was making herself known to me. Even though it spooked me, I don't think she meant any harm by it. As if to say sorry, I'm just passing through here. 
My wife has had many interactions with her in the kitchen while cooking. She would set the table and ask her to move a plate. The plate would move slightly forward on its own. Not a big movement, but enough to let her know she was there. After these encounters, we did some research about who our ghostly ghost really was. We found out that an older lady had the house built as her dream home to retire in. Unfortunately, she passed away only a day after she moved in. There was another homeowner who bought the house before us. They only lived there for a month before moving out to live with their kids. I really don't think Miss G is a threat to us, but I believe when we do eventually move from this house, we'll miss her presence, even if it's a bit scary at times. My name is Stacy, and I reside in Brownsville, Texas, approximately two minutes from the International Bridge into Mexico. What I'm about to tell you it's something that happened to me when I was in the third grade and haven't been able to forget since then. I'm now 25. I remember very distinctly that it was Halloween night and my brother, father and I had just returned from a night of trick or treating. It was almost midnight when my parents sent us to bed, worried we wouldn't wake up in time for school the next day. At this time, being so young and so close to the border, I shared a room with my nanny. We slept on two twin beds. Mine was situated right under a window to my left, and my feet pointed towards an adjoining room. We called the laundry room, that also doubled as a closet. There was a window in there as well, which illuminated to little room, with light from the moon in conjunction with the street lamps. At this time, our house didn't have central air, so we slept with the windows open and a floor oscillating fan. I'd been asleep for a while, and I woke up because I felt hot and looked at the fan as the blades had a tendency to jam. As I had suspected, the fan wasn't working, and I stared at the ceiling, contemplating going to the kitchen for a glass of water. While doing so, I happened to glance into the closet, and standing in front of the washer was the figure of a man dressed all in black and wearing some type of hat, a fedora maybe. Also, his face was not visible to me at all, and all I could see was the black underneath his hat. He was chuckling, but at the same time, I thought it was the most horrifying noise in the world. He started to talk very casually about how he was going to get me and my family. I snapped and finally I realized that this wasn't supposed to be happening. He wasn't supposed to be there. Where was his face? I jumped up from the bed and sprinted to the door, hoping at the same time, not wanting anything to be able to reach out and grab me. I could still hear him laughing and I felt him getting closer. By the way, when he said all those things to me, it was like a telepathic thing. I don't know if you understand that, but that's the best way I can describe it. I then noticed a faint banging that kept getting louder as I got closer to the door. I then realized it was my brother banging on his wall. That was when I realized that I was screaming at the top of my lungs. I reached the door and no matter how hard I pulled on it, it wouldn't open. I also tried turning on the lights. I had a dimmer and I kept turning the knob, but it wouldn't turn on. Suddenly, my nanny woke up and yelled at me to stop screaming and asking me what was wrong. Was I crazy? Then, just as suddenly as it had began, the laughing and the whispering and everything else stopped. The door opened and the light turned on. My parents had no idea what was going on because their room was at the other side of the house. My nanny still tells me that I was white as a ghost 
and as soon as she touched me, I fainted. Needless to say, I was not able to go to school the next day. When I was about seven years old, I can remember this very strange house in West Virginia I used to live in. First, it started with my brothers and sisters and I. We all had one bedroom upstairs we slept in, and one night, waking up, I saw a strange figure of a little child by our bed. I recall turning the opposite way and holding on to my older sister. Being that age, I never thought nothing of it until about eight years later my family and I moved out and we were talking about how nice it was to live there and my mother and father were telling us that we only knew the strange things that they had seen and heard. My father said he woke up one night seeing a little child and thinking it was one of us and he said go back to bed. The figure never moved so we sat up from the bed realizing it was a shadow figure and not one of us and when we went to wake my mother up, it was gone. And other times, here my mother would get up in the middle of the night and see that figure all the time, thinking it was okay, nothing bad was really happening. A few months after that, he heard loud noises, like a baby crying. He said it sounded like it was coming from the wall. My father would really have loved to know about the spirits my mother really wants to move. It's funny when you are little, you really don't know what's going on. When I was little, I used to play outside a lot. In my country, the weather is really, really hot. So hot that if you stay under the sun for five minutes and then go back inside, your head hurts and you will see lights everywhere for a while anyway. I always used to see figures that those lights would make, but I wasn't scared at all because I knew that the sun was making them. One day, I was outside playing with my brother, but it wasn't as hot to make your head hurt or see figures and lights. I saw the shape of a black dog walking or going somewhere, and then it disappeared. Well, the dog wasn't walking, he was just going somewhere. The figure was not perfectly clear to say that it was definitely a dog, but it really looked like one. And once I saw it, I didn't say anything because I was used to seeing things because of the strong sun. But as soon as I saw it, it disappeared. My brother said, hey, did you see that figure of that black dog that went by and disappeared? I was shocked because I thought I was the only one that saw that thing. It was crazy. So that was a very strange experience. We both asked each other what the heck that was. We were very confused. I'm sure that the figure we saw was a ghost. When I was a small child, around seven or eight in the late 1950s, my parents took our family consisting of my sister and two families of cousins and all their parents, plus one grandmother, to the UP in Michigan. The reason being for this was, there weren't enough bedrooms downstairs in the rented cabin, circa 1920s. That's where all the adults slept, and all of us kids were put in the sleeping bags up in the loft. Not too much time after going to bed, I felt a heavy presence, and looked around to see if any of the cousins were feeling this, whatever it was. Alas, they were all sleeping soundly, except for me. After a while, I became very afraid, and a man's face appeared right above my sleeping bag, glowing like it was daytime. It was well after midnight. I remember seeing this face for a moment or two, before the face vanished entirely. I was so scared, I screamed in terror to leave me alone, waking up my family in the process. They asked me what the matter was, and I told them that I saw a face. They both tried to confront whatever it was, and told me that it was just my imagination, and that there was nobody there to scare me. 
All night long, I laid there frozen in my sleeping bag, unable to move. Years later, I returned to the same cabin. I was 18 years old now, and I was with a couple of friends. At this point, I'd become so fascinated with ghosts and the paranormal that I wanted to do some spirit sessions in the process. We ended up using a Ouija board to contact the spirits that I thought appeared to me years before as a kid. So, me and my friends began the Ouija board session. We began to ask it all sorts of questions and requested it do things for us. Things such as turning the lights on and off, knocking on the walls of the cabin, anything to get that extra confirmation. It wasn't until my friend James told me that he was getting bored of this because we weren't getting any answers and the Ouija board wasn't even moving the planchet. It almost seemed as if the spirit had completely left until late that night when we went to bed. There was a rocking chair in the cabin that had been left there for years. What my friend James saw next swears it was true. I'd fallen asleep and James had woken up to take a smoke break out on the front porch. The rocking chair was on the front porch. As James was smoking, he suddenly turns to face the rocking chair, and the chair literally rocked back and forth, as if someone was sitting there. This wouldn't stop for about 30 seconds, then it suddenly stopped. He called me over, and by the time I had a chance to witness it, the chair stopped. This was in the middle of the summer, and there was absolutely no wind. I believe James, because he had no reason to make up any stories about the rocking chair. I mean, to be honest, it wasn't like it was the most unbelievable thing that could happen to someone. Definitely creepy, considering what we were asking for hours before. I don't exactly remember when in our friendship James said this, but we made an agreement that one day, that if either of us passes on before the other, we would give each other another sign to yet again prove that ghosts in the afterlife is a real thing. Fast forward another 12 years, James unfortunately died in a car accident the year before. It was so devastating because he had just gotten married a month prior and had a baby on the way. I was very close to his family and we remained good buddies throughout his life. Creepily enough, I had a dream that I was in the same cabin and was again playing the Ouija board with James. I then remember the Ouija board suddenly disappearing. Then, we were sitting on the couch together, drinking beers and just hanging out. James looked at me and said, if you only knew. I asked what he meant. He then remarked, I wish I wasn't dead. I miss you guys so much. The dream ends, and I wake up with tears in my eyes. I've never had a dream about him after that. You may say that this was just my magic of mind making up a dream of us together because I was mourning. However, I took it as a sign that maybe James was telling me he was still around. This was the only sign I had gotten from him, as in the waking world, I've never had any. I've also been back to that same cabin for many years after, and I never saw the rocking chair move or that face ever again. Weird. I will start by telling a story that happened to me when I was about 13. It was very early in the morning, dark as a matter of fact. I was half asleep on the couch in my living room, just about to wake up. In the hallway from the kitchen, I heard a growl, then a scratching sound. This scratching turned into a tapping, like how a dog runs on a hard floor. This sound seemed to rush from the hallway closer to me, when all of a sudden, I feel something hit me as I try to wake up. What happened next can be explained as sleep paralysis, but instead of just the feeling of being pushed down, I felt as if my chest was being torn open 
and my sides were ripped apart. The growling was still present, along with my warmed voice trying to let out a scream. After I tried to put up a fight with whatever it was, a hallucination or some other being, I jumped back awake with tears dripping. My chest felt that pain for that entire day. The reason why I told this story, even though I'm not sure if it was a hallucination or not, is that it closely relates to another experience that happened not too long ago, almost a week actually. I was again half asleep in my bed, the same room where I've mentioned seeing a ghost lady at the foot of my bed and another experience I've emailed where I was practically having a nightmare. It was a strange nightmare where there were faceless beings surrounding me, ripping my body apart. It's a dream, so it's very hard to explain in words. Well, usually in nightmares, you widely awaken in fear before you go back to sleep. The most disturbing thing about this is, after I became widely awake, these same apparitions were still in my room, surrounding me, muttering and growling. I then closed my eyes, fell back on my pillow, and I let out a cry. I woke my mom up. She rushed in to see what was wrong, and she saw me laying there with my eyes wide open on my pale face. I felt sick for a week since that day. I thought hard about this occurrence when I realized that the sounds and feelings I've sensed from the first story were present in what happened in the second one. It's a rough connection, but I felt the very same emotions and I feel like there must be a connection. They both happen in my waking stage of sleep. The spirits, as I think they are, rush and attack towards the inside of the chest and are disturbingly similar. In any case, it's something I really want to look into. I've had plenty of people spend the night here, in the living room mostly, and hear strange noises coming from that branch of the house. My room, the hallway in the kitchen, are all in the same branch of the house, which is the newer addition to the old schoolhouse building. Some of my friends who have been here late at night have felt a strange presence from that hallway too. I know I felt it as a child. I remember trying to avoid that hallway for my life. I remember when I was a little girl my grandparents own a colonial farmhouse that had been standing for at least 150 years. My grandmother thought the house may have been used for the Underground Railroad, because it had a few little doors and rooms off some of the closets in the bedrooms and in the basement. I wasn't allowed to go into them because they didn't have electricity, and my grandmother was afraid that I would hurt myself. Members of my family said that I wouldn't want to go in them anyway, because there were ghosts in there. Of course, I didn't believe them. I thought they were just telling me this to scare me, as any seven-year-old would. But that was all going to change one night, when I spent the night there one night. I was staying in their guest room, which had one of those little rooms off the closet. The little room was probably for extra storage or maybe a staircase because the back was all boarded up. And late that night, I woke up because I thought I was being watched. I looked up and noticed that the closet door was open and a small figure was standing there, glowing bluish. I screamed and ran into my grandmother's room and wouldn't go back into that room. I never saw that figure again. But I did see another ghost of an elderly farmer on the property. I was nine this time and playing in the barn. I was upstairs in the hayloft, burrowing around in the hay, again, like I wasn't supposed to be. Again, I had that same feeling of being watched. I sat up and looked around and in the corner, an elderly farmer was standing and watching me. At first I thought it was my grandfather. But then I realized that his feet weren't touching the floor. As soon as I noticed this, I screamed and ran out of the barn. 
There have been many sightings of him since then, including one of my brothers seeing him floating outside of a second story window. This is an experience I've had repeatedly over the course of several years when I'm in bed for the night, just falling asleep. Still, to this day, it tries to return, but I've found ways to avoid it or fight it because it scares the heck out of me. It's almost as if it were a dream, but I'm not actually asleep when it happens. I feel as if it is when I'm on the verge of sleep but still almost awake, like just before your mind actually lets go and sleeps. There's a place in between, and it only lasts a second, but that's when this thing happens to me. I can only speak for myself. I don't know of anyone else who has experienced this, but I've heard stories. Also, whenever I remember this, it is always in slow motion. I feel as if it is something coming at me, from behind always, always towards my back. It's like a shadow, and it tries to suck me deeper into sleep, and if I don't fight it with all my might, I truly believe I'll never wake up again. While this is happening, I'm frozen and cannot move, yet I'm aware of my room. I'm aware of things around me and what is happening. I can even hear my TV. I can scream in my mind and barely hear it all come out of my own mouth. It takes all my might and effort to open my eyes. But once I get my eyes open, I can focus on things in my room, like my dresser or door, anything, and come out of it. But it is so strong, I sometimes feel I cannot make it, and that is why I believe I will never wake up. The entire time this is happening, I'm frozen to my bed and cannot move. Please note, it's hard to explain. It doesn't feel as if it is pulling my body. It is pulling me deeper into sleep. One time, it was pulling me so strongly that when I did get my eyes open, I actually could see my room. But it was as if looking through water or fog. It still had me even though I was opening up my eyes. This is a true experience. Believe this, I'm not joking. I would not type this much otherwise. If I were to compare it to anything, I would say it resembles the dark figures or shadows in the movie Ghost with Whoopi Goldberg that come and take someone away right after they have died. Please note, I cannot physically see whatever this is. I'm saying that this is my guess of what it would look like. To this day, I still cannot sleep without the TV. This has happened to me repeatedly, countless times within a span of several years. When this began, I lived in an apartment near the Piedmont Hills in the Bay Area, California. I was always uncomfortable and felt as if I was being watched there. I started sleeping in the front room with the TV on because I started having really evil dreams and was so scared to be alone at this point. I would desperately beg my boyfriend to please stay home with me, but he couldn't take any more time off because he wasn't able to use any more sick days. Sometimes I'm just too scared to be there alone, especially at night. I never used to be that way and I'm not faint of heart. I'm actually 4'11 and 90 pounds soaking wet, but I forget I'm not 10 feet tall and bulletproof sometimes. Still, when this began, I became scared. Whatever it is that followed me when I moved, and to this day I still feel it, although it has been a while since I have struggled with it, when I go to sleep, I must have my boyfriend hold me with my back at his chest, spoon fashion. And this works, and when he rolls over, I can make sure my back is touching his, and I feel comfortable this way. As long as my back or behind me isn't opened or exposed, for some reason, it isn't as bad as when I feel my back is protected, and I'm not as vulnerable when I'm facing it. I know this all sounds strange, but it is true.
I work in a nursing home, third shift. For the last year, I've been transferred to the first floor. I, among others, have seen some pretty weird stuff. It starts like this. About six months ago, I started seeing off-the-wall things while all of us were at the nursing station. There are only four employees on third shift first floor. People coming out of the dining room, not in wheelchairs, but walking upright and pretty darn fast. A person down one hall walking out of one room and into the next on the same side of the hall. Both rooms have non-ambulatory residents. Water turning on in one's room's bathroom. One resident that passed away about four months ago can still be heard laughing. I've never heard this personally, but others have. An entity that always runs in the same direction at lightning speed with arms flailing. I'm talking 28 days later style. Only two of us have seen this. I see it sometimes up to five times a night, but only when I'm down one certain hall. I call it the track runner. These are some of the real common things that happen. Now, for the ghost story. About three months ago, I had a resident that is mentally with it ask me to get that man out of her room. It literally gave me goosebumps. When I asked her where he was, she sat there by the mirror. Needless to say, I saw no one. So later on, I asked a coworker if she had seen anything that was different or odd. She told me to stop and went pale. About 10 minutes later, she came to me again and started talking, mainly about the things I posted above. We ended up at the nursing station in a pretty good discussion, and all of us had pretty much the same story. Fast forward to Thursday, October 14th to 15th, third shift. The same resident that had asked me a few months ago to remove the man by the mirror from her room rings me her call bell. I go down and ask what I can do. She tells me to get him out of here. I ask who, the person by the dresser, she replies. Now I'm thinking too cool. I step out in the hall and get another coworker and have her wait outside the door out of sight. As I return to the room, she's now asking me, why is my husband with that stranger? My husband is dead and I don't know that other person. I ask her where they are, and she tells me, don't act that way with me, I'm not crazy, I know what I see. Then proceeds to get verbally abusive with me. The other coworker comes in at this point after hearing what went on, and the resident goes through the same routine about her husband and the stranger with him. So we get the change nurse, same routine, three, about an hour later, another resident rings her call bell. At this point, two of us go down together, different hall. This resident is bugging us to get her out of bed. Her words, I don't want to be in bed with him. He's not my husband, and I don't know him. She was definitely shook up, so we transferred her to her chair and brought her out to the nursing station with us. While we were getting her some coffee and graham crackers, another bell rings. Again, different hall. The charge nurse got that one. She comes back out and stated that the residents that the man by her TV told her she wasn't going to be here much longer, and she insisted that he was still there, although the charge nurse couldn't see him, even after turning the lights on. Number five. The first lady that saw her husband and stranger rings again. So three of us went down and left one aide to watch the hall's answer and answer call lights. This time, two of us stay in the hall and only the charge nurse went in. The residents started talking about possession and demons, very detailed and very scary to say the least. I figured with all the weird stuff happening at work and all, I would share what I've been experiencing with my coworkers as of late. I've had other uncanny things in my life at other places, but nothing with this much activity. There's so many other people that either agree with me 
or describe what I seen to me first without me asking. I have a confession to make. I'm not an ordinary person. I don't mean that I've exhibited quirky behavior in the past and I'm simply unorthodox. But I have this uncanny ability to sense things. Whether these energies that I've learned to embrace are malevolent or benevolent, I can't say, as I'm unable to clearly make the distinction. But I and to attract unusual energies, which permeate all around me. If you happen to come in close contact with me, you may be susceptible to these energies as well. I could say that there's a supernatural component to this, but because my mind has relentlessly wreaked havoc on me, I can't say for certain what is going on. Sometimes I see things, shadows, Hearing strange noises, knocks on the walls, a faint whisper in my ear, reinforcing the idea that something otherworldly resides inside these walls. All the while, while I'm sitting in the kitchen of my old Victorian home, and I'm the only one who lives here, I can honestly say that I don't know what is happening, but I have nowhere else to turn to. There's the cellar that I'm terrified to go into. I've literally haven't stepped foot down there since I moved in. But it's like I can telepathically hear the growls and moans coming from that dark space that I refuse to enter. I've always wanted to know if the source of all these energies came from that cellar. The thing is, I've no pets, no strange relationships, Nobody ever sits foot in my home. I had a wife once, but she's been gone for what seems like a millennium. I don't remember what it's like to interact with anybody. I'm virtually imprisoned. I work from home. So, I became a recluse. I don't go out much these days for fear of inadvertently transferring these energies to those who come in contact with me. Isolation is unconscionable. The fear of going insane inside my mind constantly lingers in the foreground. The helplessness of not being able to do anything about it still traps me internally. I'm mentally paralyzed. And then I have these unusual nightmares. My doctor tells me they are night terrors. So I'm laying in my bed, and the shadow opens the door. It doesn't do anything, but simply stands in the door frame. I don't know what it wants, but I can only make out its eyes, glowing brighter than the sun. The rest of the outline, a silhouette. I sweat. My body temperature drops, and I feel a cold breath on the right side of my shoulder. I look over, temporarily taking my eyes off the shadow figure, and yet there is nothing there but a mist that looks as if someone is breathing in the cold air. I look back at the doorframe, and the shadow is gone. I then lay down staring at the ceiling. I simply just can't ignore what's going on. I want to, but even the pills don't do enough. I still see these things, hear these things, and most importantly, feel these things. I'm so scared. I don't want to be a prisoner anymore. I want a release. I want it all to end. I'm sick and tired of the suffering. My mind just won't heal. I don't want to feel. It's almost better if I don't, but I can't turn it off. Still, these images persist. In another moment, I can clearly see this elderly woman 
violently screaming at me. I can feel the terrible darkness emitting from her. And when she opens her mouth, there is nothing but darkness. Almost as if it is a black hole. No sound, just the mouth opening. The woman with her old tattered clothing, not from this time period, definitely not present. Victorian times, with a black dress from that era, long black hair, matted and uncombed. This being was just standing there. I ask it what it wants from me, but it remains silently screaming for a few seconds. I blink my eyes as hard as anybody could. The figure simply won't disappear. I see a single cockroach move out of her mouth. I had to have dreamt this. This night terror felt so real. It consumes me. I can't get it out of my head. I go back and forth thinking this has got to just be a hallucination. But the more I think about these events, the way they truly never disappear, it makes me believe there is an entity in this house that I can't ignore. They are communicating to me through my dreams and through some of my hallucinations that I've had as well. The therapists, the doctors, they all tell me that I've got some psychosis. Trauma from my youth remains unsolved. But these walls inside this old home has so much history graved into it. Tell me that spirits don't exist, and I can't prove it to you. I can only tell you about my experiences and how sensitive I am to the other side. That I think to myself, why are we so arrogant about this other side? Why do we dismiss what we do not understand? Maybe I'm just crazy. Or maybe the world wants to shield us from the fact that these beings live among us. If you truly open up your eyes and begin to understand that there's nothing that the world can't see and you can believe. Several years ago, I was planning on moving from the USA to Australia to be with my partner Craig. My partner and I would talk for hours on the web. What else can you do when you're 9,000 miles apart? My daughter, Catherine, who was seven at the time, would often get in on it too. Her and Greg developed a very loving father-daughter relationship, even though he is her stepdad. One day, no different than any other, Greg and I were chatting. He wanted to talk to Catherine. I yelled for her. She was in another room, and I couldn't see the monitor. She came running, and stopped dead inside the doorway. She could not see the monitor and started wigging out, demanding that Greg shut his bedroom door, which was clearly visible behind him. She wouldn't move from where she was. We tried to coax her, but she wasn't having any of it. Greg got up and closed the bedroom door. Catherine ran into my lap and buried her face into my shoulder away from the monitor. She wouldn't even look at the monitor. I asked her what was wrong, and she said, he's mean, and I don't want to see him. Completely caught off guard, I asked her who was mean. She answered, the mean guy in the doorway. I asked her to describe him. She said he was tall, had red hair, blue eyes, and wore a dressy shirt, deeper voice than Greg's. Oh, and by the way, Greg's voice is already pretty deep enough as it is. I tried to get more information out of her. That was all she had, or what she wanted to tell me anyway. I relayed what she had told me to Greg, and he just didn't get it. 
Catherine left my lap as fast as she had flown into it. Yelled goodbye Greg from the other room. I wondered if she had seen something. I had episodes like that when I was her age, and they've continued. I asked Craig if she had described anyone he might know. He looked shocked for a second, and then asked me to wait. He went into the bedroom, and came out a few minutes later with a pick in his hand. He looked at me, held up the pick, and said, wonder if this is who she saw. I asked who it was, and he said it was his grandfather Bill, who passed away in 92. It was 2007. Now get this. The pick was exactly the description Catherine had given. He was tall, red-haired, blue-eyed, had a dressy shirt in the pick. I asked Craig how he talked, and he said that Bill was old-school Aussie. His voice was deeper than most, and with the accent, it was even harder for Greg to understand him. I excused myself, and went and told Catherine who we thought it was. As soon as I said the name Bill, she smiled. She said, I thought that was his name. That was the only thing I could almost understand. She seemed more at ease after learning it was his name. Greg, on the other hand, didn't know what to make of it. Apparently, her and Bill made peace and became friends. When I was leaving for Australia, she told me that she didn't need Bill anymore and wanted him to come over and watch over me and Greg till she got there. Gotta love kids. Fast forward a few years. Since my arrival here in Oz, I've heard a man's voice. Sometimes I can understand him. Other times, it's too deep and garbled for me to get. I ask him to repeat slower, and it gets him a little pissy. He has never told me his name, but I know it is Bill. I have that feeling. But lately, over the last year or so, I've been hearing a lot more voices. It's like being in a crowd where everyone is talking at once. I ask someone to step forward and talk only to me, but it just stays garbled. This is a weekly thing. It has gotten to the point where, when it starts, I simply say, if you're all going to talk to me at once, that I won't be able to understand any of it. What I was wondering is if anyone else has ever heard this, and if so, what did they do? Might this be more family members who saw that Bill was able to talk to us and want to try themselves? Or might it be something bad? Sometimes, not very often, I get a bad feeling when they start talking. Bill is still with me. I asked him, but he's given me nothing. I lived in Chicago up until I was 18 and had graduated high school. My grandfather lived in the house, and we lived on the first floor in the third flat apartment building we owned next door. We had the basement that was connected to the first floor apartment as well. The basement had three main rooms. The front room that led outside held a half bath, a washer, dryer, and two storage closets. This is where we kept our bikes and skates and stuff. The center room had four storage closets, the water heater, and the furnace. This was the room that held all my dad's and grandpa's tools. The back room that led to our upstairs apartment was where we had the deep freezer, old clothes, camping gears, old toys, etc. The center room was awful. Just looking at it, you felt like you were being stared down. Something was sending very angry energy out from that room. If you were in that room, it was just overwhelming and overpowering. It felt as if something was going to grab you and actually hurt you. None of us were hurt, but it always felt like it could happen at any time. My sister believed it to be female. 
I believed it to be male. This makes me think that it could have been a demon and was just appearing female to her and male to me. The stairs from the basement led to my brother's room. The stairs and the door were extremely creepy. We always kept it locked and bolted, but that didn't do much. It always seemed like someone was going to come bursting through the doors at any time. In the bedroom I shared with my sister, we have both seen strange things. I've seen a man a few times. He would start at the head of my bed, which happened to be by the door to the bedroom, and walk towards my closet. My closet and my parents' closet shared a wall. From there, he would kind of nod his head and then disappear. I could tell he was wearing overalls, work boots, and had gloves in his back pocket. He was tall, about six feet, dark hair, dark eyes. I could see all of this, but I could also see the other side of my room through him. He was kind of a misty gray color. I saw him first when I was five, then again when I was eight, and the last time when I was 14. When I was 12, I felt a pulling on my blanket. At this time, we didn't have any pets that would roam loose, and there was no way for them to get out or even reach my blanket. I feel my blanket being pulled. I kind of grumble and try to pull it back up, but I can't. So I look at the foot of my bed, and there was a boy sitting there, grinning at me, gripping my blanket. I tell him, you let go. I'm not scared of you. Go away. And he disappears. I pull my blanket back up and go to sleep. Then we just had weird things happen. Bread would slide across the counter. Things would be moved from one end of the bar to the other. Things would go missing for a few days. These types of things not only happen in our apartment, but in the upper two levels that we rented out. I was in Arizona a few years back. I was at the Snorin Desert Museum outside of Tucson. It is more like a zoo than a museum. It was summer, very few people there, and a pretty warm morning. I was in the very back of the property all by myself, taking photos of the native cactus. I was completely alone and enjoying the beautiful outdoors. I suddenly felt a terrible sense of dread behind me. I turned and looked, and there was an elderly Native American man standing there. He was dressed in all black, long sleeved black shirt in the middle of the summer. His hair was snow white, and his face was wrinkled. When we made eye contact, I felt like someone tweaked my soul. I started to walk fast. I wanted to get back to the front of the zoo and be where people were. I was really moving, and every time I looked back, the man was about six feet behind me. He never seemed to increase his pace, but kept up with me no matter how fast I walked. He casually started straight ahead and kept walking. I made it up to the front and walked into the gift shop. He stayed with me the whole time. I decided to get the heck out of there. I hurried to the parking lot. All I wanted was to get into the car and get away. He was still behind me. When I reached my car, a coyote was standing by the trunk. I made eye contact with that animal. I can't describe it. It sounds nuts. But that coyote gestured towards the exit with his head. Of course, he didn't speak to me, nor did I hear a voice, but I just knew that the coyote would watch over me while I drove away. As I was about to get into the car, I turned back to look, and the coyote and the man were gone. I never went back. Every time I think of this, I feel as if I escaped something terrible. 
It's so strange, but it's like the coyote knew me, and I knew him. Thoughts, anyone? I don't take drugs. I wasn't drinking or overheated. I swear this happened. I know it sounds unbelievable, but it did. This happened in the summer, and at the time, my horse was living on an old farm not far from the sea. The farm was from 1925, with the original stables and barn. Anyway, on this day, it was only me and my horse there, and I had him standing outside while I was tacking up, since the weather was nice. Where he stood, he had the back entrance to the stables on the right side and straight in front was the door to the barn. You had to go through the barn to get out. Everything was fine at first. Then, I got this feeling like I was being watched from inside the stable. I looked inside, thinking that maybe one of the other girls who had their horses there had come. But it was empty. I shrugged it off and continued grooming. Then, I noticed my horse had his attention towards the stables. I walked up to the door and looked inside, but again, there was no one. I got my saddle and stuff and started tacking up, and then my horse suddenly tensed up. He stood completely still, his ears forward, and all his attention on the entrance to the barn. I looked over thinking it was a cat or something, but what I saw made the hairs of my neck stand up. In the barn stood a tractor. Behind this, I could see a dark figure. It didn't really look like a man. It was more, I don't know, liquid sort of. It stood on the one side of the tractor, hardly hidden, and I could swear that it was staring back at us. It moved backward towards the back of the tractor and just vanished. Well, I hurried up with my Sadie, grabbed my helmet, and though I really didn't want to, I walked my horse towards the barn. Let me tell you, it was no easy task getting him to go inside, and when I got him inside, he refused to go anywhere near the tractor and almost ran out the other side, pulling me alongside with him. I'm having some problems with the spirit in my fiance's house again. For the past few months, the house has been dormant, and so we didn't worry much about what was going on in the home. We had one of my fiance's friends move in, and things were fairly calm and peaceful. Her friend, though, began to never stay at the house, and due to some issues, emotions got rather heated between the three of us. Two days ago, her friend moved back after a fight, and activity has escalated in the home since then. Yesterday, I got an overwhelming sense of fear and dread while at the house, and I had an overwhelming headache come over myself. I began packing up my things, and told my fiancé to pack her things, because we needed to stay a few days at my house. She became overwhelmingly tired and had a headache, much like mine, and passed out. When she woke up, she wasn't herself, but quickly came back out of it. Then, I went to the bathroom, and when I looked into the mirrors from the corner of my eye, I saw something I couldn't explain. The thing was, though, it looked inhuman, and comprised of only bones, I think, and it seemed to be wanting out of the mirror. I ran back, and my fiancé was packing and taking her time out, humming to the tune of old music box that used to be in her friend's room. She started to have a play fight with me, and threw a shirt at me, then casually kicked the door shut. The next thing I know, she screams, and I kick the door open. She said I'd been standing in the mirror after I'd left the room. She seemed fine at the moment and so I just watched over her as she kept packing. She began stalling again though, and I told her we needed to get going or we'd be late for dinner. She then told me that she didn't want to 
She liked the house and wanted to stay there. I began to hear voices as well, other than hers in the house, and got drowsy, but kept my head about me. She finally was packed, and I got her to go outside for a brief moment to see if being out of the house would snap her out of the trance. She got rather defensive and ran off and ran under a doorway where there was a crucifix standing above the doorway. When she ran through it, she collapsed and then woke up again, perfectly fine and not remembering about the past 45 minutes, except for bits and pieces, like she had been dreaming. I had been having concerns that she may be channeling spirits by accident in her sleep, and such, and this incident definitely confirms my suspicions. I'm psychologically trained from the mental strength it took the two of us to get out of the home. We're going back to the house in about four or five days, and figure it should be fine. Whatever this entity is, it fed strongly off the negative emotions that had built up in this house. I know at the strength it was yesterday, it would be much hard for me to face it and cleanse the house on my own, so we're leaving the house to settle and calm back down. By then, I feel this entity will have lost most of its power, and it would be the best time to cleanse the home and seal any portals that may have been opened in the home. I'm still a little bit apprehensive though, and if anyone could offer up some help, it would greatly be appreciated. If my fiance is the target of any danger, I can pull through any fight normally and keep her safe, but I've been so drained, and I don't know if I can handle the cleansing of the home by myself. If anyone could please help, either physically or through even psychological support, it would greatly be appreciated. Hey there, I live in Akron, Ohio. About a year ago, I moved into my ex's house since it was nice, and well, we were in love. I lived there for about six months before she broke it off and decided to live in Ireland. I've been heartbroken for a long time, but I do remember some extra stuff that happened in that home. It's on Spicer Street in Akron, Ohio. About a month after I moved in, the first thing I noticed was waking up with her and every single clock in the house, including the computer clock, wristwatches, etc., would be turned around 40 minutes ahead than what they were supposed to be. This only happened once, and after I arrived at class, she called me to explain how each clock had changed overnight later. She told me that the previous tenants believed the house was haunted and refused to move back in. They were both girls, I was told. We began to notice other things too, such as their stuff would get moved if we left the kitchen, the television would turn on and off, lights would turn on and off if we left the home, fan would move and not move, TV would turn channels with the remote being on the TV and certain spots in the house would be unusually cold. She was scared at times, but I typically wasn't. I just thought of it as having a little kid in the home. I wasn't really worried, and I was confident that I'd be able to protect her from that kind of stuff. If you read some of my earlier posts, I see specs a lot, and I guess it gives me some sort of confidence, even if I don't understand them. My thoughts were confirmed, I believe, when I was sitting in the living room with her and thought I spotted a blonde-haired boy's face under her table. It looked a lot like a German kid, but naturally, I blinked, and it was gone. There were two spots in the house that seemed really weird. The basement was odd, but not too odd, since students in the past used this place for studying. The oddest part in her house was her bedroom closet. I would step at the door and not go in. She refused to even sleep close to it. I was the one who slept closest to it while she slept between me and the wall. I didn't really see anything from it, but it did feel really weird, and it didn't feel like the kid. It was something else. 
also that closet was connected to the attic which neither of us ventured into after i saw the kid i felt some sort of attachment to it i remember she used to complain that sometimes my eyes would go completely black in the house i'd usually counter it with me complaining about staring at me as she slept as if i woke up around five in the morning but we wouldn't argue about it it was just weird when we broke up or rather when she broke up with me i'll admit it her way messages often wrote how she was scared and didn't want to hear any noises so i guess the activity in the home increased when i left again not sure why so i want to find out more about the home but i don't know where to start I've been lurking on here for about two years now, and well, I decided to finally post about my experiences with ghosts. Really only one ghost. It happened to be here in my house for a number of years throughout the 70s. The house had been built in 1970 on an old lot where an old man had lived on a shack and had died. Now. The spirit that had stayed on the property was one of a child, though. Maybe the old man had a kid and died. Who knows? Anyway, all sorts of stuff that one would imagine a child would do happened. You know, things would get lost, stuff would move from one place to another, vases and sculptures would be on their place on tables, and when the family would come back, the sad items would be in pieces, smashed against the wall about three or four feet away. Sometimes, of course, you couldn't get into the house because the screen door would be locked and nobody was in the house at the time. Just imagine the door with the simple hook going into the circle slot. Now, over the years, I've tried to get that hook to slip over into the lock, you know, to see if it could happen by accident. It could never be an accident. If one wants to lock that screen door, you intentionally do it. Feelings of being watched and feeling the weight of someone or something next to you in the bed. My grandma would tell me that I would go off in the house in my walker circa 1981 or 82 and I would travel all the way from the kitchen to the living room to the hallway. Now, when one enters the hallway, even in the daytime, if all the doors to the room are shut, it is pitch black. She claimed that I would be in the hallway for a couple of minutes, and that I would come shooting out from the hallway as if my walker was pushed or shoved by something, all the way back to the kitchen and crash into the wall. Now, it would take me a couple of minutes to get all the way to the hallway since I was a toddler, yet it wouldn't even take me a minute to come crashing into the wall of the kitchen. Now, I remember seeing some sort of whitish gray ball floating when I was laying down on the rug one day. This must have been 1982 or 83. I can still see that image in my brain to this day. My grandmother noticed me getting up and looking under the dining room table and I started to shout, get out, or in my way of talking back then, get ye out. My grandma started yelling, what's wrong? What's the matter? I kept on shouting and punching and kicking at nothing, all the way towards the front doorway. And when I got to the door, I kept kicking the door, and then I stopped. By this time, my grandmother, who was rather slow due to wait, had gotten to the hallway that led to the front door and was asking me what was wrong. She told me that I had said that I didn't want it here, and I told it to get out. I think I had some sort of hold over it, as I was the only child born in the house. My uncle, who was only 12 at the time, had been born in an older house. I think the spirit was attracted by the fresh new life that was now in the home, much like the spirits in Poltergeist were attracted to the little girl. You know, 
they wanted some sort of that life force. I think that was the case with this. I got rid of it before it got too powerful, much later on. What do you think? I've lived in this house for the past 27 years. Nothing out of the ordinary has happened since those early years. I have seen many paranormal entities during my life. Here's my first quite shocking meeting with a ghost. I was seven years old then. I was in my grandparents' house with my mother. The house is about 80 years old. I was relaxing downstairs when the phone suddenly rang from upstairs. My mother proceeded to go upstairs to answer the phone, and I followed her. After climbing about halfway up the old staircase, I felt that somebody or something was behind me. I quickly turned my head, and that's when I saw a middle-aged lady climbing the stairs, holding out her hands as if to grab me. She was wearing a bathrobe, and her hair looked mangled. I freaked out and ran upstairs as quickly as I was able to. She surely was a ghost, because she wasn't a family member or a friend. I had never seen her before, and my mother didn't even notice her. She disappeared as fast as I would seen her. Unfortunately, that wasn't the only ghost experience I had in that house. I was about 10 years old when the second meeting happened. It happened in the same old staircase in my grandparents' house. It was late night, and I was going upstairs to get some sleep. That's when I quickly discovered that my route was blocked. At the end of the corridor where you turn right to get to the staircase was a man, a very unusual man, standing there. He was wearing a gas mask, so I wasn't able to see his face. He didn't speak, nor did he move at all. He just stood still and I was too afraid to go past him. So I then got my grandmother and went back to the corridor with her. The gas man was nowhere to be found. Understandably, I was too afraid to sleep, so my grandmother stayed the night with me. I'm pretty sure that my grandparents' house is haunted, and my friend has witnessed that too, as the next experience tells. I was 11 years old, and my friend was 12 when this happened. We were playing in the basement of my grandparents' house. It's no surprise that the basement is also quite unsettling, just as much as the rest of the house is. We were in the big room just under the staircase that leads to the middle floor. We were having fun, until both of us felt a strange feeling that made it obvious that we were not alone in the basement. We felt that there were other beings present, entities that couldn't be seen with the naked eye. We're also sure it wasn't our grandparents, because both of my grandparents were upstairs. That feeling also told us to leave the basement. It felt like we were surrounded by invisible people, and that we really needed to leave the basement immediately. After a few minutes, in a panic, we fled back up fast. Even at this stage of my life, it is still frightening for me to walk that staircase or be in the basement. I often feel the same feeling in these places that I felt 10 years ago. My friend also feels the same energy as well. Luckily, I haven't seen any ghosts since then. Regardless, one thing is certain. There's a lot of paranormal activity going on in that house, and I'm the person the spirits need to target, for whatever reason or another. My story starts back in 1991, when I first hooked up with my then boyfriend, now husband. My boyfriend lived on the bottom floor of a house that his aunt owned. His aunt and her family lived on the second floor. His cousin was my best friend, 
and so I was always at the house. We had a small close-knit group of friends that were over a house one time playing truth or dare. I remember it as being late at night and we were sitting on Holly's bed playing this game. When one of the girls asked her if the house was haunted, Holly said that it was and that it was her maternal grandmother. She then went on to tell us certain things that would happen and most situations would take place right next to the father's recliner chair. About 15 minutes after we finished playing the game, I had to use her bathroom. Though I was so totally afraid to go alone, I didn't want to seem chicken, so I went on my own to the bathroom. Just as I was passing by the recliner, I noticed I suddenly got cold. It was a warm summer night when this happened. Okay. I chalked it up to being my imagination, seeing as we had just been talking about it. Then, years later, I had this woman I was working for, and we got along really well. So, one day she had invited me to her house. Well, as we were at her house, we were talking about ghost stories and the like. She excitedly pulled out her digital camera and led me upstairs to their master bedroom. We stood just outside the bedroom doorway and she told me to take the camera and just scan around the room, starting in one corner and going to the next. Just see if you see anything, she said. I took the camera, still not knowing if I was truly a believer, and scanned the room. Suddenly, I moved back to the corner I just scanned over. She said, you see something, don't you? I did. I saw a greenish male figure standing in the corner, looking out the window. I was scared to death. But even when I scanned the corner again, the figure was there. We returned to the first floor of the house when she started to tell me all about it. They had bought the house just about a year prior. The first week they lived in the house, their children, very young children, would awake in the middle of the night, screaming and crying. Finally, one night, my boss's husband got so furious, he yelled, I don't care that you're here. I don't care if you just stay. Just leave my children alone. The children never woke up crying again. Then about a week later was when my boss had noticed the image through her camera. She had been going through various parts of the home, taking photos to send to relatives that lived out of state. When she was scanning the master bedroom, looking for a good view of the room, and found the exact image I found. She yelled for her husband who saw the same thing, but it could only be seen through the screen on her digital camera. After I saw it, I was a believer. There was no way I would have seen it, if it weren't there. A couple of days after she saw the first image herself, she was cleaning in the basement when she found a hidden room. She went into the hidden room and found a box of papers. They started investigating the roots of the home. She found out that the old police chief of Renister, the town she had lived in, had built the house a very long time ago. The only thing she could figure is that the greenish male figure is the police chief looking out the window and watching over his town. They still live in that same home and they still live with their chief, all of them living peacefully together. Since I was little, I've been sensitive to ghosts. Sometimes I had dreams that would later turn out to be true. Also could tell which song was on next on the radio. Knew who the phone call was next, etc. My experiences tend to happen at times when I'm either feeling low or just open towards the other side. My stories. As a little girl, I didn't like being in my room after it got dark or darker when it was summertime. I remember feeling watched, and something wasn't right. A lot of times, 
I was so afraid of the door leading to the back of our house and the stables. I felt like something was looking at me and wanted to hurt me. This went on from when I was around eight and stopped when I was 12. At times, they would show up only once. Once I was in bed and was close to falling asleep, suddenly I heard a voice calling my name. I woke up completely and looked into the corner of my room and there was an old woman there. I couldn't see her clearly because she was kind of blurry, but she had a friendly feeling about her. She then disappeared and I never saw her again. When I was 17, my dog died, and I was devastated. A few weeks later, I heard him coming up to my room from the kitchen and saw him enter my room. He then jumped up on my bed, walked around three times before sighing, and got down. I could feel him on my bed and against my leg. When I tried to touch him, he disappeared. My parents farmed where most of the events happened is old. It burnt down once there, and there seems to be quite a lot of ghostly activity. In the barn, my parents got their car. Since I was little, I was afraid being alone there. I felt something was wrong, and that something was hanging in the dark. I always felt uneasy there until a few years ago, when my mom told me that someone had off themselves there. My worst experience I've had was when I was around 15 to 17 years old. My room was connected to the kitchen by a little hallway. From the kitchen, you can go directly to the two living rooms. The last one I've never felt easy in was always feeling unnaturally cold and just weird. One night, I woke up and my room was ice cold. I heard someone open the door from the hall to the kitchen. It was a man, and he was going directly to the last of the living room. Somehow I was there when he went there. I saw him take his rifle and then off himself. It was feelings more than actually seeing him do it. I then was back in my body, but heard him fall down to the floor, moved a bit, and moaned before he died. The second that happened, the coldness disappeared and I could breathe again. I told my friend at the time about it, but I was too afraid to ask my parents. One day, I sort of jokingly asked if anyone had offed themselves in that room. My dad turned around and looked at me with a strange look. Yes, your godmother's father offed himself there. They hadn't told me because my godmother didn't like me to know. I found his grave, and it happened the exact day he had offed himself. I've had nice experiences though. A friend of my parents and their friend had offed herself. My friend was really devastated about it and couldn't get over it. One day we were in the kitchen when I saw a sort of fog that turned into a ghostly hand. It may have looked ridiculous, but I'm telling you. I know with my own eyes what I saw. It was right on my friend's shoulder, almost as if to soothe her. After it disappeared, I immediately alerted my friend, and she said that her shoulder felt really cold. My friend then told me that she felt a lot of peace. To the both of us, it really meant a lot. The latest year, the happenings happened without any real pattern. Last year, when I was at my parents and sleeping in my old rooms, I didn't get any sleep for the last four days I was there. There was a presence in the room, and it was not a pleasant one. It just radiated hatred, and it was pointed at me for some reason. The next time I got home, it wasn't in there, but then I had to sleep in my mom's bedroom. I was woken up by someone slamming their hands into the bed very hard. I looked at the end of the bed, and I saw a shadow standing there, and then disappeared. Since then, I haven't felt it. For some reason, 
I knew I was male, but I didn't know why he felt so badly about me. When I'm home at my parents now, there's a young girl there, something I can't feel what it is, and a man. None of these are evil, but just looking out for me. I've seen the girl from the corner of my eyes, and seen her reflected in the mirror. I think they are protecting me, and just looking out for me. At times I can enter a house and know that there's more than just what the eyes see. I felt the presence of family or just passerbyers. I do believe that at my parents' house, there's some kind of field of energy where these spirits can enter. Some stay, but others don't. I got one in my room where I live now. Just a little prankster, really. Turns on my computer or opens all the cupboards. I did have an old man, though, who loved to watch me shower. I told him that it was rude, and I didn't like it. Since then, he hadn't been there. At the same time, there's a girl running every night on the upper floor. My brother is sensitive too, but apparently never experienced the same as I have at my parents' house. Seems I'm the only one they get attracted to. Also felt being pushed, but that happened at my parents' house as well. I don't mind having this ability, but I know I have to learn to control it. It can get to be too much at times. I've been doing some research about black spirits and ghosts. I had an experience in January 2000 when I lived in an old house in Portland, Maine. It was late in the evening, about 10 p.m. or so when I felt something peering at me from a closet in my basement apartment. I thought nothing of it, but when I looked again, a materialistic, three-dimensional human-shaped figure with no facial features darted from the closet and stood behind me. It was suspended above the floor, about a foot or so. Before I knew it, two more had come out of nowhere. It happened so fast, and they moved so quickly that I didn't even know what to make of this incident. I was a skeptic at the time, and had been all my life on ghosts, supernatural, etc. I was 36 years old at the time. There were multiple instances where I seriously felt like the house was shaking, doors being slammed, open and shut, cabinets being open and shut as well, pots being moved around. It was seriously like a horror movie. I remember one time this happened, and it scared me half to death, almost literally. I ended up having a mild heart attack, and I ended up waking up in a hospital. All I remember was feeling the energy of what was happening that day, and then I lost consciousness, and that's when I was in the hospital bed. The doctor told me that the neighbor noticed something was wrong in that house, and noticed me lying on the floor. So she went and called the cops for me, and the ambulance arrived. They even told me that my heart stopped for a moment, and they had to use a defibrillator to bring me back to life. I was clinically dead, even though they only classified it as a mild heart attack. Anyway, I know this all sounds absurd, but I'm telling you, it definitely did happen. I'm just glad that I don't have to deal with it anymore. I don't live in the same place I do now. It was not worth it in the end. And after the heart attack, I don't think it'll ever be worth it. Scary stuff, poltergeist, and black beings on the walls. Definitely not something I want to deal with. One night, me and two guy friends were driving into Howard City, Michigan. We were driving down the road, and on each side, there's cornfields, and we saw two girls, one standing at the opposite side of the road, and another walking directly into our path. The girl walking into our path was wearing a gray sweatshirt, blue jeans, had blonde hair, and white eyes. The girl that was standing on the other side of the road was wearing a red sweatshirt had brown hair, and wore blue jeans. As we're driving towards them, 
I tried as hard as I could to tell my friend's boyfriend to look out for her, but I couldn't. I couldn't say a word. I tried, and nothing came out, because I was so terrified of what I thought I saw. The girls had completely vanished. After we got to the stop sign, I said to my friend's boyfriend, Did you see that? He said yes, and the other guy that was in the truck with us asked me what, so I told him, and he said, We have to go back and check it out. So we turned back around and went back down the road and found no signs of them. This is a remarkable story of ghosts from my experience. This happened when I was studying at my university. At that time, I was far away from home and stayed in a hostel near my university with my friends. Before I moved into the hostel, my friend who lived in the hostel told me that it was haunted. Actually, it was a house whose owner intentionally left this world. That's why many people have said that the hostel was haunted. They said that the spirit of the owner appears near the kitchen at night. Another said that sometimes you could hear the crying voices from the woman who owned the now hostel. At that time, there was only one last room available for me to sleep in on the second floor, so I had to stay in that room. My room was in the last row. Many people have said that my room was terrifying because the surroundings around my room were quite dark and sunshine couldn't enter my room. There were multiple nights in which I kept waking up around 2.30 a.m. One night, I was terribly tired and went to bed earlier than usual. When I woke up, it felt as if somebody was pulling on my blanket from my feet, and so I pulled it back up again. However, when I went to pull the blanket back up, I still felt a resistance on my blanket. It definitely felt as if somebody was pulling it down again. I then felt annoyed and wanted to sleep. So I just said, stop it. Don't stir me. I really want to sleep. Surprisingly, it actually stopped and I was able to sleep the rest of the night. In fact, nobody ever pulled my blanket again. In the morning when I woke up, I remember what happened last night and I started shaking. After that experience, it was pretty obvious why I always felt on edge whenever I slept in that room. Ghosts are pretty freaky. I was sleeping over my best friend Jasmine's house, and the night before, her mother promised us BLTs for breakfast. So that night, after setting me up in an air mattress for the room, we had gone to bed. That night was peaceful, but I'll forever remember that horrific morning. I woke up and looked up to where a person was standing in front of a closed door from afar and simply staring at me. She was young, around my age at the time, with features almost identical to my friend. I was still half asleep and just figured it was my friend anyway. I began to ask her when we were going downstairs for the BLTs and she just stared at me without saying a word. I closed my eyes for a little bit, then reopened them. And that girl was gone. I never heard the door open in her room, and somehow the girl was gone. I looked at my clock, and only ten minutes had passed since I closed my eyes to lay down. I had screamed loud, and ran down the stairs to find Jasmine and her mother sitting in the kitchen. They looked very concerned and asked me why I screamed. I told them that just 10 minutes ago, I saw Jasmine, but she didn't say a word. Her mother looked at me and told me that Jasmine was downstairs for over an hour and had never once went back upstairs in the time in which I saw this girl. It was then when I realized that it was a spirit. 
ever since, I've only seen the girl twice. On my friend's birthday, I was downstairs getting cake for some of the other girls, and I saw her standing in the pantry watching me. And the other time, I was in the basement with Jasmine. We were getting some laundry done, when we all saw the girl run across the basement living room to a storage room. I haven't been back since, but the last experience helped my friends not think I was crazy. I've been enjoying your site, and I wanted to share some of my experiences. Well, I went to Mercyhurst College in Erie, Pennsylvania in 1995-96, and I left in the fall when my father died. Anyway, I lived in Egan Hall, which is connected to Old Main and the Chapel, and I saw the nun and her antics almost daily in the fall of 96. I saw a reflection in the bathroom windows at night. She often opened and closed the windows and doors, turned faucets and radios on, and flushed the toilets for hours on end. I was absolutely frightened at first. My roommate, a very down-to-earth logical girl, told me a friend of hers who lived on the boys floor saw the sister every morning around 4 a.m. when he got up for crew practice. He would end up seeing her, but she was only there supposedly to look out for us. It turns out that the heartbroken nun story is just a fun, creepy story. And the truth is that the nun died peacefully of old age and stuck around to keep an eye on all the students. I also used to see a blue orb floating from the chapel through Old Main when I was coming back from the computer lab late at night. Other students had seen the orb originate from a small statue in the chapel, and a figure had been seen in the organ loft as well. I have heard that the path between campus and the New Covenant is haunted, but I can't verify that. In Springboro, Pennsylvania, there is a large Victorian house which had been used as a stop in the Underground Railroad. There had been a tunnel between the basement and the barn but the tunnel was filled in the late 70s to early 80s for safety reasons, and the barn was moved to Conneville at some point. There are cold spots throughout the house, and a feeling of being watched. Sometimes, you can see strange reflections in the windows and lights or figures, just at the edge of your field of vision. The basement is very frightening. There is a feeling of pressure, and a very dark, and menacing feeling. I mean, I feel very threatened if I go down there, no matter the time of day. When I'm alone in the living room without the TV on, I can hear muffled voices from the basement. I have always felt very negatively in this house. Now, about four years ago, I lived at Country Hills apartment in Las Vegas, Nevada. My family and I had some weird encounters there. Well, first, it started with this. My sister and I went to my grandparents while my parents stayed home. We were all the way in Cali from Las Vegas, Nevada for a weekend. My dad woke up at night, the night we left. I mean, he heard a little girl singing in mine in my sister's room. He goes in there and sees my sister's rocking chair moving. Our second encounter was when my mom was going to take me to school one morning. And right when we open the door, the DVD player goes on. The radio on the DVD player. My mom and I were so tripped out, we were telling each other to turn it on until eventually my mom does it. Now how freaky and unexpected is that? Our third encounter was when the blinds for the sliding door that leads to the porch just started moving. It was strange. Really strange. My uncle had moved in with us a little bit before the second encounter, but the only encounter that he shared with us is when he invited a friend over and the blinds were closed. Then he noticed that all of a sudden they were open. 
he told us, and we got tripped out. I was right next to the blinds, too. That was my story, and thank you for reading. I work at a cemetery in California. I used to work the graveyard shift. As I was in the office doing paperwork, I suddenly heard a noise that startled me a bit. It almost sounded like faint singing from a distance. I got up, turned to face where I heard the mysterious singing. By the way, there were only four of us in the office. Everybody else was in the other room. And in that direction, I noticed a lady looking at me. She freaked me out so badly because she didn't even look real, translucent. All I could remember was that she had a smirk on her face and disappeared within seconds. It happened so fast, but I knew there was a lady there. She was just nowhere to be found. I walked around looking for this lady. I asked the other employees about it and they all looked at me like I was crazy. So I forgot about it, went back, and finished my paperwork. Well, the next night, we got four bodies in. I started to do paperwork on this one lady. As I started typing in the information, I went to check the tab on her toe and took the sheet off to see her face. And it was the lady from the night before. It freaked me out, and after that experience, I never doubted ghosts again. I was at the job for only one week at the time. It's now been ten years. I believe we walk and live with ghosts and spirits every day. They don't know they have passed on. I say that because I've experienced a few ghost sightings, and I heard things. It is so fascinating. In September of 2002, I was in Geneva, Switzerland on a business trip, and I was due to return home the day of my girlfriend's birthday. For her birthday, I purchased a violin, and I planned on giving it to her after she picked me up from the airport. The violin was at my house. The night before I was scheduled to return home, I called my girlfriend, but she was not home. So I left a message. After I hung up the phone, the phone rang back in my room in Switzerland. I picked the phone up, but I didn't hear anything. After saying hello a couple of times, I hung the phone up. Later that night, I again tried to call my girlfriend, and this time, she was home. As we spoke, she told me that she received both my messages. Having only called once before, I was very perplexed. I asked her what was said on the messages, and she described the first message that left to a T, but she thought that I was teasing her with the second message, since she thought that I might be giving her a violin for her birthday. After some prompting, she told me that she heard scratchy violin music, like a beginner tuning their instrument by me saying hello hello I thought she was joking but when I could tell that she was serious I asked her if it sounded like the music static or some other background noise she had the voice messages still on her answering machine and she played both messages back to me on the first message I could clearly hear my voice saying that I just called to say hi and that I would see her tomorrow the second message starts with about four seconds of clear but scratchy violin music. And then I could very clearly hear my voice saying hello, hello. My girlfriend said that both the messages had my phone number and the caller ID. By this time, I had convinced her that I did not leave the violin music on her machine, nor were there any TVs or radios turned on in my room during the call. All I could think of was, that I may have been hearing some future event when my girlfriend would be tuning her violin, that I would not be around to hear it. So I changed my plane reservations to take a different flight home. 
Nothing happened to the plane that I would have been on, but I cannot help to think that the violin music was meant to be some type of warning. Maybe I would have had a car accident if I took the other flight, or I would have been hit crossing the road. Regardless, an omen like that is hard to ignore. I've kept the message recording as a reminder of this very strange experience. In May 2006, it happened again. After over three and a half years, we received another ghostly phone call. Last night, we were sitting at home when my wife's, my girlfriend in 2002, cell phone rang. She answered it and at first did not hear anything. Then, the sound of the same scratchy violin music became slowly more pronounced. She said hello several times, but had no response except the music. She handed the cell phone to me, and I also heard the violin. Then, the sound just stopped. I did not hear a phone hang up. It just stopped. I closed the cell phone lid and then check the call log. There was no record of a call, incoming or outgoing, to the cell phone at that time. I'm scheduled for another flight to Atlanta on Thursday. I sure wish I could get out of it. In the Chinese calendar, people believe that the month of July is the time where all the ghosts come to Earth from hell. We call it the Ghost Festival. This is why Chinese people are very used to buying incenses in order to pray for these ghosts. During last year's Ghost Festival, something strange happened onto my family. It was the time where all my aunts and uncles and other relatives came back to my nanny's house. The entire family of mine sat in the living room, watching TV and chit-chatting. Suddenly. One of my aunts started yelling very loudly. I'm cold. I'm bleeding. I'm in pain. She then ran upstairs and started throwing everything she saw. She acted insane and her face turned pale. Every one of us in the family was shocked by her actions. We were panicked and did not have any idea of what had happened. My nanny was the only person who remained calm. Immediately, she called the ritual witch, whom we called her as Boombo, to the house. As soon as the Boombo arrived, my aunt ran to her and wanted to choke her to death. She yelled, I'm dead, and now it's your turn. Two of my cousins immediately captured her and pulled her away from the Boombo. The witch then murmured as if to cast spells on my aunt. About half an hour later, my aunt was awake. She said she felt exhausted and asked everyone what had just happened now. At the moment we told her the truth, my aunt was frightened and couldn't believe that. The witch told us that she was possessed by a ghost who was killed in an accident years ago. I have always been an avid believer in ghosts. I've never seen one physically manifest itself in human form, and I don't think I could cope if I did. I have an intense fear of ghosts, and at the same time, a morbid fascination with them. My first experience happened when I was 14 years old. I was going to stay with a friend of mine in a seaside village in Cornwall, England. I think it's called Portscaith. My dad had a friend who drove me down to the meeting point where my friend, whose family were already staying there, would pick me up. This guy's name was Mike, and he was the nicest guy you could ever imagine. We joked all the way down in the car, and he wound me up with stories of the Beast of Bodeman, a supposed large cat that lives in the moors in Dortmer, the county before Cornwall. We had a good laugh. By the time we reached the meeting point, it had gotten dark. My friend was unable to pick me up. Mike took me back to his house where I met his wife, Jenny. 
Jenny was as nice as Mike, but she was a little kooky. Looking at things that weren't there, and drawing really childlike pictures with crayons. I didn't really think much of it because I was tired from the journey. I was more fascinated with their house. Their house was so large that it had been divided into four apartments. Each one with winding stairs, large rooms, and old fashioned structures. The house itself dates back to the 1700s. After a while, I went upstairs to sleep in their son's room. He was away at the time and set about rifling through his music collection to pass the time. His CDs were in one corner of the room and every time I was looking through them, I felt like I was being watched from another corner of the room. I looked over to where I felt this presence emanating from and saw nothing except a barred window. It was only a small window with a few bars across it, and very high up, there was nothing there that should have made me feel so watched. I felt sleepy, so I turned the lights out and got into bed. As I was drifting off, I felt that same feeling of being watched. I snapped my eyes open and felt as if something retreated, ignoring this irrational feeling. I turned over to sleep on my side with my back to the wall. At that moment, the door, which was one of the old barn-like doors with a latch, made a noise. I heard the latch lift up and the door slowly creak open. Next, the light snapped on and I was blinking in shock, trying to see what happened. Next thing I heard was a scaffolding as something retreated down the slope accompanied by a horrific crackling under the breath laughter that scared the heck out of me. I tried to see what happened, but the door opened towards me and the light switch was beyond that, so I had no way of seeing who had turned the light on. From my bed, I tried to call out Mike, Jenny, but the words were really hard to say. I was so scared that any noise might bring the something back. I couldn't sleep with the light on, so I scuffled out of bed switched it off and practically jumped back into bed and under the covers where I felt safe. I finally fell asleep and thought nothing of it. I didn't really think about it again until a few months later when, out of the blue, my dad mentioned he was thinking of taking me to Cornwall to stay at that house. I told him my story and he told me that the house was haunted and that Jenny was one of those people who could see ghosts and communicate with them. He told me that the ghost that did that was probably Harry, a mischievous ghost. He also said that the house is full of them. A lot of children could be heard playing on the steps, and a Chinese washerwoman was always communicating with Jenny while she cleaned the kitchen. This at least explains some of Jenny's unusual behavior. She could sense ley lanes and everything. Being terrified of ghosts, I totally freaked upon hearing this, especially as dad told me we we're going to stay there. A few months later, after my exams he took me there as a treat. Knowing what I know now, it felt a little unsavory. I was absolutely terrified of walking into that house, especially as Mike and Jenny were away. I felt watched everywhere I went, and on the first night, I didn't sleep a wink or turn off the lights. The rest of the holiday, I actually spent sleeping in the same bed as my dad. A little unorthodox for a girl of 15, but it was a choice between my dad and the ghost, and I'd choose my dad any day. The last thing that happened which really scared me was that Jenny popped back for a short while and whilst there was cleaning the kitchen. As she did, I repeatedly saw her brush off something that wasn't there and say, with a giggle, get off, in the calm and patient way a mother does to a child that's pestering her for cookies. The next thing I saw was an invisible force actually pinch her clothing and pull it from her. I actually saw the shirt she was wearing become pinched and pulled away by nothing. She looked at me and said, oh, don't worry. 
That's just Hong Lee, the washerwoman. She thinks I'm not doing a good job of these surfaces. We didn't stay much longer. I've had several paranormal experiences during my life. Hearing my mother's voice after she had died, and feeling my mother-in-law's presence after she had also died. But in February 2002, an angel guided me from certain death. I awoke on a Saturday morning because I heard our dog whine, and that is when I realized our house was on fire. Our bedroom was off the living room which was totally in flames. I yelled to wake my husband, who jumped out of bed and ran right through the fire and out the front door. I started to follow him, but a hand touched my right shoulder and turned me to the right. At the same time, I heard a voice in my right ear saying, the window. I ran around the bed, opened the window and screen, and rolled out to the ground. It was a one-story house. I escaped with just a few burns to my back and left shoulder. My husband, on the other hand, was in intensive care for almost a month with acute smoke inhalation and second degree burns over half his body. I am certain that if I had followed him through that burning living room, I would have died. When I was in grade three of primary school, about 10 years old, I lived with my grandparents. Before my great-grandmother also lived with us, but she had also passed away for approximately five years. I remember that that night, it was Chinese New Year Eve. My family members all came back to my grandparents' house. After dinner, nearly eight o'clock, my parents and other uncles and aunts went to play Minjong game. When I was watching TV with my cousins, I felt thirsty, so I went to the kitchen to find some water. But something happened that I couldn't believe when I saw. It was a lady in the kitchen, a transparent figure. She was standing in front of the stove. However, the lady did not have any legs. She was just hovering above the kitchen. I was so scared to death that I ran out of the kitchen as fast as I could and ran into my uncle's and aunt's arms. Three years ago, I was taking university classes at St. Peter's College in Saskatchewan, about an hour and a half drive east of Saskatoon. The college was originally built as a monastery for monks who came up from Minnesota to found a colony around 1900. Since then, it had been expanded from a boys-only school to a fully integrated co-ed college. There are several ghosts on the property. One is supposedly the ghost of the first bishop of the area, who apparently died before the building's construction was completed. He can be seen occasionally walking the grounds. The other is a ghost of a small boy who had left this earth intentionally or died from an accident by falling out an upper story window. The year before I came to the college, the fourth floor was used for the drama and art classes and also had a small room where the staff could go for coffee breaks. One day, one of the women went upstairs to make some coffee. She was standing with her back to the door, loading the coffee maker, when she felt a presence behind her. Turning around, she saw a small boy standing there, then vanished right in front of her. The first year that I attended school, I took part in amateur night one Friday. I was invited back to the girl's residence by some friends for tea. The place had originally been a housing for a small group of nuns that had lived at the colony and was only a few feet from the main buildings. It was after midnight when I finally said goodnight and headed out. I had taken no more than three steps when I had the most unshakable feeling that something didn't want me on the grounds. There was the sensation that I was being chased that I just couldn't stand and I ran to my car. The feeling didn't stop 
until I crossed the railroad tracks, which I found out later was the marker of the boundaries of the college grounds. I told some friends about this, and we all agreed that we should stay some time after midnight and try to see some ghosts. Well, we tried, but that is as far as it went. None of us had the nerve to stay past midnight. Strange feelings and weird noises always promoted us to leave just before the midnight hour. I've been privileged enough to have the luxury of traveling on many cruises over the years. Being born at 12, it's something that you get accustomed to. With that being said, all these experiences are not without their ghost stories. There were times in which I had terrifying encounters with spirits while alone in my cabin. I'm not just talking the stereotypical hauntings, knocks on the walls, objects being moved around, and other supernatural phenomena, but legitimate full-bodied apparitions and dark shadows looming the halls of the cabin, as well as seeing the presence of ghost sailors. One of my earliest paranormal experiences on a ship was when I was roughly 12 years old. My parents were wealthy enough to purchase a gigantic yacht for me and my family. However, we were able to buy it off the previous owner, who ended up being a great family friend. His name was Joe. Joe suffered from a multitude of health problems, suffered mild heart attacks, had high blood pressure, I really became somewhat of a father figure for me in my youth. Every time he'd see me, he'd run up to me and give me a giant bear hug and yell, My little Sadie. He was such a great guy. However, being a 58-year-old male with all these medical health issues, I kind of felt like our days with him would be numbered. He suffered one last heart attack, and it would be the last of his life. That's because, unfortunately, this heart attack was the one which would take his life. So let me backtrack a little. Joe had been with us, me and my parents on the yacht, for the entire day. The morning before he died, Joe and I had a heart-to-heart. -heart. We were on lawn chairs on the deck, and he warned me about the dangers of excess to not get so absorbed in these riches. Joe was a successful man, but he always reminded me that all of these riches don't mean a thing if you're not a good person at heart. I'll never forget his words. Sadie, you can't bring anything with you when you're gone. These are the moments we live for. It's not about this yacht or the things you own in life. It's about the bonds we share with the people we love. I remember he urged me and said, do not waste this life. You can't get back this life, kiddo. I remember I just sort of smiled at him and nodded my head. Being 12, of course, I didn't really fully understand the magnitude of his words. So the day went on. We all had dinner together on that yacht. And later that night, that's when Joe decided to go back to his cabin to rest. He told us that he was very exhausted and just wanted a good night's rest. The morning after, I knocked on Joe's door in the cabin in his room. We had three separate rooms, and he wouldn't answer. I called for my parents. They opened the door, and that's when they found him dead. I was devastated and cried for days. About a month or so after his death, my parents were again on our yacht. All of our moments on our yacht were a little more somber after the death of our great friend Joe. Anyway, it was starting to get dark when my parents told me to get back into the cabin to go back to sleep. I yelled back that I wanted a few more minutes and they eventually relented. Our yacht is pretty long, so there is a lot of space to get around. The next few events are unexplainable and lead me to believe that our ship was in fact haunted. So, 
I'm standing right in the spot that me and Joe used to with our lawn chairs and just taking in the scenery of the blue waters and breathing in the fresh air delicately touching my face. As I began to think of Joe, my eyes began to water. For some reason, I had an urge to look right behind me. Right behind me was where I could see the control room for where you could drive the yacht. As I stared into the window of the control room, I recognized the face for a few seconds. I knew it wasn't my imagination, but I wasn't able to figure out whose face it was. I got kind of spooked and ran into the cabin. My parents were both still there, so I had to rule them out. I didn't even mention what I saw to my parents because I'm sure they would have dismissed me. Anyway, it's getting super late at night and my parents are sleeping soundly. I had trouble sleeping because of what I saw, as well as the fact that I was profoundly missing Joe. I remember I went to the bathroom to splash water on my face and try to calm myself down a bit. However, once again, something insane happened. As I looked into the mirror, I saw the face of a man right behind my shoulder. Again, the face wasn't obvious, so I couldn't make it out, but it was enough to recognize that there was someone in the mirror. It's hard to explain, but it almost looked like a poorly rendered image from a video or something. Either way, I hopped back into bed terrified. It wasn't until days later, when I really thought about it, that I realized it could have been Joe's face in the control room and mirror. Knowing this possibility, it allowed me to become less frightened and more comforted. If I were Joe, I don't think his intentions were to scare me. I think he just wanted to let me know that he was okay, that he was watching over me. Years later, when I was 19, I was on the road and I got into a terrible car wreck. I crashed into a tree. Luckily for me, I was able to escape unscathed, and my parents drove me home. My parents were furious because I told them I had been texting and driving. Later that night, I had a dream. In the dream, Joe appeared in it. He looked very disappointed in me and literally said to me, You have learned nothing. A phone is an object. Whatever you think is important can wait. All I could say to Joe was that I'm sorry I upset him, and he said worry about yourself. The dream ended. I remember waking up in a cold sweat and crying. That's all I have for now. I'm 35 now, and to reiterate, the events in this story are 100% real and factual. I noticed that many stories on the site are lacking a bit of variety, and just wanted to share something different than the typical stories I read. I don't have that same yacht anymore, and I've since become a mother with a family of my own. I'm a 20-year-old English writing professional major attending Slippery Rock University, Pennsylvania, and I've never believed in ghosts until this happened to me early last fall. My good friend told me about Snyder Cemetery in Butler County, Pennsylvania, and its alleged hauntedness. He, our other mutual friend and I, decided to visit it one Friday night. We drove up to the entrance, parked his truck, and bought a few lighters and a scented candle. The only things we had in the car that would emit light and ventured in. We as a group initially found nothing out of the ordinary in the way of activity. I, however, started hearing on human moaning coming out of the surrounding trees. My two other friends didn't hear them. However, when I asked them if they heard it, even as it was going on, still skeptical, it surely was some kind of animal I told myself. I ventured around to the rusted iron gate in the back. As soon as I opened the gate, I felt as if I had walked into a wall. 
I've been in a life and death situation before. My arm was severed by a large piece of glass when I was young, and I know what it's like feeling and knowing that I may die. I had the same exact feeling as I walked through the entrance. I physically, for the first time that night, was scared, beyond scared, petrified even. It was now dark. I creeped forward and lit my lighter to read a gravestone. I couldn't read it because of my actual shaking and fear. After about 15 seconds in the enclosed graveyard, I quickly exited. Then, the real problem started. As I went back to my friends who were standing at the entrance, they both decided it was best to leave. Apparently they were bored. We walked out through the entrance and got into his truck, a late 90s GMC pickup. The truck wouldn't start for about five turns of the key. Eventually, it did start. Then the truck's headlights started flickering extremely rapidly, but randomly, from high to low beam, as if being controlled by a person. We started barreling down the gravel road, in fear of whatever it was doing this. Immediately we noticed that a dense, zero visibility fog had come around our truck. We could only see about three inches past the headlights, and only the outline of the road. Burton Road extends for probably about two miles either direction out of the cemetery. For that entire stretch, we had no visibility due to the fog, and the truck's lights were behaving erratically, as previously stated. As soon as Burton ended, and we were on the main road, the fog disappeared, and the headlights were fine, and have been ever since. No areas that we drove through to get home had fog, and the lights haven't acted that way since. These are the things we have experienced. Cell phones go out as soon as you get onto Burton Road. No service from four different providers, including Virgin, Nokia, Verizon, and Trackphone. Drums. This is sometimes listed on other sites, but not on yours. Odd, bassy but wooden sounding drums are heard. Not like a bass kick drum, a more of a war drum sound, playing simple war beats. Sounds of heavy creatures, peoples, or whatever entities in the woods, snapping sticks, walking in trees, etc. When pulling out, a feeling of tugging or extra weight in the car, as if we were riding the brakes, or we had about 500 pounds in the trunk. I hope all of this will be helpful in your listings on your hauntings. One last thing, Butler County. Marine State Park Burton Road Snyder Cemetery. Red eyes will chase you out. Also, something else will chase you out as well. It is Conrad Snyder who is haunting the family's resting place. I've been reading the stories on the site for a while, and I would like to share one of the many experiences I've had. This was without a doubt, one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. Now as a little bit of a backstory, I've been aware of the other realm and its inhabitants all my life. Also my mother, her mother, my nana, and her mother, my great nana, have as well. I've been in tune with the entities that are among us my entire life. So. To say that this particular event scared the heck out of me is saying a lot, but I think the only reason why it scared me so much is just because it happened to someone I love, and it hit so very close to home. I want to make it very clear that I am absolutely no way being dishonest. Here is my story. My boyfriend and I had just recently gotten together and had only been dating a few months. We were house-sitting his parents' house while his parents were out of town, and we were sleeping in his parents' room. Also, we had just gotten our dog, that was a puppy at the time, a week before. This is all relevant to the story. It was a Sunday, and things had felt very different that day, not normal, and I had taken a nap during the day, 
which for me is just simply not something I do. But it was a good thing that I did, and I found out why later. As the day turned to night, around 11 p.m., I tried to get my boyfriend to come to bed with me. He was acting weird and said that he would be coming to bed really soon. Now, like I said, it was around 11, and anyway, I went to bed, and I ended up jolting awake at 10 minutes till 5 in the morning. I remember because I looked at the clock. Anyway, my boyfriend had not come to bed yet, and all the lights were still on in the house, but I disregarded it, and I laid back down. Then I heard him coming down the hall, and got into bed. When he laid down, he obviously sounded very tired, and he said, in almost a dazed voice, that there was a man outside the front window of the house that he and the dog both saw, and they didn't like the way the guy looked. He also said that he had just taken a sleeping pill. Now, my boyfriend kept telling me to look out the window. At this point, I was getting freaked out, because my boyfriend says there is a weird looking guy outside, and he just took a sleeping pill. So I told my boyfriend I was going to call one of my friends that is expertly versed in the ways of the supernatural, and when I told him that, he started saying no, don't call her, and at that point, I immediately called her. Now while I was on the phone with her, my boyfriend shot upright in bed, and started repeating the phrase, when all the lights go out. He just kept repeating it, and then, as he was halfway through the saying, his voice changed into the most demonic sounding voice I've ever heard in my life. I have never moved so fast in my life. I turned on all the lights and went to the living room. I was just watching the hall to see if my boyfriend came after me. I was trying to decide if I should go to my car, but I was under the impression that someone was out there, so I felt trapped. But. I finally got enough courage to get to my car, and I never saw anyone outside, and to this day, I still firmly believe the man who my boyfriend saw was the demon. As I sat out there trying to call one of my friends to come to the house so that I wasn't alone, my boyfriend kept calling me from the house. Now, he kept saying on the phone that he couldn't move, yet he was able to call me. Our dog was very small, and in a big deep box at the time, he kept telling me that our dog was in the hall, and bleeding, that he was scared, and he needed me. I knew things still weren't right, and then before I knew it, he was speaking and laughing in that demonic voice again. Finally around 6am, my friend showed up, and he escorted me into the home. When I got back to the bedroom, my boyfriend was passed out, and I went up to him with my blessed cross, and remember, he's passed out, and every time I got the cross two inches from his hand, he would close his hand. My friend saw that his eyes did not move, and were closed, and he was not awake. If I had not had a witness there, I wouldn't believe it myself. Then, as I turned my back and started to walk away, he started laughing in that voice again, and telling me to get out. Then, I told the demon that I was aware of what it was trying to do. Then, my boyfriend passed out again. So my friend and I left the home, because I had to go to work. Well, later that day, my boyfriend called me, asking why her dog was in its box in the bathtub with the water running. I had not done that and he obviously didn't do it either. But when I started talking about the events of the night, he didn't remember any of it. But he did talk to his mom, and she said that the same thing had happened to his dad many years before. I knew that there was something in that house, but what had visited that night was not it. I grew up on a farm and I had stepbrothers and sisters. We lived in this old farmhouse that had four bedrooms upstairs, and I shared a room with my stepbrother who was about two years younger than me. It was 1986, 
and I was 17 when this happened. Our room was a small one. We had two beds in there. And the way I had my bed was that the end of my bed was towards the bedroom door. And then my head was about two feet from the wall because I had a couple rifles, a 22, and my 32 Winchester Special the night this happened. I was sleeping on my belly with my arms under my pillow, and something woke me up. It wasn't a noise or light. Maybe it was a dream, but I woke up and kind of pushed myself up a little bit with my arms to look at the door. When I looked, there was this figure, a dark shadow, or better yet, like a silhouette, and for some reason, almost telepathically I learned that it's just one of my sisters. Their room was straight across from mine on the other side, just bringing in one of the cats to sleep with me because the cat was keeping them up. We had a lot of barn cats that weren't allowed in the house. So I turned back around the way I was before I woke up and laid my head back down and I expected the cat to be put on my bed and the feeling that I got was very comfortable feeling like everything is okay a few seconds later I felt the weight of the cat snuggled up to my side like it was half on my bed and head and paws on my kidney area of me I woke up a couple more times feeling this kitty cat still next to me I was going to reach around and pet it, but I didn't want to wake her up. After a good night of sleep, I woke up and I couldn't believe that the cat was still in my bed and partially on my side, and I did not find a cat on bed with me. I found my 22 rifle laying across my back. I was totally confused by this. I wanted to confirm that it was not me who put my rifle across my back. So I put it back to where I had it before I went to sleep. And to be able to get at it, I would have to have gotten on my knees and reached way over to the corner. And with one arm grabbing it, and I couldn't lift it up at that angle. Of course, nobody had believed in me. So I just never tell the story, except for now. For my next story, I'm going to say something first as it relates to my story. I have what is now known by some as sleep paralysis. I'm sure a lot of you know what this is. When you wake up and you are mutually awake, but you cannot move. This is a very terrifying experience. I have heard many theories on this, and the one that makes the most sense to me is by Sylvia Brown. She says that while you sleep, your soul leaves its vehicle, your body, and goes wandering around to various places. As a result, your body wakes up, but you can't do anything about it because your soul isn't back from its journey to whatever. On with the second story. After we had sold the farm, my family moved into this town called Ashland, Wisconsin. I decided that if I wanted to make it in life, I had to go to college so I stayed in this house my parents bought, which was very old. Not sure what year was built, but it was one of the first ones built when the town started. My room was a very small room, about the size of a large bathroom, but it worked. The year was 1993, and I stayed there throughout my college years till I graduated. One night, again I was sleeping on my belly, and I was in a very deep sleep. Something woke me up, not a noise or light. Everything was as dark as it could get. It woke me up enough where I sat up and I was staring towards my door. I couldn't see my door. It was so dark. I was wide awake and I kept looking at it, almost as if I was in a trance of some sort. All of a sudden, I got this telepathic-like communication that told me that everything is okay you don't have to worry this feeling is the most bizarre feeling as if someone's mind is with my mind talking to each other so then i was told to lay down and don't be scared 
Then I got this extremely comforting feeling, so I laid back down, except this time I laid down on my left side. Then I felt someone or something's hand around my neck, and it started the squeeze, and then I cocked my head over to the side of my bed, by my neck. Meanwhile, I tried my hardest to yell or scream to wake someone up, but all that could come out of my mouth was a little gargling sound that no one could hear, except for myself. This was extremely terrifying. Then I had the feeling of high voltage electricity that make this humming sound and buzzing sound and feeling this throughout my entire body. I then woke up in the morning in that exact same position that it left me in. So, those are somewhat short versions of my two stories. I have many more like them. Thank you for taking the time to listen. During my college years, my brother and I lived in an old brownstone in South Minneapolis. The apartment itself was large and sub-level with two bedrooms. From the moment we moved in, we knew there was something wrong. On numerous occasions, I saw someone in my hallway moving across the rooms out of the corner of my eye. I always felt that it was my eyes playing tricks on me initially, but then stranger things began to occur. We began to have our television turn itself on at night. The stereo would do the same. I would be sleeping at night, and it would just start blaring. My bedroom was the worst. It was uncomfortable. I became afraid to sleep in there. I could not describe the feeling. I began sleeping out in the living room, or on the futon. Finally, I told myself to stop with the silliness and resign myself to sleep back in the bedroom again. I did so uncomfortably for a few nights, only to be awakened one night by a man's disembodied head hovering above me and smiling. I still very clearly remember it. I screamed as loud as I could and took off out of that room, and never slept in it again. We moved out after six months of living there. There was a large home in Martin that I lived in for 20 years. It used to be a carriage stop. The first day I was moving in, there was a woman in a black high-collared dress peering out at me, and my mother. The curtain was being held back and she was fiddling with the brooch and the collar of her dress. Once inside the house, it appeared to be a bundle of gray dusty rags floating in the air close to the ceiling. It swooped down under a doorway and went out through the window. It has been seen many times in the road in front of the house. A man in a black coat with a high collar holding a lantern and swing it back and forth as if to lead the way for persons passing through. Sleeping on the couch one afternoon, a little girl in a blue dress was standing in front of me. I couldn't see her face, but she seemed so real. Lying in bed at night, and sometimes in the morning, footsteps can be heard walking up the stairs. You can't move. You feel a weight that holds you still. All you can see is the boots of a large man, he looks into every bedroom and then goes back downstairs. You can then move. In the parlor, you could hear a party going on, and while that is going on, you hear a baby crying. When my mom and I were sitting in the dining room, we both saw objects being thrown across the laundry room. You feel cold and get goosebumps throughout the house. A while ago, me and my friend were doing a project for school, and we got to choose what we did. So we did Ghosts and Hauntings, and we used the site, and it helped us loads. But anyway, while we were working, our substitute came over and saw what we were doing, 
and he asked us if we ever had seen a ghost. I think I've heard a ghost crying, but I wasn't too sure, and my friend hasn't seen anything. But my sub said that he had seen one. He said that he went to look after his nephew once, and he saw something. He said that he went around to his brother's house, and while his brother and his wife were getting ready, his nephew came downstairs and told his dad that he had seen the man with the big hat and the funny glasses right upstairs. My teacher asked his brother what he was on about, and his brother said that he had seen the ghost again. My teacher didn't believe him, but his brother said he'd seen it upstairs. Then when his brother and his bro's wife had gone, his nephew, who was only five, wanted to play football in the garden. So as they were going through the kitchen, his nephew said that the man with the big hat and funny glasses was behind my teacher. He freaked out and was scared to death. He said he just wanted to get out of the house, but made himself turn around. He said that he saw a ghastly form that had a pilot's hat on, an old one, not a helmet like nowadays, and that the thing was wearing big goggles. He later found out that his brother's house was built in an old airfield. The story freaked us out. I've been to Reader Road many times, and actually know a different story of the road. The ones I saw on your site are new to me. My parents told me the story long ago. And although I've not experienced it for myself, I know others who claim to have. This may be more of a local story, but who knows? It's still something I'd like to share. Back in the 1950s, the road was often used by teens and young adults as a private makeout place. The story goes that a young lady and her boyfriend made a stop at the road. While they were parked, they heard a thumping on top of the car. They ignored it for a bit, but the girl started to become creeped out as the noise grew louder. The boyfriend decided he would get out and investigate. When he got out, the thumping stopped. After several minutes, the boyfriend had not returned and the thumping started again. The girl panicked and got out of the car. She found her boyfriend bloodied and hung from a tree, and the thumping she was hearing was the sound of her boyfriend's feet hitting the top of the car as he hung there dead. Supposedly on warm summer nights, if you pull off into the road and park for a bit, you will hear the thumping, and if you get out to investigate, the thumping will stop, and you will find a letterman's jacket hanging from the tree above you. There is also an abandoned school out in Cedar Lake, where Hammond Baptist used to attend. The story goes that the pastor went crazy and removed some of the little ones from this world, if you know what I mean. I have personally have experienced strange happenings in the school, such as children's voices, windows that were shut on the way in open as we walked back out. Supposedly, it's supposed to be the little ones trying to escape. From what I understand a few years ago, part of the building caught fire inexplicably. I haven't been there in about five years. However, if you would like some directions to the place, it's a little tricky to get to, and I would be happy to share them with you if you are interested. Like I said, this is a story passed on to me by my parents, and others I know also know the story and claim to have witnessed it. I'm also aware of the satanic gatherings in the field, down the trail in the woods, usually occurring during the two equinox every year. This may explain some of the animal parts we found. Also, in this field, I've seen glowing orbs here and there, but never thought much of them since they were out far in the field. But you may be able to look into this more than I can. Oh, and the girl that jumped into the river and drowned, she is also part of this story, and Hammond, of course. She can be seen on Halloween night on Klein Avenue, hitchhiking to get to her wedding. 
Supposedly, if you pick her up, she thanks you for the ride and then disappears into the night. My name is Gemma. I went to a primary school in a small village where I lived for a year or two. Then we had to move into a town nearby. It wasn't too far away from my friends, so sometimes I would catch the bus there. One day, I went up to see my friend Holly. She told me that my old deputy head teacher had just died. I don't know how old he was, but apparently he got murdered. That night, Holly asked me to stay at her house for the night, so I did. We were only about 10 at the time. Her parents were downstairs, and her two little brothers were both asleep. We were the only people awake upstairs. Holly went downstairs to get something to eat for me and her, and left me alone. I decided to play a trick on her. I turned all the lights off and hid under her bed in her room. I looked around. I was really scared, so I looked up and saw two eyes looking at me. They were glowing. At that point, I closed my eyes, thinking it was just my imagination. When I opened my eyes, they were still there. I stayed under the bed because I didn't want to move. Then, I heard Holly coming up the stairs. The eyes backed away into the darkness, and I backed away and hid again. When Holly came into the room, I jumped out and scared her. I told her about the eyes, and she believed me. Then she said, let's take a look inside the wardrobe. So we both opened it slowly and took a look inside. Funny enough, nothing was in there except for her clothes and stuff, so we both decided that it was me seeing things because it was dark. Later that night, Holly turned the lights off, and we both went to sleep. I couldn't get to sleep, and I kept on looking over at the wardrobe. I laid there with my eyes open, when suddenly, I saw the eyes again, looking over at me. I slid under my covers. When I looked out, they had gone, but I could feel something in the room. I knew something was there. Suddenly, a black figure appeared in front of me. It laid down, and then I saw the eyes. It was staring right at me. I screamed, which woke Holly up, and she suddenly backed away against the wall. We could both see the black figure on the floor. Then it seemed to sink into the ground and disappear. We both went downstairs and stayed there for a couple of hours. We talked about the figure for ages. Then I said it reminded me of something. Holly said that as well. If we both realized that it looked like Mr. Baker. Why would he haunt us though? We'll never know. When I was younger, I had quite a few paranormal experiences, as did my mom. The most direct contact either of us had with spirits was with her father. He died at home and lived with us when I was about four. My mom was very close to him, and I was pretty close to him too for being so young. After he died, my mom would often be house cleaning and walk into his room where his old recliner sat and smell his unique scent, cigarette smoke mixed with cologne and whatnot. She never saw or heard him, but she would know he was there and would talk to him for a while. When I was six, we moved out of the house he died in and into the house where my mom still lives. I never had the type of encounters my mom had with him but I was lucky enough to see him once. First, I need to explain the setup of her house. 
The front and back doors are directly parallel to each other, and both have glass panes in them. The front door opens into the dining room, and you can walk straight through to the kitchen, and then to the back door. You can look from the front porch all the way into the backyard through the glass in these doors. When I was about seven, I was standing in the kitchen, looking out the window of the back door, and I could see the reflection of the front door in the glass. Suddenly, I saw my grandfather walk by the front door in the reflection, as though he was walking across the front porch. He smiled and waved at me. The whole thing only lasted a split second, but he was very deliberately contacting me. I believe he chose to do it in such an indirect way, so as to not frighten me. Maybe he was saying goodbye, since I was too young to understand when he actually died. What's really strange, though, is that I described him to my mom as looking younger than he did when he died. And when she showed me some pictures of him in his 40s, I told her that that's exactly how he appeared to me. She thinks he must have been happiest during that time of his life, and so chose to appear that way. I think it was a couple years after that when my mom had her final encounter with him. She was house cleaning again, when she smelled his familiar odor. She was in a hurry. And she told him, I'm sorry, Dad. I can't really talk right now. And left the room. When she came back in, the scent was gone. And she just knew that was the last time she would hear from him. She feels guilty that she didn't stop to talk to him. But I think she just realized that she was ready to move on. And that's why he didn't contact her again. We do believe that he stuck around for a while after that because he would often lose a piece of jewelry or something small, only to have it turn up right under our noses a few days later. I've had other experiences unrelated to my grandfather, but his was the only human spirit I ever actually saw. Not long after we moved into the new home, I had several experiences with feline spirits. I once saw the hind legs and tail of a cat disappearing into, not up, the top of the stairs from the landing. I know it could have been our own cat, because it was pure white, and our two cats were black. Another time, I was sitting at the kitchen table when I felt a cat rubbing against my legs. I reached down to pet it, but nothing was there, and when I looked under the table, there was no cat to be found. There were also a few incidents in my mom's house where electronics would do seemingly things on their own. The TV turned itself off at least twice that I can remember. But perhaps the weirdest instance was when I was in my bedroom listening to my stereo. It has one of those LED screens that flashes at things as music plays. And when you turn the volume knob, these bars show up on the screen that move up or down as you change the volume. I was listening to music one day, and I had my back to the stereo. When I realized the volume was getting lower, I turned around, and the volume display came up on the screen, and the bars were going down like the knob was being turned. I turned the volume back up, and nothing else happened after that. This has gotten long, but I only have one more experience to share. At another sleepover with my best friend, we decided to leave a tape recorder with a blank tape in an empty room while we hung out in the living room and record whatever there was to hear. No one went in the room while I was recording, and the door was shut. When we played it back, we could very faintly hear ourselves in the living room for most of the tape, and nothing else. But there was one spot on the tape where a high-pitched voice spoke in a loud, raspy whisper. It was obviously neither of us, because you could hear us in the background very softly behind it. 
we weren't sure what it said, but it sounded like shine a light. It didn't make any sense, but it did creep us out. That was the only unexplained voice on the tape, which unfortunately, I no longer have. That was the last experience I had that I'm certain had no physical explanation. This is a story about ghosts that I think is worth sharing. It's a little bizarre and not very detailed, but I think it would capture your interest. When I was young, I always heard ghost stories revolving around these red coat ghosts. These were entities that would often appear in our house. The home I lived in used to house British soldiers from Napoleon's time. So essentially the late 1700s. I remember one particular incident. It was late at night. And that's when I started to hear strange noises in my room. At first I brushed them off. Not thinking anything of it. Because you can always explain these incidents away. As nothing more than just normal noises. Then I started to hear noises which were very peculiar. I would hear faded whispers, like a group of people whispering when I would open my door to investigate the sound. It wasn't anything loud, and didn't last for too long. Of course, I ended up going down that staircase to find a root cause of these whispers. What I saw next was actually quite interesting to me. Not scary, although a bit unbelievable. After going downstairs and into the living room, I saw two red coat soldiers for a second, just standing side by side as they quickly faded from the living room. They also had a foggy and faded quality to them to begin with, where you could barely tell a figure was there with the red colors. I'll never forget the moment the rest of my life. Growing up in Lakeland, Florida, my parents purchased a repossessed mobile home. One of the bedroom doors had a deadbolt lock, but face of the child in the room could not get out. My elder sister had this room and reported a small girl about the age of five or six that would appear in a white nightgown carrying a teddy bear. She would sit at the end of my sister's bed and just cry. In the closet of the bedroom in the same home, there were stickers and drawings on the wall where it appeared someone was punished and made to sit in the closet. There were also fingernail scratches on the wall in the same closet. In the third children's room of the same home, there was brown carpeting with a lime green shape on the floor that was the same shape of a clothes iron. If an iron fell into carpeting while it was hot, doesn't it make sense it would just burn the carpet hair instead of change the color to green? My aunt even had to come remove a spirit once that was following my little sister all the way to school and hiding behind things when she'd turn around to see who was following her. My little sister said it resembled a grim reaper type of shadow. In the same home, Items would mysteriously be moved to another area. Things would then come up missing, then all of a sudden reappear one day. I truly believe that we are not living alone on this earth, and that spirits live among us. There are a lot of theories as to why this is, but to me, I believe that ghosts and spirits are almost other living forms trapped in another dimension. Even if we have loved ones who have passed and appeared to us, to me, it's like they are leaving this realm of existence to enter another one, and they behave much like we all do, often unaware of the world they just left. I believe that the ones that chose to bridge the gap between our world and theirs 
are messengers chosen by God to give us confirmation that we as human beings will not lose purpose once we have left this earth, and that our souls do live on. Even if you aren't a religious type, I do believe that if ghosts exist, then God must exist in some form. Otherwise, how do these souls still live on? And what power is allowing them to exist in the other universe? Anyway, my ghost experience comes at the time I was staying at my grandmother's. It was night, and I was 11 years old. I was watching TV in the living room when I heard what sounded like my grandfather, who was a heavy set man, but tall, make his way through the home. Noticeable footsteps, as if he were wearing boots, and they were walking across the hardwood floor. At the time, I immediately recognized it was probably my deceased grandpa. So I yelled out to Grandpa Bunky, please stop scaring me. I was hoping I would get confirmation of him leaving me alone, because I'm a very anxious person. And even though I'm in tune with spirits, sometimes I just don't want to deal with it. I don't think my grandpa honestly meant any harm by it. But I think he felt that he wasn't getting enough attention, if that makes sense, and wanted his presence to really be known that day. He was always known as a loud, boisterous person in life, the kind of man that had to be the center of attention. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I could have swear I saw the shadow of my grandfather materialize. As soon as I got up to turn directly to where he was, he was gone and faded. So I rushed downstairs to where my grandma was. I really wanted to make sure that nobody else was upstairs. So I just asked grandma if she was just up the stairs in the hall. She emphatically said no and asked me why I was so concerned. I told her that I saw Grandpa, and she said that Grandpa is gone, and that while you may miss him, we have to accept this. She didn't believe in the afterlife. Funny thing was, about a year before this all happened, my great uncle died of a disease in his lungs and kidneys. This was the exact same disease that my Grandpa had died from. While that's not unusual, my older sister told me she witnessed the exact same thing that happened to me. One night, when I was at a friend's house sleeping over, she was about 17 at the time. So, I'm not entirely sure if it was my grandpa or great uncle exactly, but I still think my grandpa was the one to visit because he knew me better than my great uncle did. I also think that it had to be my grandpa, because maybe he wanted my grandma to believe, but since she is closed off to this world because of her views, he was frustrated. Maybe he gave her signs, and she ignored them. Are frustrated ghosts a thing? Anyway, hope you enjoyed my story. I have a crazy story to tell. I live in New Orleans. That's of course located in Louisiana, the deep south. One night, me and my girlfriend were at home, and I'm guessing it was around 5.30 in the morning. I'm assuming, because that's when I got up to go to work, and I always sit by the window and wait for my ride. This morning was a bit unusual and different. I was sitting there, and all of a sudden, I felt this overwhelming chill brush past me, like an undeniable cold air. I asked my girlfriend if she was cold, and she said no. I don't know what it was, but something told me to tell her to sit in my chair to see if she felt what I was describing. It was a lingering cold that didn't go away and told me she could feel the cold chill as well. It gave us both goosebumps 
and within a few moments, the coldness quickly disappeared. The crazy part is, I think the chair is haunted. It was given to me as a present from generations in the family. I'm talking an early 1900s style rocking chair. I remember one of my uncles wanted to just sell it off eBay to get rid of it because he didn't want anything to do with it. So I ended up taking it off his hands because of the family history. The most interesting part of this chair is a lot of my family members have claimed to see a black figure in that chair rocking back and forth on numerous occasions. At times, it would be seen rocking on its own without anything being seen. I still have yet to witness anything like this, but ironically, a friend staying over our house actually did. It was later that night, and my girlfriend and I were in a separate room. Suddenly, my friend screams for us to come in because he just saw the rocking chair move on its own without any force. He didn't even know about the history of that chair and our family. So that made it even more terrifying, but intriguing in a way. My dad had stayed in our house once, and he said looking out the window, there was a tree outside our home, and late at night, he saw a faded man in overalls walk behind the tree and suddenly disappear. Again, none of these things have personally happened to me, but they seem to be happening to my family and friends. None of them are capable of lying. I don't see why anyone would anyway, since we're all older, mature adults, and we have no business lying for attention or any purpose, really. Now, just because I said I didn't experience anything, besides the coldness in the chair, doesn't mean my girlfriend hasn't. She told me one day when she was out on the front porch where you could see the tree, it was evening, it was getting pretty dark, but not so dark, you couldn't see anything. She too thought she saw a very dark shadow move around the tree and then disappear. She said it was the weirdest thing because it was like a fog and you could easily see the contrast between the tree and this mysterious fog. I don't know if you've seen these type of videos before on YouTube. Will they show this type of stuff? But she said it was very similar to that. She's also seen the blinds from the window where the chair is positioned move from time to time without any explanation. Knocks on the walls, and sometimes her name is whispered into her ear. Again, these are her experiences, so I can't tell you if it's real based on what she said. But again, my girlfriend wouldn't lie to me for no reason. As you know, New Orleans is a city with lots of history dating back hundreds of years. And with our old home, there's bound to be some entity, especially with the haunted chair. Do you believe in this? Because honestly, as crazy as it may seem, I do, even without having these experience for my own to share. As an open-minded person, I'm not just going to hate on someone just because they have a ghost story to tell. I'll be open-minded. I'll consider their credibility and other things. If all those aspects of their personality check out, then yes, I'll have to believe them. This world is fascinating. It has a lot of mystery. I will not just ignore the spirit world. I just wish that I could experience it too just once, what everyone else has as well. I used to live in the Theta Chi fraternity house, as a brother. There were stories talking about the house had a fire in the attic, and whole sorts of supernatural and paranormal happenings. I can confirm, the fire in the attic was true, and strange things did happen too. Some even reported glowing eyes in the dark of the attic. However, one of the most common had to do with the lights. We had sensors installed to cut back on the brothers leaving the lights on. 
These sensors only react to the movement. These lights would go on and off all the time when nobody would be in the room. We would be several rooms away, far enough from the sensors that we wouldn't set them off, and they would suddenly go on and off. Also, there were times when we would be sleeping, and we would wake up to what sounded like a large social gathering downstairs. Several of us would go down there, thinking it was a group of brothers coming home from the bar, only to find the entire house empty and no one would be around. Also, I used to work at Half a Nice Day Cafe, and the upstairs was indeed haunted. I would have to go up there every night to take down a banner that was thrown over the exterior of the building. To do this, I would have to go to the roof via the upstairs. It is full of rooms, completely empty. There was this long hallway that stretched the length of the building. There was only one light that sat at the end of the hallway. As you walked down the hall, you would get the feeling that you were being watched. Several bouncers have claimed to see a man up there. Apparently, before it was half a nice day cafe, it was called industry. And one night, a bar back intentionally left the world upstairs using a broken beer bottle, and when the bouncers would make the rounds before closing, they would have to go up there to make sure no one snuck up there. When they would flash their flashlights into the room in which the sad incident took place, the man ghost was seen crying and bleeding. He would get up and run towards you, as if asking for help. Many bouncers quit after they experienced it. I guess you could say they bounced after they saw that ghost. This is a true story of our family's experience at Theodorus' Bridge in Wichita, Kansas. I grew up in Sigwich, Kansas, a small town just north of the bridge's location. Since my family is American Indian, we always respected the legend and tales of the bridge. On May 12th, 1983, my own mother was killed in a car wreck within feet of the old bridge. The police couldn't explain what caused her to swerve sharply to the left. However, they agree that something must have been in the road right in front of her. What's odd is that no animal tracks were ever found and it wasn't another car. I was young at the time, and I woke around midnight with a horrible dream. It had to do with being grossly removed from this life. Someone had chopped my head off with an axe. Later that morning, around 4.45 a.m., I was awakened again by someone pounding on my door. It was the police looking for me. Turns out, they found my driver's license in my mom's car. Thinking it was me who died, they came to inform my parents only to find me standing in the doorway. Several years later, I was helping my dad go through some papers and found my mom's death certificate. Only then did I find out that mom was thrown through the windshield of their head coming right off. Throughout the years, as family members and friends have drove by, the sight strange things have happened to them. Their cars would quit working for just a few moments or they see things, like my mom standing there, looking at them and smiling. If anyone would like to email me, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about all the strange things I've occasionally seen. My name is Catherine. After the experiences me and my family have had, I know we have a ghost. It all started when I was seven. I couldn't get to sleep. I looked down from my bunk bed for a moment or two and saw in my bedroom closet, which had no door, what seemed to be a little girl sitting in there, staring at me. She wore a white dress and was underneath either a white blanket or a duvet cover. Once me, 
my mom and my sister were watching a film in the dark, and suddenly, on the shelf, my picture was slammed down. One time my sister had said that she had seen the ghost, one night when we had our normal beds. She saw her walk from the closet to the end of the bed, and just staring at her. Then she flew through the wall. The second time I saw her was when I was out in the kitchen. I saw her out the window, in the shadow window, smiling. But there would be two faces beside her this time. The scariest experience I've ever encountered was when I was watching TV. I was sitting down on one of the seats when I heard footsteps coming down the stairs. I got scared and turned off the TV to ask who was there. Then, the door creaked open. Then there was a noise in the other seat, like someone was sitting down on it. I was so scared that I couldn't even move. Nothing else happened since then, but I know our house is haunted for sure. The girl just won't go away. Hi, my name is Kim. I'm 18 years old, and I have a few experiences I would like to share with you. Every summer, I used to go to my Nana's farm and help out. The last time I went was a few years ago. That was when I was 14, and something creepy happened that I've since tried to forget. I think it's about time I shared it with you all. It was a boiling hot July afternoon and I was helping to clean out one of the barns. My Nana went on and on for about an hour, complaining that it was too hot for her liking, but I decided to stay to try and finish. About 10 minutes after my Nana left, I began to hear tiny pitter-patter of the feet in the hayloft, thinking that it was just mice or something. I got on with my work. I began sweeping when I heard laughter and two voices, one of a boy and the other of a girl, talking in hushed whispers. I peered up the stairs, feeling slightly scared, and called again, but nobody replied. As I turned to get back to my work, the voice of the girl called up, up here. I was quite spooked. Nobody should be up here, but yet, there I was, Hearing a voice. Sometimes, though, the other kids in the village muck around, so maybe I thought it was one of them. Hey, you're not allowed up there, I shouted as I walked up the stairs. As I got up to the hayloft, I looked up to see two black shadows with hooks through their necks, almost hanging for a split second. This faded quickly. I completely freaked out and ran screaming to my Nana's house. My Nana later told me that two little people had died in that barn when they were playing around. My mom came to pick me up the next day, and as we drove away, I looked back at the barn and saw two little faces staring right back at me from the hayloft window. Needless to say, I never went back. In 1998, I had a ghost experience, my first and I hope my last. I was living in the second floor of a college dormitory. My colleague that lived directly under me would ask me on occasion if I was moving furniture late in the night and early morning, between 12 midnight and 2 a.m. Absolutely not. I can recall that I moved my bed once in the middle of the day. When I first moved in, at the beginning of the semester, I thought maybe it was a ghost, because it was common knowledge that our dormitory was an old TB hospital. The entire campus was located on an old military hospital site. Her cafeteria was where the morgue was, back in the Great First Conflict, or the Great Second Conflict. I never heard anything in my room. Then. Early one Saturday morning, I got up and made myself coffee and left the dormitory on the second floor and headed down the old iron stairs. 
I made my way across the tennis courts to make a phone call. I could see my dormitory from where I stood. I dialed the number and was talking to a friend steadily watching the stairs to my dorm. That is, when I saw a smoky black figure flailing its arms around and staring straight at me. Then it went back into the locked closed doors of the second floor dorm. They lock behind each person that leaves. So I reported it to staff. That is when I started to hear many ghost stories from the night's guardsmen that patrolled the cafeteria and hallways. There are many dorm buildings on campus. Anyhow, I put it behind me and continued my life. Shortly after my brother died, due to a long illness, I returned to college, but got my own apartment and shared it with a friend. It would get so cold in there. He turned on all the way up and the fireplace on, yet it was 70 degrees outside. I was still grieving, so I withdrew from college and took my truck on a long drive across the country. In Nebraska while at a rest stop, my entire truck swarmed with flies. I'm very clean, and so was in my truck. I was eating, but still swarms of flies. I threw my food away and drove, and drove crying and screaming, trying to get them out of my truck. I stopped to wash my truck, then got a motel and shower. I returned six months later to my old apartment to ask around to see if the new renters had any problem. The lady that opened the door was really nice and said that she had to hire someone from another state to come and clear the ghost. She said that it was so bad that the person they hired had to have a partner come and help. She mentioned the freezing cold room temperatures, the feelings that someone's following her up the stairs like I had. They said they do a certain ceremony and burn certain herbs to clear away the spirit. Because she didn't mind her ghost clearing work. But it was too much for her. She said that the people she hired said that the bowl they used to burn herbs caught fire. The flames reached the ceiling. It was the worst ghost cleansing they had to do in a long time. Then the lady did a ceremony over me. And the feeling that something hanging on my back just went away. Actually... I felt whatever it was kind of crawl up and out of me and move my spine involuntarily. I've never had a problem since. Mabel Castle, located in Asherville, Scotland, was built many hundreds of years ago and is reputed to have its fair share of ghosts. There have been many sightings over the years one of which may be the young lady Jane, who had been imprisoned in the turret for falling in love with a gypsy. I recently have been invited to participate in a sponsored ghost watch at the castle, but chicken out at the last minute, due to a recent visit by a ghost expert, who reported the presence of at least three ghosts, one of which was a crying child who had been tortured and tied in the basement. There is regular paranormal activity reported as the castle is still being used as offices. Anyway, I'm sort of of two minds about losing my nerve as the ghost watch had proved eventful. Crying had been heard from the basement. When the team left at 4 a.m., they made sure all the lights had been turned off. But in the car park, they looked back and all the lights had been turned back on. When the cleaner came in the morning, the energy conscious ghost had turned them off again. Of course, such paranormal happenings are not rare in Scotland. I can quote hundreds from friends and family. These are just a few. My sister and husband walked into a bookshop housed in a very old building with a bookshot straight off of one shelf, one after the other. My youngest sister lived for years in a haunted house, possibly the spirit of a young child. There were occasional temper tantrums. This is a tragic, 
a true tale. My youngest sister and her then boyfriend George had friends over for the evening. Of course, the talk turned to ghost stories in general, when suddenly the door of the sitting room flew open with such force it crashed against the arm of the sofa and slammed shut again. George jumped up and pulled open the door, but nobody was there. Everyone was shaken by the violence of the event. Later it was learned that at that precise moment in time, George's cousin and his friend had drowned in the River Irvin after a night of drinking and hijinks that went badly wrong. I remember reading about the drowning of these men in the local paper at the time, but did not learn of the connection to my sister's boyfriend. Until later, a friend heard the voice via baby monitor, which urged the baby to come. It was hard to be distinguished from the low guttural tone, whether it was male or female. When they went to investigate, no one was in the room besides the baby. My name is Trisha and I'm writing about one of the many few ghost experiences I've had in my life. I'm fortunate to have found the site to talk to many of those who have experiences with the supernatural. I moved to Bemis Point, New York from Woodbridge, Virginia on May 1st, 2004 into a house which as to this date, I still call my dream home because all my life, I always wanted to live in a home so big and so beautiful. This house had five bedrooms, one bath, a basement, and a beautiful yard. I want to explain why I've chosen to talk about this particular experience in this home, in Bemis Point, New York. Of course, I wasn't the only person living in a five-bedroom home. It was me, my fiancé, and my four-year-old son. My fiancé's brother and father were going to live with us. However, that didn't really work out, so it was just the three of us for a while. Before we all actually moved into the home, my fiancé and my father went to the house to drop off some belongings of ours. My fiancé had videotaped every room of the home. The home was just so extraordinary to us, like something we had never seen before. As of this date, we still hold in possession the tape which had been recorded of that home. One of the bedrooms had been painted with artwork from a very artistic person. That artwork is believed to have been finger painted and very unusual. At the time I looked at the house before we had all moved in, I went to that room with the painting many times. I knelt down on my knees in front of the painting and touched it with my hands to get a full feel of its characterization. I will say, to this date, that the painting that was on the wall that very moment had changed once we had moved into the home. First, it was a painting of a turkey, very unusual. There were many things in this house that were strange, only we didn't catch the unusual things about them until we had moved in. To this date, I only hope to find who had lived here before we had, and I will, in time, find my answers. Now you will know the beginning of this unusual experience. It started with that painting. After we had moved into the home, we began to refresh our minds a little bit of what we thought was strange. I was in the process of unpacking and settling into our new home. I went back into that room with the painting and was in shock from what I had seen. That painting was a woman, and there was writing above the painting of that woman, and it said Earth, Hater, Everything. The painting of the woman was on the wall, right on the outlet corner where a television had been sitting. I will explain to you what description I would seen in that painting. It was a woman whose face was intensely beaten with blood flowing from her hair down through her face and then to her arms. Her hair was hung up as if she had been in an electric shock. Her face was bruised badly and cut up with scars on the side of her face. Her eyes were open 
and the smile on her face was extremely intense, as if she was angry. I looked around the room more thoroughly, and there on the other side of the wall were more paintings. One was of a butterfly, and a mushroom was the other. On the closet door was a poem written by the famous poet, Keats. I believe to this date, the same person who had written the poem on the door had to have been the same person who did the painting on the wall. I looked around the room closer and came upon some blood on the floor on the side of the room. It was not fresh blood because it looked like it had dried up and had been there for a long while. I closed the door behind me and left the room. I didn't go back to the room until later on through the next week. One of the rooms upstairs was right next to that room that we had turned into an office. Across the room was the bathroom. On the other side was another room we used for our bedroom. Of course, there was an attic located right across from the room with the painting. On the door that leads to the attic is a sign that says private. I always wondered who slept up there in that attic. In the attic, there were beds, two of them. The beds were built into the floor and the walls. Underneath the boards of the beds were pipes. I won't say what kind of pipes, because I'm not sure. My only guess is that they are water pipes. The attic was made to be one of the five bedrooms in the entire house. This room, however, was among the most strangest thing I'd ever seen, the exception with the room being the painting. In this room, the attic was cross spaces large enough to fit almost ten or more bodies depending on the size. In one of the cross spaces was another painting. This painting was put together with boards. It was handmade, and the colors of the painting were the exact same colors used in the painting of the other room. It seemed to be the painting of the devil. However, it was never confirmed of what the painting really was. There was a sofa left in the room with strands of brown hair, which seemed to be the color of my own hair, and I never even sat on the couch when we found it there, let alone had it belonged to me. Along with the sofa, there had been a brown recliner chair sitting next to the sofa, Underneath the recliner there had been a huge blood stain. In turn, could have passed to be a huge stain of grease. The attic could have been turned into at least two rooms by the size of the cross spaces, and that's an example of how big they were. When I left the room of the attic to go back downstairs, I noticed as I walked down the stairs, there had been names engraved into the carpet of each step that I walked down. I could not make out the names, but I was indeed visible to the eye. It was very strange to me. I wanted to find out some information about the house, because I began to get nervous and anxious of the situation. I turned to our next door neighbor for info, and hoped to find out all I could. One side of the house was cut off by a wall, where the next door neighbor had lived. It was indeed unfortunate to us, because that wall was separated from the neighbor and had not been closed off to him, as he had all entrances into our part of the house. No door on our side had locks to keep him coming through our side of the home. This made me very nervous, especially throughout the night. With an exact total of four rooms upstairs, and the bathroom, and only one bedroom downstairs, we had turned that room on the bottom level downstairs into my son's room. It was not safe enough to put my son upstairs due to the stairwell, and the fact that I was afraid that he would get hurt. Therefore, the only room downstairs we had used for his room, just outside of my son's bedroom, was the basement door, and another door that led to the next door neighbor's bathroom. We were told that the door that led to the neighbor's bathroom had not been used because the bathroom toilet was broken. To this date, I don't believe that theory which had been said to us. I noticed on the side where my son's bedroom was, each door had locks on them at the top, 
which made me nervous because I was concerned that someone could get locked in and would not be able to get out. However, the only door without a lock was the bathroom door to the neighbor's side of the home. That seemed a bit unusual to me, as if it was purposely set up that way, so that the next door neighbors could have entrance into our side of the home whenever he wanted to come on our side. Another entrance that our next door neighbor had to our side of the house was in the kitchen right where the pantry closet is. In the process of unpacking, I had sat some pictures against the door until I got around to hang them up. Other entrances the neighbor had to our side of the home were upstairs and in the basement. There was a storage place located right between the office and the bathroom, which had two doors inside the storage space that the next door neighbor could use on our side of the home. On our side of the storage space were locks, therefore, we're fortunate for the matter. The doors to the storage space were made of glass, and therefore, it would have to take someone to break the glass or professionally remove the glass in order to enter on our side. As for the basement, the neighbor would have to break the chain on our side to come up the stairs on our side. Anyway, after having suspicions of what may have happened in this home, or what could have happened, I had to talk to someone and find out something. That's when I started questioning the next door neighbor. One day, I ran into our neighbor outside, not literally, and asked him about the painting that was on the wall. I asked him if he had known of the tenants who used to live in the home before us, and possibly all he could tell me about the painting and who stayed in the home where the painting was. The neighbor claims that a girl by the name Anna stayed in that room at one time and told me that she was the one who did the painting. At that very moment, I felt that there was more that he had known that I need to know now. With having a few supernatural experiences previously, the feeling that someone would lead me to some kind of answer clung to me to ask him more about what he could tell me. He told me that Anna was about the same age as me and knew that she had been involved in many serious circumstances with others dealing with gothic rituals, practicing witchcraft, and had camped out with others in the back of the house at a campsite where most of the rituals were being performed. He offered to take me back to the campsite one day, although I never was able to get around to it. Thereafter, I insisted on letting him take a look at the painting himself, as well as the poem from Keats that was written on the door in the room. We also went to the attic to look at the stain that was on the floor. He could not agree with me that it looked like anything like a blood stain. I showed him the names engraved into the carpet on the stairs to the attic. He couldn't make a vision of what I had been seeing. Therefore, he wasn't able to discuss that matter with me. As far as the blood in the room on the floor of the room with the painting, he did in fact agree with me that it appeared to be blood stains. However, he could not give me any explanation of why or how it got in there. The neighbor explained that he rarely paid any attention to anything in the home and hadn't been in the home but a few times to do some work to it. I didn't agree with that theory at all. I knew there had to be a lot of info missing that he wouldn't tell me then. The neighbor insisted on finding someone to come look at the painting. I told him that it would be a good idea for someone to come out to take a look at everything I'd seen and to examine the home in case there was any signs of supernatural crisis. When the neighbor left, I assumed that what he intended to do was not going to happen only because I felt that he knew more than he was willing to tell me at that time. I left the matter alone long enough for me to stumble across anything else that seemed unusual to me. The day after, my fiancé and I, along with our son, left the home to take care of some business, and when we had returned to the home that evening, we saw the neighbor coming out of our house with a cooking pot. 
It was quite unusual to us knowing that the home had been locked up and could not understand how he had gotten into the home without having a key. My fiancé and I got out of the car and the neighbor walked over to us explaining that he went into the house. He told us that we made him quite nervous about the discussion with the painting as well as everything else we talked about. Therefore, he decided to speak with his cousin on how to bless the home. The neighbor explained that he blessed the entire home using some ancient herbs that were given to him and told us that he was trying to help us out because he felt that it would resolve the situation. After his explanation, he continuously explained that he would not go back into the home without us knowing about it first. We left this incident alone, being as it was a first time offense, and he said he was trying to help. When we walked into the home after speaking with him, we could smell the scent of the herbs he used all through the home. It was a very strong and painful scent almost as if it was the smell of marijuana. The smell was in a long stretch throughout the home. I was more concerned for my son. We had to leave the house for a few hours more in order to escape the smell and painful irritation of our eyes. Finally, once we returned to the home, the smell settled and we could breathe again. I wasn't actually pleased for the matter that he had came into the home uninvited and blessed the home with no knowledge of what he was doing. Still, I left the matter alone, believing that he would not do it again. In order to concentrate on other things, I used my time trying to unpack my things and cleaning one room to the next. It wasn't until the next few days later, I had an incident of my own. It was in the middle of the night, we were all asleep, and I was awakened by a man who laid there on top of me with all his weight pushing on me, so tight that I couldn't breathe. I thought I'd been having a nightmare, although my eyes were open, and the force I'd been using to fight and pull to escape this man's weight, and the fear he had been pouring over me, was only a nightmare in my life, in reality. I looked beside me as I laid there fighting to escape the fear amongst the man's desire to hurt me, trying to wake my fiancé from a sleep to save me. My fiancé laid there in a deep sleep as he could not hear a peep from my crying screams of what I had left to breathe. I had been played with that very night, if you know what I mean, laying there in my own head with my fiancé laying right next to me. With one heroic scream, I used all my weight to escape this man's arms and pushed him off of me. Frightening, all I could see was his brown hair and his back that turned to my face as he walked away with not even two seconds and disappeared. I sat up in my bed next to my fiancé, waiting there, holding my body, hoping he would be awake and hold me. I could not make sense of this. Not then, and not now. Even after, I knew it wasn't over. I couldn't even call the police, because let's face it, I wouldn't be able to explain to them of such an incident. Even so, they wouldn't be able to believe me. Amongst other things, they would turn it on my fiancé, and I will not take that route, not then, and not now. After my fiancé had awakened, I told him about what happened. He just held me tight, and he was worried. I'm thankful he believed me. After a while, I was too angry to sit there and do nothing. I was determined to get my answers. Even then, why me? I know I'm not the only person in the entire world who has had this exact same incident. There are others. I know, because I've read about them. I know that there are others out there who have been hurt multiple times in incidents like this. I've now moved out of that home and only lived two minutes away from there. 
I've not been back since we moved. There are others who I'm aware who live in that same house right now as I'm telling you this. Four of them I am aware of are girls. I fear for them. I worry for them. Even though this isn't the only incident that happened to me in that same home, they live in there as I speak. As there have been many incidents, not so much severe to this one, I worry for anyone who lives there. This will come back to me one day. In some form, some way, it will find me, and I will find my answers. I've had the experience of the supernatural ever since I was a young child, around the age of seven years old. It has followed me. I'm 22 now. This house I lived in in Buma Point, New York, was said to be over 100 years old. The supernatural experiences I've had are real. It may be some kind of gift that I've been given, but it's frightening at the same time. I only seek to understand it. Even so, it's frightening to know the answers I'm looking for. I can only do what I can to accept this the best way I find reasonable. I will tell you that the man who messed with me that night is in no way comparison to any person I've ever met or come across my entire life. This will be one of the many experiences I will never forget. I know that there are others out there who wonder just the same as I do. Why me? Is there ever really an answer to that question? And if you ever wonder whatever happened to the painting, the handmade artwork that was found in those rooms, I won't be able to explain that to you. All I can tell you is that the neighbor that lived next door to me went into the house without telling us, carved that painting off the wall, literally, and told me that he burned it. As far as the handmade artwork made out of boards, I won't ever know. The neighbor took that too. To this date, that painting exists, as well as the handmade artwork made of boards. Everything in this house exists to me, and as far as the girl I was told that did the painting on the wall, Anna, what does she know? Where is she today? My last question in regards to the landlord, John. Do you always allow your son to go into the home whenever he wants to, especially when other tenants are renting the home from you? Trust me, one day it could end up being a big mistake for him. My guess is, is there something to hide? I live in Arlington, Washington. When I moved into my house, the forks started bending. Now when I'm there by myself, I can hear people walking upstairs. When I'm upstairs trying to sleep, I can hear people or things running up and down the stairs. If I get up and look down the stairs, I can't see anything, but I can still hear it. Soon after we started moving into this home, our pets started disappearing. One of our cats came back, covered in what looked like blood. He was gone about an hour after he came back. All of our pets were inside pets. My aunt saw a little girl in my yard and in the house with blonde hair. Nobody I live with or live near has even blonde hair. When my mom lived with me, she saw her too. My sister loved to listen to her stereo, but then the stations started changing by themselves. We could actually watch the bar move back and forth across it. Recently, my dad's stereo started doing that too. I got an iZone sticky film camera for my birthday one year. I took a picture and there was an orb in the corner of it. When I'm home alone, it can totally be silent. I'll be reading a book and my dog will start barking. I can get her to calm down, but as soon as I sit down again, she starts barking again. My cousin and I got really big chills right before we hear any of the noises upstairs. We look at our attic doors, but every morning the lock is unlocked and sometimes on the ground. Sometimes at night, 
I can even hear faint talking. I had a friend stay with me once, and she tried to get out of bed, but she said she felt something heavy on her. There was nothing that I could see on her. My dad went into the kitchen in the middle of the night to get a glass of water, and the freezer was wide open. This all started in 88. My aunt even had someone come and bless the home. I guess it didn't work, because it is still happening. My name is Eric, and I have a couple of occurrences that are rather interesting. Nothing amazing, but definitely weird. I've always been interested by dark things. Like to dress in black, and I like to listen to extreme metal, and such things like that. So I've always kept an open mind on such things. Well, anyways, when I was about six years old... Me and some of my brothers slept in the floor of the living room for about a couple of years. Well, one night, I awoke for no real reason, I guess. I was still tired, so I didn't want to get up or open my eyes when I felt something unexplainable. It was the feeling that someone was near me that wanted to hurt me. I can't explain it. I just felt that. Well, being curious... I opened my eyes, and I saw an older woman crouching down next to me, and her face was right in front of mine, as if looking right at me. I closed my eyes again in sheer terror, but I was still curious to see if it was still there. So I looked, and the woman's face was still there. I didn't actually see her body. I just assumed she had a body or something. I closed and opened my eyes several times. And she was still there. I was more scared than heck. But somehow, I went back to sleep. It never happened again. And I never told anybody. Because I really thought it could have been my imagination. But I know what I felt. And I'll never forget that terrible feeling I got. Another interesting experience I had. Was the same year. A few months later. I woke up for no real reason. And when I opened my eyes, I saw an older looking woman standing on the base of my brother's feet that slept next to me. I didn't close my eyes because I wanted to see if it was real. At one moment, I felt that same threatening feeling, but not for myself. But I actually feared the well-being of my brother. I went to sleep again, and it never happened again after. I never told anybody for the same reason as last time, because I'm skeptical, so I could have been either a real apparition, or just my stupid imagination. I guess I'll never know. I've been looking at your website for the last couple of weeks, and have read some of the experiences people had with the supernatural. I've had several experiences in my life. The first one that I can really remember is when my grandmother died. I was 16 years old and lived most of my life with my grandma. The night she passed away from cancer, I was devastated since I never got to say goodbye to her. But the night she passed, she came back to say goodbye to me. I remember being in that state between wake and asleep. I remember her coming to my bed, sitting beside me, and telling me she was perfectly fine and so happy to be with my grandpa. I told her I loved her, and she left. The second thing that happened was about two months after I had my third child. We moved into a beautiful home in Northwest Ohio. It had been totally remodeled, except for one room upstairs in which we made into a toy room for the kids. My daughter, who was two at the time, was in that room playing when she started screaming for me. I ran up the stairs to see what was wrong with her, and she was in a corner with her hands protecting her head and screaming for the bad man to go away. I did not see a man. I picked her up and headed back downstairs, and when I was on the third or fourth step down, 
I felt as if someone was behind me and very angry with me. Needless to say, I ran the rest of the way down. Also in that home, I was in the kitchen washing my son's bottles, and directly behind the sink was our stove. I had placed my son in the carrier by the stove. My daughters had brought in their stuffed animals that my mother had gotten them for Easter and laid them down beside the stove. Now, these stuffed animals were the kind that make noise, as in the duck quacked, the pig oinked, and the cow mooed. I know my son was just a little bit too young to be able to reach over his carrier and play with the toys, let alone make them talk. While I was washing his bottles, the duck started in. I thought nothing of it. I thought maybe it was just malfunctioning. But then the cow started in, and a few seconds after that, the pig. I turned around, and my son was just all smiles. Needless to say, I hightailed it out of the home. I always hated to go into the basement of that house. It just felt wrong for me to be down there. But one afternoon, I had no choice but to go down. I had to take a bag of old clothing down to be stored. I thought I would just leave them on the floor, right at the bottom of the steps. So I leaned down to retie the bag, and as soon as I look up, I saw two little girls standing right in front of me. They were not my little girls. They looked about seven and five years old, and let me tell you, I didn't waste any time getting up these stairs. They did not make me feel very safe. I did some research on the home and found that the house was built in the mid 1800s. A man and his family lived in the home and he had two daughters. The man owned some money to a loan shark and when he couldn't repay his debt, the loan shark killed the two daughters and buried them in the basement. My family and I didn't stay long in that house. The longer we stayed, the more evil it seemed to be. The most recent experience has been for the last two and a half years. My father passed away, and I've had a very hard time dealing with his passing. I was made to make all of his decisions when it came to taking him off of life support. I felt and still feel guilty for letting him go. I know that my dad comes to visit me, and I hope he never stops visiting. I don't let anyone smoke in my home, and my dad hated it. He hated to go outside in the garage. He was always on my case about it. Well, now that dad has passed away, there are many nights and even days that you can smell cigarette smoke so plainly, like it's right next to you. I know it's my dad, and I tell him to take it to the garage, and he does. I know that he's looking out for me and my family. I just wish he would show himself to me just one more time. Thank you so much for your website. It's a comfort knowing that I'm not alone, and definitely not crazy. This story involves my aunt and uncle and took place in the late 70s and early 80s. My aunt and uncle and then baby cousin lived in a nice modest house in Upland, California, a very nice little city near Panoa in Ontario. The niceness of the house didn't last long, and almost immediately, my family began experiencing weird things. Every night on the way to bed, my uncle would latch close the door to the spare bedroom across the hall from he and my aunt's master bedroom. Every morning, as he passed the same door, it would discreetly unlatch and push itself open on its own. This same room once locked in my uncle's sister, with her and my uncle both frantically turning and pushing and pulling on the door as things flew out of the closet at her. All at once everything stopped, and they both jumped back to have the door unlatch and push itself open, as it always did. 
Needless to say, my uncle's sister didn't stay much longer in the bedroom, let alone the home. When my aunt would leave the home to run errands in the daytime, she would return to find all the pictures from the wall on the ground, not knocked over, but propped against the wall directly under the nail it was once hanging on. This would happen nearly every time the house is left empty, no matter how many times they would put the items back on the wall. Another nightly struggle is the pounding up and down the walls, like someone banging their fist across the center of the wall, back and forth, back and forth. My own grandma, as well as my mom and dad, witnessed this, I tilled it out of there ASAP. One day in the summer, my cousin, who was about two or three, was sitting in a high chair next to a long hallway. My aunt was just outside the back door. My cousin asked, Mommy, who's that man in the hallway? My aunt, not quite listening, aspects somewhat distracted. What man? My cousin proceeded to explain. That the man looked like her uncle Mike, who lived out of state. When my family had finally decided that enough was enough, they decided to sell the home and move to Kalamazoo, just outside of Yucapica, California. On one of their last nights in the home, it seemed as if everything was going crazy. The pounding was out of control. There were loud bangs and unusual noises everywhere and their dog was at the front door, its hair on end, and growling out the front porch. My aunt and uncle looked outside to the wraparound driveway and saw their van rocking back and forth as if people were inside jumping around. Within seconds, everything had stopped. Once my family had moved out, they eventually learned that their house was built over an old Indian burial ground. I've tried to ask my aunt more about this story, but she'll rarely talk about it, and I think is subconsciously trying to block it out. My aunt and uncle are very straight-laced, and don't make up these sort of things, and I think that if my other family members had not been there to witness a lot of them, I would not even know about these occurrences in Upland. I've had to rely on my mom retelling me what she remembers, my aunt telling her as it was happening there are probably many more things that went on that i would love to find out i still don't even know the address of this old home to see if the place still exists as for the significance of uncle mike my cousin's uncle mike had long black flowing hair with darkly tanned skin and often wore a leather band across his forehead think 70s rocker fashion, looking somewhat like an Indian perhaps. This happened quite recently, well a few weeks ago actually. Apart from what I think are a few cases of what I think are more likely sleep paralysis with resulting hallucinations, this is the only experience I felt that was truly well weird. A bit of background first. I live alone and rent an apartment in a newly built block, one of three, of low-rise units. These were built on the grounds of an old public primary school, which is over a hundred plus years old. The far end of the strip of where the school used to be is preserved and still has the school hall, a beautiful sandstone building and is used for public functions. My particular block is built where the playgrounds, etc. used to be. I know this as I grew up in the area and remember the school when I was a teenager, though I did not go there, and remember what it used to look like beforehand. I'm personally unaware of any hauntings in the area, nor am I unaware of the history of the site, as I have not researched it. There is a fairly modern funeral base directly across the road containing offices, a small chapel, and a large garage with several hearses. Whilst I assume bodies prepared there, etc. there, there are no burials. The story. I had a very hard day at work, 
have been under a lot of stress. It was a Friday night, fairly late, and I eventually decided to go to bed. I had a lot of trouble sleeping, as my mind was working 100 miles per hour. You know the feeling. I simply couldn't turn it off. After staring at the ceiling for an hour, I became frustrated, and finally, I thought I'd open my mind and try to meditate. It was an effort, but after almost half an hour of this, I drifted off. Shortly after, I had an odd feeling, and I woke up and opened my eyes. I immediately noticed a web of white mist floating above me. This network of yellow-white colored mist was basically sort of like a spider web about a meter above my bed and almost stretching across the entire room. Actually, the whole room was a bit foggy in general. I blinked and then did a I don't think so, double take, and rubbed my eyes. No sleep paralysis this time. It was still there. I tried to focus my eyes on it, and it was not easy. But what I saw was what I thought were transparent faces outlined in the mist. The effect was very like the outline of an invisible person in smoke. One moved through on my right side and looked directly at me. The fear started to hit me now, but I tried to calm myself down and think rationally. Just hold on here. I might be seeing things just because I am so tired and stressed, and I've just woken up too. I forced myself to be distracted and take my attention away. I shifted position in bed, closed my eyes, rubbed them, blinked them several times, and looked over at my clock radio. It was about 1.10 I think. Then looked back up, and it was still there. I then started to feel a slight vibration in my bed. Not a strong one, just like you'd feel the ground at a station as the train went past. I remember thinking what the and thought at first it was just my body shivering because I was cold or I had a muscle twitch. My attention on this now I flexed my muscles a few times and then tried to hold still and feel it was still there. The bed was definitely vibrating, even a bit more pronounced now. I was getting quite frightened and not knowing what else to do short of running out of the bedroom. I began to recite a prayer softly and also verbalized what I wanted any spirits to leave the place, basically anything that came to mind, just in case I wasn't imagining things. After about a minute of this, it faded. After a while, I wanted to go back to sleep as I was super tired, but every minute or so, I was worried it was still there, so I snapped my eyes open to check. It had gone. A few minutes after that, I fell asleep again, with no more events that night. Now after the events when I think about it, I wonder if it was just my imagination or something else. What surprised and concerned me is that I felt very lucid. I felt quite clear-headed. The only other event which is vaguely similar, which I dismissed at the time, was about a year ago when I woke up in the early hours of the morning to see a similar face above and to the left of my bed, no mist, looking at me. I rather sheepishly recall the shock yelling and then punching it. Honestly, who punches a ghost? Seemed to work though. The action either jolted me out of my sleep hallucination or made whatever it was go away. I'm not sure what to make of the above event to be honest. As a general comment in my apartment itself, I don't typically feel anything strange or a presence, and other than this, there have been no odd things going on. Plenty of unusual sounds mind you, but I'm fairly sure these come mostly from the neighbors, etc. Usually from what I read about hauntings, they tend to be more or less repetitive and don't just hit you like that and go away, so I'm still not 100% convinced it wasn't a half dream, but still, what a freak out.
I now believe that I officially have a poltergeist in my home. At first, my living boyfriend thought I was nuts. Now, he believes it too. The first day I moved in, I was doing laundry in the basement. My cats both began acting strangely and circled me whenever I was in the basement. I thought they were just hungry and trying to get my attention. But when I waited out to go upstairs, I had this terrible feeling that someone was standing behind me, staring right through me. The 12 year old inside me told me to run up the stairs like I did when I was a kid. And I did. Then, one day, I was looking for my favorite tank top. I couldn't find it anywhere and could swear that I brought it to this new house. I dismissed it as having it left somewhere. The third day we lived in this house, I broke my ankle playing softball. I ended up having to sleep on the couch in the living room. Throughout my two months stay on the sofa, I could swear I heard someone going up and down the basement steps, cold breezes, etc. I just thought that the pain medication was kicking in, and that my mind was playing tricks on me. After I could walk again, and venture into the basement to do the laundry, I still had the same feeling that someone was standing behind me and staring at me. One night, I was getting ready to fall asleep in the bedroom when my boyfriend was out of town fishing. I had both dogs in the room, one on the bed, and the cats too, and the dog on the floor next to the bed. Out of nowhere, I heard a loud thump, like a book had just fallen off a bookshelf and onto the hardwood floor. Well, I don't have any bookshelves in the bedroom, nor was anything on the floor, except for clothes when I turned the light on. Just this last week, I came home to discover the bed neatly made, pillow stacked just so, and the blankets pulled up neatly and turned down. When I thanked my boyfriend for making the bed, he just stared at me. He said, what are you talking about? And I said that I didn't know what got into him to make the bed so nice, but it was a nice thing to do. He said though that I came home on my lunch hour, and made the bed. He had been gone all day and didn't come home until I was already home. The basement lights continually go on and off. The light switches don't work and the light bulbs are new. The circuits have been checked and everything is fine. I never know when they will work. The other night, the toilet handle in the bathroom jiggled for 10 minutes straight at 3 a.m and we both heard it. The night before last, my boyfriend witnessed the light come on in the hallway outside our bedroom and then heard the light switch flip. The light faded and later when he got up to go to the bathroom, the kitchen light was on, which had been off when we went to bed. Last night, I saw a light come into our bedroom from the hallway and then fade. I also heard a very loud thump at the foot of my bed. When I got up, only my tennis shoes were in the floor, hardwood floor, and nothing else had fallen off or was out of place. It was so loud, I physically jumped when I heard it. My boyfriend was sound asleep. I am convinced that someone or something is totally screwing with me. This is a very personal story to my family, but I think your readers might find it as fascinating as I do. My mother grew up in an infamous mental institution in Massachusetts, now closed, and I won't name the facility for privacy's sake. She was placed in state custody in 1948 at six years old because my grandmother, a Portuguese gypsy immigrant, and closet psychotic, claimed she was mentally disturbed. In actuality, my grandmother was just not capable of raising her, so she successfully pawned her off on the state. My mother was not only a beautiful and innocent child, but was totally mentally capable and 100% sane. In those days, 
there was no system in place to accurately assessing a child's medical condition. They simply took the parents' word for it. After living at various orphanages and state facilities, she ended up at this institution just outside of Boston. The place is notorious for paranormal activity. Even on the outer grounds where some of the buildings once stood, she was about 12 when she got there. She said that there were many physically and mentally incapacitated young people there, and the story she told us about the school or institution were both heartbreaking and terrifying. There were mental abuses, deprivations, beatings, medical experiments on patients, and cruel punishments galore. So-called professional care was barbaric, and even the terminology was outdated. My mother's own records, which I've seen myself, showed her mental assessment as a moron, even though she said she was never really tested by any mental health professional. When she was around 13, she began helping the patients whenever she could. She would bandage their injuries, break up fights, and speak to the matrons on behalf of those who could not speak. This created enemies among the staff, who knew she wasn't handicapped and who felt she was a threat to their employment. Therefore, whenever they could, they punished her severely. One such punishment led to a horrifying encounter with the supernatural. One dark stormy afternoon, mom had words with a matron, trying to tell her that certain handicapped children were frightened of the thunder and that they should not be forced to go outside to exercise that afternoon. The matron appeared to give in, then asked my mother to please go down into the cellar of the building to get to the rain gear for those who wanted to go outside. Mom was terrified of that cellar, and the matron knew it. There was this long, steep, narrow and rickety stairway, ending at a long dark hallway with no windows, and just a tiny yellowish light bulb in the ceiling. At the end of the hallway, there was a cabinet that contained raincoats, boots, etc. When my mother hesitantly stepped onto the stairway, the matron slammed a door, bolted it shut behind her, and shut off the light. My mother screamed and pounded on the door for an hour only to be laughed at by matrons who had been instructed to let her spend the entire night down there. The stairs being steep and dangerous, she decided that she would rather creep to the bottom and at least huddle on the damp floor. As she descended, she noticed a dim light coming from the long hallway beneath her. She came to the bottom of the stairs and looked around. She said she saw a man in a dark jumpsuit about 20 feet from her, leaping against a wall and just smiling at her. She thought he must have been a custodian, so she walked towards him, asking him to please let her out. But as she approached him, he kept getting further away. She realized he was not a sullen being and that the dim light seemed to be coming from his outline. The light began to fade and she found herself screaming again, only in the total dark of the dingy basement. She was disoriented and stumbled forward until she bumped into the cabinet which held the rain gear. As she squinted in the dark, she began to make out shapes forming on either side of the cabinet. What appeared to be a pair of detached hands forming a clawed shape were each coming from around opposite sides of the cabinet and heading for her. She turned and ran, faint with terror, until she tripped on the bottom step. Frozen with fear, she could only sit at the bottom step and cover her face with her hands. After a minute or so, she peeked through her fingers down the hallway. The strange dim light was back. She chanced to look down, and what she saw filled her with horror. One of the smoky floating hands were reaching for her skirt as if to pull at it. She again screamed and ran back up the stairs, tripping and falling several times in the dark, 
convinced she was being chased. The air was cold, and she heard a strange rustling sound behind her as she frequently climbed. When she reached the top of the stairs, she pounded furiously on the door and found that it had been unlocked. She never found out who unlocked it, but she didn't care either. She ran all the way to her room and hid on her bed. She never told the school staff what had happened, fearing reprisals, and she never set foot in that cellar again, despite the punishment of defiance. She's fine today, despite her horrific youth. There were many other strange things happening during her stay, but I'm considering a book about them, and I want to treat the benefits of the sales if it happens. I'll save the creepiest stuff for that. I've had many paranormal experiences since I was a young child. At the age of four, my mother and grandmother would visit the graves of my father and grandfather, staying all day. I would play with the little girl there while my grandmother and mother sat and talked. They believed I had an imaginary playmate. Both are now dead themselves. I decided to check the records of the cemetery and had little trouble since it is a small place. I found one girl that could have been the one that I played with. Her name was Mary Jane Walker and she died in 1866 at the age of nine years of age. My husband and I decided to see if we could find the girl's grave. I told him to check the back of the cemetery because that was where we played. He found the grave. I asked Mary Jane if I could take her picture. I took three of the grave, and one of my husband, sitting on a tree stump not far away. I had the pictures developed. All the pictures were normal, except for the one of my husband where there appears to be a vortex in it. I've looked for all the usual problems can find no rational explanation for this. I now feel that I have proof of my friend's existence. My husband and I rented a home in southwest Detroit in the 1980s that was very haunted. The first thing that happened was when I was waiting for the gas company to come turn the gas on. I felt as though there was someone watching me, and I smelled pipe tobacco. I figured okay. I'm alone in a strange place. I also thought that maybe the people who lived in the front part of the house used pipe tobacco. I found out later that these people were from India and were visiting that country. They moved out within a week of returning to the US. All the problems in the house seemed to originate in the attic. There was a log cabin built up there for children to play in. It was complete the glass in the windows and a drawstring latch for the door. I was only in there once, but the feeling of uneasiness I felt was real. We never allowed our children to play in it. The attic door had no lock, but my five-year-old daughter got locked in and was screaming for us to let her out. Although you could hear any noise from upstairs, we never heard her. The door opened on its own. I started the dream about an old Indian woman with a pockmarked face. Since this was a dream, I never told anyone about it. One day, a woman I had become friendly with asked me if my mother was visiting. I told her I sure hope not, since my mother was dead. She said that she saw a woman with long black hair in my bedroom window. This sort of freaked me out, since I was dreaming of that Indian woman. She had long black hair. One day this friend was visiting me, and we were sitting in the kitchen having coffee and talking about nothing really. She seemed to go into a daze and was starting to go up to my attic. In fact, she was insisting that she was going. I got her back to the table and sitting down when something punched her head hard enough to leave a red mark. She left and refused to come visit anymore. My husband and I had cleaned out the basement, 
Yeah, my kids found a Ouija board down there. They showed us where it was, and we got rid of it right away. We don't mess with that thing. Things seemed to quiet down for a couple of weeks when the apartment in front of us was rented to a young couple. They started to have problems right away. The keys hanging on the wall would begin to sway. The rocker in the front room would start rocking by itself. At first, things only happened at night, but people decided to contact this thing, and things got bad from then. She would get phone calls, and when she answered, no one would be on the line, except one time. She told me a voice told her to get out. We are Christians, and decided enough was enough. We had to have help. I turned on the radio to listen to evangelical echoes, and called a prayer line for suggestions on what to do. This program wasn't on yet, but another one was, and someone on that program was praying in the spirit. Suddenly from the basement came an unearthly howl. Needless to say, this woman and I got out of the house and waited on the front porches for our husbands to get home. While all this was going on, my husband never noticed anything. One night, my nephew was spending the night, and while he was praying, this thing shot from our apartment to the other one, banging things in its haste to leave. My nephew refused to stay another night. One night, my husband was in bed sleeping, and I was on my way up when I asked a man in the next apartment to go wake him up and tell him to come sleep on the couch. He asked me what was wrong, and I told him I could see my husband in pieces. He did, and the couch was occupied that night. The only thing my husband noticed was that one night we were watching TV, and it sounded like a dresser was being dragged down the stairs. He heard that. We moved from there, and the next place was no better. Whatever was there caused arguments. My nephew and his then girlfriend were constantly fighting, and it got so bad that my husband and I started fighting as well. This was something we normally didn't do. We had the normal arguments that married people usually have, but this was getting serious. Even one of my children was being affected by this thing. It was appearing to her as a little girl talking to her. At first it was nice to her, but as time went on, it was turned to get mean. We had bought this one house, and it might sound silly, but the best thing that ever happened was that an arsonist burned us out, and we had to move. We have had no problems since. I don't believe this was a ghost, but rather a demon, and why it hasn't followed us, I have no idea, but I thank God that it hasn't. I have more stories, but I have taken up enough time as it is. I'm glad that I can finally tell this story without fear of people ridiculing me. There's a place in Smithfield, Virginia called Bacon's Castle. It's not really a castle, just a gigantic plantation home. They give tours there on a daily basis. It was in the summer of 2003 that I went with a summer creative writing group to tour this magnificent home and plantation. As we toured the home, the tour guide told us all of the kinds of stories of happenings and how the house was shifted from family to family. When we went up the stairs, we were greeted by a sudden draft. As my friends and I sauntered through the home, it didn't get warmer. In fact, it got colder, but the best part was when we reached the room where the woman and her husband would have stayed. There was also a small cradle in the center of the room. The tour guide spoke of a woman during the Civil War who stayed in the room for months after her baby was born because something went wrong with the birth, and the child was terribly sick. When the child died, the woman wouldn't leave the cradle. She remained there. Convinced she had to rock her to sleep. 
she wouldn't eat or sleep, and eventually, she too died. As I stared into the room, I didn't notice anything. My friend Crystal had asked me if I felt a breeze. When I said I didn't, she said she didn't either, and pointed at the cradle, which was swaying back and forth noticeably. I didn't really think much of it, and after everyone left, I took a picture and then followed my friends up the stairs to the attic. A few weeks later, I was looking through my pictures, and something caught my eye in the picture of the room with the cradle in it. Sitting in front of the cradle was a woman dressed in Victorian-style dress. She was transparent, and a wispy hand had gripped the cradle. I looked even closer, and it looked as though she was smiling. Hello, my name is Ray, and I would like to share with you the experiences that happened to my small family in 1996. We had been transferred to the Houston area from San Antonio and found a two-story four-bedroom home in the Clear Lake City area, a real fix-it-upper, and it was the worst-looking home in a very nice community called Green Acres. My brother-in-law Robert and her sister helped us for six months in remodeling, cleaning up, and making the place a nice home. Robert had sold his own home two years earlier, and lived in a travel trailer, but missed his home. He jumped in, and was happy to do most of the work, and was proud of the results. A month after the house was finished, we found out that Robert had terminal cancer, and had less than six months to live. The trailer was small, and so my wife and I decided to bring Robert into our home for his final days. We put him downstairs in the formal living room, and with the help of hospice, we knew we could help Robert with a peaceful and quiet death. This was not the case. Robert fought hard for his life and was terrified of death because he had fought in Vietnam and had killed many. He didn't know what was waiting for him on the other side. The end came with Robert fighting to get out of bed. The look on his face was one of horror. As per his request, he was left in his room for six hours after his death, and then the funeral home was called and Robert left. Or did he? The week after the funeral, things started not being right. Odd bumps and sounds from downstairs, late at night. Our dog would not go downstairs after dark, and furniture being moved. One morning, the living room sofa was standing on end with all the cushions still in place. Dining room chairs would be taken and lined along the living room wall, and mirrors would vibrate. We called the hospice minister to the house, and he blessed every room, but Robert still didn't leave. We did. The house stood vacant for a while, and new people moved in, but their stay was short, Neighbors say two families came and left. It has been eight years now, and just a while back I was in the area and went by the home. It sits vacant again with a sales sign in the front yard, standing in front of the window of the room in which Robert died. As I stood there, remembering our last few months at home, a chill ran down my back, and I quickly got into my car to drive away. I sent a story to the site about two months ago. Is it my imagination or something paranormal? Well, since then, some new things have happened, and I found out some interesting information that I didn't know before. When I first sent out my story, I told my sister-in-law Jenna about it. She's a Jehovah Witness too, but a little bit more open-minded than my mother-in-law. Anyway. I told her what I had wrote, and she told me she had a girlfriend when she was a teenager, about 15 years ago, that lived next door to her. The side where I heard the whispering, in the house where the old couple had died. 
I believe her family bought the house after the couple died. Anyway, she told her that her friend was a little odd because she had been sleeping with her parents at night. But Jenna had found out later why. One night, she had stayed the night at her friend's house and they slept in her friend's bed. Early in the morning, Jenna had woken up for some reason and noticed that her friend was squirming a lot and moaning, almost like she was doing the deed with someone, but no one was there. Her arms were at her side. So Jenna thought maybe she was having a dream. Then she thought that maybe she had seen imprints in her friend's body. She got startled with this and woke her friend up and told her what she had witnessed. Her friend got so upset about it that she didn't want to talk about it at all and never did. To say the least, Jenna never got asked again to stay another night. Then there is the other story that my mother-in-law told me recently about my other sister-in-law's house, Linda, which is ironically across the street from my mother-in-law's in the other house, about a shadow that lingers in her hallway, shaped like a person. They have all seen it, including my mother-in-law. She swears that there is an explanation for this, but even she has admitted that she can't find one. When she told me about the shadow, I got real nervous and I started to get goosebumps and got real cold. I told her sometime last year when I stayed the night at Linda's house. I was sleeping on her couch in the living room, my back to the hallway. There was a small light on where the fish tank was, so it wasn't completely dark. For some reason I woke up and turned around, and I saw this dark shadow move from the open hallway and disappear into the instance of Linda's kitchen. I was startled at first, but then got up to investigate things, to see maybe it was the shadow of the fish tank, but there was no way it could have been with the position where the tank was. So I went back to sleep, thinking it was just my imagination, and I never told anyone of that incident. That was until my mother-in-law said something. She told me not to say anything about it to Linda, because she gets freaked out about it, and she said she'll still be looking for a logical explanation for it. Good luck on finding one in all three houses, I was thinking to myself. But one last thing, back at my mother-in-law's house, a couple of weeks ago my niece Christine was staying the night, and my niece told me that when she got to the bathroom in the middle of the night, she came out running, screaming and petrified out of the hallway. She told my niece crying hysterically that when she turned the corner to go into the hallway, that she saw a shadow figure walking towards her. My niece went to look and nothing was there and my two-year-old daughter will not go near that hallway at all. One time I went to carry her down there to show her nothing was down there at all and she started crying real hard and grabbing my neck and wouldn't let go, shaking badly. So whatever is in my mother-in-law's house is probably the same thing that are in the other two homes. Makes me wonder if it goes on in the other neighbors' houses. I was doing some just for fun ghost hunting with a couple of my friends one night in a cemetery on an old gravel road. Two of my friends were out in the cemetery looking around, and my other friend decided to stay in the car. As the two guys were out in the far corner of the cemetery, I looked to the center of the graveyard and seen something that made me lose my breath for a few seconds. A blurry gray figure floated above one of the gravestones, and then looked to run through the air across three other stones, and then drop right behind another stone. After it disappeared, I asked my friend in the car with me if he had seen it too, and he said he did, and he was just as freaked out as me. It was not light that created this, because it was pitch black out there. It was my first, and so far only time, I've seen something like a ghost. 
Thank you for letting me share my story. I know this one was kind of short, but I appreciate it anyway. Hi, my name is Louise, and I live in Oxfordshire, England. The story I'm about to tell you happened only a few weeks ago and scared me and my friend to death. It was about 9.30 on a Sunday night, and I was bored, so I decided to call my friend Heather. We were talking about the usual, when all of a sudden, you could hear someone on the line breathing. Heather and I both said at the same time, do you hear that? As we listened, it got louder until there was complete silence. At first we thought maybe one of our brothers or sisters were messing about and picked up the phone on the other end. We both checked our houses and no one was in there. My parents had gone out for a meal and my brother and sister were out and Heather didn't have any siblings, and there's only one phone in her house. Anyways, we forgot about it, and after about 10 minutes of talking, we heard it again, and this time, the voice said, help, I'm close. We both really freaked out, and said what the voice repeated it again, and then went. I told Heather that I would phone her later, and about an hour later, I phoned back, and we didn't hear anything for a while until the shriek came from the phone, from what sounded like a girl. We got so scared, and as soon as our parents got home, I told them what happened, and they said maybe our phone lines got crossed with someone else's. We still don't know who was on the line to this day. I know this wasn't very scary, but thanks for reading. Well, I've been a ghost hunter for quite some time now. I've submitted a few areas under the California section of the haunted places. I recently moved to Arkansas and bought a home in April. Three in one rock house with a huge pond on 1.6 acres in Boonville, Arkansas. I fell in love with this house as soon as I saw that it said for sale by owner sign right in front of it. I called the number, and they were selling it for $48,000. I thought, my god, this is cheap for such a beautiful home. I moved in. I have a nine-year-old son and one cat. About the end of July, I started hearing and seeing things. To begin with, I was laying in bed one night, and my nine-year-old and six-year-old, who was visiting from California, were asleep in their rooms. All the lights were out. My bedroom door meets the living room. I was lying on my left side looking out into the black of the living room, and I heard what sounded like someone walking in it. Now, my son sometimes wake up in the middle of the night and come sleep with me, so naturally I thought it was them. I called out their name. No answer. Then I thought maybe it was my cat, but then I noticed her laying at my feet on the bed. It really sounded like someone was walking from the kitchen in the living room entrance towards my room. Second, my television is hooked up to the stereo because the speaker on the TV is blown. Well, when I have to be at work at 11 p.m., I usually take a shower around 9.45 p.m and my nine-year-old goes over to his father's house. One night, I turn my stereo on and put a disc in it, five-disc CD changer. It was on disc four, song number 11. There were two songs, and it should have switched to disc five after it was done with song 12. I took my shower and had the stereo loud enough to where I could hear it. All of a sudden, I didn't feel the vibration of the music anymore. I thought, well, maybe it's at a quiet part. When I got out of the shower, I still heard nothing. I put my ear to the door. Nothing. I went out and looked at the stereo, 
and it was not on CD anymore, but on FM radio, on 100.1, and that is not a station at all, it's just fuzz. There was no one else in the house but me and my cat, that was on a Friday night. Two days later, on a Sunday night, my son and I were watching television around the same time, between 9.45 and 10 p.m., in the middle of television. The radio goes from auxiliary to FM radio, 100.1, fuzz. My son says, Mom, what did you do? I was watching that. I told him I didn't do anything. On a Saturday, my son was at his father's, and I was there alone with a cat, and she started going crazy. At one point, she was standing in the doorway of my room in the living room looking at me she meowed and took off like crazy into the back bedroom belonging to my youngest son she came racing back into the living room just then i heard a loud boom coming from the room like something fell it shook the entire house my stomach had butterflies in it then and i got up to go see my son one tall dresser with small bionicle toys on it, but they were still all on there. There wasn't anything else that could fall from any place. I have always heard pipes rattling under the house since I moved in. Out of the corner of my eye, I always see things dart quickly about. I haven't seen it fall on, but I know it moves quick. I haven't took pictures of my home yet or of it for that matter. Also, I have a two-car garage. Sometimes when me and my son pull up from school, both garage doors are closed. In the morning, sometimes the right one is open. I've never really been a great believer, but for the past eight or so years, since me and my mom moved from our old flat to our new house, I've experienced numerous experiences. The first one I was about six. My bedroom is the box room, and so it's small. My bed touches each side of the room with the door to the left. I was laying in bed waiting for my grandma, who was babysitting, to bring me water. I looked up at the wall and saw a strange shadow. It was like a side profile of someone's head. I could see the nose mouth and hair clearly. It could have been my own shadow since the only light came from the ceiling and I was lying down in bed. I watched it for a few seconds, then it seemed to fade before my eyes. I thought it was just because I was tired and so I ignored it. I had no further experiences until seven years later, in 2003. I was laying in bed once again the light off about 12 o'clock at night. I was really tired and was trying to fall asleep. My bedroom had been rearranged so the door was opposite my bed and one side of my bed was pushed against the wall. I had my back to the wall and was staring into the darkness when I felt a cold breeze in the back of my neck. Thinking it was just a drought, I rolled over the face of the wall. On the wall, Probably three inches from my face was another face. I could tell it was a man, and he had a black hood up. All I could see of his face was a pair of cold eyes, and what I can only describe as green paint, a face paint on his cheek. I closed my eyes for a few seconds, thinking I was just seeing things, and when I opened them again, the face was still there. I don't know how long I stared at it, but in the end, I fell asleep, and in the morning, I find no trace of what was there the night before. These sightings carried on for weeks, always appearing on the wall at night. I didn't tell my mom about the face, but asked if I could move my bed back to the original place. We moved it, and I slept peacefully that night. The following night, I went to bed about 2 o'clock since I'd been up watching a movie on television. I got in bed as usual and rolled over to face the radiator 
like I had done for years. But the face was there again. This time, however, it was more vivid and real. It seemed to be sneering in the dark and more threatening than before. I rolled over so my back was to the wall, but I could feel the cold breeze that I had felt the last few weeks whenever the face appeared. I pulled the covers around me, refusing to look back at the face. The incidents got less frequent over the weeks, and I believed that the face was going. One night, I was sat at my computer in the corner of my living room. I have a cockatillo's cages right next to the computer desk, who was asleep, and my mom was in the kitchen making a drink. I didn't really notice anything until I heard my birds start to hiss and back away into the corner of the cage. Wondering what frightened him, I heard a scraping noise. I looked to the side of the computer to see my glass moving towards the edge of the desk. There was no way it could be moving because of our house being set on a rise, because it is where it should be sliding the other way. I lifted my hand to stop the glass from falling off the desk. When I touched it, the glass was cold, even though I hadn't had a cold drink in it. The strangest thing was, was when I went to push the glass back, I couldn't. Something was trying to push the glass. I had to shove it quite hard before I could get the glass to move. When I did, my bird came back to the front of the cage and looked as though nothing had happened. I had gone to bed earlier than my mom that night and must have been asleep when she came up. Once again, the face was there, but this time, the presence was really strong. My bedroom was icy cold when it normally is the hottest room in the house. Almost one o'clock I wake up shivering and could feel something gripping my arm, but as I come to it released its grip. I rolled over to see the face once again, but it looked different. The smirk had gone and looked more angry than anything else. I didn't sleep that night and I couldn't sleep in the room, so I spent the night sat on my sofa with the lights on downstairs. When my mom came down in the morning, she was shocked to see me up, but I just said I had woken up early and came down. I didn't want her to know. Later that afternoon, we were having dinner when she asked if I had a nightmare last night. I couldn't recall anything but the face and cold hand, so I asked why. She said she had heard me talking in my sleep, which I had never done before that. She said I was telling someone to get away and don't touch me over and over. Then after about five minutes, I was quieter and mumbling things like, why are you doing this and just go away. When I asked her what time, she said it was about half past 12. Just before I woke up with a hand gripping my arm, I haven't seen the face or had any strange experiences since that night, and I'm not quite sure what happened after. I don't know if I did something to make it all go away, and that was why the man's face looks so angry, but I'm glad they're gone. I still expect to see the face every night, but so far I haven't. I finally told my mom about it all, and she asked if I wanted to have the house blessed, but I said no. Although the scary face did no harm to anyone, and it's gone now anyway. This is an experience that occurred over several months. In the autumn of 2012, I was home from university one weekend. On the outskirts of my town, there is an old graveyard called the Red River Cemetery. It is very old. The earliest graves are from the 1790s, and associated with an abundance of local history. The Great Revival of 1800 occurred there, the first camp meeting in Christian history. A lot of spiritual activity happened at that event. This cemetery is a regular spot for me. It is a pleasant drive into the fresh country, and the entire graveyard is surrounded by ancient trees. In the back of the cemetery is a reconstruction of a log church that was once there. 
You feel as if you are going back in time when you go there. It is serenely silent and still, and there is a nostalgia with all the graves and arrangement of trees. In the center of the cemetery is a separate walled graveyard. It is an elaborate family plot, and the old wall dates back to the 1830s. There are many graves in there, and one has sunken in and opened. Vandalism or other natural occurrence? Not entirely sure. I walked around the plot for a few moments. I had come here many times before, and nothing strange had ever happened. But this time, I felt an unpleasant feeling. It wasn't very strong, but I felt that I should get out of this plot. I did so and continued to walk around the cemetery. Then it started that night. I mostly had insomnia, but I did drift into sleep eventually. The line between the two is blurred, but I definitely know that I was awake most of the night. In lack of a better term, my mind was tormented. Seemingly out of nowhere, my mind burned with the image of these two particular graves in the back of the walled plot. It was scorched in my mind. I had nightmares when awake of these two graves and never could I get my mind off of them. It was something I've never experienced before. The thought and image of these graves blared and blared in my mind and I felt terrified. I knew I was awake and I was afraid in my own home. I felt I wasn't alone. I covered myself in the middle of my bed with this torturing thought of these two graves. As the night wore on, the thought or nightmare, I can't recall which, I had a dream of the people buried there. I remember specifically seeing a man, young, but I couldn't tell how young, and his face was a blur. He wore brownish beige clothes, pre-1850-ish style. He may have held pale hair, but I can't recall specifically. He was a little heavy set, not fat, just big. This image is crystal clear in my mind, and in my torment, I knew it was one of the people buried in those graves. This incident was absolutely dreadful. The next day, I was emotionally disturbed. My parents didn't know what to think. If I thought about my experience, I would start to cry. A few odd things happen that can be attributed to coincidence, but nevertheless odd. My dog was barking at nothing. Then the washing machine went crazy and started moving. The repairman said a part inside had gotten loose. It never done that, nor has it again. Again, this could be coincidence. Eventually, I put it out of my mind. It was disturbing, but I couldn't let it get in the way of my studies, so I carried on with my life. Then came the spring of 2013. I became curious again about those graves. I wondered, just who are buried in those graves? I thought if I found out, some sort of mystery would be solved or a question would be answered. So I gathered my courage and went back to the cemetery. I found the two graves. They were there. I wrote down the names but misplaced the exact information, but the individuals were two siblings. There was a Jane, and she passed away when she was 28 and had three children. Her brother's name was Chatham. He died when he was 21 or 22 in the 1810s. They were the children of a Kentucky senator, who is also buried nearby, and the site of their old family home is nearby. Nobody's special, and I thought little of it. That very night, I woke up at exactly 3.30 a.m. Insomnia again. I had been awake for a few moments, and then my doorknob wiggled. I stared wide-eyed at it for the longest time. It had just wiggled. My first thought is that it was my cat. Sometimes she opens the porch door, then tries to open our doors. I prayed to God, please let that have been my cat, then I can sleep in peace. I convinced myself it was my cat, of course. The next morning, my cat was on the porch, and the porch door happened to be locked. 
Kitty had not snuck in, so I interrogated my mom, dad, and brother. They denied my accusations. They wouldn't do that. Then, the next night came, and I awoke again at 3.30 or 4.30. When I went to bed, my brother, who was in the den, right outside my room, was watching TV. But here, I was awake again, and I could see the light coming in, where I could see under the door. Then my door opened. I heard the doorknob turn, and it slowly opened, about halfway. Then it began to close again, but didn't close all the way. Then there was a flash of light in the den, and it went dark. I stared at it for a while. I thought it was my brother, because I thought he stayed up all night watching the show and opened my door for some reason. Thus, I wasn't scared, and I got up and closed the door. I attempted to go back to sleep, but was a little bothered. I asked him about it the next morning. He didn't know what I was talking about, because he swore he went to bed at midnight, and he has no history of sleepwalking. I did my usual interrogation, and everyone denied it. I was ambushed and became frightened. Later that day, I was on the computer and heard my mom scream my name twice, as if from outside, like she needed help. I rushed outside to get her aid. She was calmly tending the garden. She looked startled when I got there. What's wrong? I asked out of breath. I heard you scream my name. She said she never did and looked at me like I was crazy. She thought I was playing a joke on her. She'd never play a joke like this on me. Since this moment, nothing has happened with the incident. I even went back to the graveyard and got no bad feelings. It was a lovely autumn noon. Me, my parents, and my granny were on our way to visit relatives. Everyone was a bit on edge, as these family gatherings tend to be extremely awkward and competitive, so they thought it was the perfect time to express their views on political matters, which is always so delightful. For these reasons, I was rather annoyed when we arrived at the cemetery. Our final destination was visiting live relatives, Although, visiting the dead ones can be competitive as well, as our culture has a knack of graveside landscape design. But my granny also wanted to pay our respects to the deceased, because she can't go there by herself too often. I used this opportunity to keep my distance, and to gather my wits before standing in front of the grand jury on matters of finance and romance. I raked the leaves and started looking about. I was pleasantly surprised to notice I felt at ease. Previously, I've always felt uncomfortable in graveyards, jumpy even. I started looking around, observing the old, shadowy trees, leaves swirling down. There are mossy graves with old German names, barely possible to read now, Lithuanian names. It's close to the border. Sometimes, I would notice a name I have heard probably from local gossip. I was mostly enjoying the nature, though. At that point, I think it's important to admit, I felt anxious and a bit depressed because of the visit, but the graveyard felt to me like a park. Graves, just like some monuments dedicated to soldiers. However, when we were about to leave, I approached the graveside, almost from behind. Suddenly, I thought to myself, ah, a young girl. Then I got scared because I didn't know if it was really a young girl. I rarely visit there, and I have consciously memorized just our family spot. A few graves around it, and some grave with, I think, Lithuanian names on the way in, because it is so close to the path, you almost step on it, and that makes me feel bad. The more I tried to brush the impression off, the more persistent it got. I don't really know how to explain it. 
the kind of presence I felt was like, it wasn't even physical. Let me give you a clear picture here. You were hanging out with your friends, watching a movie, laughing about this or that. Suddenly, someone says, oh, it's too bad John isn't here. And you feel like it would just be the perfect time if John was here, like he is truly missing at your party. That is the kind of presence I'm speaking about. You don't miss John's appearance. It's such a pity he's not here. The sofa looks awful without him. You don't miss any particular quality. You miss his presence, his being. That is what I felt. Like there was this presence of a particular young girl that I felt. It wasn't threatening or anything. I just got freaked out by my own old self. Then I also noticed, or perhaps before, I can't place these two in order because maybe that directed my attention to the grave, that a candle had fallen off the edge of the gravestone and I felt I should have probably picked it up and place it back. There was this little angel fingering too and I thought maybe that was why I decided it was a young person, although I'm not sure I saw it from where I was coming. I don't know why. People just don't place angels on the graves of adults and elderly. Maybe it's because jobs and wrinkles don't seem angelic and old people mostly don't like flying. Sorry, couldn't resist a joke. I approached the front and counted the numbers that added up to 23 years. A girl. The graveside was neatly raked, not just raked to sweep away the footsteps from the sandy oil. Someone had even made ornaments in the sand in the traditional manner. I thought it was a perfectly good practical reason not to get involved. I was scared to do something awfully wrong and cause something terribly bad. I didn't want to ruin someone's thorough work. So I started stepping away slowly, having that internal fight with myself. I knew I had to go and put that candle back, but I told myself, Come on, it will fall off again when it gets windy. Who cares? The candle's probably burnt out anyway. This isn't an abandoned grave. Someone will come. The grave was cared for. I can't go around picking up everything. As I later explained to my friend, I was probably worried that when you go to heaven, you still have to be preoccupied with order. I'm messy and I've been persecuted all my life for that. I hope when we die, we don't care anymore about such nonsense. I don't want anyone to visit me in my dreams, telling me to clean up under my bed. Finally, I rather unwillingly went back and placed that candle on the stone. I prayed to God to take care of this young soul and to protect me because I mostly had no idea what I was doing, so God had to take care of me. And as I walked back to the car, I suddenly felt really happy and warm around my shoulders. It wasn't a jolly kind of happiness, more like this, all is right kind of happiness. And it stayed with me until we found out my cousin had lost a lot of weight, which made everyone feel plenty of things. Thank you kindly for reading this experience. P.S. My granny saw me by the girl's grave, and she told us about her. It was some kind of tragic, unexpected death. I'm saying this because it might be that she had told me this before. The girl had died several years ago. As the grave was on the way out, and maybe I had unconsciously memorized it, it would be honest to mention this option. I just started experiencing whatever is going on, and it is really scaring me. A few weeks ago, my sister and I went to the local graveyard to test out this ghost raider I got in the app market for my droid. That's my phone, if you didn't know. I didn't think it would really work. It's just a circle with lines around it and a scanner, and if there is a so-called apparition nearby, a dot appears on the scanner in the direction it is. There was a slight breeze that day, and it was sunny. We got near the graveyard, and the scanner started going crazy. 
Dots were appearing everywhere, red, yellow, and green dots. The colors meaning the strength of the so-called entity, red being the most present and green being the least. A word or phrase appears at the top of the screen sometimes, like something to do with their death or whatnot. A large amount of phrases and words began appearing, some names and some frightening words like hanged or murder. The creepiest part of the whole equation was when a name appeared. The name was Peter. My sister and I started wondering if the Peter that appeared was an inhabitant of the graveyard. We started looking at gravestones, and we actually found one that said Peter Longs. It was a little scary, but then again, there is a lot of people named Peter in this world. We started talking to the so-called spirits. Like I said, is there anyone here with us that would like to share things via my radar? I started getting replies like crazy. Random words and phrases were blazing around like a wildfire. We then started to go home because it was getting near dinner time. Everything was good from then on for about two days. My whole family started hearing footsteps, knocks, bangs, etc. My sister said that she heard her name called, and then a bottle of her perfume flew off of her shelf and across the room. I later started seeing shadows and hearing muffled talking in the room next to me, even when nobody would be in there. Everything was starting to scare me, so I spoke out to them and told whatever was plaguing my family that it had to leave my home. Everything was quiet and back to normal until the next night, when I was laying in bed trying to sleep. I felt really cold, all of a sudden, and my TV turned on really quick and then it turned off again. I went to my sister's room and saw her sitting up in her bed, looking really frightened. I asked her what was the matter, and she said that her TV turned on and off again. I told her that the same thing happened to me. We were both scared as can be, so I just slept in her room that night. The most recent and scariest experience I have was when I was home alone one night because my family was out at the store and I didn't want to go. I was just watching TV and then the channel flipped. The remote was all the way across the room when that happened. Later, I got in the shower and as I was washing my hair, I heard a knock on the bathroom door. The door swung open and one of the knobs in the cabinet hanging on the wall fell to the floor. I was so scared that I called my mom and I went to my neighbor's house until they got home. But are these experiences attributed to me going to the graveyard recently? I don't know, but I'm really terrified of all these events that occurred. But I guess in a way, it is kind of entertaining. Not in a good way, but an interesting one. Thanks for reading. I live in a two-bedroom apartment in a suburb of Portland, Oregon. One afternoon, on returning from the store with an armload of groceries, I started the usual ritual of unlocking my front door. There's a deadbolt above and a key lock in the knob beneath it, and I keep the key, which fits both on a lanyard around my neck. I had uh, turned the deadbolt, and before I could remove the key and insert it in a knob beneath, the knob turned first left, then right, as it would if someone were unlocking and opening the door from the inside. Thinking that my neighbor John, who has a key, had come over to finish some work he had begun on the previous day, I expected to see him when I pushed the door open. There was no one on the other side of the door, but the atmosphere was electric and there was a strong impression that someone had just been there. I called out but received no answer. Putting down the bags of groceries, I immediately went to the phone and dialed John's number. To my great surprise, he answered and I asked him to come over quickly and help me search for a possible intruder. I want to make it clear that, at this point, the front door near which I was standing the entire time 
was the only way in or out of the apartment, as the back door to the patio and adjacent parking lot had been temporarily blocked. John arrived about a minute later, and together we searched the premises. Every nook, cranny, and corner, of course, but there was no sign of an intruder or anyone else to be found anywhere. And I guess that's a good thing, at least. It is most likely only a coincidence, but I learned several months later that a previous incident with a tenant and an elderly lady known for her helpful nature and numerous kindnesses towards her neighbors had passed away in the apartment about a decade before I moved in. Possible spirits? I'm not entirely sure, but I would say if this lady is behind all the kindness with opening the door and being helpful, I thank her immensely. A friendly ghost encounter. July 7th of this year, after coming home from work, I noticed the commode lid in my bathroom was down. This is not something I ever do, nor does my little boy, Dalton, and he wasn't even here the night before. Since we live on my parents' property, I thought maybe my dad had come down during the day and for some completely insane reason shut my commode lid. So I asked my dad about it and he said he hadn't been down that day. And no one was home except our kitten Rex, who was only about five weeks old, and my hamsters. If Rex was able to climb up the commode, he'd had fallen into the commode and drowned before I got home that night. That night, after using the bathroom, leaving the lid up, I went to bed. Sometime during that night, while dreaming, I realized I was holding something in my hand. So I opened my eyes enough to see what I had clinched in my left hand. I couldn't tell what it was, just that there was something in my hand. When I woke up the next morning, my hand was still closed. I opened it, and there was a green Satan-y type ribbon in my hand. All of my Christmas and Halloween decorations are stored in my building. I'm not a scrapbooker or anything artistic like that at all, so I don't have ribbon lying around my house. And with my OCD problems, if I find it, it's either put where it belongs or thrown away. Anyway, I have no idea where that ribbon came from, nor do I know why I was woken during the night to acknowledge I was holding it. I also don't know why I continued to hold it until next morning. Upon entering my bathroom the next morning, which is connected to my bedroom, I discovered my commode lid was down again. Now this lid is one of the heavy kinds, not the plastic ones. It is very heavy and very loud when it falls. I have probably peed the bed if I'd heard it fall during the night. <laughs> A week later, as Dalton was in bed, he leaned up and called for me. I was sitting at the computer and asked him what he wanted. I figured this was another one of those nights where Dalton was too awake to sleep and he would find excuses to talk all night. He said, Mom, I heard our ghost again. When I asked him what was said, Dalton said he just said, Dalton. When Dalton says his own name, he doesn't enunciate the T. He says Dallin, no T. When he says they say his name, always emphasizes the T. It's like Dalton. So, after he told me the little boy called his name, I told him it would be okay to just lie back down. A few minutes later, Dalton came out of the bedroom and, with a pillow and a blanket, told me he was going to go to sleep on the couch. Within a matter of minutes, Dalton was sound asleep on the couch, which leads me to believe that Dalton did, indeed, hear a little boy, and it scared him enough that he didn't want to be in bed by himself, even with the light on and being able to see me. 
July 25th, I woke up with a horrendous headache. This kind of headache doesn't go away with my migraine medication. I literally have to sleep it off and that can take hours. So I decided to try and take a bath to see if it would relax me enough to be able to go to back to sleep. While running lukewarm bath water, I couldn't bear it hot because the heat on top of the headache would make me puke. I wondered if the water running from the faucet onto my forehead would help. Sometimes, pressure on my forehead eases the pain. So I lay down in the tub with my head under the faucet for a while. I'm not sure how long. All at once, the water went hot. I mean completely hot. I shot up away from the stream of water and yelled, What the heck? Yes, I said heck. And I also said, that wasn't funny. It wasn't nice, and it wasn't funny either. I know the first instinct would be someone somewhere ran water. Natural assumption. Except Dalton didn't come into the bathroom. He wouldn't have run water in the kitchen sink because we have cold bottled water in the refrigerator. In my bath water, it doesn't fluctuate at all. Never. You can flush the commodes, run every sink, and the washer and the water temperature in the bath doesn't fluctuate. So why did my water turn from lukewarm to hot in less than a millisecond? After I adjusted the cold water, I realized I was mere inches from the top of the tub. My tub doesn't have an overflow. If the water hadn't gone to hot, I probably would have overflowed my bathtub. A helpful ghost in our house prevented fire. Just when my mom and my brother and I moved into the house after the divorce, we immediately noticed that we were not alone in the house. I'm going to tell you about an experience mom had when she was alone. This was about two months after we moved in. Me and my brother were visiting my dad and mom was upstairs taking a shower because she was going over to a friend later on. Downstairs she had a candle and a little candle holder shaped like a little house on top of the fireplace. She forgot about it, but when she stood in the bathroom putting on makeup after her shower, she heard a scratching noise. Naturally, she thought it was our two kittens, so she didn't pay much attention to it. The scratching kept on going and became stronger. She went outside the bathroom to see what the kittens were doing and why exactly they were scratching at this. But when she reached the bedroom, she found them sleeping on her bed. Mom went on to the stairs, thinking maybe me and my brother had uh, returned home. She called out our names, but she got nothing but silence in return. At this point, she was freaked out, but started to walk down the stairs to check out the noise, as it seemed to come from the living room. When she reached the bottom of the stairs, she saw the backside of a long black dress sweep into the living room. She ran after it and saw that the candle holder on the fireplace had caught on fire. She managed to put it out before anything else got damaged. The woman in the dress were nowhere to be seen or found. When me and my brother returned home, she told us all about it, and we thought about what could have caused the scratching noises. It wasn't until my mom tried to scratch her nails against the fireplace that we found out what it was. It seems like the lady in black dress saw the fire and scratched on the fireplace until she got mom's attention. A very helpful visitor. In 2011, I was rushed to the ER suffering from a very high fever brought on by septic shock. I was quickly admitted and was put on a course of intravenous antibiotics called Levaquin. A few nights into my treatment, I was unable to sleep and found myself content with watching late night television. My attention would frequently wander over to the open door and to the nurses and staff passing by the door. On one such occasion, a woman happened to slowly pass by me, and I muttered, 
somewhat out of character. Hello. The woman was pretty pale, with a pale complexion, with very, very blue eyes, and her face was framed by nearly shoulder-length brown hair. She smiled at me, then passed her index finger to her lips and let out a soft shh. She then continued down the hall and out of sight. I replayed the odd occurrence in my mind, and it then occurred to me that she wasn't wearing the scrubs of a modern nurse, but rather the white outfit of some turn-of-the-century nurse. I asked the attending nurse if there was some sort of a costume party the night before, and was told no. A few days later, after the fever had broken, I found myself being wheeled out of the hospital, and we passed by a mural of the hospital's history, including a bunch of photos of women wearing similar outfits. Whenever I relate this story to others, they tell me that I was dreaming, and me seeing the photos put the information in my head. I never saw that mural, I say. I was admitted through the emergency room, not the main entrance. To this day, I'm confused by the experience. I've never had any type of paranormal happening. One believer told me that I was being watched over by a kind spirit, but I don't know what to believe. Until then, I'd like to believe it was just a happy coincidence, and if not that, then the spirit was very nice to me and hoping that I would pull through. Thanks for reading. When I worked at an inn in New Hope, Pennsylvania, as a live-in housekeeper, I always knew exactly how many guests we had at the house. I always took time out to talk to each guest, trying to remember who they were and their names for the next morning when I served breakfast. That night I knew we only had one room left unoccupied, and I always felt relieved to have even one less room to clean in the eight-room inn. I knew that all of the guests were in their rooms one night, and I looked down the hall to see a man in coattails look up the long stairway to the upstairs of the old house. I thought that he looked upset because he's bolted upstairs, two steps at a time. I remember thinking at the time that the manager or the innkeeper may have checked this last guest in, and he was possibly part of a wedding. I told the manager the next day that I wasn't looking forward to cleaning all the rooms. He said, what are you talking about? You don't have to clean all the rooms. Only seven were rented. He said in a voice that I can only describe as annoyed, confused. I asked him who the man in the gray coat was that bolted upstairs last night. Was he one of their friends? He wasn't any of the guests that I had checked in. I knew that for sure. When I told the manager about the gray-coated man, he looked at me like, well, like he had seen a ghost. The manager said, don't tell me that. I don't want to hear any more about this. Still confused, I said, what do you mean he wasn't a guest? He said, oh no, it's Ann Miller, the movie star, all over again. She stayed here and started talking like this. Apparently others had seen this ghost before, and there was an old newspaper story on the wall about a ghostly soldier staying at the end, or something like that. I'm just really, really glad that I didn't realize that the ghost was a ghost, or I wouldn't have been able to sleep that night in my room on the top floor. I had also nights in the inn where I was sure somebody was watching me, standing right over me. I used to hear very loud, almost insanely loud ringing sounds in my ears at the time. I remember thinking how cruel that was, that loud ringing sound, and I wondered if I was going to die. The energy was very, very strong. I was also uncomfortable after that and couldn't stand to have the vacuum cleaner on because I felt cut off from the real world when I was in the inn by myself. Evening Magazine did a story when I was still working there too about the best inn in New Hope. As you may have guessed, yes, they did mention that ghost in the story. Me and a couple of my other friends were at a slumber party at my friend's house. All of a sudden, my friend starts talking about these people that went into the cemetery and never came out. So I automatically yell out, let's go check it out. So we did. We didn't go in the cemetery, 
but we saw some really freaky things, and I think you deserve to know what we saw. At first, I did not believe her, but then I saw this strange figure sitting on a pole on top of the fence. So I'm like, you guys see that silver pole? And they said, yeah. Then I said, look up. We all saw it. It was a faint sight of a woman, her head facing downward at first. Then she looked up. I screamed. We all did. Then we ran inside the house. After we were calm enough to talk, we started dancing around to the music. When we had come in, we closed the shades. But then something strange started happening. The blinds started to sway back and forth, faster and faster each time. By then, we were so scared we jumped on the couch, but none of us had the guts to get up to turn the television off. But another strange thing started happening. The TV started turning on and off and changing channels slowly. It was about 3 o'clock in the morning. We were tired and freaked out. But me and one of my friends were still up, so we look out the window. We didn't get up, but sure enough, we looked out a crack in the window and saw a ghost looking straight at us. We screamed and woke the other girls up. They saw it too. We went up to wake my friend's parents up to show them, but when they got downstairs, the ghost was gone. I've always been a Stephen King fan, and have always wanted to visit the hotel that inspired The Shining. I got to do just that in September. We checked in, went to our room, turned on the light, left our bags, and turned the light off. We came back an hour later and could only turn the light on with a chain on the ceiling fan, not the light switch. Later, after we went to sleep, the bed shook, like it feels when your washer is in spin mode. We found out at the tour that this is Billy, a mischievous boy. Then we heard the hotel ghost children, described the next day in the tour, giggling and running up and down the hall outside our room of 416. Nobody was even outside the door. I got to meet the people staying in 217, Stephen King's room and the presidential suite. And while we were in the room, we all started smelling a strong scent of rose water. The tour guide said that that was Miss Stanley. We ate in the restaurant downstairs, and my wife's phone went to vibrate mode all on its own. I also set up my Sansa brand digital sound recorder in our room, and got the children running not once, but twice, as well as the sounds of chairs sliding across the floor and dresser drawers opening and closing, although we were asleep and didn't see it happen. While taking photos, my camera would zoom by itself and sometimes shut off. I don't give a rat's butt if anyone on this website or my friends ever believe me. I will be staying there again. I have business meetings in Loveland every six months. What a great time. My daughter had just passed away. She was only 31 years old. She had a grand mal seizure, so it was sudden. After the funeral, I took some of the cut flowers and used twine to hold them together. I then hung them from a pipe in the basement to let them dry. A few days later, I was in the basement doing laundry when I got a really uneasy feeling, and it was getting worse. It got so bad that I started to feel that someone was in the room with me but I was also too scared to turn around and look. I then turned to my right as slow as I could to walk towards the stairs. I never moved my head. Like I said, I was scared to death. I knew someone was there. I started up the stairs very slowly. I was afraid if I moved too fast, it would hurt, grab, touch, or do something to me. When I got to the top and turned the corner, the feeling left. But after about five seconds later, there was a horrible crash that came from the basement. I had a wall of shelves holding canning jars, glassware, knickknacks, etc. It sounded as if this whole wall just fell down. The noise was horrible. That was it. I packed a few things and got the hell out of there and went to a friend's house. After four days, I went back with my friend. We waited a little while because we were both apprehensive. But then we went into the basement. I expected to see a disaster on the floor, but there wasn't. 
To my amazement, the only thing on the floor were my daughter's funeral flowers. Fluffy, dried up flowers that couldn't have been heard falling if he stood right next to it. I also know that it would have been impossible for them to just fall because of the way I tied them up there. I've been trying to contact people who know about this stuff, but hit a dead end because they all want money to answer my questions about this. When a close person dies, it's natural that you would feel and hope that if possible, they will send you a sign. In this case, I don't think this event was my daughter's doing. She would not have scared me like that. That presence was one of evil. It felt evil. If I never was a believer before, I was on that day. I was 15 years old and was home from Arizona for the summer. I more or less grew up on our family farm. The house there is an older style two-story farmhouse. I play guitar and like to play in the stairwell because the acoustics sound good there. It was early one afternoon in the month of June and I was taking some time to play, sitting on the middle landing. It was a warm day out. As I was playing, I had noticed the air leading upstairs had gotten cooler. It was weird. Appearing from the north bedroom was an apparition of an older woman with short dark hair, wearing an older style dress, apron, glasses, and holding a rag. She had no feet, but moved to the south bedroom across the hall. Then she came back and looked at me and smiled. She then went back to the south bedroom. The air by this time was noticeably cooler. My first reaction was to get out of there, but I really did not feel scared. I talked to my father a few days later about it, and that was when I found out my then-grandmother was not my real grandmother, but my grandfather's second wife. My father told me his real mother died from a fall down those stairs, resulting in a blood clot to her brain. My father was 14 years old when she died. Her funeral was also in the house. She was a lover of music, as all her children played from one form of instrument or other. I, of course, had never seen her. My father just stared at me when I described her to him. Then he took me to visit my grandfather, and I was shown a picture of her. That was her. For some reason, when I go back to the house, I still feel a presence there. I can remember my first experience with a spirit, and it frightened me to the point where I was almost petrified to get out of bed. Okay, let me back up. I was quite a few years younger, probably eight or nine, when the usual bedtime routines would begin. My younger brother, age four at the time, was making his commonly nightly advance for the light switch on the wall. He'd always switch it on right before bed, because he was afraid of the dark, to a point where he would scream like the uncanny themselves. The light switch was at the top of the stairs, in our room, and to scan down the stairs without the lights on, you were almost never able to see the bottom. I believe there was at least 18 stairs, and at the very bottom, another light switch. Above the switches were the light fixtures themselves, just two tiny fixtures lighting a long staircase, which would leak beams of light right into the bedroom and keep it well lit. The night continued like any other. Our parents tucked us into our beds, gave us each a kiss on the forehead, told us they loved us, and we'd sleep content knowing they were there. No more than an hour or two passed and the light bulbs went out, one after the other. I thought nothing of it until my brother began to toss and turn in his bed as if he were very ill. He sat up in his bed and buried his head into his hands, looked up, and cried for our parents to fix it. Some time ticked by. It turned out the light bulbs blew, which I also thought nothing of until I realized the next morning that we just put new bulbs in that afternoon. After the small bothersome fiasco, I finally managed to get back to sleep. Many hours later, I regained consciousness, keeping my eyes closed, hoping to get back to sleep. No lights on, which meant nothing would burn my eyes, and I thought I'd be back out in seconds, until I was disturbed by a long, chilling wind that swept up from the flooring. Immediately, I realized I had the chills and opened my eyes, seeing nothing more than a long, flowing, 
white fabric float over my entire body. Almost too afraid to move, I slowly jerked my head to look at the staircase, seeing how it was almost perfectly adjacent to the foot of my bed. I saw a woman. She seemed so peaceful, content, without a care. Standing at the top of the stairs, she reached for the handrail and dropped her right foot down one step. At this time, I realized there was something amiss with her beautiful, fluttering, chestnut brown hair. I was curious as to how her hair was flowing, as if in the wind, when she caught me glancing at her. She seemed so startled and afraid to see me, as if she did something terribly wrong. She began to become transparent as her head hung lower in shame and came back up in a gasp. As if she meant to say something or became even more frightened, and then she was gone. The breeze that filled my room as this event transpired died down, and my alarm clock read 3 a.m. My husband and two children moved into a house that we had rented while we were waiting for our new house to be finished so we could move in. We had only been in a rental a few days when strange things started to happen. My husband worked long hours and wasn't home much, so my children and I spent many nights alone. At first, I dismissed what I was feeling was nerves for being alone in a new house and not knowing any of the neighbors. I would be startled awake in the middle of the night with the feeling that I was being watched and someone was trying to get my attention. I would sit up in my bed and there was a dark figure standing in the doorway of my bedroom. Like I said at first, I dismissed it as my imagination. However, the events continued to take a place on a nightly basis. Then my four-year-old son started to talk about the monkeys that were counting his fingers when he was in his room. I asked him to tell me what the monkeys looked like, and he described a dark figure that I had been seeing. At this time, I was getting a little spooked. It really got to me, and I realized that I was dealing with a spirit when one of my kids wound up stuffed animals kept laying in the middle of the kitchen floor, and I would pick it up and put it in the toy room, and within minutes the toy would be in the middle of my kitchen floor again. Finally, I gave up and put the toy on top of the fridge to keep the toy away from the kids. We left shortly after placing the toy up out of the reach of my children. We were gone for most of the day. When I walked into the house from being gone for the day, the toy was in the middle of my kitchen floor, playing the song it plays when it has been wound up. This made the hair on my back of my neck stand up. Later that same week, I had the kids in bed asleep, and I was laying on the couch watching TV. Everything seemed at peace for the time being, when all of a sudden, it sounded like someone was beating up the freestanding fireplace with a baseball bat. I ran for the kids' room to make sure they were safe. When I reached the hallway, I went through one of the spirits. It was a cold that cannot be described. It went all the way through me, and it's a feeling that I will never forget. When I got to my kids' room, I saw that the children were fine and sleeping like babies. I went into the living room and started yelling at whomever it was, and I told them that they are welcome to stay in the home if they would quit scaring us. I said if they let us be, we promised that we would move out as soon as possible. The events calmed down quite a bit, however they let their presence known on a daily basis. The monkeys continued to count my son's fingers, and I would be startled nightly with a dark shadow standing in my bedroom doorway. We moved out about a month later, and my son stopped telling me about the monkeys. My son is now 20 years old, and he still remembers the monkeys and brings the subject up from time to time. I would like to share with you one of my own true experiences, which happened right here in Dayton, Tennessee, approximately 20 years ago. This story is true. I don't have a witness and I can't prove it, but it happened. When I was about 25 years old, I was hired on at the city of Dayton as a laborer. Due to medical problems, I requested a transfer and wound up working at the water plant. This is where water is sucked in through huge pipes from the Tennessee River and treated with chemicals to make it safe for drinking. 
since it had to be located near the river. The water plant was rather secluded and far away from any houses. It was a lonesome place on the graveyard shift, from 11 p.m. until 7 a.m. Nobody there but me and sometimes my little dog, Rustus. But it wasn't really scary either. It was spotlessly clean and well lit. There were no cobwebs or dark corners. And best of all, it was easy. The only place in the plant that made me nervous was the basement. That's where the huge pipes from the river entered into the building, and the atmosphere down there was just creepy. Anyway, I've always been sensitive to spirits, somewhat psychic, and I know my way around a deck of tarot cards, and that intuitive voice, that gut feeling, told me that I should stay on the upper floors, at least above ground level. So I did, and everything was cool for a long time, but then, things changed. I went into work that night at 11, same as usual. Nothing out of the ordinary was going on, and after saying goodnight to the guy that worked the evening shift, I started the filters, checked all the chemicals, and then settled into the chair behind the desk in the office with a book. It's kind of strange, the little things that we remember. The name of the book was One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest by Ken Kessie. Why do I remember that? Oh, well, that's not important. I was really getting into the story. You know how sometimes you can get so absorbed into something like that? You forget about everything, except the book, and the next thing you know, a couple of hours have slipped away without a whisper. Well, that's what happened. I looked at the clock and it was 3 a.m., straight up. It's a true witching hour. That's exactly when I heard the noises began. Slam. Something in the hall had fallen onto the tiled floor. Bang. It happened again. But that was impossible. I was alone, and there was nothing in the hall that wasn't bolted to the floor. So I took a deep breath, slowly eased out of my chair, and peeked through the doorless opening into the hall. First to the left I looked. Nothing. Just the closet door, which was open slightly. Then to the right, and there, about a halfway to the door that led down to the basement, were two of the cabinet doors laying flat out on the floor. The same two cabinet doors that I had carefully closed and latched earlier. I decided that they weren't hurting anything by being there instead of on the cabinet, at least until the sun came up. I reasoned, would be okay, and I could just stay in the office in case the phone rang or anything. I turned back to my chair and book, and wished that there was a door that I could close, and lock. But there was no door. It had been removed years earlier by Charles, an enterprising ex-employee who would never tell where he hid that door after he got fired for trying to disassemble the whole building in eight hours. When questioned by the supervisor, Charles pulled a knife and began to babble about the Bible, the Great Beast, and the Book of Revelations. But back to it, my chair and book. I sat back down and tried to read more, but it was impossible. You see, I began to feel that I wasn't alone. I knew that there was someone else in the building, in the basement, to be precise and I knew that it was not friendly. So I just sat there behind the desk, looking through the doorway, waiting. I didn't have to wait long. I felt it before I saw it. A terrible air of hatred and evil seemed to settle in like fog in a graveyard. I was scared, really scared. And then I saw it. As I sat in the chair, looking out into the hallway, the shape drifted into view. It came from the direction of the basement, floating slowly about 6 to 12 inches above the floor. It was the shape of a man, solid, but at the same time not solid, and it was totally black, like a human body dipped in tar. I saw the arms, the legs, the head, but no face and no eyes. When it was exactly in the center of the open doorway, it seemed to notice me for the first time. It turned in my direction, and when we were face to face, with no more than eight feet of open space and one small desk between us, it almost killed me. It very nearly scared me to death. It began to scream and reach for me, but for some reason, it seemed that it could not cross the threshold from the hall. So it reached and reached, and the arms started to get longer, getting closer with every effort, but never quite touching me. The monster leaned inward through the door and screamed its frustration. Now let me explain that it never made a sound that I could actually hear. It had no mouth. When I say screamed, 
I mean that it sent wave after wave of negative energy towards me and through me. Hate and fear of such intensity that I had never felt before and never want to feel again pulsed through my body with every lunge of that black demon. I truly thought that I was going to die from the fear, but I didn't want to die in the presence of such a creature. So I sat there for the duration of the attack, at least 30 seconds. I know that 30 seconds is not usually thought to be a very long time, but in my situation, it seemed to be considerably longer. Finally, after my half minute of terror was up, the thing turned its head to its left, as if it heard something. It then looked eyelessly back at me for just a moment, then turned away and floated back towards the basement. It was several seconds before I could breathe again. When I regained my senses, I was in a fetal position in the chair, with my legs in front of me for protection. Only my bugged out eyes were above my knees as I watched for any reappearance of the spirit, but thankfully, it did not return. As soon as I was able to speak again, I was on the telephone calling everybody, anybody, I didn't care who, just to hear a human voice. I finished my shift that night, and I didn't say anything to the day shift guy when he got there at 7 a.m. I immediately applied for a transfer back to the chain gang and soon received it. I never went back to the water plant. I now know the reason that Charles lost his mind. He thought his religion would protect him, but somehow the evil got through. And I know why the people that work there now, 20 years later, carry handguns at all times. They're scared, but they don't know what is scaring them. And you and I both know that if a monster ever returns, their bullets will not protect them. I still don't know what protected me, but I'm glad that it did. In the 20 years since this happened, I've done a little research and talked to several psychics, and I've learned that other people have seen these black spirits in various places and that they are indeed dangerous. So, if you ever go out ghost hunting, and I still do, watch yourself. These spirits are real, and they are nothing to play with. I've always heard odd things and seen the supernatural, though usually it's just a general feel or whisper in a house with a haunting. A haunting that's human, that is. But recently, something's changed, and it's really freaking me out. It all started when I started university in Devon, England. I'd been very sick for a couple of days with a nasty cold and was just starting to feel better. So my flatmate and I decided to go out to the town for a lunch out. All went as planned and we managed to catch one of the sparse buses in the nick of time. This is where it gets a little odd. I always gaze out the window whenever I'm traveling so I don't miss much. Usually, it's just a fox running across a field, or a nice view, but this time, it was a guy. He was sticking his arm out for the bus. This obviously wasn't the odd thing. What was odd was he didn't even have a face. He was dressed in a pair of jeans and a black hoodie, with the hood up, and looked as if... He was wearing one of those joke black morph suits over his face. I laughed a little to myself, expecting a general prank. The bus stopped, letting people off, but no one got on. This made me frown a little, as I'd seen the guy waving, so I asked my friend if she'd seen him. She didn't, and when I pressed her further, simply said the illness must have made me sleep deprived. I thought about this for a while and decided she was probably right. After all, the mind can play tricks on you when you're tired and I'd never seen anything like that before in my life. However, after that event, I started to see odd things all the time. Shadows of people where there were no people odd faces in windows, and strange noises. It also wasn't the only no faces. 
I'd see. When I was still at university, there was this truly horrifying apparition outside my flat, always there whenever I opened my curtains, night or day. It was extremely tall. No, this is not Slenderman, and this figure had long, greasy hair over its face. But I knew that it was smiling, and not a very nice smile either. It scared me to the point where I started to stay over at my current partner's, using the excuse of poor sleep thanks to my cheap mattress. Mind you, not that I could get much sleep knowing that thing was outside. I'm not sure what to do or what it means, and it's scaring me. I see the no-face people everywhere, in corners, at train stations. I try not to get too close. I even tried to talk to one once, but it didn't result in much. They just stared at me. Obviously, seeing these odd things have become a bit of a problem, socially. It's not exactly acceptable to flinch for no reason or look alarmed at the slightest thing. I just can't help it. They make me nervous and scared. I don't know what they are, after all, but they just don't seem human. I mean, some of them do human things, like the waving down of the bus, but the majority of the time, they just seem to be watching and following people. Some of them have quite a solid shape, just like another person, aside from the obvious face thing, but others seem to just be odd shadows. Can anyone help me with this? If you've seen the same, what does it mean that I've started to see things? And am I in any danger? A few years ago, I posted my story about seeing the people with no faces. Things had stayed the same for all these years, and I'd gotten used to seeing them, even if it unnerved me more than a little. But now, things have changed. Not so long ago, I was taken into hospital after having a four-hour seizure, and it was touch and go for the month that I was there. I was diagnosed with a central nervous disorder, one where I have a 30% chance of survival. But I'm determined. They didn't think I would walk again. But I proved them all wrong, and am currently able to get around on crutches. After all that, I'd been so focused on getting better, I'd more or less forgotten about the no-faced people. For those who aren't quite sure what I mean by that, I'll give a description you know when people wear those morph suits that cover your face? They kind of look like that, but the skin is always black, and they don't have very clear facial features, more like a suggestion of them being there. Anyway, I soon remembered the day I left hospital. I was in high spirits, happy I was leaving, more or less on my own two feet. It was then that I noticed one of the no-faced people standing at the entrance, and it was different. It looked straight at me a lot more intensely than the usual glance. Yes, I was disturbed at the time, but just assumed it was a one-off. That soon changed. They started to move closer and closer to me. Then. It really kicked off. Doors started to rattle behind me, as if someone were trying to get in. But when I opened them, no one would be there. Even that only scared me a little. But now, I'm really scared. The other night, I was relaxing, preparing to settle for sleep. 
I suddenly felt something grab and twist my foot. At first, I laughed, thinking it was my cat playing, until I realized that my cat was lying asleep next to me, nowhere near my feet. I've read many theories of shadow people, and I've often wondered if the no-faced people are something alike. So perhaps a reflection of a dimension close to ours, or something more sinister. I'm scared because I'm aware that I still have a 70% chance of becoming sicker and dying. Are they attempting to increase this chance as they've suddenly become more aggressive? Or does it mean my body is failing without me realizing? I don't know, but I really hope that someone on here can help me and shed some light on this. Please. This is my first time talking about any of this outside of my close childhood friends and my doctor. I guess my story begins when I was about 15 years old. At the time, a few friends and I were interested in ghosts and magic. So when rumors spread around that there was a Ouija board for sale at the thrift store, we pounced on the opportunity. It took us a few weeks to get the courage to use it, but we finally decided to try it out in our tree house we had built in my front yard. We waited until it got dark, lit some candles I stole from dining table, and started our little seance. At first, all we could do was stare at each other, but finally, my brother asked if there was any spirits with us, and that little eyepiece slowly moved over to the yes section. We were all shaking at that point. Being a scaredy cat back then, well, I said I was getting out of there, but as I backed up, I fell out of the treehouse. The next thing I know, I'm awake in a hospital bed with both my parents crying about how they love me, and soon the doctor came in and explained that I had a cracked skull and had suffered a major concussion. As the nurse wheeled me around the hospital, I noticed a slight blurriness around the edges of my vision. The doctor said that it was normal for people who have suffered from concussions. As I started to recover, I noticed that the blurriness had subsided and life was beginning to return to normal. But there was still something wrong. I felt like I was being followed because, even though the blurriness was still gone, there was still something in the corner of my vision. Every time I turned to look at whatever was following me, it was gone, around a corner or fading into the darkness. I could never get a good look at it. The first night since the accident, I had a hard time falling asleep, and I kept waking up with chills. After hours of tossing and turning, lightly falling asleep and waking, I finally fell asleep. When I woke up in the morning, something didn't seem right with my room, like something was going to happen. As I got up, I noticed a tall, gangly shape in the corner of my eye next to the dresser and turned quickly to see a horrifying creature without a face, just a pale featureless face apart from two impossibly deep black holes where the eyes should be. At first, all I could do is stare into those two black holes and silently scream. But I finally slammed my eyes shut and started screaming. When my parents burst in my room and asked what was wrong, I told them what I had seen, but they insisted I had been dreaming. I did not see the faceless thing for about ten years later. The no face, as I had named it, did not appear again until the accident that ended my fiancé's life. After that, 
I began seeing him everywhere, and there were more than one following other people. I began to see a therapist for my hallucinations, and she recommended an MRI and a CAT scan, both of which were inconclusive, and she determined that these hallucinations are coping mechanisms that I subconsciously created to cope with the stress of my fiancé. The trouble is, these things haven't gone away, even though I've come to terms with her death. The other no faces seem unaware of my presence, other than the one that keeps following me. It stays about one to two yards away from me at all times, and never gets too close or too far away. Can anyone here help me? I've become very stressed over this lately. I haven't had much to eat and haven't slept very well. A quick background on this story. This takes place in the house I currently reside in. At this point in my life, I was in my earlier teens and there was much pent up negative energy in the household from constant fights with my family. This was the hardest point in time for my family to date and I attribute our negativity to drawing in the activity, which has led me to share my experiences. At this point, I'd witnessed many shadow people and dark figures walking around my upstairs, but for some reason, I was the only one able to see them. However, my little brother was able to hear them, which gave me some peace of mind, knowing... I wasn't losing my marbles. So besides seeing these shadow people walking around and hearing their footsteps in the hallway at night, things were considerably normal. One more note before I begin, that is a key element to this story. My closet has a panel in the ceiling which leads to the attic. This is the only entrance to the attic in our house. The activity stayed at that level until I began researching the paranormal. I had watched a few Ghost Hunter themed television shows and it led me to draw conclusions about the activity I was experiencing on a day to day basis. I figured they were just restless spirits and decided to let them be and try not to interact. As conditions in my household worsened, the activity grew. The spirits began interacting with me at night, and I could hear noises outside my window and even on the roof. The sounds were like scratches and small taps, like an animal. Squirrels get on the roof all the time, and I figured it was something of that. After a while, the sound moved from on top of the roof to inside of the attic, Although mildly discomforting, I still led myself to believe it was an animal of sorts. The other experiences with the sounds led me to believe otherwise. One night, I awoke at around 2 a.m. to my bed shaking. I thought it was my mom or brother trying to wake me up, but when I looked around my room, nobody was there. My bed then jerked once, as if someone had pushed it with a quick, large force, which scared the living daylights out of me, and I quickly laid back down and pretended to be asleep. At another point in time, I heard footsteps come down the hallway from my parents' room, and a tapping on my door followed by the sound of the doorknob shaking gently. This made me uncomfortable because of seeing the shadow people. It made me think they were trying to get into my room to get me or something. On this particular night that the story takes place, I'd fallen asleep on my back. I've heard this can lead to nightmares and the likes, and since then have refused to fall asleep in that position. At around 2.40 a.m., I abruptly awoke I checked my phone to note the time and was about to roll over and go back to sleep when I heard a scratching sound above me in the attic. 
By above me, I mean right above my bed, where I was sleeping. Out of curiosity, I rapped on the wall three times with my knuckles. The scratching became instantly louder, and whatever was in there began pacing around. I got a shiver down my spine, and the mood of the room instantly changed. It was as if my room had grown darker, and I felt a very ominous feeling. My playful thoughts of messing with an animal were shattered by the worrying feeling growing in my gut. At this point, I heard thumping sounds over the panel in my closet. I tried to sit up in my bed to look, but it literally felt like a heavy person had laid on top of me. Feeling trapped, I tried to ignore the growing feeling of panic as I heard the ceiling panel in my closet slide out of place and drop and wooden beams creaking in my attic. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I told myself it wasn't real, and I heard my clothes moving around in my closet, hangers clicking together, as if someone was climbing down out of the attic into my walk-in closet. To my horror, the doorknob began violently jerking left to right, and scratching sounds emanated from behind the door. I thought whatever it was would get through, and I couldn't move still. And to make things worse, I tried to yell for my parents, but no words would come out. When I was convinced I was about to be face to face with some sort of monster, I began praying in my head that it would leave me alone and go away and not to let it hurt me. At the instant I closed my prayer, the sound stopped for about 20 seconds or so. I heard again whatever it was moving close around, but this time it sounded like it was climbing back up into the attic. I heard the ceiling panel yet again slide on the roof and fall back into place and the scratching went to the far corner of the attic away from my room and faded into silence. As the noise stopped, the room seemed to grow lighter and the blanket of bad energy was lifted. Since then, I've had several more experiences in that house, none of which were as frightening as that night. The experience was questionable, as it seemed like sleep paralysis, but from what I know, that usually happens from the instance of being awoken, and I was not paralyzed until the feeling of oppressive energy had engulfed the room, which was several minutes after I had awoken. Regardless of it was a case of sleep paralysis or an actual entity. The experience was frightening, and I remember it clearly as it happened to this day. I will likely post the other strange experiences I have encountered over the years and hope you enjoyed reading this. P.S. Since this event, I have cleansed my room as well as inside my closet right up to the attic with sage and have had no further experience in this particular area of the house. My parents do not like incense or the smell of a lit smudge stick, so I was only able to cleanse my room, leaving the rest of the house open to activity. And believe me, it lingers there still, especially in my parents' room. Here is my first story. Hope you all enjoy. This is not my first encounter with the paranormal. However, it is my first sighting of an apparition. This story is true, and there are several witnesses that can attest to this happening who were present during what took place. Gold Camp Road is notorious in the Colorado Springs for two main reasons. Partying. It is an isolated and mostly unsupervised area and as such is frequently used as location for teenagers to drink, smoke pot, and blare music. 
paranormal activity. There are many stories regarding the area ranging from an infamous bus crash, which never actually happened, and apparitions, as well as mildly demonic or malevolent activity. There is a history of car crashes and murders as well as people dropping off murdered bodies over the cliff into the Cheyenne Canyon area below. Taking this into consideration, many people come out of skeptical interest and curiosity of the unknown to see if the tales are true. It was a normal Friday night and I was with my friend Jay. I'll call him that for the story as I don't want to release his personal info on the web out of respect. We were bored out of our minds and after the hookah we set up had died, we needed something to do. We wanted to go to a party but realized we both lacked the hookups to get an address. So we thought of places we could come across to get together. Gold Camp was brought up and soon after... I drove us up there. We came to a pull-off before one of the tunnels that overlooked the city and parked next to some cars that were loudly blasting music. Some college-age kids were drinking beers, smoking, and generally chilling, and we were quickly invited to join them. At a little after midnight, the music was turned down, and everyone was either in the cars or outside in a huddled group, talking about life and joking around. I was in the middle of a conversation when I heard what sounded like the faint clicking of metal chains and a sort of dragging sound. As it got louder, I decided to investigate the source. The sound grew louder near a sign by the edge of the road. As I peered over the edge, I took note that it was a cliff and would be impossible to get down without serious entry so the fact that a sound was rising up was astonishing to me. My thoughts jumped to, who would be down there and how did they get there? And even more worryingly, did someone fall down there? Before I could say anything, a large and dark figure arose from the edge, a mere ten feet away from me. It appeared to be a tall man, like six foot five, shrouded in a white tattered cloak or sheet and wrapped in chains. At first I thought it was a guy trying to scare us and prank us because I knew of the tales of the area, but one thing struck me as odd that made me keep a serious complexion. The man had no face. In addition to not having a face, I thought he was black at first, but soon realized his body was composed of what appeared to be a shadowy mist. He looked like someone had wrapped his body in a sheet and wrapped chains around it before throwing it down the hill and downwind. From this vigor was a terrible stench like sweat and mild decay. I couldn't even believe my eyes. The figure began slowly trudging towards the road, dragging chains behind him and each footstep making a loud thud as if he was wearing boots. The group outside I had left to investigate went silent and we all watched the apparition and fascination and bewilderment as it slowly walked along the road, not looking back. I made sure everyone else was seeing what I saw and summoned the courage to follow the apparition with the intent to see if it was really what it appeared to be, and not some guy dressed up being dramatic. He walked up slowly, but his strides were huge, so I had to walk quickly to keep up with his pace. I followed him for about 30 feet. When he finally stopped, he slowly turned towards the edge of the road with the cliff, but there were bushes and trees at this stretch of the road for about... 10 feet before the edge. I loudly said, Hello, trying to communicate with this strange man, and he took two steps into the bushes and disappeared into thin air in a cloud of mist. Just like that, gone. I walked back and told the others what I had seen, and they could hardly believe it. We all talked for another half hour about what we had seen before 
parting our ways. All in all, it was an interesting night, and despite the others' sobriety rendering them less credible, I was completely sober since I was driving and saw it as clear as day. I've yet to witness another apparition as clear and real as the one I saw that night, but it definitely got me further interested in the paranormal, and I will always remember the man with the chains. My only wish was that I could have learned more about the apparition and its story, but perhaps I'll see it again when I decide to go back up there. At around seven feet tall, the eyes were nothing but black holes, but they had a kind of glow behind the darkness. It was last week, and I sat upon the cliffs overlooking Shark Bay. The sun had just set, and I saw someone walking upon the short sand beach below. There isn't much of a beach due to the relenting waves. It isn't a beach for swimming, and the fishermen overtake the area. It is approximately 20 feet down, and I watched a wavering figure growing closer. I knew it was an evil entity, and I wondered why he was showing himself to me. In an instant, I know what they were in life. It's a feeling that overtakes me. I don't have to see them to know. They don't need to be nearby. I just know. I think he was trying to scare me, but after all I have seen, not much phases me these days. So I sat back, just watching him, waiting for him to do his thing, whatever that may be. The last of the sun was gone, and the purple-blue of the clouds was now a solid black. No moon, no trade winds, stillness. Perfect element for a ghost to try to make a move. Good or bad, I was his target. As I'm used to being sought out, all I can do is ready myself for the experience. It's not an afterthought to go into a prayer of protection. I close my eyes and ask God to surround me in a shield of strength. I can do nothing on my own of this, I learned long ago. When I opened my eyes, the entity was standing in front of me. His black eyes were piercing through mine, and I noticed his face was covered in tattoos. For a moment, it scared me, but then I stood face him. He backed away from me, and I knew then he was a very evil spirit. He tried to take on the appearance of a warrior, but his facade began to break down. I watched as his face became distorted. The skin became taut and skull-like, and I saw his true face behind the pretense he projected. I saw what he looked like in life, and he had been an ugly man. So sad the ugliness had permeated his soul as well. The entity was filled with evil. He had been a man at one time, but in his latter days, became obsessed with power and greed. He had hurt a lot of people in his journey, and he had a few people killed. I could smell the deaths layered upon him, like chains seen to the naked eye. You want to know how I know this? I can see it on their faces and bodies. It's like the words in a book. Each face, body projects life lived in shame, sorrow, greed, happy, sad, evil, and good. Anyway, this is how I am able to read them. It's as clear to me as a page filled with descriptive explanation. Every soul is read, heard, and helped, or avoided. I wanted to rid myself of this entity. He made my skin crawl and his being well. Best way to describe it, he made me feel like I was covered in feces. I almost wretched, and I started to walk away. Turning my back on him would be a bad idea, so I was careful to move slowly. I try not to speak to this kind of entity. If I can feel him, he knows what I am. Last thing you would want to do is anger an evil entity. Too late. He called me a few expletives, which I will leave out here, and tried to push at me with his energy. Of course, since I had my power of prayer working in my favor, it did no more than lift a few hairs from my shoulders. Kind of like someone blowing their breath on your face or neck. Creepy, but I kept moving towards my truck. I took a quick glance to see how much further I needed to go, and that was my mistake. The entity was next to me again, and he started to threaten me with death. Of course, he screamed it at me, 
and with detail. I'm too much of a lady to repeat what he said, as it was nasty and very vile. I didn't flinch. It wasn't the first time an entity had threatened harm, and wouldn't be the last. Having the beliefs I hold dear, I know these types of entities cannot harm me, and certainly cannot take my life. They can try, and this one did, when he saw I was not reacting to his threats. He mustered enough energy to knock me to the ground, but it's like being pushed over by a child. The key is not to be afraid. If you allow fear to enter the equation, he gathers this from you, and fear gives an entity power, which can be used against you. Never give in to fear, no matter how scary the situation. The entity hovered above me, and he did his best to look frightening. He did manage a few looks I had never seen before, but I didn't waver in my stare. He knew he couldn't hurt me, and he started to wail in frustration. My ears were burning from the high-pitched sound he made. It sounded like tin kids going through a grinder. Add to that, strange sounds, akin to sitting front row at a rock concert. It was painful and annoying, and loud as crap. Some entities are great at throwing temper tantrums, and this big guy, he was throwing a dilly of a fit. I sat up and rubbed my knees, brushing away the rock that stuck to them. I was getting mad now, and I told him so. Get away from me, you evil one. You have no power over me. Go away. I yelled. My knees throbbed from where I landed, and I was ticked off. The entity looked shocked, and he seemed to shrink before my eyes. I found myself staring eye to eye with him. His black eye smoked anger, but he was shirking away from me, moving back to the cliff's edge. God will take care of your kind one day, no matter what rock you hide under. I called out as he moved away. Sometimes just using the word God will cause them to retreat. Retreat? This one zipped away. I saw him dart across the sand below, and in a blink of an eye, he was gone. Thank goodness, he took his nasty smells with him. I went home and took another long shower. My shower stall is filled with scented shower gels. It takes me a while before the odors filling my nose goes away. This is part of my gift I really hate. Any comments? I work on merchant ships as an officer. My last job was on a big ferry. Some of the overnight engineers were saying that they felt uneasy in one of the engine rooms. A couple of the guys knew I could hear things, so they asked me to stay one night after we were done with our runs for the day. Fifteen minutes went by when I finally felt some activity. The spirit was not bold. In fact, he was darting around the room whispering softly. I couldn't make out what he was saying, just that it was definitely a male voice. My skin started to get goosebumps and feel electric, which was my usual indication of a spirit presence. He finally stopped moving and got quiet, and that's when I started to get worried. He very clearly told me his name in a very angry voice. My two buddies were scared at this time because they had an uneasy feeling right before I started talking to him. He told me this was his ship and that we were trespassing. This alarmed me as I have never really dealt with a ghost as territorial as he was. Not being as scared as my two buddies, thanks to paranormal investigating on the side, I told him this ship was in fact not his, but he may stay if it feels like it'll make him feel any better, pending he doesn't hurt anyone. He mumbled angrily and took off. To this day, I believe his presence is still there, and upon further research, I found out that the man died from gunshot wounds in the shed that the ship was being built in during a fight while the ship was being built in the shipyard. That man's name was the same as the name the ghost told me. As I've mentioned before, I was born and raised in Decatur, Illinois. This town has many unrested spirits largely due to the fact that it's built on top of old cemeteries and Indian burial grounds. Growing up in my old house, it was scary in many ways, fascinating in others. From the time we moved in, I had an imaginary friend. 
I can still see her fresh in my mind. A little girl, about my age, six years old, with dark curly hair. I remember wondering why she was dressed like my Holly hubby doll. I don't really remember specific conversations, just that she was always there. She had a very unusual name, Darina, and that struck my mother as odd. Most children give their imaginary friends simple names, and this was a name no one had ever heard before. Through the years, most of the strange things that happened were either to me or my mother. She was alone in the house doing dishes one morning when she felt someone pull her hair. Another time, she was alone doing laundry in the basement, and she heard the front door open and close, and footsteps that stopped just above where she was standing. Thinking it was my dad, she went upstairs to greet him, only to discover that there was no one in the house. She was so scared that she abandoned the laundry project, and went on the front porch to wait for my dad. The only time I felt any real danger was when I was standing on the stairwell right above the landing, and I was pushed off the steps. I didn't just fall through. I shot straight for the window that was directly across from where I was standing. My mother was at the foot of the stairs and ran to me. My backside had gone through the window, shattering the glass. Aside from a large and very inconveniently placed cut, I was okay. But what I remember very clearly was the sensation of an arm pulling me back so I wouldn't fall out the window. It wasn't mom because she hadn't reached me yet. I lived in other creepy houses since that time, as this town is chock full of them. None of them affected me personally as deeply as this one did though. Anyway, that's my story, and I thank you all for letting me share it. I look forward to comparing ghost stories with you. My first ghost stories that I can recall. I was about 9 or 10 and I was into Dungeons and Dragons and was all about coloring in the pictures and the different manuals and compodiums. So I would spend hours up in my room reading about monsters and demons and just using my imagination. But frequently, I would hear my mother calling me from downstairs. I would go running down there as fast as I could because she was prone to having chest pains and I would have to pour her a glass of wine or something if she was having trouble breathing. So there I would be in my room and I would hear my name called and I would yell coming and run downstairs and say what and she would say that she hadn't called me. This would happen a lot of the time, sometimes nine times a day or more until I would be more selective about when I would go down there. Once my brother, who was five years younger than me, said that he was going to watch TV in the living room, I would left him alone to go play down the street, which obviously was a bad idea. And he said he came down the stairs, turned the corner, and then the rocking chair, sat an old woman in an old black dress with a large W painted in white across her chest. He stopped and stared at her in shock. He noticed that her eyes were entirely blue, no whites at all, and then she opened her mouth and a hissing sound came out. But it wasn't like it was just her. He said the whole room and all the air was making this sound until he couldn't think. He did what he was supposed to do. He screamed and ran to the neighbor's house. Sometimes in the house, we would experience things like hearing loud bangs coming from the downstairs, sounding like pots and pans being thrown together. We had cats, and they would come racing all the time. The cats were always looking at things I couldn't see. Another notable experience I had was when I lived in an apartment when I was about 19 that I shared with some friends from high school. One night, I was watching TV in one of my roommates' room when there was a knock at his door. We both said come in at the same time. No one came in, so we got up and opened the door and no one was there. I went and checked on the others in the apartment. One was asleep and the other was in the living room, playing GTA with headphones on, and seemed confused when I asked if he had knocked. In the end, I'm not even sure what to attribute these experiences to, but I really thank you for reading my story. I'll have more in the future for you guys to enjoy. I lived in a boarding school, if that's what you would call it, compared to others in Europe. 
This was just a hallway with beds. It was an old school, but I heard many things at night that shouldn't have been going on, and I saw something that scared the crap out of me one night. One night, when all the girls were upstairs getting ready for bed, I passed by the door that goes to the rest of the school. The doors to the classrooms are huge doors. They get locked with a chain and padlock. Why? I don't know. But I heard someone push the door from the inside, as if trying to get out. I forgot to mention this was a Catholic school. I also heard the desk being moved, and there was a room where they kept instruments. I heard drumsticks, as if someone had dropped them. One night, I had to use the bathroom, and I never went to the bathroom alone. One time I did, and I never went alone again. So I went with one of my friends, and I went first, because I was the one who woke up to go. We took turns because we had to have a lookout, because we were so scared. There was a makeshift bench, made with a plank of wood, and some logs at the other end, and the moonlight was hitting it at an angle. And on the side of the bench, I saw a shadow of a nun just sitting there. And I stared at it, and I told my friend to hurry up and pee. I didn't want to scare her, so I didn't tell her that I saw anything, but I told her to hurry. The last experience I had over there was probably my scariest. I was sleeping in my bed in the middle of the night, and footsteps woke me up. Big, heavy, clunky footsteps, as if someone was wearing boots. Just for the record, none of the girls owned boots, and the footsteps came from the other side of the hall, coming closer and closer to my bed. I wanted to turn around and see what it was, but I didn't want it to know that I was awake. I didn't want it to come near me, but it kept coming closer, and I was so scared, so terrified. Then, right when I was about two, maybe three feet away from my bed, it stopped, turned around, and went back to where it had come from. And as I heard it walk away, I was finally able to move, and I slowly turned over, as if I was still sleeping, so it wouldn't come back, and I tried to peer into the darkness to see who it was, and I saw nothing. I scared myself typing this, and I hope this story wasn't too long. Thanks for reading. My first encounter was when I was 12 years old. Where I lived, the previous owners passed away at home. Their last names was Parsons. I had a vent outside my bedroom door on the floor that I could see downstairs in the living room. Within the first few nights, I would hear sounds down there. When I told my parents, they said it was a new home and I would get used to the noises. One night, I heard humming. I got up and looked down the vent. It was coming from downstairs. Of course, I went running into my parents' room. Dad went downstairs, looked around, and said maybe I was dreaming but if I heard anything again to wake him. This went on for a while. One night I heard talking. I had the courage and walked down the stairs slowly. When I came out of the stairway and went into the living room, I could see two figures sitting on the sofa. I went running to my dad. He got up and went downstairs with me. He saw nothing. A few weeks later, it happened again. Dad and I again went downstairs. Like the other times, he saw and heard nothing. We went to go back upstairs, and I heard talking. This time, I looked at my dad, and I knew he heard something by the look on his face. We went into the living room, and again, Mr. and Mrs. Parsons were sitting on the sofa. Dad didn't see anything, but he said he thought he could have heard someone talking. Just then, it got a little louder, and we both heard them say, it is so nice to hear children playing in this big old house again. I jumped, and so did Dad. We went back upstairs. Dad came into my room and told me now there isn't anything to be scared of. He heard the same words I did. I explained to me that I might be hearing and seeing Mr. and Mrs. Parsons off and on. When I do, I shouldn't be scared. To think of them as my angel friends or something like that. While growing up there, I would hear them a lot and from time to time see their figures. 
I quickly learned that not all people believe in spirits, which was hard growing up, not being able to talk about what I experienced. But at least I had my dad to talk about it with. I lost my dad three years ago. Now I am back to keeping my experiences to myself, which is hard at times. But I enjoy it when he appears and visits me now. So I am not all alone. Dad is always here with me. Mother's fiancé and I were very close. He was more like a father to me in my adulthood than my own. So when he scheduled to meet me for lunch and didn't show, I was a bit dismayed. I got back on the train from downtown Chicago, rode back to where I had parked my car, got in, and drove to his house. Upon my arrival, I noticed his car was still parked outside. So I picked up my cell phone to call, but got no answer. So I called my mom, who in turn called a friend of his to come over. As I stood outside the house, I had a sinking feeling something told me he was dead. I climbed over the fence. This was not the best area of Chicago, which was locked, grabbed a ladder from under the back porch, climbed up and broke the window. I discovered his body lying nude in the hallway, partially in the kitchen. I started to cry and phoned my mom, who said she was on her way. After the police came and went, the friend left and I was left sitting alone in the house with his body. I started hearing creaking on the stairs, and I called out, Mom, Mom, is that you? But no one was there. Again, creaking, and no one. Finally, my mom shows up, and the coroner comes. They take his body, and we're alone looking through paperwork. All the while, there is a creaking all around us. We find a $50,000 tax bill for him from a failed business he helped his son launch on the kitchen table next to where his body was lying on the floor. We dig further through his things and find two of his three firearms. His son flew up from Florida the next day with his two sisters. He dug through more of his dad's things and found the third gun and laid it on the dresser. He walked out of the room and back in with his two sisters on either side. But the gun mysteriously goes off and shoots him in the leg. After that, the creaking we all had experienced stops. The next day, the autopsy reports came back and we learned that he died of a heart attack, probably from the tax bill. So I asked his son at the funeral how it feels to be shot by a dead man. He didn't laugh, but I'm sure his father got his last laugh. I wanted to share an incident that happened to me last year in Las Vegas. I'd just been reunited with my best friend after about 17 years, and we decided to meet up in Vegas for our reunion. We stayed at the Luxor Hotel because we were going to see Chris Angel's new show, Believe. We stayed in the pyramid on the 24th floor. It was on the second day that something weird happened. Even though we had stayed up really late the night before, we got up early went to eat breakfast, and headed out to explore the strip. We came back around 4 p.m. and decided to take a nap before going back out. My friend had the bed closest to the bathroom, and mine was in the back of the room near the windows. We dozed off for a while, and I was awakened by the sound of someone in the bathroom. It sounded like someone kept dropping a coin into the sink over and over. At first, I thought it was maybe a housekeeper had come in but then wondered how I hadn't heard her come in, since I am a light sleeper, and why the bathroom light wasn't on if she was in there. So naturally, I went to investigate. As I got closer, it stopped. Odd. I turned on the light, and everything was in its place. So I went back to the bed, and immediately started again. To prove to myself that I was really hearing this, I called out to my friend, Hey, did you hear that? It's coming from the bathroom. She said, yeah, I heard it earlier, but didn't want to say anything. We both got back up and just walked in front of the bathroom to see if we could see anything, but didn't turn the light on. No sound, nothing. So my friend turns on the light and says out loud, you can do whatever you want. Just don't do it while we're here and stay in the bathroom. Then she turned off the light, closed the door, and we left the room. Nothing else happened for the duration of the trip, which lasted a week. I thought about asking the hotel staff, but thought they might think I'm crazy. 
I did do some research though and found out that a couple of workers died while building the hotel, but they are said to haunt the 10th floor. Thanks for reading. We had moved into our new house in August of 1972, and I had just turned 12. I was the oldest of four kids, and although my sisters and brothers took to the move easily, I did not. I don't know if it was moving from the area where I was comfortable, or if it was the uneasy feeling that I had in this new house. The house was a seven-year-old, four-bedroom colonial, which was in a cul-de-sac with four other houses. The house that sat at the top of the hill outside of the cul-de-sac was much more older and was the original farmhouse built 200 years earlier. Wayne was named after General Anthony Wayne, who fought during the Revolutionary War. The area itself is rich in history from this time period. The first indications of a presence was our dog. His hair stood on end, and he barked at the walls constantly. We thought he was bred too close and he was crazy, only to find out later it wasn't him at all. My mother was in the kitchen baking one day, and a decorative plate on the wall went flying across the room and broke into pieces. It seemed to be my room that had the most activity. It was the center room of the front of the house, and one night, when friends of mine were waiting out on our front porch, they heard someone walking around upstairs, and the light in my bedroom went on and off. No one was in the house since we all just returned home. My friends thought we had a maid or a house guest. At times, we would hear music playing, but not music from that time. It sounded like a harpsichord. All of us heard it, and I even had friends who slept over and heard this music coming from above us. My father slept with a bat next to his bed, thinking that someone was playing an awful joke. Many nights in my room, my light did go on and off, and I thought it was me not turning the knob all of the way. I would always feel a presence with me. In fact, it would sit next to me on my bed. I used to actually feel it get up and see the imprint it made. At times, my bed would actually breathe. This went on for a while, and in August of 1976, my air conditioner broke and I went downstairs to sleep on the couch in the living room. I had my Cocker Spaniel Muffin with me, and something woke me up around 3 a.m. Muffin was shaking and I tried to calm him down, but he just buried his whole body next to me. The next thing I hear is a loud bang, like a door slamming, and then another door slamming. But I don't know where these sounds were coming from, because there weren't any doors. Then I could hear heavy footsteps walking towards me, and then it stopped. I heard them going through papers on my father's desk and then continue again towards me. I can't tell you the feeling of fear I was feeling. There was a lamp behind my head and I couldn't lift my arm up to turn it on. The footsteps continued towards me and a man turned a corner into the living room and saw me. I thought it was an intruder at first, but what I saw, I will always believe, was this spirit from another time. The moonlight was pretty bright that night, and I could make out his features. He was tall and thin, about six foot four. I know this because my dad was that tall. He had reddish brown hair with a beard and mustache. He had a white shirt under his high-waisted pants with suspenders. He just looked at me as if to say, I've been here all along and it's okay. I thought Muffin was going to have a heart attack, but as soon as I saw this man, incredibly, he calmed down. The man stood there for a couple of minutes and then turned and walked back with heavy footsteps again and back through the two doors that weren't there. I waited until the sun started rising and ran to my parents' bedroom totally freaked out. I told them someone was in the house last night and my mom immediately agreed and said she heard it too. I gave my parents a description of the man and they called the police. Now mind you, the police had been there on several occasions because of these disturbances. After this last incident, they themselves did some research and found that there were two men who lived on the property the house was built on who were murdered. This was during the 1700s and the cops showed us a picture of the two men. One of them was the man that I saw, which confirmed my belief of a spirit encounter. We moved from this house within a few months. I've always been very aware of forces around me. I was seven when my grandfather was taken to the hospital. A blow of sadness came over me, 
and I knew he was never going to return. I blurted out to my aunt that Papa had died and would never come back. Just after saying this, my parents came home and told us sadly that Papa had passed away. I knew right away that Papa had come to say goodbye to me. As my life progressed, a lot of little things started happening. In the early 80s, my grandmother passed. At that time, my husband and I were renting a duplex from her. Since a lot of people had come from out of town, they wanted to expedite her estate as soon as possible. Immediately after the funeral, her house was cleaned out and put on the market. My husband and I stayed on until they could sell it. About two weeks later, I was home alone. My husband worked nights and only me and my dog were there. At about 2 a.m., I started hearing sounds in our apartment. At first, my dog started to growl, but then he fell silent. Since I was the only one home, I originally thought that there might be burglars looking for something to steal, so I called the police. They told me to wait in my apartment until they could get there. Meanwhile, in my grandmother's apartment, it sounded like bedlam. Drawers were being opened and closed, and doors were being slammed. When the police came and we entered her apartment, nothing was amiss, and all became quiet. The officer told me that there was no forced entry. The door was double bolted, and unless someone else had a key, they could have not gotten in. They left, and about a half hour later, the noise starts in again. I called the cops. They come out, but no one there. By this time, I am hysterical and call my husband home from work. While I was waiting for his return, the front door slammed and opened shut so hard that the plates of glass in my living room window shattered. I definitely felt that it was my grandmother's doing. I wonder what she may have been searching for. Maybe she became mad because everything was gone. I've had some other things happen, and I feel as if the undead are drawn to me. I will write again soon and tell you about the haunted apartment. Until then, thank you for reading my story. This just happened during the night. My daughter Courtney was lying in bed. And suddenly, she saw my deceased brother sitting on the side of her bed. My brother had lived in England and dropped dead of a heart attack almost two years ago. She was shocked to see him there and a little afraid as she knew he was dead. His name was Bill. Bill leaned forward, looking intently into her eyes and then leaned back. Courtney, being frightened, closed her eyes. She suddenly felt like she could not move. It was like a wet blanket was on top of her. This really made Courtney freak out. She also could not speak. She was frozen. But then Bill was gone. I think Bill was coming to tell her something, especially when he was leaning forward towards her. The other part, I cannot figure out. Bill would never hurt Courtney, and he would never bring anything evil with him. Her husband and Jack Russell Terrier were out in another room and knew nothing until it was all over which she then went out of the bedroom to desperately find them. My daughter doesn't know what to think. We need an explanation. I believe my brother was trying to give my daughter some information. The leaning forward then back. I myself had a ghost visit me as a child. Fifteen years later, I was married and working on family genealogy when a family cousin gave me a photo to borrow that contained my great-grandfather who came from Ireland. This man in the photo looked just like the ghost who came to me as a child. Also, I had funny things happen after my dad died. For one, I took pictures of my dad's car before trading it in. Some years after his passing, as it was the last thing of his to go, the pictures were foggy like a ghost stood in front of the camera. It was film pictures then, and the rest of the roll had wonderful photographs. I had also seen my previous husky who passed away in 2005 in the house three times. I've gone as far as almost two hours away to a doctor's appointment and was in an exam room on the table when something touched my foot. Things never happened to other people in my house. Just me. But my daughter, after graduating college, had one dream while still living here in 2008, where both grandparents and our previous husky were in this dream. This was the first time she met her grandmother, as I became pregnant with her right before my mom died. 
I know it was real and true by what she said to Courtney. My mother liked to put on airs, like she was better than others. That told me it was her by the haughty words mom used. Around my daughter's birthday in March, my brother Bill was in a dream of hers. My daughter didn't believe before in spirits. She certainly does now. I lost a child, a miscarriage, two months before I became pregnant with Courtney. I wondered whether this spirit, whatever, that was preventing Courtney from moving, could have been a child trying to get close to its sister and Bill brought it to meet Courtney, just trying to figure this out. I've been concerned that this also could be a sign that someone in the family will pass soon. Help. I've owned the largest New Age shop in northeastern Pennsylvania, the Emporium of Curious Goods, for the past 19 years. For 16 of those years, I lived in an upstairs apartment until I bought a 22-room Victorian mansion in the next town. Quite frequently during the apartment living, and still to this day downstairs in the shop, I see a large gray cat, usually out of the corner of your eye, but then it vanishes when you look directly at it. I'm not the only one to see it. Many customers over the years have said things like, you know you're not alone in here, or they'll just outright tell me they saw a big gray cat which vanished before their eyes. One lady recently told me she saw it lying on a counter and went over to pet it, thinking it was real, and it vanished before she reached it. Just a few months ago, I was behind the counter and four teenage boys were looking at books in front of the shop. I heard the familiar cat call, Puss, 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 come from one of them. I looked up to see what was going on and they called back to me, Hey, do you know you have a cat out here? I asked them what it looked like and where it was. They told me it was a big gray cat and had walked around the corner of the counter. Now, the counter in question is against the wall, so if it walked around the corner, it had to vanish into the wall. When they looked for it again, they couldn't find it. My partner once saw a curtain hanging at a door in a passageway, flip up at the bottom and then lower again, just as if an invisible animal had walked under it. Both one of my clerks and I have actually felt a cat rub up against our leg as we sit behind the counter. We don't know where it came from, but we nicknamed it Spooky, and when we came in the morning and found an item thrown off of a shelf and broken on the floor, we always say, well, Spooky was on the prowl overnight again. One odd thing is the fact that the mansion I bought was the site of a suicide years ago. It belonged to a doctor and his wife committed suicide in his carriage house, still on the property. She closed the door, turned the car on, and was found many hours later. There are many rumors I've heard as to why, but I do not know if any of them are true. But the ending of the story is that it is the most quiet house I've ever lived in. No activity at all. No feelings. No vibes. I have five cats, and at times, they seem to follow with their eyes something moving across a room or up a wall. But at the same time, I experience nothing. The only odd thing concerning the cats is the fact that my oldest cat, which incidentally was gray, died of old age problems a few years ago in the house. I buried him under the kitchen window area outside in a large patch of ivy. This has now overgrown the gravesite, but all the cats at various times sit on the kitchen windowsill and just stare down at the spot where Salazar is buried. Sometimes their tails twitch and their heads move back and forth, as if they are following something outside. I've even gone out to look when this happens, and there is never anything there. At least I can't see it but they definitely see and watch something. It seems strange to me that a house from 1895, which probably had many deaths there over a hundred years, plus a suicide, only manifests a recently deceased cat. But I guess it is what it is. Thank you for eating. My very special father got sick around Christmas, 2002. The doctors told us that it was probably lung cancer, which originated from his colon, which he had partially removed a few years before. He was 82 years old, but even with all of the cancer treatments, he was not the least bit confused or fuzzy brain. As he grew sicker, one day he looked at me and said, 
Look at the little boy at the end of the bed eating an ice cream cone. I looked, and there was nothing there that I could see. He said, why can't you see him? He's sitting there smiling and having a great time. I thought at the time that daddy may be losing it. Two days later, he looked at me again and said, now the little boy wants me to play ball with him. Don't you see him on the other end of my bed? Once again, I told him I was sorry, but I didn't. The little boy obviously cheered my dad up because it put a big smile on his thin, worn face. That next morning, the nurse called me and told me that my sweet dad had passed away quietly in his sleep that night. I'm telling the story because I believe with all my heart that the little boy at the end of the bed was an angel that came to take my dad to heaven. My mom had a miscarriage before I was born, and it was a boy. It could have even been my brother. What I'm trying to say is that now, more than ever, I believe that there is a life after death. And before you die, an angel is sent to carry you to heaven. I love and miss my dad more than I can say, but because of the little angel, I know that my dad is in a wonderful place where you eat ice cream cones and play ball together. The Kaimaki House is a true story about a haunted house in Honolulu, Hawaii. The ghost that is said to haunt the house is called a Keisha, a man-eating demon from Japanese folklore with an insatiable hunger for blood and corpses. There is an infamous haunted house in Honolulu, Hawaii that locals call Kaimaki House. In the summer of 1942, the house was occupied by a single mother and her three children. One night, the police were called to her house. They found the hysterical woman in the front yard screaming, She's trying to kill my children! When they entered the house, the police officer stumbled onto a scene that they would never forget. The three children were being thrown around the room by an invisible force. The officers watched for over an hour, unable to do anything, as the children were beaten and strangled by the unseen entity. The incident was on the front page of the local newspaper headlines for several days. Years later, three girls were sharing the house. One night, they started to hear strange noises. It sounded like someone was moving around and talking. One of the girls felt an invisible hand on her arm. They called the police. When the officer arrived, he found the three girls standing outside the house with a look of sheer terror on their faces. The girls decided to go and stay with one of their mothers, and the policemen decided to follow them to make sure nothing happened. However, on the way, the police officer saw the girl's car pull over into a parking lot. The girl in the front seat was struggling with something invisible that was trying to strangle her. When the police jumped out of his car and tried to rescue the girls, he felt a strained, calloused hand grab his arm and twist it. Suddenly, the door of the vehicle flew open and the girl was thrown out onto the road. She was clawing at her throat as if someone was choking her. They were unable to do anything to stop the attack and were forced to watch as the woman was strangled to death. In 1977, a Japanese couple moved into the haunted house in Kaimaki. They didn't know anything about its history. On their first night in the place, the wife woke up at midnight because the bedroom was very cold. When she looked around, she was horrified to see a ghostly white figure floating in midair. It was a woman with no arms or legs. When the wife tried to wake her husband, the figure disappeared. The next day, the couple were so disturbed by the apparition that they contacted a priest. He advised them to make offerings of bread and water to the spirit every night. He said it was Acacia, a Japanese demon caused by some horrible murders that occurred in the house years before. After repeating the ceremony every night for a week, the couple never saw the horrific spirit in the house again. These stories are just the tip of the iceberg. They say the cause of the haunting was a series of terrible murders. Many years before, a Japanese immigrant lived in the house with his wife and two children. Apparently, the husband killed his wife, his son, and his daughter. He chopped up the bodies and hid them on the property. 
The police discovered the corpses of the wife and son buried in the garden, but the daughter's body was never found. They say her corpse is still hidden somewhere in the house. After that, the house was abandoned for many years. Later, there were two women who lived in the house. One of the women fell in love with a man. There was some type of love triangle, and they say the man was driven mad by jealousy. He murdered both of the women and then committed suicide in the house. The bodies of the three people were found inside the home after a few days. It is believed that these horrible murders were created by Acacia, a Japanese demon created by a grudge or extreme anger after a shocking murder. Today, villagers still tell stories of the terrifying occurrences, and many books and newspaper articles have been written detailing the haunting in Taimiki House. In another story, an hour ago, dispatch received a call from the neighbors. There were shrieks coming from this house, and then a woman was hysterical in the yard. Something was in the house, they say, that was smashing furniture and attacking anyone who tried to come in. It seemed to be after her son, who, according to the officers, was floating smack dab in the middle of the room while all the fracas was going on. The officers say that the attack lasted for nearly an hour. The blood-soaked interior of the room and all the furniture had been smashed to a million bits, as if a tornado had torn into k Mickey, had been methodically pulled apart by the arms, legs, and head before his torso was ripped in half like a gutted fish. The family that lived there before the vacancy had two children and a single mother. Both children were killed by this entity, ripped apart by an invisible force right before the mother's eyes, as well as the eyes of several police officers that were called to the scene due to screams and major commotion. These events are actually documented in a police report, therefore deeming this event credible. The Land Remembers One night... I was camping near where an old river dam had been. I pulled the canoe late, so I just draped the tarp over the canoe and crawled in underneath it and fell asleep. In the middle of the night, I woke up to the sound of roaring water. I crawled up out from under the tarp and the sound stopped. I thought I must have been imagining it or it was the wind through the trees or something. I crawled back under the tarp and the sound started again. This time when I crawled out, it didn't stop. The sound got louder and louder. I realized that it sounded like water ripping through the woods. Even the dogs had their hair on end. I quick pulled the tarp off the canoe and dragged it up to the top of a ridge and waited to see what was making that noise. Then I heard the voices. Men yelling in a dull thumping noise. I huddled down next to the boat, pulled the dogs close, and waited for the sun to come up to find out what was happening. Morning came, and there was nothing to see. To this day, I don't know what it was, but I have my ideas. I will not camp there ever again. I was told that the land remembers, and that's fine. I just don't need to be there when it's remembering. The Thing When I was younger, I used to visit my family with my grandfather in Knoxville, Tennessee. He had nine brothers and sisters that lived up there, and they all had children, my cousins. Everyone lived in one really large house. The house had a huge backyard, about three football fields long. But past the yard on all sides was nothing but mountains and woods. One night, I was out in the woods, although it wasn't supposed to be. Adults would always yell. When I saw what I guess to be a half-body apparition, I never found an explanation for it. I can only describe it as half a person. The torso was missing. It was just black but almost see-through black, if that makes sense. It wasn't in a straight form. It was almost like moving gas. 
but it was definitely the lower portion of a very tall person. It just materialized suddenly, although the moment before I saw it, I heard a noise that I can't describe. It sounded like a really heavy person, around 300 to 400 pounds to make that noise, stepped on a really heavy or thick branch and cracked it. I booked it up to the house as fast as I could. My oldest cousin stopped me and I explained as much as I could at the time. He had also seen something familiar a few summers before that. The Scream Some friends and I were doing some night fishing on the James River. We were sitting along the shoreline with a nice fire going accompanied by the usual idle talk and a few beers. When suddenly everyone just stopped talking like a switch was flipped off. We were all staring across the river and felt as if something or someone was staring back. It was a very uneasy feeling to which some of the group tried to shake off with the typical macho humor. When a blood curling sound erupted from the other shore that froze everyone in their tracks. This sound was unlike any other that I had heard and it made every hair on my body vibrate and tickle. The only way I can describe it is it sounded like a wild person with no language skills being gutted alive. No words, just this high-pitched, blood-curdling scream. Nobody moved or said a word. We all just sat there, fixed in our stare, when just as suddenly, a second scream was let loose, with even more force than the first. By this time, several of us were sprinting to our tracks that were parked within 20 or 30 feet and retrieving various firearms. We all sat there quietly with our eyes fixed, staring towards the opposite shore, watching the light from our fire reflecting off the rocks. Hours later, we packed it up and left, feeling very unsettled. We never did figure out that one out, or even hazard, a guess as to what was on the opposite bank. The Invisible Assailant It was very early in the morning, around 2 to 3 a.m., and I was in a very open area, waiting for my boss to return with some equipment. As I was waiting, I got that feeling like I was being watched by something that didn't want me there and had some intent on harming me. I stood up and looked around. The moon was very bright that night and I could clearly see all the way to the tree lines, probably 50 yards on both sides of me. Nothing around. I calmed down a bit and took my pack off my back to get my drink out. As I open my drink, I hear this whoosh, whoosh, whoosh sound flying through the air from behind me. It was like that sound that a stick makes if you throw it overhand. I literally drove out of the way with my bag falling to the ground and my drink flying through the air, spilling as I jumped away. I recover from my diving experience and take my radio out of my bag to radio my boss. I go, I'm not trying to freak you out or anything, but I'm on my way back to the shop. I just had something thrown at me. As I'm talking to him, I'm looking around on the snowy ground for anything that could have been hurled at me. There was nothing on the ground but snow. I had no idea what the hell was going on at this point. His reply of, I've already got a head start on you. I'll see you there. Sounded out of breath like he was running. I gather my stuff and start hauling ass back to the shop. I get back and meet up with my boss. He's pacing back and forth in our shop, freaking out. 
I get him to calm down, and he tells me he was on his way back up to me when he got the same feeling I got before something got thrown at me. He said after he got the feeling, he stopped to look around and heard something clearly too lagged. Start walking towards him, barely crunching in the snow. Then he said it started running at him, but there was nothing in sight. All of the sounds of movement stopped, and he froze to listen for more sounds. Then he said a hot breath was hitting the back of the neck, and he proceeded to freak the fuck out. He said he ran the whole way back to the shop, and about halfway back is when he heard me on the radio. The crazy part about this whole thing is the area we were working has several burial mounds in the woods from Native Americans. Apparently, there also used to be an altar of some kind, made out of stone, that was buried during a construction project a few decades ago. The Thing in the Swamp As I sat in the dark, in my tree stand, I kept having that feeling of being watched. Now I have hunted, camped, and grew up in the woods, and am completely at home, day or night, in the darkest, deepest swamps, and I had never had this feeling. I just couldn't put my finger on it. When I was slithering down later that morning, I saw something out of the corner of my eye about the same time that I heard it. I heard the crash and just barely caught the sight of something running through the palmettos parallel to me. Now I say barely because it looked like a huge brown dog. Honestly, at first I thought it was a buffalo. It crashed through the thicket and I heard it hit water. It sounded like a herds of hogs plowing the trees. Around two or so that afternoon, I had been sitting in the stand, maybe an hour or so, when I heard the faint splash of hogs across the thicket in the swamp. As it got louder, I began getting nervous. It was so weird because I had never felt that way before. Well, what I thought was a bunch of hogs turned out to be one single critter. When it was within a few hundred yards, I could hear it plain and clear. Whatever it was, it was in no hurry and stayed out of sight. I had scouted the area and I knew the water the creature was in was waist deep on me. I could hear the splash, drip, 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 splash, as it put one foot in front of the other, real slow, like it was trying to be quiet. I thought it might be another person, till I thought about how deep that water was. I would never point a gun at a noise or anything I wasn't planning to kill dead, but as that noise got louder, I was looking down the barrel. I was actually shaking. The creature eventually got to the edge of the water with about 40 yards of thicket before the open ground between us. It crashed about 10 or 15 yards and then went quiet. Deathly quiet. No frogs, no crickets, no birds, nothing. I might have imagined it, but I thought I could hear something every now and then, like it was slipping in on me. It was getting dark by then, and to say I was shaken would be an understatement of the century. I never saw or heard anything else that evening, but I was so put off by the sounds that I left my bag hanging on a nail in the stand. It was two days before I got the nerve up to go back after my bag, but when I returned, the bag was gone and the bark of the tree had been scratched and clawed to hell. I have never been back to that swamp. I've told a few people about the creature, but no one believes me. The Thing in the Woods When I was young, we lived in this tiny town. It had three streets, two streetlights, and about 50 homes. All of the town kids would get together and play pickup games of baseball and such during the summer months. 
This particular evening, after the sun went down, we decided to play laser tag. There were about 10 of us, and all of us had our own set of tag vests and laser guns. We basically took our over one section of the town and would run through the yards and hide behind garages. Anything we wanted to do. We split into five teams of two. I was with my stepbrother at the time, Ryan. As I mentioned earlier, there were three main streets in this town and lots of alleyways. One of the streets was the easternmost, and it was bordered by a marsh and woods on one side and homes on the other. Ryan and I were running down the street, thinking we had seen one of the other teams running through a yard. We were going to block them in and shoot them, so Ryan and I split up. He went west, and I stayed on the eastern road, bordering the woods. This is a scary road at night. The houses are a little dilapidated on the left, and the woods on the right have some ruins of old farmhouses scattered throughout. The marsh attracted a lot of frogs and other animals, so it was always loud. I continued walking along and soon became distracted with cracking twigs and leaves in the woods. My heart started the race, but I was frozen in fear. I just couldn't move. I looked to my right, and there was an old dead tree, and I swore that I saw a movement behind the trunk. I stared, waiting for it to move again. I saw the tall, dark figure lean its head around the trunk of the tree. I could not see any features in detail because it was nighttime, but I could make out the dark solid figure. It was standing upright. This told me it was time to leave. I ran home and stayed inside the rest of the night. I didn't even bother to tell my stepbrother. He later came in mad because I had abandoned him. Today, I wonder if this was the same thing that chased my dad. I have posted that story as well. Wake up call, Texas style. A little background before the story. It was the summer that I turned 10 years old. I was spending the summer working with my grandfather. He was retired. In his life, he had been a soldier from World War I, farmer, mechanic, carpenter, salesman, general handyman, and anything else that needed to be done to make a living for his family. A true burly man. He and my grandmother lived in a house in Mineral Wells, Texas, that he, my dad, and uncles had built on a small farm at the edge of town. His farm was about 10 acres and covered in fruit trees and garden plots. There was a man-made pond, or tank as they are called in Texas, right outside the kitchen window. The house was small and utilitarian. It had a living room, kitchen, bathroom, and two bedrooms, granny and granddads, and off-limits to the grandkids, and a small guest bedroom that I was staying in that summer. Someone had given my grandfather an old house for the materials in it if he would tear it down and haul it off. So my dad and uncles tore the house and hauled all of the material to granddad's back lot. Granddad was going to use the lumber to build a workshop, guest house, for all of his kids and grandkids to make use of and my job was to pull and straighten nails and sort the lumber that was stacked out back. Summers in Texas are brutal. Granddad would get up early, before it was light outside, then wake me up. Granny always had a breakfast ready for us. We would eat and then get to work. We would work until around 10, or until Granddad thought it was warm enough. Then we would go inside, cool off, have lunch, maybe take a nap or play dominoes or cards, then go back out and work some more, in the evening when it had cooled off outside. To make a short story long, one morning I woke up before Granddad had called me to get up. I had the feeling that he was in the room just staring at me. 
I was lying there wondering why he hadn't teased me about being a lazy bones or slug aped as he usually did. Finally, I opened my eyes to see what he was up to. When I opened my eyes, I noticed that the room was completely lit up, like the sun was coming through the windows. Then I heard a loud voice yell, you peeked, you're dead. Then an explosion of light, then the whole room went dark. I was lying there with my eyes squeezed shut, scared out of my wits. I was thinking, holy crap, I'm dead, or something along those lines. I don't know how long I lay there thinking that I was really dead and that this was indeed a very strange experience. Finally, Granddad came into the room, flipped on the light, yelled at me to quit burning daylight, and I realized that I was still alive. After a couple of days, I asked Granddad if anything weird had ever happened to him or Granny in the house. He said, don't worry about it. It would change the subject whenever I tried to bring it up. When I would ask Granny, she would say that she didn't understand and change the subject. Could have been a dream, but if it was, it was the most intense, terrifying dream that I have ever had. With Granny and grandkids' responses, I think that there was something going on, but they didn't want to scare me or any of the others. Granny and Granddad lived in a house for about another 10 years before moving into a trailer on my uncle's ranch in West Texas. Until they moved, I never slept in that room again, and if I had to go into it for any reason, would get in and get out as quickly as possible. The Shadow Man is back. It's been a while since I posted anything on here, since I only had one experience whilst I was a child. So the spirit demon creature that I have dreamed, and deemed the Shadow Man, has come back into my life. Now before I say what has started happening, I will explain a bit about what happened when I was a kid. Basically, when I was younger, I had a spirit stalk me wherever I went. I always felt like I was being followed whenever I went outside when it was getting dark. I would always see it out the window, but whenever I saw it, it would run away. I believe that it increased my anger issue when I was a kid. To put it simply, when I was younger, I had anger issues that were never really tied to anything. I had a short temper, but I don't remember doing as much as people said I did. Throwing things at people's head, trying to hit people with metal bats, etc. Since I can remember I had anger issues, and since I can remember I saw the shadow man following me, and after a certain point I stopped seeing him, and my anger issues subsided sometime around the end of elementary school. Now. I believe it is back. About a month or so ago, I felt extremely uncomfortable. I was at work around 8 and it was dark outside. I work at a fast food joint and don't usually have the later shifts, and I felt like something was watching me from outside the dining room windows. The dining room walls are pretty much all windows, by the way. And I kept feeling the need to look out the windows and look into the darkness of night. And for the second time in my life, I was extremely uncomfortable in going out into the dark because I knew it was out there. Although I knew, in the end, I had to suck it up and throw out the garbage. At the time, I just ignored it and thought I was just paranoid for no reason. But two weeks ago, whilst I was in the morning shift before the store even opened, I saw a black figure walking around in the dining room, and by the time I went to check it out, the shadow man was gone. The reason I knew it was him is because I got a better look at him than I usually did. After that, I started getting scared. Now I thought, hey, maybe it's just a mistake and maybe it was just my imagination. Maybe it was something that, you know, I was just making up in my head, as I just mentioned. But now I just learned 
that last night my mom woke up to a black figure. The way she described it matches the exact same thing I saw. Standing near her bed and looking down at her, and when she woke up, it disappeared. Now, back when I was a kid, it caused me anger issues, from what I believe. And now, as of late, I have been feeling more annoyed, angry, bitter, hateful. At the moment, I am trying to tell myself that it is all in my head. But I was wondering what you guys thought. And is there a way for me to get it out of my life? I am honestly so scared to lose what's left of who I am. I already hate most people. I didn't when I was younger. There are times I don't feel emotions. And to be honest, I don't value human life at all. I'm not a psychopath. I just don't care about people at all and don't feel anything when people die around me. I still try to be nice and I still try and care for people, but I've always felt like there was a part of me missing. A part of my soul. I'm agnostic. So what do you guys think? Anything will help. Real experience with Bloody Mary. I was only seven at the time. A few friends and I went to a bowling alley. Now our parents belonged to a bowling group, so we just chilled at the arcade part. One of the other kids told us a story about Bloody Mary. My friends and I didn't believe them. So me and two of my friends went to the men's room. All we had was a flashlight. We turned off all the lights and chanted, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary. My one friend then flashed a flashlight on and quickly off. I looked at the mirror and there was a girl. She looked like she was in her early 20s. She was looking the other way, yet started to turn towards us. My friend and I bolted out of there before she attacked us like the legend says. After this experience, I feel like someone's always watching me. I haven't tried contacting any other spirits after this. A few months after my friend did this, my dad died. Could she have driven him crazy enough to kill himself? Could the spirit be so full of rage it drives people to shoot themselves? Now, ever since this happened, my moods are different. I'm 15 and sometimes I'll just suddenly go into depression. Some days I just want to curl up and die. Could this be revenge for summoning her all these years ago? My friends who did this with me all stopped talking to me. I met one recently and she seems okay. Could I have been the only one who's seen Bloody Mary? Could she only be after me? If she is, then why? This may have happened seven or eight years ago. But I still feel the effects. The Fireplace This is the first paranormal experience that I ever had. It took place at my grandma's house, and I was seven years old. My grandma lived in a suburb of Melbourne called St. Kilda and lived on Crema Street. Many of the houses in St. Kilda were built in the late 1800s to the early 1900s, and many were mansions. My grandma's house was a single story, red bricked, two bedroom home that was very modest in comparison to some of the mansions that were built on Crima Street. It was built on a large block of land and I remember the front and back being overgrown with trees. Sadly, many of these houses have now been torn down to make room for newly built houses and apartment buildings. My grandma's home had two bedrooms at the front of the house, and then a long dark hallway which led to the lounge and kitchen area. The laundry and bathroom facilities were located outside, which was not unusual for houses built in this era. The main bedroom, which was my grandma's, had a huge fireplace in it. No central heating back in the day when the houses were built. 
The house was always cold, mainly due to the fact that it was surrounded by trees. It was a great cool house to be in during the hot summer, but it would get extremely cold in the winter time. There was a gas heater at the front of the house, which would warm up the lounge and kitchen area, but bedrooms would always stay cold. As my grandma was getting old and suffered from bad asthma, my dad used to worry a lot in the winter that she would get too cold in the winter time at night in her bedroom. My grandma absolutely refused to use the fireplace as she was scared of having an accident and being burnt or setting the house on fire. Many times when we visit her, I can remember my dad constantly offering to light a small fire in the fireplace, telling my grandma that he would extinguish it before we left, just so she could have a bit of warmth in her room at night. But she flatly refused, and would be very adamant that she did not want to ever use the fireplace. I remember it was a Saturday night, and my dad and I had stayed for dinner. I was sitting on the floor in front of the TV, and I was watching The Muppet Show. I must have fallen asleep, and my dad took me to my grandma's room and put me in her bed. He left the door open and switched on a lamp next to the bed. I remember walking up and realizing that I was in my grandma's room, and I was all alone. I hated being alone in her house, and I was really afraid of the long, dark hallway and would never venture to the front of the house without someone being with me. I threw back the bed covers and contemplated whether I should call out for my dad to come and get me or if I should make the bolt down the dark hallway to the safety of my dad and grandma. I put my feet on the floor deciding I would run down the hallway and something flickering caught my attention out of the corner of my eye. Standing by the fireplace was a transparent figure of a lady. She was standing side on and seemed to be gazing sadly into the fireplace. She was wearing a nightgown that was long at the back, but the front of the gown seemed much shorter and ragged looking. I screamed like a banshee and tore out of the room down the hallway where my dad met me halfway. Through terrified tears, I told him that there was a lady in a funny nightie in my grandma's room. He went to have a look while my grandma hugged me. She told me not to be afraid and the lady would never hurt me. My dad assumed that I must have had a bad dream, although I insisted it was real. Every time we visited my grandma after this, I would never look into her bedroom. For freer, I would see this lady once again. A few years later, my grandma moved as the house was getting too much for her to maintain on her own and she moved into a smaller flat. While packing and cleaning up, my dad made a joke that at least we would not have to clean out the fireplace, as it had never been used, and it brought back the memory of the night I saw the lady in the strange nighty. I asked my grandma if she remembered, and she said of course she did. She then went on to tell me that she had seen this lady on many occasions over the years, and had grown used to seeing her. She believed that she was a past resident of the house that had probably fallen into the fireplace and had burnt herself to death. Hence why her nightgown was shorter and ragged at the front as it was burnt. My grandma had not mentioned this to me before as she did not want me to be any more scared than I was when I visited her. This is why she never used the fireplace as she felt this lady answered and appeared as a warning that accidents can happen, and obviously my grandma took her warning very seriously. My grandma has since passed away, but I will never forget that night I saw this apparition of the lady with the funny nightie. A head in the fireplace. I've lived in the same house all my life. I'm 16 in a few weeks. I'm not an expert on these sorts of things, like you guys seem to be after reading some of your stories, so bear with me, as I'm not very knowledgeable on the subjects of ghosts and demons and those things of that nature. My house is pretty old, about 80 years old, my mom says. 
my Grams believes in this sort of thing, but the rest of my family is pretty skeptical, so we will rarely discuss it. The first thing I remember happening to me is when I was about six. I had chicken pox, and I couldn't sleep because they were so itchy, and my mom let me stay up late. It was about midnight, and I was watching Jurassic Park. I was alone, but my mom was in the next room, if I needed her. We have this big old-fashioned fireplace, but we rarely light it, and it wasn't lit on this night. There was a funny bit in the movie, and I giggled, and I heard a laugh, really quietly, but pretty gruff like a man's. I turned around and saw a man's head in the fireplace. It disappeared quickly, but I was convinced of it. I wasn't frightened at all and just carried on watching the film. See, I have no idea how that had even materialized. I know there was an old lady who previously lived there. She was a librarian. She knew my mom, and my mom had lived on the street all her life. The lady moved out and went to live with her relatives. That was about 25 years ago, so I'm assuming she's not alive, and she was very old when she left. So I'm thinking she might have had a husband, and I guess if I were to explain the fireplace incident, it might have been her husband in the fireplace. I know this is a short story, but there were other events that occurred that I will explain in a different post. So does anybody know what happened or can explain anything about the man in the fireplace? I'm still at a loss for words. I don't know what to say about that. As I said, I'm new to this whole experience and I don't know much about paranormal activity. Thank you, though. About 15 years ago, the guy living in my current house died. After about 12 years, we moved in. People say he died from a heart attack, but others say his wife killed him. But I ended up getting the room he died in. Every night, I could hear beating in the chimney in the room, and it would slowly move its way up right above my bed. A week later, I had my friend Megan spend the night to see if we could hear it too. Well, she did. Then I had my sister stay in there to see if she could hear it. About a week later, it was my birthday, and we slept out in the tent. We could hear someone screaming, so we went out to check it out. We didn't see anything outside, so we went inside. We could hear footsteps up the stairs, but we didn't see anybody. But then the door to my room opened. We went in there, and we saw a shadow going into the chimney. We were wondering why he would go into the chimney, and people say that his wife killed him and stuffed him in the chimney itself. Every other night, I can hear the doorbell ring, but no one is there. So I'd go up to my bed, then I could hear the door shut, and hear the footsteps go up the stairs and into my room, but this time, I didn't see anybody. I've heard rumors that there's a chimney ghost, but also that the body may still be there. Then again, I've never seen a body in the chimney, so I really doubt there would be a body stuffed in the chimney still after all this time. This is pretty creepy, and all the occurrences in the chimney just leave me unsettled. Thanks for reading. About one week ago, my daughter called me from work asking me if I would take in a dog that had been hit by a car and that they thought both its legs were broke. I said yes, and while her friend was bringing her to me, I was getting a cage with bedding, blankets, paper, food, and water ready for her arrival. The friend got to my home, and we walked out together as it took the two of us to carry the dog. We got her in my home and I saw that she was hurt worse than they had thought, so I'd put my dog in another room, and we put her here in the living room in the toddler bed so I could stay with her. The friend left, 
and I called my girlfriend to come over because I had no money to take the dog to the vet and thought she may help. By the time the dog got to my house, I covered her in blankets and tried putting water in her mouth with my fingers and moistened her lips and tongue. Her gums and tongue were pale, like she was in shock. She started having trouble breathing, so I rolled her over. Nothing changed and only got worse in a few minutes. By the time my girlfriend had gotten there, I had already once thought that the dog had died. She stopped breathing, then suddenly, she took a breath. And my girlfriend came in and the dog was having a really hard time, only breathing periodically. Within five minutes of my girlfriend getting there, the dog died. I made sure for about ten minutes and then covered her head with the blankets I had tried to warm her with. My girlfriend and I then sat. I bawled my eyes out and she tried to comfort me. I then got myself together and started trying to figure out what to do with the poor dog's remains. I kept checking her to assure she was gone and closed her mouth. I got a shower curtain and a stuffed toy to put under her chin to lay with her to rest in peace. Then I took my family blanket we used to watch TV and throw over us to wrap the little girl in love. Then I found an old cargo net out of my old SUV to tie it shut as I didn't know as of yet where to put her as the ground was frozen so I couldn't even bury her. About 30 minutes later, my girlfriend and I decided to put the little one, all tied up and warm, in my girlfriend's garage until we could bury her. We drove to her house and I carried her in and placed her on an old lounge napping couch. Me and my girlfriend had broken up over this and stayed that way until the day of the encounter. Now this dog was a black lab with white down the center of its chest and a faded red nylon collar. Then the 16th rolled around and I was just bothered and wanted to see my girlfriend. So I texted her asking if she wanted to come by that evening and hang out. Of course she said yes. So she came over straight from work that evening and we had a few beers and were driving around. While driving around, she told me that she had gotten someone to bury the dog a couple of days prior about 30 minutes away. We got a little over halfway between her house and mine and we passed a dog on the road coming towards us in the other lane of a two lane road. I slowed down and gasped for air and said, oh my god, did you see that? She asked, what are you talking about? And I replied with, no, I'm not saying a word. I'm turning around and see what you think. She replied, I think I know what you are going to say. So I found a place to turn around and we drove back to see this dog. We found it on the other lane of the road, walking up another road that went up the hill. I said, no, Kathy, wait, just look. So I drove up beside the dog and it stopped and stared at us without making a move or sound. So I ended up rolling down my window and said, hey there, baby. Still no wag of a tail or anything. It looked just like that dog that we had that died previously and had the very same collar. Kathy told me to get the hell out of there and just not speak about it anymore. But what does this mean? Did we see the dead ghost of the dog that we just took care of? Because I swear it seemed like the same one. It looked exactly like it. I just don't know what to think at this point. But thank you for reading. My experience happened in late October to early November of 1985 or 1986, and for years, I have searched the web and reading materials of World War II for information regarding the USS Alabama. I gave up for a while, but recently, my interest was aroused again, and there is more information available now on the ship. I toured the ship with my first husband and two other couples. No one else was on the ship except the six of us, and each chose a different route. I believe there were three painted lines, red, yellow, and blue, at the beginning of the tour, and each route ran through the entire ship, but just not together. Each couple chose a different route, and we did not run into each other again because the ship was so large. A few minutes into the tour, I had the feeling of not being alone, that other people were watching us, and I kept turning around, looking for someone, but no one was ever there. This continued throughout the entire tour, until my husband started questioning me on why I kept turning around. When I told him, he just scoffed at me. I never heard any voices or saw anyone or anything, but I just had the uncanny feeling of unseen presence and some sadness. The only noises I remember was something being banged on metal, which I attributed to the settling of the ship. At the very end of the tour, just before we were to get off the ship, we saw a sleeping compartment for some sort of lieutenant. I entered the compartment and sat on the bunk for just a second or two. As I was coming out of this compartment, something snatched a diamond earring out of my ear. 
not much pain, but definitely a force, and not just the earring falling out on its own. I was upset because I thought even if I was able to find the earring, I would have to go to a jewelry store to get another back for it because I knew I would never be able to find the little tiny back to it. When we found the earring, it was in the corner 10 to 12 feet from where I had been standing and the back was still on it. I took this to mean that there definitely had been someone or something else in that tour with us and because my husband kept scoffing at me, this was the other person's way of letting me know I had not been wrong. This next part may be just my imagination, or maybe there could have been pictures of some of the officers on the ship at the time I was there. I don't remember. But for years, I've carried the image of a tall, thin-faced, blonde officer in my mind. No name, just his face. A few weeks ago when I began my search again for information on the ship, one website had pictures and biographies of some of the commanders. One is the face I had seen in my mind for years. Unless there were pictures on that ship back in 85 or 86, there's no other place I could have seen that face. None of the books on World War II I've searched through have this man in them. This is the only strange thing that has ever happened to me. I've been to the Winchester Mystery House in California, the Oak Alley Plantation in Louisiana, Silver War Battlefield Parks, etc. And never, ever has anything even remotely different happened to me. In my opinion, California is one of the most haunted places in the world. Its history is no doubt one of greed and sadness. Whole tribes of people like the Tungava, ravaged by disease, slavery, genocide, and deculturalization at the hands of the white man and his moral cloak. Both my mother and I have had a heightened sense of spirits, both good and bad, and have had many interesting encounters of which many may be skeptical. Regardless, when one experiences things firsthand, they tend to be more understanding, and so I hope you find my encounters with spirits interesting. About six or seven years ago, I was around 12 at the time. My mother and I lived in the Vanderlip estate of Portuguese Bend, a place of urban legend and mysterious happenings. Frank A. Vanderlip bought the Palos Verdes Peninsula back in 1913 and began construction of the Vanderlip estate within the year. There is a large mansion in which he and his family lived and several other surrounding buildings. It is said that his daughter, Narissa, fell in love with an African-American and bore his child, which was at the time an abomination. Outraged, her father locked her away in the asylum he had built across the road, now called Narissa Drive, and murdered her lover and child. It is also said that not long after, he murdered his entire family and their two dogs and buried them in the walls of the mansion, then hanged himself from a beam in the living room. Some say they have seen the ghosts of the family members in the windows of the mansion and have heard the cries of the children and barking of the dogs. Whether or not this is true is debatable, as there are no known historical accounts of this happening. But I will leave that to your judgment. What I can confirm is that this place is cursed by something dark. Experienced psychics will tell you to stay away from this area. It is not something to be tampered with, and I don't disagree. My mother and I lived in the farthest building up the hill, Casa Azul, which is, as the name describes, a blue house. All the homes in the estate are Spanish-styled houses of a somewhat lavish design, each with a unique name, indeed very beautiful and not seemingly sinister, not during the day anyway. Whenever my mother and I would explore the grounds, we could feel the presence of spirits around us, usually content and peaceful, but as soon as the sun would begin to set, we could feel the change come over the land, as if the air was constricted and something was lurking in the shadows that did not mean well. In our home, we would experience things all the time, and it didn't really frighten us. Events like screen doors opening and shutting when there was no wind, footsteps running on the tiled floors, objects taken and left in peculiar places. One time my mother's white gold hoop earrings went missing from her jewelry box. On my way back from the Greek pillar ruins, I felt something behind me and ran as quickly as I could down the hill. I stopped and turned to confront it, and there was nothing there. But when I turned around, there were the earrings in the middle of the path, just in front of my feet. The hair stood up on my whole body, and I picked them up and ran back to the house. On another occasion, I was sitting on the couch in the living room, reading quietly, when I heard something walk behind me and tenderly grabbing my hair which was hanging over the back of the couch as it walked past. I thought it was my mother, but when I turned, no one was there. 
I remembered then that she had been sleeping for over an hour on the bed across the room, and I realized that I had been touched by a friendly spirit. Other things occurred in that house, like tipped over drinks, spirits like offerings, and broken dishes. The bathroom sink would randomly turn on, and beds would be unmade when we got back from hiking or days out. We heard laughter and cries, people whispering in other languages, and sometimes we would hear someone calling our names, but no one was there. We could also feel someone watching us while we were sleeping, hovering over us. There was also a ghost cat that lingered there who I called Daisy. Sometime later, we were forced to move back into the house I had lived in since I was five with my grandmother. She's a skeptical woman, an Episcopalian who doesn't believe in the supernatural, but many things have happened to me in that house. I've seen my deceased grandfather, a man who I've never met or saw a picture of, since he died in front of my mother when she was eight. The first time I saw him, I heard a high-pitched ringing in my ears, and when I looked through the back window of the study, I saw the cloudy gray figure of a man in his 50s-style clothing, thick-rimmed glasses, and hair combed back. He looked at me for a few seconds, and then he was gone. I saw him again two years later, only he made himself more present. He was less transparent, standing in the hall of the living room wearing a blue sweater, tan shorts, and the same thick rimmed glasses with comb back hair. When I described him to my mom, her face went slightly pale, and she showed me the picture of him, telling me who he was and what happened to him. We were both amazed. Other spirits dwelled in the house, and still do. Spirits of Tongva, spirits of things that were never human, and deceased relatives. My mother and I often smelled floral perfume and clove cigarettes at random times, and she was certain it was her grandmother's sister, Dorothy. My own grandmother, a succulent woman named Gloria, who was my father's mother, would watch over me, on and off, and still does. I know this because when she's present, everything gets quieter, and I get a static ringing in my ears, accompanied by the strong smell of cedar. There were good and evil spirits in the house. The bad were tall, wispy, shadow-like figures who would hover over you when you were sleeping, looking at you menacingly. They were energy stealers, much like the Dementors of Harry Potter, who hated good things and sage smoke. The good spirits were ghosts of Tongva, who my mother and I could feel constantly. Some felt lost, others scared and sad, and some angry. I think we intrigued them in some way. They would give us signs to make themselves known. We would ask to find beads, bowls, or shells, and they would appear. Sometimes, I would have to make a bed on the floor so my mother could sleep in my bed when she would visit, and on two separate occasions, I was moved. It was always the same position. I would be sleeping next to the closet, with my feet pointing toward the direction of the ocean, which was a 10-minute walk away. When I woke up, I would be at my mother's left side, laying horizontal to the ocean. The blankets were folded neatly underneath me, and I would wake up on my back. I sleep on my side with the blanket laid neatly on top of me. After reading about the spirits of Hawaiian soldiers, the marchers, I have come to the conclusion that where I was lying must have been a sacred path, and the spirits continued to walk that way. To give you a visual idea, we lived right next to the Lunda Bay Canyon, which stretches from the top of the hill in Rancho Palos Verdes all the way down to the ocean's edge, though the portion between our house and PV Drive West was filled in and made into a storm drain. Still, as Jim Morrison said, the streets are fields that never die. I am a firm believer in ghosts and spirits, and I can tell you that everything I've said is true. Whether or not you believe me is your own choice, but if you keep an open mind, you might have a few stories of your own to tell. In 1967, we moved into a home in Lancaster, California. This was in the desert, and when it got really hot in the summer, me and my older brother liked to sleep outside. Occasionally, I thought I heard footsteps pacing up and down the hall. I just covered my head. Then one night, I heard the back doorknob moving like someone was trying to get in. I screamed for my dad, and we both walked down the hall towards the kitchen where the back door was located. As soon as we got within sight of the door, it stopped. The footsteps in the hall continued, though. Then one night, my brother and I were sleeping outside. We had just finished listening to the Dodgers game on the radio. I recall that game was very, very long, going into multiple extra innings. We fell asleep under the stars when the game was over. We suddenly woke up to our dog, who had been leashed to the tree we were under, running around the yard barking. 
We gather up the dog and notice that the metal clasp of the leash was bent backwards. This was a heavy cast clasp, and it would not be possible to bend it back unless we put it in a vise and used a hammer. So we tied the leash on. The dog could not have done it because this dog was just a little poodle terrier mix, and the bend was in the wrong direction for it to have been made if the leash was pulled on. Then I noticed it. The back door, which was half glass and inside of our glassed in porch, was shaking and doorknob was rattling all by itself. I told my brother, see, that's what I've been hearing. Now I had a witness. We watched it for a bit before it stopped. I heard the rattling doorknob several more times, once when I was sleeping outside by myself, and it was almost light out. This is where the story takes a freaky turn. The lady who sold the house to us was selling it because her husband had just died. All their children were gone, and she no longer needed a large four-bedroom house. Also, the day we moved in, I was sick with a sore throat. The doorbell rang and my mom went to answer it. I followed her. At the door was a little girl, my age named Kim, who I later became friends with. I was seven when we moved in. She said that she had come to our house to inform us that we were moving into a house that was known in the neighborhood to be haunted. Then she left. I later did some research and read that poltergeists can't get through locked doors. When we slept outside, this back door was locked. If we needed to get in, there was another back door that led to my parents' bedroom. At about 3 a.m. Tuesday morning, I was leaving my apartment on North Penn near Qual Springs Mall in northwest Oklahoma City, and right as I got to the intersection of my complex in Penn Avenue, I ran out of gas. I whipped around the driveway and pulled to a stop at the entrance gate to avoid stalling out in the street. I popped the trunk of my Chevy, retrieved a gas can, and hoved it the half mile towards the Congo station at 122nd Street. I crossed Penn to the underdeveloped land to the east of Penn. Having lived in my apartment for two years, I was aware that there's a shanty for the local homeless people tucked a couple of hundred yards off the road next to the creek. In the summer, when the trees are green, it is virtually impossible to see the camp from the road. Walking in the desert at night, I kept glancing towards the shanty, just being curious. Stepping out of the grass to cross the creek, I spied a girl in her teens, or possibly early 20s, much younger than the panhandlers I see on the street corner every day. She had on jeans and a white shirt under a black hoodie that was almost all of the way unzipped. Her head was bowed down, and her raven hair concealed her face. As if she noticed me, she raised her head, parted her hair, and before her eyes met mine, she dissipated like smoke. Well, being no stranger to the paranormal, it was still a little creepy, so after I filled my gas can, I walked back on the other side of the street, and there was my story. Thanks for reading. All kinds of weird things used to happen around my house, day and night. I inherited the Disney Haunted House record album from my brother when he moved out of the house. I played it for the first time in my bedroom that I shared with my sister. I had asked my friend if she wanted to listen to it with me. I turned it on. Then she suggested we pull the drapes down and get on the bed with the sheet over our heads so we would be in semi-darkness to enjoy the album more. I figured why not, and then we proceeded to do just that. Not much time later, about the second section of the album, she noticed something and asked if it was me doing it. I had my eyes closed, so I asked her what she meant. She asked me if that was my hand. Huh? I opened my eyes and there was a perfect image of a hand on the sheet. Just a hand, no arm attached or shadow of a person on the sheet. I told her to cut it out, that it wasn't a funny joke. She said it wasn't her. I looked over at her, and she had her hand right above her head, holding onto the sheet, and then I felt her arm and hand against my right arm. It scared us half to death. We threw back the sheet, and there was no one there. I've always been nervous about going into the basement. One day, when I was around 9 or 10 years old, I was down there with some friends. We were listening to the Disney Haunted House album, which was not a bright move on our part. One of my friends said she saw a shadow of a man near the stairs that led into the house. I went over to her because from where I was standing, my view of the stairs was blocked by a 10 by 10 foot cement foundation block, which acts as a base for the fireplace. When I got to her, I looked and saw the shadow of a man in rain slicker and hat. It was like the kind that fishermen wear. He was standing on what would be the third step of the stairs. 
there was a window to the left side of the stairs about 10 feet away. There was nothing there to cast a shadow. The only rain gear down there was 12 feet away to the left of the window. It was impossible for it to cast that shadow, and even if it did, the angle of the light coming through the window would have cut off the lower part of the figure. We freaked and ran from the cellar up the outside steps. My mother came outside and asked what was wrong. I told her, and she insisted I show her. Needless to say, I was none too happy about that. We went down to the cellar so I could show her. It was gone, which freaked me out even more. She gave me a weird look and said that it was alright and that she believed me. I still have the Haunted House album, but I never played it again. In 1990s, I was doing property preservation, securing foreclosed houses throughout New England. I would be on the road for three days straight, sometimes in rural Maine. I would stay in the house I was at, at the end of a 14 hour day, to save money on a hotel. This one house in Hampton, Maine. Keep in mind these homes have no utilities, all have been disconnected. This one house was a former large turn of the century farmhouse, remarkably clean with fresh paint. I would seek out the higher rooms, usually the second floor, because the day's warmth would stay in those rooms longer. Even in the summer, the nights can get brisk. Anyway, this night I fell asleep about 9pm, and suddenly, I was awakened by the sound of banging on the front door downstairs. I was not in a good mood being very tired from the day's labor, and I hurried down expecting to see the sheriff, and I would show the work order and explain my reason for being there, and he'd be on his way. Only... There was no one there. I went back upstairs. This time I was thinking I was more tired than I thought and wasn't happy being awoken from a sound sleep by my imagination, so I thought. A few minutes later, just as I was falling asleep again, there was the banging again. I sat up and surely someone was banging on the front door. I yelled out hello and the banging stopped. And again, I head to the front door and no one... I walked around the rural property, no one. Now I'm fully awake and not happy, but still not thinking of anything supernatural, so up to bed. I was sleeping on the floor in a sleeping bag, but now I had one eye open in both ears. Then the banging started again. I listened, then shouted out, what do you want? The banging stopped at the downstairs front door and then started right at my wall in my room without missing a beat. Needless to say, the hair stood up on my neck. I grabbed my stuff and beat it out of there. My name is Amber, and I'm almost 22 years old. I've always been a firm believer in ghosts, but was never a believer in evil entities. So the first time I saw a shadow being, I thought it was just my imagination playing tricks on me. It was the spring of 2007 when the first encounter occurred. I was working on a short story for my high school science fiction class when I suddenly felt like something in the room had changed. Something wasn't right. I couldn't detect anything, so I just shrugged it off as having an overactive imagination and went back to writing. Again, the feeling came back, and I was overwhelmed with dread. So I turned around, looking all around the room, and that's when I noticed it. Huddling in the corner, it was black, short, no distinct features really. I saw it reach out its hands, and I screamed at it to go away, and it sank into the other shadows in the room. Shadows that were obviously made by the lights shining on objects. That was my first encounter with the shadow beings. The second encounter occurred about two years later. It was a bright sunny day in summer. I was in bed with the fan on, trying to beat the heat. I decided to call my friend Katie because I was bored and wanted someone to talk to. Our conversation didn't last long because she had to get ready for work. So there I was again, with nothing to do. I was about to reach for a book when I noticed something near my window. I thought it might be a kid blocking the window, but this thing, it seemed to have materialized out of nowhere. It was like a giant blob with no form. At the blink of an eye, it was just gone. It had me running out of my room in fear, and I definitely didn't want to sleep in there for quite a while. My last encounter occurred months before I moved into my own place. I was watching TV in the dark upstairs, a horror movie of course. I had to pause the movie because it suddenly became chilling in the living room and I went to grab a pillow and blanket, wanting to keep warm and also deciding that I would sleep upstairs that evening. Some comfort thing that I've had since I was a kid after I've watched a horror movie. It makes me feel safe knowing that my parents are in the next room. Well, 
When I came back upstairs, I noticed that there was something huddled in the corner. I thought it was my sister Santana because she always made her way upstairs to the living room because she thought her room was too cold to sleep in. As I approached the corner, I realized it wasn't her, but one of the shadow beings that I'd seen before. As quickly as I noticed it wasn't my sister, it had disappeared, as if evaporating. These shadow beings are not just a figment of my imagination. They're not my eyes playing tricks on me because of the way the room is lit. The shadows are pure black and look as if they could be solid. Sometimes they take the shape of a human, sometimes they are shapeless, or at least in my experience with them, that's what has happened. I don't know why it targeted me to be able to see it, or where it even came from, and if it's still in that house. My whole family moved away, and I'm in an apartment on the opposite side of town, with no shadow being encounters for at least 9 months. I do know that my mind was telling me that this thing was evil, and something bad would happen if I stayed there with my family any longer. So I immediately began searching for an apartment after the last encounter, finally freeing me once moving into my own place. I was, and still am, glad to be free of whatever it was that was haunting me. This story has never been heard by anyone. I chose not to say anything because I know what happens when you tell someone you have seen a demon. Seven years ago when I was just 12 years old, something happened to me that I will never forget. My life was altered that cold windy night. A few friends and I were playing hide and seek, like little most boys do. The neighbors did not care if we played in their yard and there was a church next to that. We had plenty of room to play a good game of hide and seek, flashlight edition. It just so happened that it was my turn to be the seeker. I had given everyone approximately four minutes to hide. We counted in the garage with the door securely shut. My four minutes were about up, so I began my quest to find my friends, but that was not what I found at all. I started going towards the church in search of them, but then doubled back. I was hoping I would catch them quick, I started walking down the tree line in my friend's backyard. This was approximately 50 yards from the garage where I started. I heard some rustling in the woods, so I knew I had found someone. Slowly creeping up in the sound, all I could see was the branches and tree trunks. Going deeper and deeper into the woods, I began to feel like someone was watching me, but I knew it was not my friends. I just sensed like it was something else, so I started to get out of there, fast. I finally was out of the woods. And then I started to walk even further down the tree line. I heard that same noise again. So, of course, I went back in to see what it was. I probably walked 15 feet into the woods again. And that's when I saw it. My flashlight was aimed at the ground so I could see where I was going. The noise was about 15 feet in front of me. I slowly lifted my light upwards. I began to see strange gray feet, legs, and a back. I dropped my light instantly, with only the moon as my light. I saw the shadow turn around. Standing motionless in front of me was a creature that I only seen in horror films. It was about six foot six. I can only describe this thing as being a demon. It had wings that were tucked behind itself because I saw them before I dropped my flashlight. His arms were at his side. I could not make out any facial features very well. I hate to sound cliche, but it did have glowing red eyes. It was a very faint glow, but a glow nonetheless. At this point, I was frozen with fear. All I knew was I had to get out of there. I slowly began to step backwards, trying not to make a sound, but I knew my cover was blown. It still remained motionless as I was doing this. I was almost out now, and I could hear sticks breaking so I knew it was moving. When I heard that, I started running out of there. I was standing in the backyard now when I heard this loud swooping noise, like a giant bird taking off. I turned around and saw the most incredible thing I had ever seen in my life. This great creature was flying towards the moon, and I could see its very large wingspan. It disappeared very quickly. I was standing in the middle of the lawn, speechless, looking at the sky. I forgot we were even playing hide and seek at this point. I just walked back to the house and sat on the steps. Maybe 10 minutes later, my friends came walking up asking me what I was doing. I guess they saw me sitting there from their hiding spot. They thought I had given up or something. I told them I was not feeling very well, not letting them in on what I had seen. So we all went back inside. The rest of the night, all I could think about was that creature. What was it? What did it want? Where did it come from? These were the things I was thinking of. The next day, I decided to draw as best I could what I saw. A few years ago, 
I was reading a story that I saw and stumbled upon. It was about people who had seen some pretty weird things. And this thing sounded like what I saw that night seven years ago. What really gave me goosebumps, and I'm getting them now for just thinking about it, is there was a drawing that the witness had drawn. It looked exactly what I drew. There were a few more stories about this creature with even more drawings that looked like mine. They called this thing Mothman. Now, I do not know if what I saw was the same thing all these other people saw, but I do know I saw something that I cannot fully explain. I do not plan on telling my friends or family about this because they would laugh at me. I know what I saw, and that is all that matters to me. It was the summer of 09. It started on a bright sunny Friday afternoon. It was nice out in my day off, so I decided to take a walk downtown and go to the bookstore. I spent a good few minutes just browsing until I got to the paranormal section. On the top shelf in the left corner I found it. It was an old thin dusty book that had the word witchcraft printed on it. No author's name or date of being published. It was priced $9, so I thought, why not, and I bought it. I went to a convenience store got a few snacks, and then plopped myself down in my favorite seat in town. It was right by the old movie theater, at a view of Main Street, the bridge, and you could still see the sky. I made myself comfortable and opened the book. The first page was blank. The second page had the title of the book, but the third page was, well, strange. It said introduction and had a weird boarding around the page, and then a short paragraph. It was in Latin or something, and I struggled to pronounce it, but I made it to the next page. I can't really remember what it said, but the second after I turned the page, I will never forget. The sky went from bright blue and sunny to dark gray and gloomy. A huge gust of wind swooped down and blew the book straight out of my hand. Lightning flashed and several big bands of thunder boomed. I was so focused on the strange sky activity that I didn't notice the book had completely disappeared. The dark cloud seemed to almost spin in a vortex. I was thinking a tornado, but then it started to pour rain, and then the rain turned to hail, and it did that for quite some time. I was stuck on the bench for about an hour waiting for it to let up. I had no phone, and I was wearing a tank top and capris and flip-flops, and it had turned so cold. The hail was about a quarter size, and I couldn't get anywhere. I was lucky that part of the roof hung over my head, so I didn't get hit. When it finally let up, I looked for the book, but could never find it, so I headed home kind of bummed because the sky was still so dark, and it looked as if it was going to storm for a while. I had planned on going camping that weekend. I took my usual route home, but was kind of wanting to turn around and take a different route. The usual route was a road I would take home coming from my friend's house. I had a bad experience there with shadow people the year before this. I took that way anyways, but walked cautiously. The wind was still howling, but I didn't mind. I love the wind when it blows through my hair. It almost seemed as if the wind was speaking to me at this point. It was whispering in my ear. It sounded like the words that were on the page of the book, too. I could hear the wind so clearly, and then it hit me. Why is it so quiet? There was no one anywhere. The street was empty. No cars. No kids. Even if it was raining, kids in the neighborhood would have puddle jumping contests. It was abandoned. Completely deserted. When I got home, the lights wouldn't work and no one was there. I got to my room and got my cell phone and was going to call my mother, but it was dead and I had no way to charge it. It didn't seem strange to me that the power would be out after the freak storm, but it was weird that no one was home. Eventually I drifted off, and the next day when I woke up, my alarm went off. It was really weird because my alarm clock is electric and there was a power outage and it shouldn't be working. I could hear people in the kitchen so I ventured in there to question their whereabouts last night. They say they didn't know what I was talking about. They were home the whole time. I was really confused, so then I proceeded to talk about the freak storm, and they looked at me with a puzzled look on their faces. They said that it was sunny all day yesterday. I walked away laid back down thinking, this must be a dream. I closed my eyes, pinched myself, and I felt it, then reopened my eyes and sat up. I was really confused, Maybe yesterday was a dream, and today is actually Friday. I grabbed my phone, and it turned on this time. I could have sworn it was dead earlier. I looked at the date, and it said Saturday. I then put my phone on my dresser, really, really confused now. I turned around, ready to go back to bed, but then I stopped, turned around again, and there it was, 
That book was on my dresser. I opened it, but every page was blank. Right then, my mom walked in and asked what was wrong. She said I came home yesterday with that book in my hand 20 minutes or so after leaving and went straight to bed and slept the whole day and had just woken up now. I left the house at 1 p.m. the day before, came back around 1.30 p.m. and slept until 10 a.m. the next day. That is, that's 20 and a half hours straight. What the hell happened that day? I was never really sure of, but I burned that book a few days later. I took it to my friend's house and burned it in a bonfire. It burned pretty quickly, and the smoke from it was black as the night sky. I'm not really sure if I want to know what happened that day. To this day, it still seems as if the wind speaks to me. As a young boy of 13, I lived on a farm in southern England next to the River Arran. Being the oldest with two brothers and sisters, I naturally became the babysitter of them when my parents would go out on a Friday night. It was on one of those Friday nights that I experienced a paranormal experience. I just put my brothers and sisters to bed, made myself a cup of tea, put another log on the fire, and just sat down to read a book. We had no TV or video games back then, when I heard a faint laughing and whispering sound coming from the upstairs. I got up from the chair and yelled, if you kids don't knock it off, I'm coming up there with the paddle. Then there was a silence, and a smile came on my face, and I sat down to read my book. Half an hour later, I could hear it again. This time, I grabbed the paddle, and as soon as I started to go up the staircase, I suddenly froze. At the top of the landing was a transparent figure of a man, dressed as an 18th century pirate, including sword and dagger in his belt. In his right hand, he was holding a goblet and was drinking from it. He then turned and looked straight at me, lifting his goblet in a salute, and started that laugh again, and slowly disappeared through the wall behind him. I ran straight upstairs and into my brother's and sister's room where they were all sound asleep. I told my mom and dad about this when they got home, and they just laughed and told me the story of how the farm was an inn back in the late 1700s, and that pirates would come up the River Aaron from the English Channel to hide from the British Navy. This one pirate was caught and hanged on an oak tree just outside the inn, and every now and again would show himself to have a little fun. This was a ghost story that my late father-in-law told me nearly 20 years ago. His story goes back some 20 years before that he mentioned his ghostly tale to me. Around 1975, he was working as a bus driver in and around Durham area. But this story is not about him, rather a good friend of his, who too was a bus driver for the same bus company. On a late summer's evening, around about 10 p.m., my father-in-law's friend, who was called Peter, was making his way back to the depot down the country lane to Durham. He was driving a single-decker bus, the bus had a door for entry and a door further along the bus for passengers to exit the bus. The bus was empty of passengers, as it was his last run back towards the bus office depot. As he was driving along, he noticed a young lady at a bus stop with her hand out as though she was attempting to flag the bus. Peter Dolly obliged and opened the bus door for the young lady to step into the bus. The young girl was approximately 20 to 24, looking from how Peter described her. She was, however, in a state of dishevelment and was crying. Peter apparently asked the girl if she was heading back towards Durham City Center. The young woman replied yes. As she was crying and upset, Peter allowed her on the bus for free as he was heading back to the depot anyway. He told the woman that he would drop her off at a particular road in the city center as he was heading off to the office. The rest of the journey was uneventful for Peter. He occasionally looked in the mirror to see if the lady was okay and had stopped crying. Peter was nearing the road where he told the young girl he would have to drop her off. As Peter opened the doors for her to leave, there was no sign of her movement, so Peter, believing her to be asleep, walked down the whole bus to see if he could awaken her. To his utter horror, there was no one else on the bus. In a state of complete shock, Peter drove back to the depot and called for assistance as he could not believe what happened and he was absolutely shell-shocked. Over the next few days, Peter's story started to spread, and it became apparent that years earlier, a young woman of the mysterious passenger's description had been knocked over by a car in the same area that Peter had picked her up. The story went that she had just seen her boyfriend, and they had an argument. She ended up going home heading for a bus, rather than letting her boyfriend drive her home. As she walked to the bus stop crying, 
She is alleged to have walked into the road in oncoming traffic. She was sadly killed outright by a car. The actual time of Peter picking up the young lady was said to be the anniversary of her death. What I do know is that Peter never worked again whatsoever. And as for the young woman, she is said to walk the county lane to Durham, searching for a lift towards Durham City Center. Kelsey and I had been friends since kindergarten. We're not very close anymore, but we were all through elementary school. Whenever we were together, strange things would always happen. Sometimes scary, sometimes just abnormal. Usually, when we would tell people, they'd think we were bluffing. I admit, on some occasions we would, but there was one particular time that didn't require any bluffing. It was her birthday party that day. We must have been in about third, maybe fourth grade. I was the one friend that she had spent the night, so after everyone had left, we began to color this huge poster that I got for her. It was raining outside, and as it got later, the rain got heavier and it eventually began to storm. It must have been well after midnight because we were both exhausted but refused to go upstairs. We were enjoying ourselves. We didn't feel like going to sleep yet. The lightning was starting to get pretty severe, and it would light up the entire house. She had windows everywhere, behind us, in front of us, to either side. On my left side was the front door. Next to the front door were, surprise, windows. They had curtains over them, but they were lace so we could easily see through them. During a fairly violent flash of lightning, both of us must have looked to the windows at the same time and we saw the shadow of a man walk in front of them. We were pretty sure the front door was locked, but this still didn't prevent us from panicking. We looked at each other, both of us with wide eyes, and we knew we'd both see the same thing. At first, we thought it was a person, but what kind of person would just walk right onto someone's porch? Then we realized he was dressed odd. He had what seemed to be a top hat and a cape, or that's what it looked like, we didn't get a particular look at him. He appeared to be only a shadow. Could it have been a ghost? Both in hysterics. We tried to convince ourselves everything was okay and to just run upstairs as fast as we could to tell her parents. Our first stop though was to her bedroom, also on the front side of the house, so we could look out our windows to see if we saw anyone. Nobody. We were sure this couldn't be true. We'd both seen the guy. He couldn't have gone too far if it was a man even. Since he was gone, we just sat on her bed and replayed it over and over again to each other. Had it really happened? Of course, we both saw the same exact thing. We talk about how oddly he was dressed, and even though it made more sense for it to be some crazy guy walking on her porch, hey, maybe he was just trying to get out of the rain. We were sure it was a ghost. If it was a man, wouldn't we have been able to make him out more clearly? He was more like a shadow than anything. Fear still running through us, the storm still active. The light suddenly went out. Both of us screamed, ran into the hallway crying, and down to her parents' room. We barged in, and the lights came back. It was just the storm we knew, but at no worst possible time could the lights have gone out. We told them what we'd seen, and they just rolled their eyes and told us we were just tired and to go back to sleep. Her dad told us to even go downstairs and make sure nobody was there. He did, and we went back to her bedroom. A few minutes later, he came upstairs and said he saw no one. We continued to talk about it all night, but we eventually fell asleep. Neither of us had ever seen anything like it again, but we still talk about it whenever we do talk. It was one of the most craziest experiences either of us has ever endured, and that marked the beginning of my speculation that maybe there is more than this physical earth we live on. Ever since, I've believed in ghosts. Hey, I guess seeing really is believing. This is a paranormal story about my bedroom door. Everything started about six years ago, when I had just reached seven years of age. The incidents began about the time when I had my lock removed from my door due to the few times when I locked it and it wouldn't reopen. Now, since my house is old, so are most of the built-in appliances. For instance, 
I've pole chained toilets in an old fashioned fireplace. So when I had my lock removed, I had to remove all of it. Now my door wouldn't even close. Two nights after the lock close system was removed, there was an atrocious storm. I woke to a flash of fork lightning in the field across my house and felt the sudden urge to turn my light on. The minute my light flickered, my door began to violently slam open and close. Turning to the door, I noticed my window was open. After noticing this, I was quickly calmed. As my hands reached for the window, the door stopped abruptly. As you can imagine, being so little, I was extremely frightened. Little noises started around me like the sound of someone writing with a quill or a soft buzzing. Nothing abnormal happened for the next two years until a storm came rolling in off the coast. Once again, I woke up and turned on my light to find the door opening and closing. This time it wasn't with much force at all. But still, I being nine, was still thinking it'd be nothing less than the wind. Not until I turned 11 did I decide to do some thorough research on the matter. I made this decision because I now started to get this cold sensation on my cheek during the summer night storm incidents. My grandmother seemed the only one who would understand. She told me that she knew something was up. She said that about three owners ago, a young woman had a child about six or seven. Every summer, the child would keep his window open during the night because of the heat. The young woman wasn't very rich, so they only rented out that one room. When the young woman would return from work, she would find the boy's window open and be so mad that she would slam the door open and close to wake the child. In the words of my grandmother, if she had a good night, she would tuck him back in and give him a kiss. But if she had a bad night, she would sit at her desk and write a letter to her sister. I still haven't figured out how my grandmother knew this or why I had the urge to turn the light on. I still didn't even know why there was a buzzing noise or why the incidents only happened during thunderstorms. I still have much to unravel, but this is one thing I know. I have a young woman that will always be watching over me. Thanks for reading. I was 16 or 17 years old and worked as a shrimper out of Beaufort, North Carolina. I was trained as my mate by the owner, Captain F, of the boat, who was 72 years old and lacked the strength and stamina of his younger years. Finally, I was given command of this 25-foot channel net boat. The boat was moored at an old fish house on Taylor's Creek that was literally built in one day by the boat owner's father, Captain P in the 30s. I had strange feelings while working in the old fish house quite often, but never felt quite anything malevolent. Other sounds were heard, but I always attributed the sounds to nets and other equipment settling in the loft in other places. This place was stuffed. Captain P, when alive, had a reputation for being a hard and even abusive individual. He supposedly tolerated few people and was particularly hard on his boys. I knew two of them well. One night, I was shrimping in the river when a huge storm started approaching from the west. Quickly, I retrieved the net into the towed skiff and headed for the fish house just as the storm hit. The storm was as bad as I assumed it would be, and I could only move at a slow pace. The seas in the river rose up about four feet, and the rain came down in torrents, but I eventually reached the relative safety of Taylor's Creek. The rain and wind subsided before it reached the fish house, but the lightning was still illuminating the skies as the storm passed to the east. During a few of the lightning flashes, I saw a face looking out of the window, wearing a pair of glasses. The face was definitely a male face and had a thoughtful look on his face. As I approached the dock, I saw Captain F standing on the dock frantically pacing back and forth. He helped me tie the boat, inquired to my safety, and then went on board to make sure that the boat was okay. As I walked through the door to the fish house, I saw Captain F's wife sitting on the old couch that was inside. She was very calm and smiling cheerfully. I asked her what she found amusing, and she said she was laughing at her husband being such a tizzy over my safety. She then stated that she knew I was okay because Captain P told her so. I asked if Captain P wore glasses, 
and she went on to describe the wire-rimmed glasses I had seen during my approach. She added that Captain P has been standing by the window, amused, at his son's antics on the dock. Captain F's wife did not get along with Captain P when he was alive, but she told me that since his death, they got along quite well. He had been drawn to her, as she was very sensitive, and no one else in the immediate family could see him. She had many spiritual experiences in her life. She later told me that she only saw him in the fish house, usually when Captain F was worrying about something. There was one other time Captain F's wife had a psychic experience that I witnessed, but I will save this for another time. Thank you for reading. My story, I guess, is fairly tame compared to some I've read on your site, but nevertheless, it creeped me right the hell out, and none of the few people I've told really seem to believe, so here it goes. First of all, this happened about five years ago. I travel a lot, like a whole lot, and at this time this happened, I was traveling from home, which is northwest Ohio to Georgia, just outside of Atlanta. It's pretty much a straight shot down I-75, it takes about 10 hours, give or take. I only mention I travel a lot because I want it understood. I've crisscrossed the country I don't care to think how many times, and nothing remotely close to anything I'd consider paranormal or ghostly has ever happened to me, and I've been on a lot of shady roads that are the prime candidates for bad horror movies. As a slap to the collective face of those movies, this happened on I-75, probably one of the most traveled roads in the country. Being the major north-south highway of the Midwest, it usually has quite a lot of traffic. Sometimes it doesn't though. So I was traveling south on 75 heading for Atlanta, and as I mentioned, I travel a lot so I have my habits. On the longest drive like this, I prefer to leave in the evening just as rush hour is ending and make the bulk of the drive overnight. Pro tip to any others, 75 is almost completely deserted after about 10 p.m., unless you are very close to a city, and that is why I do it. I was making pretty decent time, and just starting into the hilly, not quite mountainous part of the trip in the Kentucky, Tennessee area when it starts raining, and I mean really coming down and hard, the kind of rain where you can barely see where you're going. This forced me to slow down a good clip, as the road gets pretty twisty in some areas through there, and God knows, I didn't want a horrible plunge off the side of the road in the middle of a rainstorm in the middle of the night, as I'm sure you understand. So I'm probably plugging along about 45-ish, much less in a curve, in the low 20s, give or take, when the incident begins. At first, this won't sound too weird, but I will explain. What I saw coming up on a curve was a hitcher on the side of the road. Just that. Pretty common, right? Well, maybe. Except it's 1.30 in the morning on a weekday, it's raining, an absolute torrent, and it's I-75 up in the hills, nowhere really near what I consider walking distance to a town or village. To be fair, I'm a little lazy fatty, so it doesn't have to be that far before I consider it out of walking distance. I'm sorry now that I wasn't paying closer attention to mile markers or whatnot to really know where exactly I was, but it was definitely north of Knoxville, and definitely in Tennessee. Anyway, I digress. A hitcher, in the middle of the horrible rainy night, nowhere near a town. I should mention, he appeared to be going my way, and I hadn't seen a breakdown or anything. Traffic was also very, very light. Not surprising considering the conditions and time. The entire story spans about 30 to 45 minutes, perhaps an hour. I can't imagine I saw more than one or two cars at that time, all northbound. I was slowed down considerably due to the curve, so I got a decent look at him. Pretty ragged looking, not surprising considering. Stood out most was the extra wide brimmed hat. I'm not a hat expert, so the closest I can compare it to is a sombrero, but that's not quite right, as it was just plain brown. I don't know, it stood out. Framed there in the light of my high beams, he was a sorry sight indeed. Nothing really remarkable about his appearance, except how out of place the fellow was. Now normally, I'm a pretty charitable guy, and always welcome some company. Bad movies aside, hitchers are pretty normal decent folks, and provide some break up to the monotony of long highway drives, but I'm also not a stupid guy. 
wee hours in the morning, middle of nowhere for all intents and purposes, and generally unsavory looking fellow, uh, no thanks. With only the slightest pang of guilt, I pass him by. Maybe next time, pal. But next time wasn't as far off as I thought. And here is where the weirdness comes in. Less than five minutes later, approaching another curve in the road is the same exact man by the side of the road. I smoked some pot back in the day, I'll admit, but my memory isn't so shot that I forget such an out of place figure inside of five minutes. I've already admitted I wasn't going that fast, but I was going a damn sight faster than a man goes on foot in a rainstorm I know that much. The road is curvy there, but at no point does it curve back on itself in such a way as to allow a pedestrian to go cross country and come out ahead either. It simply is not possible, but there he was. It still gives me a tiny chill, just like it did at the time. I actually started to slow down a bit, just in disbelief, and to confirm what I was seeing. I couldn't make out his features in the poor light of my high beams, not through the awful rain, but I can't mistake that hat. And I didn't see eyes, but I know we were making eye contact. It was a very surreal moment. With nothing else to do, I gave myself a mental shake and sped up as much as I dared and put it behind me. So I thought. I had almost convinced myself I had merely been road dazed or something. It happens. Usually not to me, but occasionally. You just get so strung out from a long drive that your brain sort of goes into autopilot. Unsettling. But I hadn't been driving that long. I was maybe 5 or 6 hours in, but I'd almost convinced myself when after about another 20 minutes or so, you guessed it, Mr. Hat is back at the side of the road. The rain's lit up a bit by now, and there's no mistaking at all that it's the same figure. I won't do the math because frankly I suck at it. But this guy has gone the same distance on foot in roughly 30 minutes that I have in a car traveling between 30 and 60 miles per hour, went on a straight bit. Just give the guy gold if he shows up at the summer games. That little joke just came to me now as I write this, and it's quite clever I thought by the way, but at the time what I felt. I will describe as my previous little chill's big brother. I was literally shaking all over at the sheer impossibility of it. I did not slow down to confirm this time. I gunned it as much as I deemed safe and then some and didn't let up until I got deep into Knoxville and found a service station to pull over, gas up and calm down. I was sitting at the pump for probably a good 20 to 30 minutes. I was that shook up. I have no idea what exactly I saw that night. And I don't overly want to know to be entirely honest. I won't utterly dismiss the possibility of three separate hitchhikers with very similar hats as I like to think of myself as open minded and the simplest explanation is usually the truth and all that but frankly I don't find that explanation all that simple. I'll let the readers decide I guess. The rest of my trip as well as the return trip continued without incident. I've desperately crossed the country coast to coast a time or two since that night, but I've never had another experience I would call ghostish. Is that a word? Although there have been a few other weird incidents over the years, this is the only one I feel merits a place in your archives. Thanks for reading, and hopefully believing. My mother had a hideaway closet in her room that she used for storage. I never really paid any attention to this closet until I started to hear this faint cry of a small child. I was confused because my brother and I were grown and the only person who lived downstairs was a 90 year old lady that never had any children or grandchildren. After nights of hearing this cry, I noticed the closer you got to my mom's room, the louder the cries got. Nothing was in my mom's room and then I opened the closet. I noticed that you could see the bottom half of the house, so I ran and got my brother. When we came back, we noticed that there used to be a staircase that led upstairs where we lived, but later they made it into a duplex and boarded it off. Anyway, here is the scary part. When we looked down, we both saw a small boy, no older than 5 or 6. He had a shaggy brown haircut, white socks with blue stripes pulled all the way up to his knees. A pair of navy blue shorts with a white stripe on the side and a white shirt with blue stripes going across. Very late 70s to early 80s attire. After investigation from the landlord, we found out that years ago, there lived a mother, 
father, and a small boy, and the parents would stick the boy on the staircase as punishment and shut the door. Well, one day, they forgot about him and apparently went on vacation. He died in the staircase. When me and Nick looked down, I asked the boy if he was okay. He looked up at us and literally disappeared. We never heard another cry. I guess he needed someone to know what happened to him before he could move on. In the 90s, I worked as a security guard, and one of the businesses that contracted us was the local hospital. On top of the usual drunks, addicts, etc., we were also responsible for checking the guest list in the morgue. Every two hours, we were to go through the drawers and the meat locker and check each toe tag against the inventory sheet to make sure everyone was always accounted for. I worked night shift there for almost two months, and nothing weird happened, except for a call button that liked to go off in an empty room. On what ended up being my last night there, I had a college interview in the morning, so had to get off work a half hour early. I always made my morgue check at straight up the hour, but because I was leaving early, I did my last check of the night a half hour earlier as well. Like most hospitals, the morgue was in the basement, and the acoustics down there were such that every sound echoed slightly. I got off the elevator and started down the long hall to the morgue, my footsteps echoing as I walked. I started hearing what sounded like people talking, which was nothing unusual in itself. Late night arrivals and attendance, working late was commonplace, but this sounded different. The voices, especially a couple of laughs I heard, I still can hear the laughs, had a hollow kind of distant quality to them, and there was more than a few of them. I was officially creeped out. As I got 25, 30 feet from the morgue, I hear a man say, he's coming, and an old man will respond, he's early. I quicken my pace, and as I hear a hurried commotion of mumbled voices, and gave a shout on my walkie for backup in the morgue. I burst out into the morgue not knowing what to expect, and there's no one there. I look in all the rooms, under and behind all the furniture, nothing. Then I see it. Laying on the floor by the drawers is a toe tag. I start opening the drawers, expecting to catch someone hiding in some of them, and find no one but the guests. The third one I opened up ended up being the owner of the orphan toe tag. Three other guards came down, and we did a full search of the whole floor. Found no one. What freaked me out, though, was I had been checking the bodies all night. Some had been here a couple days, and so I kind of knew what body was where. When I did my search of the drawers... Almost half of them were in the wrong ones. Needless to say, I quit that day. My favorite morgue. I got this great job working at a hospital. I really get to do something I enjoy. Taking care of others has always been a passion. I work on one of the hardest floors the cancer floor. We always have the same patients and not a whole lot of them make it. This makes my job hard in a lot of ways. Anyways, I have seen my fair share of death since I started here. I worked a night shift. Well at night, it can be a little creepy when you have to go to the morgue. One night, myself and a co-worker were taking someone down to the morgue. Now let me explain our Morgue is a little freezer box that is in the basement and smells horrible. Plus it has a ramp to get into it. So she and I wheel the body down there and we push it up the ramp and then we argue over who is going to push the body in. Of course, I lose, so I swing the freezer door open, push in the body and slam the door shut. We start to fill out paperwork when we both look up at each other. She says to me, did you hear that? 
and I respond saying, I think so. We both turn and look at the door. We both got cold chills, and the hair on our arms were standing straight up. It sounded like someone was crying out for help. We froze, turned, looked at each other, and ran out. Halfway down the hall, she asked if I really heard what she did. Yeah, I did, I tell her. So I was telling one of my friends who is a nurse on our floor, and also the story. She tells me that she has had similar things happen in the morgue as well. To this day, I will not go alone, and, and I know this sounds weird, but I always try to get out of that situation. We also have a tradition on our floor that when someone passes away, we open the window so the soul of that person is not trapped in the hospital to roam. I'm not making this up. It truly happened. If you don't believe me, I don't care. I know who does, and so does everyone else who works there with me. Thanks for reading. It all started off early one morning when I was lying in bed watching my TV. My mother walked in and said that we were going to the Everglades to canoe with my cousin and aunt coming alongside us. I quickly got out of bed and we all got ready to go. The drive was about an hour long and when we got there, there was hardly anyone there and it was very breezy and cold. We waited for about 15 minutes before my cousin and aunt arrived. Once we had gone to the office to arrange our canoeing plans, we headed outside to where the canoes were and started to get in. Me, my aunt, and my cousin got in one canoe and were pushed off the shore first, leaving my mom, dad, and sister behind and us having to wait for them in the water. Once they were in the water, we started paddling. We had been paddling for about 15 minutes, enjoying the scenery and the time we were spending with each other as families do, when I spotted something move in the water. I looked down into the water, and I saw a human figure swimming beneath us. The water was extremely shallow. The figure moved like it had all the room in the world, stretching its arms out wide, legs extended, and it was doing that even though there were walls of sand and mangrove trees everywhere, including the water. He seemed to be going through everything. I looked closely to see that it was a young boy. About 13 or 14 years of age, with beautiful blonde hair. I gasped for air very loudly too, so that my family would hear and show concern. The boy looked at me with dark red eyes and rings of black as well. I sensed evil and sadness and very much cruelty. On seeing me, the boy turned his head and swam away, deeper into the water, fading away. Once I had realized what had just happened, I noticed that my family was around me, worried. What's wrong? Are you okay? My mother yelled out to me. I nodded my head. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just fine. I thought I just saw something in the water. And it scared me. It was nothing, though. I replied, unfortunately lying. My mom said, okay. And then we all headed on with our sightseeing. Not even five minutes had passed. Another thing happened. I was looking all around, enjoying the scenery, when I saw the boy again. I focused my eyes through the layers of thick mangrove trees to see the boy staring back at me with a very angry face, and this time with completely full bright red eyes. I thought I had passed through his territory and that me and my family needed to get out of there, and quickly. Our canoes went into an open area of the river, and I was still focused, looking at the boy. The wind started to pick up real fast, and it got real cold. My cousin was standing up at that moment, taking a video of the area with her video camera. My aunt was holding her legs from behind, but barely. As I continued staring at the boy, the wind got worse. The boat tipped a bit, and my cousin lost her balance and fell overboard 
into the water. I quickly looked away from the boy to look at my cousin just falling into the water. I stood and then reached out my arm to her. Then I remembered the boy and his evil look. I looked back at the place where I was just staring at him before, and to my amazement, he was gone. I panicked to reach for my cousin and pull her back on the boat. The boy was gone, and I feared he would do so, and maybe cause harm to my cousin, who was still in the water trying to reach me in my aunt's hands to get back on the boat. Take my hand, take my hand, take my hand, get back on the boat. I yelled out to my cousin very loudly and quickly. She did as I said and swam to me quickly, reaching for my hand with both arms. I quickly pulled her back onto the boat and she was fine. No damage done. Whew. I was worried the rest of the time in the water and when we got back to the shore, I just happened to spot the boy again. He gave me an evil wink and rolled his eyes back, fading away. Ouch! My back hurts, my cousin yelled out. And just after I finished looking at the boy, I lifted her shirt up, and to everyone's surprise, her whole back was a big black and blue bruise. Everywhere you looked on her back, she had a bruise. She basically looked like a ripened plum from her back. I don't even remember getting hurt, she said to me. Who knows, I said back, fakingly, knowing that the boy had something to do with it. We left after that. I came back a few years later and asked one of the workers there of the history of the place after telling them of what I had experienced there. They told me that many years ago, a boy in his teens was playing around with his friends in the water where my family and me were canoeing. One of his friends placed a bet with him to see who could hold their breath the longest. The boy who had died was from a poor family and wanted to win the money desperately. After they completed, the friend who was competing against this boy noticed that his partner was floating when he touched him to tell him that he had won. He quickly grabbed him and pulled him out of the water, then went to go get help. The kid had wanted the money so bad that he drowned and did not even mean to. He lost his life that day, and no one could bring him back to life. When his parents found out, they both committed suicide for losing their only son. I understood the story. When I was walking out of the Everglades Center building, I looked down at the area at where the canoes were, and there was the boy standing there looking at me with a sorrowful face and this time light blue eyes. I smiled at him and then waved goodbye to him. I looked back and he had sort of a smile on his face. At that moment, I felt like he knew I understood and was just glad. I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee and went to school with lots of the country music stars kids. This afforded me some rather unique experiences and one of those is how I came to encounter a ghost. There is a hotel in Watrice, Tennessee, called the Walking Horse Hotel. I know it is still there because I visited it yesterday with my wife and kids on the way back to Atlanta from visiting family in Nashville. The property has changed dramatically on the inside, but as soon as I saw the outline of the building, I knew that it was it. It was in the early 1980s, and I was invited to go with some of my friends and one adult, the wife of a very prominent country music star, to stay New Year's Eve as the guest of the manager of Unique Hotel located in Tennessee, Walking Horse Country. We were to be the only people in the hotel as it was closed that evening. My friends had stayed there in the recent past and had some interesting experiences. This particular hotel was the resting place of Strutting Jim, one of the most famous Tennessee walking horses of all time. His trainer Floyd had lived in the hotel, and sometime after the horse's passing, had died himself in his room on the third floor of the three-story hotel. Floyd was still said to be wandering the grounds in the halls of the hotel, but our host George, the manager of the property, 
assured us that he was always friendly and had not harmed anyone. We arrived mid-evening after stopping for dinner on the way and enjoyed a nice quiet evening. We spent most of the evening looking at the amazing walking horse artwork that hung on almost every square inch of the lobby and main staircase. It was shortly after midnight. We had been listening to George's tales of encounters from other guests when everyone started settling down to sleep. I was feeling a bit brave and still wasn't as sold as the others on the authenticity of Floyd the Ghost, so we decided to go up and sit in his room on the third floor to see if anything would happen. I sat on the bed in almost total darkness and waited for Floyd. When I opened my eyes, I was laying on the bed, still fully dressed in clothes and shoes and day was just breaking. I knew that I had fallen asleep and that there had been no visit from Floyd. I went downstairs to find George, starting to put together breakfast and the others were just starting to mill about. George suggested we go out and see Strutting Jim's grave marker and stretch our legs before breakfast. As we headed out to the back pasture to visit the stables and grave, it all seemed strangely familiar. As we approached a fenced-in area on the side of the pasture, I stopped George and asked how long the English sheepdogs had lived there. He looked rather surprised, as we had not been out there the night before, and there had been no mention of the dogs. But sure enough, they came running up to the fence and started barking and looking directly at me. We then proceeded to the stables where the grave marker was, and there were a few horses kept. As we approached one of the stables, George told us all to stay clear of the big black one as he bit anyone he didn't know. The black horse immediately came to me and started nuzzling my head and stamping his feet in excitement. We then walked over to the grave marker and I led the way as if I had been going there for years. By now, even George was blown away with all of this and when asked, I responded that I slept in Floyd's room, but didn't remember leaving the bed all night. We all walked back to the hotel, talking about the strange events, and without asking, I walked directly in the rear kitchen door like I owned the place. We had not been anywhere near this area of the hotel for our visit, but I knew exactly where to go. We all sat down in the dining room, and George asked who would like biscuits with honey to start. I jumped up and stated that these were the best biscuits in the world and everyone should have some. George asked how I knew this since this was my first visit and we had arrived after dinner the night before. I walked straight into the kitchen, opened a pantry, reached up to a tin on the third shelf and opened it up to reveal a tin full of the very biscuits. That pretty much sealed the deal. It is my assumption that Floyd took me for a little spin the night before using my body as a vehicle to get to his favorite places and get some of his favorite food. I am still not quite sure what to make of this incredible event, but I know that I now believe that there are some people who just aren't ready to go on to heaven or whatever awaits them, and they are still here on earth with us. On my visit yesterday, it was so disappointing to learn that the new proprietor had gutted the hotel, changed the entire layout, losing the lobby and grand staircase, and didn't believe that any of the tales about Floyd were anything more than poppycock. The entire feel of the place was different, and I hope Floyd has moved on to his eternal resting place. I know the memory of that incredible day will always be with me. When I was 14, my family transferred from Danbury, Connecticut to Simbago, Maine for my mom's work. My parents bought a farmhouse with an attached barn so we could keep our horses on the property. I was a freshman in high school, and my sister was a few years behind me. Almost immediately, I began seeing, out of the corner of my eye, someone walk past the bathroom door and go down the stairs. But when I looked straight down the stairs, no one was there. This would happen every morning as I was getting ready to go to school. As the months and even years progressed, I'd witnessed voices having conversations that I couldn't make out. I heard banging and footsteps coming from the second floor when no one was up there, and a voice calling me by name and demanding that I come to it when I was the only person in the house. I did not have the courage to come to the voice, so I stood there until my father came inside the house. There was also the time I was in the barn with the horses and was enveloped by the stench of decaying flesh. No dead animal could be found in the vicinity of the barn. 
During the summer of 1992, I was 17 and working for a family camping resort in the general store. I remember being asleep and being woken up by a man's voice in my ear. He said, wake up and hear the storm. I can still remember feeling the vibration of his words in my ear and being puzzled by what I had just heard. I sat up in my bed and was afraid that there was someone in my room with me. My father was the only man in the house, and I was positive that it was not his voice that I heard. Beside the fact that I didn't hear my door open or close, so I was sure that whoever had spoken to me hadn't left yet. Lightning was coming down outside, and I could hear the horses whining, so I got out of bed and tried for the light, but the power was out. I stumbled down the stairs and saw that my father was in bed sleeping. I took a flashlight with me to the barn and saw that the horses were outside loose. One horse had broken through the fencing and the others were running around, panicked by the storm. Thanks to the voice, I was able to gather up all of the horses and put them in their stalls safe and sound. It was the only time that the spirits were helpful to me. Thanks for reading. I'm an experienced ghost and demon hunter. That is a big claim, but I can offer eyewitnesses if needed. I want to share my first real encounter. I was 15 and my family saved for months to rent a vacation home on Cape Cod. It was in the little village of Warham near Onset, and the whole area was made up of vacation homes. When we got there, I was excited and immediately ran into the house, only to run through a wall of cold. The cold got in and took over my mind. I was pushed to the back of my mind, and this other being thought through me and touched things with my body. The entity actually held a conversation with me about what she'd remember things being like in her day. The strangest part of this was that my vision changed. I wear glasses, but she took them off. Also, all colors paled into a weird black and white vision. I was terrified. No matter how I squirmed, I could not break loose. My mother called me outside, and as she went to see who my mother was, my body crossed the threshold of the door and the entity was popped out. I was panicked, but what could I do? Saying nothing, I built a wall up in my head that said simply no. When my little brother and sister went upstairs, they soon came down screaming that a dead hand had reached into the open window. I had not told anyone about my encounter, but my no strategy was working, so I cradled them in my arms and said no to the ghost for them as well. My baby sister was stationed in a crib in my room. She often woke up about 2 or 3 a.m. screaming. I got good at waking up when the presence got near and throwing my proactive no over the baby too. We had so much poltergeist activity in that house. Like the salt and pepper shakers would fly off the fridge and onto the table. My mom would put things away, turn around, and they would be back. We also experienced knocks, footsteps, and bad smells. And when my cousin came to visit, he stuck his head through the open window that led from the TV room to the porch, a window that was jammed all three of us could not budge it, and it slammed down on his head. At the end of the week, I finally told my mom about the encounter I had. She believed me and went to see the realtor we had leased the house from. He casually told us that the reason we got the house so cheap was because it was haunted. A woman had been murdered there 20 years ago. We rented that house out a couple more times. Since we knew it was haunted, we would say hello to the ghost. My mom felt bad for her when we got there. It was never an easy thing for me, as she often tried to get into my head or talk to me. I built up my auric protection from that experience, but I was very afraid of ghosts for a long time afterwards. As will happen, ghosts were very interested in me. Then demons started being put in my path. It is one thing to believe in ghosts, but it took much convincing and hand wriggling to accept that there are demons. For every encounter with the demonic, I've had to reach deeper into old myths and religious writings to tease out what the ancients knew. I am not a devout Catholic, although I was raised to be. That path never held answers for me, or I should not say enough answers. Yet I became an ordained minister of universal light. I know there is a great spiritual mind, a great source, and sometimes that source appears to me as female, sometimes male, 
sometimes both, or neither. I died a few times as a child, due to what I now know was demonic attacks. When I gave birth to my daughter, I had complications and bled to death. That journey took me to the great source, in a word, to love. But not love as an attachment to a person, idea, or pet. Love as an infinite ocean of creation. I was immersed in this oceanic experience while the Great One spoke to me. It was really more like receiving direct knowing. He, she, said it was my choice to go back on or move on. That I had a hard life in addition to my nonstop illnesses. I had been abused in every sense of the word. And it was fine to let go. My children would do fine without me. I was needed, but not necessary. If I chose to go back, however, I would be sent teachers and would fulfill certain duties for the balance. I would be a teacher and healer and have the tools and gifts I needed as such. In this place, I had no ego, no desire. I was awish in love. I looked down at my daughter, not three minutes old, and chose to go back for her and my son. As was told to me, Within a year, my teacher showed up. Also, the demon showed up. Those first few years were dedicated to clearing out my mind and personal history. As I came to know my personal demons, a correlating world demon would make itself known. At first, I did nothing but observe and clear myself. After practicing mindfulness for nearly eight years and having the help and teachings of a medicine man, a Buddhist nun, a master therapist, and a couple of gurus, the universe gave me the nod, and people literally started showing up at my doorstep. I worked with people on many levels for many years. I worked with hauntings and cast out some demons from buildings. I've not done an exorcism yet, as one has not been in my path, and I do not go searching for these things. I cannot say I would know where to begin, but for gods of grace, guidance, it can happen. I've trapped destructive forces and banished them or helped them transmute. The people involved always have dramatic changes, even the ones who don't know what happened. I've had spiritual duels with practitioners of dark arts and removed hexes and lesser known demonic attachments. But the hunter can become the hunted. I caught some backlash from a few entanglements that involved black magic and ghosts that stuck into my car and followed me home. Before I knew what hit me, I was really sick with an undiagnosable problem of my nervous system. I had to leave the city, move to Vermont, and get involved with horses to ground me and bring my being back to life. For the last three years, I've done nothing but heal and surround myself with nature. Some very tricky forces have challenged me here, as Vermont is ripe with haunting and strange energies, but I have not worked the public more than a few times. Now, I am ready again. I am also ready to learn new things. I would love to talk to others who have had any experiences like my own. Please feel free to contact me, and thank you for my very long read. I first got into the paranormal on October 16, 2011, when it was my 11th birthday and my mom and I went on a ghost tour of a war of 1812 fort and saw a strange shadow. Since then, I've created my own paranormal group and expect to ghost hunt many haunted places like the Waverly Hills Sanatorium in the future. Today, technically this night of October 24th, my granddad took me on a ghost tour which had a bunch of people get led around a small part of Jordan Village in southern Ontario. There was this one point we got to go to a nice winery building known as the Cave Spring Winery or Cave Spring Wine Shop. Here, we got to descend down into the cellars here. Before that, we were informed about the three main spirits here. One was a nice female spirit named Margaret. The other was an unnamed male, malevolent entity. And the other was a horse who was said to have had a heart attack and you could hear the hooves on the cement clip-clopping along. Anyways, our group of 30 or so people headed down to the tunnels and we learned a bit more of the history and discovered we could enter one of the supposedly haunted tunnels where screams and voices have been reported. When I went in there with my grandpa and two women on the tour, it was just four of us because we went four at a time. It was somewhat chilly. At first we didn't hear anything, just looking around for a moment then taking pictures. 
Then it happened. There was a loud clang right near us. It was as if someone picked up a sewer grate and dropped it right by us. We thought that they were closing the door on us, and we'd investigate the tunnel alone, but the door was open, and the tour guide didn't seem to be reacting to the sound. Then it happened again. The same loud clang, maybe a bit louder, only a second or two after the first one. It was getting a bit closer to us now. Moments later, there was a third clang. I didn't get a negative feeling, but more shocked like, wow, that's interesting. Once the tour was over, I spoke to the guide about it. She claimed she didn't hear a thing, nor did the rest of the tour group. But they were so loud. Someone besides us must have heard it, but there was no noise. The Cave Spring Winery is in operation on the upper floors, sometimes busy, but the floor is thick and we were at least 10 plus feet underground. It would be very difficult for sound to get through. Even so, it wouldn't sound like it was close by. It would be muffled. The tunnel didn't have any vents for noise to travel through, and there was only a staircase way out on the other end of the tunnel. It would be practically impossible for a noise like that to get through. Can I verify what we heard was paranormal? No. I can't conclude it was paranormal, but based on the evidence gathered with thick walls and a thick floor above us, and nobody but us four in the tunnel were able to hear these three loud noises, there might be something there. I've heard stuff about these knocks or scratches means a demonic presence, and yes, I do believe demons do exist. Was this a demon? This is somewhat unlikely. I'm a bit paranormal sensitive. I can't tell when a spirit has entered the room, and when I have encountered a negative entity, which I have before at a local cemetery, not in Jordan. If this were a demon, I would probably feel the negative presence as a very, very uncomfortable feeling in my chest. I have a slight heavy feeling in my chest when a good spirit is in the room, not wanting to do harm, probably just making itself known. If this were a ghost, I guess it was Margaret, as she wants people to acknowledge her presence. Personally, I would recommend taking this tour to where you'd have to speak to someone at the Jordan Historical Museum, and the tours sell out fast and are usually in October. Of course, to put you in the mood for Halloween, there are people dressed up and hiding behind trees and stand there silently to freak you out. Many places on the tour had ghost reports surrounding them but I do believe the Cave Springs winery is haunted. This happened about 10 years ago. I was 14 or 15 at the time and working night shift with my mom delivering papers. I was having a lot of unexplainable things happen to me. One place we delivered to was beside an old park that no one played on anymore and I always saw a little girl on the swing. The first time I saw her, I was really concerned. She looked no more than four or five, and it was about 2 a.m. I told my mom, but she said no one was there. Just to make sure though, mom had me stay in the van and she went to walk through the park. She saw no one. Fast forward about a month or so, I'd gotten very used to seeing this girl, sometimes on the swing, sometimes walking around. I wanted to know who she was, so I did research on the area. Nothing. At first, she gave off that innocent lost girl vibe, so I thought maybe she was a missing kid who met a tragic end. So more research. This time, Missing or murdered children from the whole city and the towns around it. Again, nothing. Slowly, I started feeling uneasy when I saw her. She no longer felt like a child. She felt old and something was definitely not right. I started getting bad headaches every time I saw her. Started getting sick and very weak as well. At one point, I was so weak and dizzy, I couldn't stand on my own for almost two days. My mom, who is not religious at all, started to get very worried and called a church asking for help. 
they suggested that we pray and ask God for guidance. In all likelihood, they thought I was just a troublemaker, making stuff up. Well, that didn't do anything. Things got worse. One night, my headache was so bad, I told mom to take me home. I couldn't see it hurt so bad. At the time, we lived about a five minute drive from the park. So she drove me home and my brother went to work with her. My sister stayed up to take care of me. Nice cold cloth on my forehead and made sure it was dark and quiet. I finally passed out on the couch and she went upstairs to bed. Dream time. What felt like only a few seconds after I fell asleep, I hear a blood-curdling scream come from my sister's room. I open my eyes. All the lights were on, but I didn't care. Screw the headache. I booked it upstairs to my sister's room. Only I wasn't in my sister's room. I was in the van at the park. Confused, I look around and see my sister standing about 10 feet in front of the car. It started pouring rain, so I yell at her to come inside the van. She comes to the passenger side of the van and she's not my sister anymore. She's the little girl on the swing. She smiles, looks me dead in the eyes, and in the most evil sing-song voice I have ever heard, she said, I found you, and starts giggling. My eyes shoot open. I'm back on the couch. The lights are on, so I figure I'd been out for a while. I try to get up for a drink of water, and I could not move. I was in a form of sleep paralysis. I think I can hear that evil giggle again and start freaking out, trying with all my might to move, to yell, to do anything. Maybe about 30 seconds later, my mom comes rushing in the door, and I can move again. I rolled off the couch and screamed and cried. My mom said that ever since she dropped me off, she had a bad feeling and just needed to make sure I was okay. It had been about 20 minutes since she dropped me off. I told her about the vivid dream and now my mom was convinced something seriously bad was occurring. She called one of our good friends who was a Wiccan for help. I'll call her Jay. Jay said it sounded like something demonic, but not necessarily a demon. She said she would be over within a week. She lived a 12 hour drive away. The next night, I'm working with mom again, feeling like crap, but I was too scared to ask to go home again, much rather sleep in the van, which is exactly what I did. Now, what happened next, I have no recollection of. My mom said she let me sleep, got out, and when she came back, I was sitting up, smiling at her. She asked me why, and I started to giggle. She told me to stop because it wasn't funny. She said I stopped and looked at her, tilted my head, smiled and said, I found her, she's mine now, and started giggling again. Mom freaked out and started yelling my name. Finally, I asked her why she was yelling at me after snapping out of it. I had a headache. Mom called Jay and told her what had happened. She hopped on the next flight over. She just called in to work. Originally, she was going to finish the work week and drive over the weekend. She did a blessing and smudging of my house in my room. She prayed to the goddess for protection. She did everything she could think of to protect me. Something worked. I haven't seen or heard this little girl since, and I'm very happy about it. 
I still don't know exactly what she was. Demon or evil spirit. This story begins when I was a child, probably about seven years old. My mom and aunts threw a huge Halloween party for all the kids in the family. I think there were 16 of us at the time, ranging in age from probably 5 to 13. It was awesome, but the coolest part came about the time it just got really dark. We took a hayride to a cemetery a few miles down the road from my aunt and uncles where the party was being held. My mom told us about some of the people buried there and how some of them were not resting in peace. Typical urban legend stuff. When we got there, the adults said they wanted us to show us the grave of an old man whose ghost was seeking revenge for his wrongful death. We were all scared and excited, creeping through the cemetery in the dark towards the largest tombstone. When we were about halfway there, my dad and uncles popped up from behind the graves, wearing scary masks. The kids all screamed and ran for the wagon while the ghosts and moms all laughed. For years, the adults retold this story, laughing over the details of our panicked faces and terrified attempts to get away. When I was a teenager, my sister and two of my cousins decided to get our moms back for this prank. Our parents got together once a month to play cards, so that October, we made sure we were around for card night. We waited until our fathers went for a beer run, which inevitably meant an hour or two at the bar. We told our moms about a legend we had heard about a sad ghost that could be seen weeping at her husband's grave when the moonlight hit. We made this story up and convinced them to take us to see it. My cousin secretly called his best friend who had agreed to go there in a mask and hide to scare them. The prank worked perfectly and our mothers nearly peed themselves. We all laughed hardly as we went back to our car. When we got to it, the car would not start. We laughed some more about the ghost sabotaging it and decided to walk where my cousin's friend had hidden his car. We would send our dads to get the car later, but of course, his car would not start either. We started to feel a little weird about this since neither car had problems recently. But what could we do? This was before everyone had cell phones, so we started walking towards the closest house, which was about a mile or two away. Though none of us knew them well, we knew the name of the people who lived there. As we walked up their long driveway, we started to worry because there were no cars parked by the house and it looked pretty dark inside. We knocked anyway, but got no answer. We were about to leave not having nearly as much fun thinking we would have to walk the long distance to the next house when we heard voices coming from the back of the house. We went to the backyard looking for the people we heard, but it was pretty dark and nobody was around. We yelled hello a few times and identified ourselves, but got no answer. The backyard had a fair amount of trees and suddenly large branches started falling. This scared us since there was no apparent cause. In just a few seconds, at least a dozen branches bigger than your arm fell from the five or six trees closest to us. It was utterly crazy. We all ran for it. We were around the end of the driveway. My cousin screamed and pointed towards the house. It looked like several pairs of red eyes were peering around the house at us. We ran straight back to our car and tried it again. It started no problem. We did not stop at my cousin's friend's car. We went right back to the house. Later that night, 
My uncle, dad, and cousin took his friend back and got his car, which also started on the first try. When they drove past the house, it looked completely normal, and there was a car in the driveway. We have never been sure if the people there saw us mucking about in the graveyard and decided to prank the pranksters, or if it was something else. If it was a prank, they put it together awfully fast and never laughingly confessed. We felt too foolish to ask. It was in 1971. I was in my late 20s. I was then staying in Rose Hill, in a different country, not married yet and staying at my folks. One day, my dad came home with a South African couple. He met them while coming back home, and they were tourists visiting Meredith with their back bags, tents, and sleeping bags. Meredith was still safe in that period, but independence was given by Great Britain in 1968, and a civil war had just come to an end a few months before. Two communities had fought for some political reasons. Anyway, my dad invited them home to sleep over for a few days. I remember the guy had a big blonde beard. He was very kind. His wife was as well, but I forgot her face. We decided to organize camping during a weekend on the west coast of Meredith. This place, which is now pretty developed, was at the time very wild with just a few houses. We went on a Saturday morning, found a nice place to put a tent, and organized the day. The South African man and his wife were very good swimmers and divers. We spent a lot of time in the sea, catching fish, crabs, some lobsters, which were getting scarce then. We don't find them anywhere by the coast, and cooked all these goodies on a small homemade barbecue set. All of us, mom, dad, the couple and I really enjoyed the day. The sunset was beautiful. It was warm. We were in summer and everything was perfect. When night came, we prepared a nice barbecue with chicken, beef, and pork, and a few shrimps we had caught earlier. The night was starry, my dad was happy and drunk, and the couple was obviously having a great time. Since we were not fluent in English, I was improving then. Communication was a bit difficult, but we could make ourselves understand with gestures and sometimes drawing on the sand. It was a great fun seeing my dad, trying to converse with them with a very limited knowledge of English. Anyway, it must have been around 9 p.m. We were all seated on the beach, watching the ocean as well as the starry sky by the campfire. It was so beautiful. Then we started to hear like a complaint. We couldn't determine the origin of the sound, but it was like a woman wailing. It was faint, but clear, since the place was wild and remote. The wailing was not constant, but would be heard from time to time. We put it on the sound of some sorts of animal. Since we were not people living on the coast, thus being ignorant of animals, which could be active at night. We were seated on the beach facing the ocean when suddenly we noticed someone coming out from the sea on our left at about 30 to 40 meters away. It looked like a woman with a long white dress just walking from the sea to the beach. We could not see her face but could guess she had long hair. The only lights were the stars and our bonfire. She silently walked straight and disappeared from our view in the vegetation. We found this very odd. I knew it was not normal, but did not know what the others were thinking. 
My dad was drunk and watched the scene with a little smile on his face. I think he was lost in his thoughts. We all looked at each other and did not know what to think. I tried to check if there was a house where the woman walked to. I just stood up and walked towards the sea and looked on my left to see where she went. There was only green, bush, and trees. There were no lights or any constructions around. I was now scared because I was realizing that we must have seen a ghost. I walked back to the bonfire and sat and told everyone that I did not find any house there. We stopped talking and everyone kept alert. We could now hear all the little noises of the night. We heard faint crackling like someone or an animal quietly walking on dry leaves. Then, suddenly, we heard loud flapping noises on a tree nearby. It looked like large birds, pigeons or bats, flying away. It scared us. Then my mom told me quietly she felt that something was not right, and I and she were feeling watched. The couple was looking around with their glass in their hands. Then, suddenly, something heavy fell in front of us on the beach at about five or six meters. I stood up to see what it was, but could not find anything. Everybody stood up and looked around. Nothing was found. Despite the fact that the night was clear and sweet, the atmosphere had changed. Apart from my father, who was in a trip because he was too drunk, we were all scared by then. The couple talked between them, and I could not understand. They seemed quite concerned about the situation. I did not know what to do. Could we stay there, or maybe go to sleep, or maybe we had to leave? That was a pity. We were enjoying such a nice time before seeing that woman. Then, in the middle of the night, we heard this bone-chilling scream like a woman being attacked. It seemed close to our camp. We were on our feet with eyes about to pop out from our sockets. My heart was pounding so loud that I thought others could hear it. The couple started to pick up their stuff and my dad followed them. Mom and I packed away everything quickly. As we were doing so, some coconuts fell and rolled on our camp as if someone had thrown them away. We were now scared to death and no one would talk. We heard running on the beach, then in the woods, but could not see anything. We quickly put stuff in the car and it was not easy because we did not have a big car and we had taken time to pack things so that they could fit in when we came down. Now we had to pile up things. The worst was the barbecue. It was hot and dirty and we did not want to leave it. I burnt myself twice while trying to put it away. While we were packing away, things were happening around us. The screams seemed to originate from different places and there was a lot of noises going on. We all got into the car practically, one upon the other with stuff on us. I decided to take the wheel because my dad was too drunk. As we moved away, we got a shock. We saw a woman dressed in white standing by the little lane looking at us. It was bone chilling. I stopped the car. She was standing about four to five meters away. I didn't know what to do. I was too scared to move closer to her, but it was the only way out. We waited a few minutes as she was standing there staring at us. I heard my mom praying 
and the South African couple mumbling something between them. Suddenly, we heard a bang, like something hit the car behind. We all turned to see what had happened. The atmosphere was very tense, and I think my dad was becoming sober very quickly. He was now swearing. We did not see anything behind, but when I looked forward, the woman was not there anymore. But the scariest thing happened. She was now standing by my door, looking at me. I can't describe the utter fear which took hold of me then. I released a scream. My throat was sore several days after and pushed the gas pedal. I think everybody screamed then, but with panic, the car choked and the woman was still there looking at us. I remember not seeing her eyes or features because it was dark. I switched on the car again and drove off as fast as I could. The poor car got shaken on the dirt road. We reached the main road, relieved and shouting. What the hell had we seen and experienced? Fortunately, Rose Hill is not far from that area we were just at. But when we reached the town, the car broke down. The fan belt of the car had broken and the engine stopped from overheating. We were in the 70s, no cell or anything like towing services available a Saturday evening. The couple and my mom walked home, which was not far. My dad and I stayed by the car. At home, mom phoned a friend of my dad, who was not staying far, to tow away our car. We finally reached home at around 11.30 p.m., completely exhausted. My dad's friend who had helped us was invited to have coffee, and we told him what had happened. He said that we were lucky because there had been accounts of people walking to the sea, like being in a trance and never coming back, getting drowned by possession, really scary and unbelievable. Some would be hurt by objects being thrown at them. A woman apparently lost her baby while being pregnant. She was a few weeks away from delivery, but after coming to that place and seeing the ghost, she had pain in her tummy and started to bleed a few hours later. She had to go through surgery where they noted that the baby had died. These events would not always happen, but would take place randomly. The South African couple stayed two more days at home and left. We never heard or saw from them afterwards. I later discovered that there was a cemetery on the other side of the road. Not too close to the road though. I never knew who that woman, ghost was, but it seemed that regularly she would come out of the ocean and walk to the cemetery. However, in the late 80s, there was no accounts of seeing her up to today. I'm sorry, but you can't just leave the video without leaving a like, leaving a comment, and letting me know if you like the video, if you want to see more of this content, or if you want to see different topics and ghostly topics and all that. I love you guys. Please don't forget to share. It helps the algorithm, social media, um, whatever you guys have there. Say something at the end of the video. Just let me know that you're there and you're active and you watch the videos. And all the effort is... Um, appreciated. Um, not that I, I want to feel vain, but it helps, you know, let me know that you guys are still, you know, watching and enjoying everything. I think I just said that, but it doesn't matter, guys. Whoopsie daisy. I'll see you in the next video. There are going to be short videos coming, long videos, everything coming soon, guys. So please enjoy the video. Love you.